This is Audible. Metal Boxes, Rusty Hinges, Volume 3, by Alan Black. Narrated by Doug Tisdale, Jr. Acknowledgement. Thanks, Beta Reader Team, for your quality reads and feedback. Stephen, Bennett, Melanie, and Melissa, you make my books much better than they would be if left to my own imagination. I also want to thank my editors. Melissa Manis, www.scriptionis.com, has done her usual wonderful job. My chief editor has exceeded all expectations. A Brief Synopsis of Earlier Books Metal Boxes Stone's first assignment as a newly minted midshipman is on a massive warehouse ship supplying the Empire's fleet with everything from bullets to bandages to food during the Hyrocanian War. He becomes friends with the officers of the Marine Contingent, Numos, Hammermill, Heller, and Vedrian. Full Commander Danielle Elizabeth Wright, the officer in charge of the vast ship's farms, mentors him as he struggles with Navy life, his duties, and his budding relationship to First Lieutenant Ali Vedrian. Stone uncovers a ring of thieves lining their pockets at the expense of the military and the Emperor. Before he can report the theft, he and Commander Wright are kidnapped, thrown into an escape pod, and jettisoned into hyperspace, a certain death sentence. Stone reconfigures the pod engines and makes a safe landing on an unknown hostile planet. Stone and Wright struggle to survive the harsh environment while making repairs to the pod in an effort to return to human space. Stone happens to be present at the birth of native creatures that look like a cross between a dragon and a scorpion. Two babies imprint on him after their badly injured mother dies. He calls them Draskos and gives each of them a name. Wright determines their relative location in space and studies the flora and fauna of the previously undiscovered planet. Stone names the planet Allie's World after his girlfriend. Rather than die as their would-be killers planned, they manage to get the pod's engines repaired and refueled. Taking the baby Draskos with them, Stone and Wright return to human space, where they proceed to the local Empire Military Investigative Service, Emis office, to report their status among the living. They soon find themselves pressed into helping the Emis agent take control of the warehouse ship to investigate the attempted murders and possible theft. When the ship's admiral is found complicit, the Emis agent places Stone in command of the ship with orders to plot a course for the nearest space station. The ship is on course to a combat zone to resupply the fleet, fighting a desperate battle against the Hyrocanians. Stone struggles with the orders he's been given and determines to do what is right for the Navy. Stone risks his life and the lives of his Draskos in an effort to save the fleet. His actions damage the fleet warehouse ship beyond repair. Expecting to die at the hands of humanity's enemy, he's rescued by his girlfriend, First Lieutenant Vedrian. His unusual problem-solving solutions save the remnant of the Empire's heavily battered fleet. The Hyrocanian fleet is soundly defeated, and Stone is declared a hero. Metal Boxes Trapped Outside Ensign Stone feels trapped on Lazaroni base while the legal issues surrounding his escape from the Hyrocanians and the rescue of the Empire's fleet whirl around him for months on end. Meanwhile, his marine friends are transferred to systems unknown, taking Ali with them. The medical corps continues probing, prodding, and poking him. They discover that his close association with alien Draskos is affecting his DNA, and they can't explain the changes in his body, but as of yet none appear dangerous. The Draskos are classified as pets, although their level of intelligence has been recognized by many. In a fit of the Emperor's humor, his next assignment returns him and his Draskos to Ali's world, as the appointed planetary governor and military commander of a mismatched group of military, medical, and civilian personnel, including his marine friends and girlfriend Ali. Before the military can fully secure their small headquarters area, the compound is heavily bombed. The battered survivors desperately struggle to vacate the compound ahead of a Hyrocanian ground assault. While running and hiding from the Hyrocanians, the small band of survivors finds the local fauna as dangerous as the aliens hunting them. A massive rampaging male Drasco attacks their ragged camp. Barely able to kill the beast while attempting to save Allie, Stone is infected with Drasco bodily fluids, resulting in a massive growth spurt, thickening of his skin, and a heightening of his senses. 
The desperate attack on the Hyrokanian base camp turns to victory, as Stone manages to commandeer an alien shuttle. The humans know little about Hyrokanian physiology, language, society, culture, or even why they started the war. During the battle for Ali's world, they learn the Hyrokanians prefer eating living flesh. Stone rescues a group of creatures from the Hyrokanians who were attempting to catch and eat them, oblivious to the fighting surrounding them. The obviously intelligent, diminutive creatures bear a strong resemblance to piglets from Earth. Bolstered by civilians, Draskos, and a cluster of piglets, the military personnel succeed in a do-or-die attack to capture the alien spaceship orbiting Ali's world. Chapter 1 the governor of Alley's World, UEN Ensign Junior Grade Blackman Perry Stone, sat on the veranda of his new office space. He tried desperately to avoid wishing for something exciting to happen. Exciting on this planet could get a person killed. Not wishing to die, he couldn't stop himself from wishing for anything that might take him away from the monotony of day-to-day -day paperwork. He propped his bare feet up on a small wicker ottoman. The overhead fan swished back and forth with slow, rhythmic repetitiveness, but the pleasant onshore zephyr overwhelmed the fan's delicate airflow. The stunning view of the black sand beach and calm blue ocean beyond peeked through the thirty-foot-tall fern grove surrounding the building. The picturesque scene included small groups of dependent families and military personnel playing in the mild surf. A piglet he'd named Shorty, one of his private staff, quietly entered, placing an iced smoothie on the tiny wicker table next to him without disturbing him. Stone and the Marines rescued the piglets from the Hyrokanian shuttle kitchens in the final battle for Ali's world. Since then, he hadn't been able to convince Shorty to stop following him around. One or another piglet had been at Stone's side since their rescue. Originally, his plan had been to stir up a little confusion for the Hyrokanians by turning panicked livestock loose in their corridors as the remaining Ali's world forces attempted to wrest control of the shuttle from the four-armed freaks. The piglets weren't simple food stocks, and adopted him as their savior, especially Shorty and his female companion Sissy. Stone felt obligated to include both on his private staff. They were not true piglets, but the small sentient creature's resemblance to earth piglets was remarkable, and to folks partial to bacon, sausage, and chops, the similarities were disturbing. Stone found it unsettling that Shorty, always carrying a shoulder bag filled with God's know what, now wore tiny sunglasses under a handmade, wide-brimmed straw hat. Stone didn't know who made Shorty's accessories, or Sissy's for that matter, but they were a curiosity. Assuming the piglets had made their own hats, he wondered who made the sunglasses. He was positive that soon hundreds of piglets on the island would be wearing sunglasses. He hoped whoever was making them wasn't gouging the little guys too much. He couldn't ask Shorty or Sissy about the glasses, because he couldn't communicate directly with them and there weren't any Draskos around to interpret for him. He shifted slightly in his chair as a loud screech filled the air. No strange odors wafted up from the beach alerting him to danger, but he looked anyway. A couple of oversized marines had tossed a young navy spacer into the clear, clean water. The cry was one of distress as the young man lost his swim trunks, much to the glee of the female marines who grabbed them and ran away. Stone sighed and turned back to his dataport readouts. He'd already read through the daily messages on his civilian personal assistant. Ninety-nine percent of those messages were from family, and of the let's copy tray on this status report to butter up the next boss variety. There had been one distressing message from his girlfriend, Marine First Lieutenant Allison Vedrian. She was on leave, and had just checked into the hotel. The message had videos of the penthouse suite, her glowing report on how excited she was, and how she couldn't wait for him to join her in three days. The message was already a week old, and his message to her, saying he would be even later than their Plan B schedule, hadn't reached her yet. He'd desperately needed to join her. They hadn't wanted to travel separately. Plan A was to travel together, but that changed at the last minute so he could attend a newly scheduled mandatory commander's call. Being the governor was one thing, but he was still in the Navy, and mandatory meant just that. So Allie and Stone agreed to Plan B. She would go on ahead, and he would hop the next shuttle to Brickman's station, catching a ride from there on a family-owned cattle hauler to join her for an extended vacation. Cattle haulers weren't as fast, glamorous, or clean-smelling as the five-star cruise liner she took to Peach's Rest, 
but it was the next fastest travel option. True to military standards, the commander's call was a waste of time, simply confirming the rumors of command changes in the planetary system's navy contingent. So much for military life. People were always being transferred in and out. No specifics were shared, except for Vice Admiral Temple's upcoming promotion and assignment to Lazzaroni Station, much to everyone's disappointment, approval, or cause for celebration, depending on their relationship with the Admiral. Stone longed to join Allie. If given enough time, Stone could remember and list each time someone or something had tried to kill him. But this job of planetary governor was going to kill him faster than the Hyrocanians, rampaging male Draskos, or murdering criminals ever would. He glanced around his office and realized that what was truly going to kill him was the lack of physical activity. Time with Allie would settle and soothe his aching nerves. The governor's office and residence was nothing less than a paradise, complete with servants, but he'd always been one of those people who preferred to do, not sit and read about doing. As a child, he'd always been in the middle of activity. He'd been in the way more often than he'd been a help. Even when shifting cargo, he tried to help, although helping usually meant sitting in Grandpa's lap while the man ran a loader. Plan B was put on hold after Allie departed. A priority message from the Emperor set alarms off on his data port and shifted his vacation schedule to Plan C. He was told to stay put and greet a special representative who wouldn't arrive until tomorrow. Whoever was coming, and whatever the reason for their visit, would make him weeks late in joining Allie, cutting his vacation time by half. Fortunately, time in hyperspace didn't count against leave time, unless traveling by military craft. Living the double life of a Navy ensign and a civilian governor was frustrating. The jobs and tasks were often at complete odds with each other. Both positions were now joining forces to prevent him from spending time with his girlfriend and keep him buried knee-deep in mundane reports. Against his better sense, he wished again for something to happen. The light warm wind blowing in from the beach brought him the fragrance of cinnamon. The odor wasn't pleasant like cinnamon on snickerdoodles. The fragrance had overtones of burnt garlic, so strong he could taste it on the back of his tongue. It made his eyes water. He knew this drifting odor. It wasn't a good thing. Two years ago, during an attack by a berserk male Drasco, the Drasco's blood and sperm had entered into his body through an open wound on his arm. Mixing with previously acquired DNA from his female Drasco companion's spit and his malfunctioning military-grade nanites, Stone developed some peculiarly enhanced senses. His sense of smell was finely attuned. Previously, while in the jungles on the continent, he'd caught a whiff of cinnamon immediately before a freshwater creature attacked and killed a marine intelligence technician named Eaton. The odor of cinnamon was a clear indication of a mindless desire to kill and feed. It was a wild marine creature's fragrance. Stone was on his feet racing toward the beach before he could form a thought or grab his shoes. Halfway to the water, he started shouting, Clear the beach! Get out of the water! Shorty and Sissy were following him as fast as they could. Wild wonking drowned out his shouts. His personal bodyguard team consisted of two marines and a team of Draskos. PB's daughters raced past him at full speed. L, T, and B pounded toward the beach, their small vestigial wings flapping in alarm. They were about a year and a half old, but full-grown, or at least as large as they would grow until one of them died. Stone's improved hearing alerted him to Jay and PB's wonking in the distance, with Jay's daughters, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, wonking in chorus. They were off duty, but the shouts of alarm would have them running after him, as would the Marines on duty, once they realized there was a danger. L, T, and B hit the edge of the beach first, and slid to a stop in a spray of sand. They wonked in alarm at the danger they were unable to communicate to the humans at the water's edge. "'Clear the beach! Get out of the water!' Stone shouted to be heard as his feet hit the sand, sprinting past the young Draskos. A clack and a whirr caught his attention as the lifeguard stations started reacting to the emergency. The tiny buildings scattered along the beach rose up on their expansion knuckles, bringing their lifeguards to a high-ground protective position. The high-powered automatic twin-barrel Gatling guns spun in an angry whisper, waiting for the lifeguards' fingers to twitch on the triggers. Guard shacks ringed the island as a secondary defense against the monsters in Allie's world's ocean. Most were unmanned and set on automatic, but where humans played and swam, marines manned them. 
Charged ocean nets ringing the island hundreds of meters out to sea were the primary defense. Somehow, something had breached the nets. Hearing the commotion, military personnel hustled fathers, mothers, and children off the sand, many grabbing weapons and rushing back to the water's edge. Sand chairs, beach blankets, and picnic baskets were forgotten, left scattered behind in the rush to reach safety. Stone sprinted down the beach, hit the water with a huge spray, and dove headfirst into the surf. If he'd stopped to think about it, he wouldn't have gotten any closer to the water than his office. He couldn't swim. He didn't mind getting into the water, but the ability to move around without his feet touching the bottom eluded him. His brain cognitively connected the cinnamon and garlic odors. He'd smelled the combination twice before, once before the ocean safety nets were in place, and once again when a marine shuttle killed and dragged a creature they called a needler to shore for the scientists to autopsy. The needler was the size of a shuttle, with thirty-centimeter spikes on the end of a dozen tentacles. The spikes were needle-sharp to skewer their meal and drag it to a toothless maw. A needler looked like a squid, an appetizer stone was fond of, except a squid was small and tasty. The needler had somehow broken through the nets. Stone didn't have any desire to meet a needler face-to-face -face anywhere outside of an occasional nightmare, but he couldn't stop. Getting his feet under him, and a few splashes later, he grabbed Spacer Dollish by the shoulders. What? Dollish shouted. He'd been so intent on finding something to cover himself with after losing his swim trunks, he'd missed the activity around him. Stone uttered an incomprehensible shout. A thick tentacle breached the surface with seawater dripping back to the ocean from its tentacle. It hovered slightly, taking aim at Dollish. The bone-like spike, sharp as a needle, glinted in the sunlight. Other tentacles slithered around, bracketing them, cutting off their escape in every direction except straight up. He spun Dollish around. Wrapping his arms around the young spacer, he hunched over, trying to protect Dollish while bending them face down in the waist-high water, barely a bubble over the mild surf. He felt a sharp pressure in the middle of his back, pushing him underwater. He jerked his face up, pulling Dollish back up for air. The spacer tried to pull away, recognizing the danger. Trying to get to the beach and away from the needler, he struggled to free himself from Stone's grasp. Stone held him tight. Neither man moved. Two lifeguard stations opened fire. Streams of hard-shelled projectiles generating a crossfire churned the clear water to an angry white froth. A second tentacle rose from the water toward them. Stone twisted, keeping his body between Dollish and the needler. Before the needler could strike, the lifeguard's bullets cut through the tentacle, severing it. Dollish finally pulled away and raced toward the beach. Disregarding his nudity, he ran across the sand. Though the young spacer was a low-ranking cook, he grabbed a weapon from a Navy specialist at the shack doubling as a beachside snack bar and armory, running back to the water's edge. He pointed the weapon in every direction, along with a dozen other people, but there wasn't anything to shoot. The lifeguard stations had already turned the needler into chunks. Stone sighed and walked out of the surf onto the beach. The beach is shut down and off limits until we find out why the safety nets failed. Sorry to mess up your picnics, folks. He turned to walk back to his office, pulling at his trousers. They were not designed to be worn wet, and were crawling up his crotch, binding some rather important parts that he preferred not to have bound too tight. Dollish said, Hold up, Ensign. The young man put a hand on Stone's shoulder. Thanks, boss. It's what we do, Tim. Besides, I think this makes us even. Oh, hell no, boss. We aren't even close to what I owe you, and I ain't talking about your getting me promoted to spacer first class ahead of the zone and helping me with my night school. Hold still, sir. Stone was surprised Dollish called him sir. He was authorized a personal chef on his staff as governor, and selected spacer first class Tim Dollish. Rarely did the young cook call him anything other than boss or ensign. Sir must be an indication of something important. Dollish grabbed Stone by the shoulders and turned him around. He felt Dollish's hands on his back, but with his thickened skin, he didn't feel more than a light pressure. Dollish grunted, and Stone felt a brief stinging sensation. He turned around, and Dollish handed him a bone-like needle about twenty centimeters long. It had snapped off the needler and stuck in his back. He tried to look over his shoulder, but all he could see was a ragged tear in his wet shirt, flapping in the light breeze. Must not have stuck in very deep, boss. You ain't bleeding. Stone nodded, swearing silently that he wasn't ever going swimming again, and he would immediately stop wishing for something to happen. Chapter 2 Stone stood on the tarmac waiting for the representative from the Emperor's shuttle to land. 
Vice Admiral Temple, the system's leading military commander, stood waiting with him to greet whoever the Emperor had sent. Neither man knew the reason for this visit, nor questioned the lack of reason. Both men knew it wasn't a career-enhancing move to question something the Emperor did, said, or even thought. No one had openly questioned an Emperor since Emperor Seligman two hundred years ago, a maniac who had to be deposed by the military and a new Emperor placed on the throne. Crazy was crazy whether the loony was an emperor or not. Everyone says that power corrupts, but few people mention that power can also drive a man or woman insane beyond redemption. After Emperor Seligman, Empress Xin Zhu added behaviorists and psychologists to the Emperor's College to review all potential candidates for humanity's top leader, and to keep an eye on her. Shin Tzu had personally executed Seligman for his excesses, and after a few years she abdicated and installed the next candidate when her own college determined she was succumbing to post-traumatic stress syndrome. Although she determined he had to die, she hadn't been able to order anyone to kill the ex-emperor, so she ended his life by her own hand. The trauma of personally killing Seligman caused her to hesitate in ordering anyone to do tasks that might get them killed. Not a good mental state for the commander-in-chief of humanity's military forces. No one knew for sure, but the rumor said Shin Ju was a gentle soul, still residing in a little mountain cabin on a backwater planet in the Regulus sector. She was comfortable, but isolated in her retirement, still unable to bear the thought of a security guard risking his life to save hers. Stone shivered, remembering those history lessons— He'd met Emperor Alberto Garza a few times when he was younger, before joining the Navy. The man seemed to be a nice guy, unless you beat him at tennis. Still, those were social occasions, with a lot of family around, the Emperor having married some distant cousin. Stone wondered how the Emperor would react if Stone did something other than claim victory when the man hit a double fault. Personal snits were one thing, professional anger was something else, and something he didn't want to tempt. Stone shifted from one foot to the other. Acting in his capacity as governor, he was in full dress uniform. The heat from the plasticrete tarmac was cooking the bottom of his feet, and the humidity was high, as it always was on their island retreat. The island was big, huge by island standards, with almost ten thousand square kilometers of land, but not large enough to dissipate the ocean's humidity. "'Quit fidgeting, Ensign!' Temple snapped. "'Yes, Admiral,' Stone froze. Even though he knew he couldn't stand still much longer, his body and muscles reacted to the admiral's command. His training kicked in, and his body became motionless. He blinked, but his eyes focused on a hilltop across the landing pad, did not flicker to the left or the right. They were cemented into a static glare. He continued to breathe, with his breaths so shallow his ribcage barely registered the change. Sweat trickled down the back of his neck, and he could feel some insect crawling up a trouser leg. Yet he didn't move. He smiled inwardly. His toughened skin had its benefits. Not only did it keep him from being impaled by a mutant sea creature, it meant he could feel the bug on his leg and the running sweat, but they didn't tickle. Damn it! Temple snorted, shifting from one foot to the other. He looked over his shoulder and snapped, Butcher! Where is that shuttle of yours? I thought they were supposed to be here already! Commander Thomas Butcher started to speak, but interrupted himself. Sir, they— There they are! A shuttle dropped from the clouds, settling on the tarmac with a gust of breeze. The landing didn't stir any dust. The admiral had ordered the tarmac swept clean and washed, so the emperor's representative wouldn't get the bottom of their shoes dirty. The enlisted team had grumbled about the duty, but the tarmac sparkled in the noon sun. Three lines of officers mumbled and shuffled into order. Stone didn't move. Every off-duty Navy officer on the base was in the formation, from the base commander to the newly assigned ensign in administration— even lower ranking than Stone, a real newbie. There was a long row of senior officers from every ship in system, including the captured Hyrocanian ship Rusty Hinges, commanded by Butcher, and the captain from Temple's own carrier, the fleet's flagship. The only Marine officers in line, Major Dashiell Numos and First Lieutenant Theo Hammermill, were resting comfortably in their huge combat suits. Missing were Second Lieutenant Rain Escamilla, who was on duty, and First Lieutenant Allison Vedrian was off-planet on leave. Squads of Marines remained at attention, or rather their huge suits stood at attention, although everyone knew they were probably napping, playing video games, reading books, or just chatting. Rows of Navy ranks stood in line, snapped to attention, including those in combat suits. 
Few people had seen the emperor in person, and only a slightly larger number had seen an official representative. Volunteers to stand formation swelled until almost everyone on the island was on the tarmac. Jay and Peavy stood between the Marines and the Navy. Their shiny armor glittered in the sun. Jay's blue filigree on her chest plate sparkled, as did the red flames on Peavy's armor. Standing in formation behind each of them were their daughters— Behind Jay, in matching but smaller armor, were Charlotte, Emily, and Anne. Their blue colors ranged from almost a dark purple on Charlotte to a pale watercolor blue for Anne. Behind Peavy were her three daughters, L, T, and B. Each wore slightly different red flames on their armor, from L's fire engine flash to B's sunset soft red. Behind the Draskos were rows upon rows of piglets, standing in such perfect formation it should have embarrassed the Navy ranks. Stone had been surprised at their numbers when they arrived, but Shorty and Sissy chivied them into position with the barest of nods in Stone's direction. Every piglet head was covered by a straw hat, and their dark-mirrored sunglasses reflected the noon sun. Stone hadn't thought to invite the Draskos or the piglets to this welcoming ceremony. He hadn't wanted to be here. He wanted to be on vacation with Allie. So why force these creatures to stand in the hot sun waiting for who knew what, why, or even who? Drascos and the piglets were intelligent, but no one ever claimed they were subject to the emperor, though they all followed Stone whether he wanted it or not. The final contingent awaiting the emperor's representative was Dr. Emiliano Wisniewski, with a few civilian scientists. Most were dressed in their finest suits, dresses, ties, and scarves, as their personal fashion sense dictated. Wizzer was his usual nonconformist self. Ignoring any formation, he simply gathered a few friends together. He was even holding hands with his friend, Dr. Cat Emmons. They were laughing over something another scientist had said, ignoring the somber formal ceremony unfolding around them. A loud chime sounded from the shuttle, and the door lowered slowly and stately. The Emperor's emissary was the first person through the hatch. She stumbled and barely caught her balance by grabbing the hand of a man just behind her. Stone laughed. Oh, no. Not her! Chapter 3 In violation of all tradition and orders, Stone broke ranks, rushing across the tarmac. He wrapped his arms around former Navy commander Danielle Elizabeth Wright. Still laughing, he squeezed, happy to see his old friend. His growth to six feet four inches still surprised him as he looked down into her shining face. She said, You've grown a few feet, Stone. He stepped back and looked her up and down. Either I've grown or you've shrunk. He reached over and patted her distended belly. Well, Mrs. Ivan Storovich, it looks like you are doing some growing yourself. She smiled and patted his hand as it patted her stomach. It takes a lot of work to get this fat, but I get away with it since I'm eating for two. Her husband stuck a hand in to interrupt. Can anyone join this reunion? Good to see you again, Admiral Stone. Stone laughed and shook the man's hand. Not any more, maggot. I'm just a simple ensign. Maggot replied, Simple nothing. You're the governor of a whole solar system. Stone nodded, suddenly all business. Yes, we have a permanent base on Alley's World with a couple of growing civilian towns. We also have two permanent installations on a couple of moons surrounding the closest gas giant. I have been fending off the Emperor's not-so-veiled suggestions that I upgrade from governor to king. Gack! I have enough trouble being an ensign. I sure don't want to be a king. Danielle nodded. Now that you've got some profits rolling in on this world, I've given up my veterinary practice, and I'm planning on taking a nice, long retirement in some big city where I can go shopping and out to fine dining whenever I want. Stone looked up at the shuttle hatch. You are the Emperor's representative? There aren't any other surprises? Maggot shook his head in confusion. I didn't think we were his representatives. We were just going to be in the area and wanted to check out Danielle's holdings. We got a message from him asking us to deliver a message to you. Danielle just nodded. Stone hooked an arm through each of theirs and turned to walk them across the tarmac. Well, everyone here is expecting an official representative of— He was interrupted by the wild wonking of excitement from Jay and Peavy. He could hear them shouting. Jay was yelling, It's Danny! It's our friend Danny! Mama, can we come see her? Mama! 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 Peavy yelled. Stone said, We have a couple of your old friends who want to see you, too. Jay and Peavy, come here. Leave your girls behind. 
Before Danielle could react, she was surrounded by a bounding horde of Draskos. All eight of them had rushed forward, despite his orders. They banded around the three humans like a brood of wild puppies. Wooting, hopping from one foot to the other, tails wagging, and smelling breath was the order of the day. Danielle said, "'My word! They've gotten so big!' She looked at Stone in amazement. "'I get all of the updates from your civilian scientists studying the Draskos, but until you see them up close, it's hard to imagine how big J and PB have gotten, and their babies are beautiful!' Stone noticed Maggot standing frozen, not daring to move. "'Don't worry, Agent Storovich. They're pretty housebroken by now.' "'As I recall, they didn't like me much the last time we met.' Stone grimaced. That was probably my fault. Sorry, but you jumped in and told me what to do all the time. That didn't really sit right with me. I've got a behaviorist friend here, he waved a hand in Dr. Emmons' general direction, who told me it was just normal teen angst. It would seem I was, and probably still am, at the tipping point of giving up being a child and turning into an adult. I'm sorry, I guess I was tired of everyone telling me what to do, and I took it out on you. The Draskos took their cue from me. Jay said, Mama, Danny is going to have a baby, like PB and me did. She made a little huffing noise that Stone could only interpret as a Drasco giggle. Stone said, Danielle, Jay and PB are happy that you're pregnant. PB said, Not like us, Jay. We had three girls. She will have only one boy. She patted Danielle on the head in sympathy. Danielle looked startled. What was that? Stone said, Baby is sad for you. She and Jay had three baby girls each. He waved a hand at the six younger Draskos, who, after the initial excitement of meeting and smelling their mother's friends, had dropped into a defensive circle around the small group. She said that you're only having one baby boy. Oh, you didn't know. Danielle looked at him with a wry face. Of course I knew I was having one baby. We just hadn't told anyone that we were having a boy. How did— Stone tapped the side of his nose. We can smell it. We, Danielle and Maggot said in concert. Stone ignored the question and said, Jay and PB, why don't you take your girls down to the beach and take the day off? Even if he phrased it that way, it wasn't really a question. The nets have been reset and the beach is open for business again. Jay shook her head in a replica of a human shake. I want to stay and talk with Danny. Please, Mama? PB added, Me too. Stone smiled. Even after a couple of years, he still didn't broadcast he could talk directly to his Draskos, although he was sure a few close friends guessed. He found it amazingly helpful to leave a Drasco in a room. The Drasco could recite some pretty surprising conversations after he left the room, as most people didn't imagine they were any smarter than a large guard dog, and would talk freely in front of them. He said, You can stay if you want to, but go ahead and let your— He was interrupted as Jay and PB's daughters raced toward the beach. Maggot said, The beach sounds good to me. Mind if I follow them? Stone said, We have a greeting ceremony for the Emperor's representative that we have to get through. I'm sorry, but I've left an admiral standing at attention on the tarmac far too long already. Danielle laughed. From what I remember of my time in the Navy, that's a bad career move for an ensign junior grade. Maggot pointed at Danielle. She's the Emperor's rep. I'm just her consort. Do I just follow your herd of Draskos to find the beach? Stone said, PB, would you ask Shorty and Sissy to guide Agent Storovich? It's just Ivan, now that I've retired from being an Emus agent. Stone gave a quick nod of acceptance. Please ask Shorty and Sissy to guide Ivan down to the beach and keep an eye on him for me? He grabbed Danielle's elbow and guided her to the military reception. Stone introduced Admiral Temple to Danielle as the Emperor's representative. In turn, they introduced her to the crowd of officers behind him. Danielle took in the ceremony with good grace, meeting this and that officer and saying hello, until she reached the Marine contingent. She even smiled when PB came bounding back, enthusiastically bumping into her, causing her to lose a couple of layers of skin on an elbow. She hugged Numos and Hammermill like old friends, but refused to go any farther, claiming her feet hurt and the sun was too hot. Temple said quietly over his shoulder to no one in particular, Formation dismissed. Dozens of non-commissioned officers picked up the phrase and bellowed it across the tarmac. Stone tapped open his data port and ordered a floater for him, Danielle, and Temple. When it arrived, it was driven by Spacer First Class Dollish. Normally he would have driven the floater himself to show Danielle around, 
but he didn't want to send Dalish away. Despite their difference in ranks, he looked at Tim Dalish as the only friend he had close to his own age. He surprised them all when he said, Danielle, this is my friend, Spacer First Class Tim Dalish. Tim, this is Commander Danielle Wright, retired and the Emperor's representative. Helping Danielle into the back seat of the four seat floater, he punched Tim lightly in the arm. As the young man stared goggle eyed at the woman, Temple vaulted into the back seat with athleticism that belied his age. Stone laughed. Come on, Tim, don't stare. You've seen a pregnant woman before, or is it an admiral that fascinates you? He climbed into the front seat next to the driver. Dollish nodded, but couldn't tear his eyes away from her. I've seen admirals far too often, boss, and I've seen a pregnant woman before, but I've never seen an emperor's rep before. He lowered his voice to a whisper, but no matter how quiet he was trying to be, it carried to the back seat. She looks normal, boss. Kind of pretty, but still normal. Danielle laughed. Of course I'm normal, young man. What did you expect? Wings in a halo, maybe? Dollish drove slowly along the tarmac, heading toward their main building. J and PB bounded in front of the floater, chivying people out of the way. Dollish kept his eyes on the road, but couldn't help glancing at Danielle in the rearview mirror. I don't know what I expected, Your Grace. Uh, Your Majesty? Highness? Danielle laughed harder. You can call me Danny, if I can call you Tim. Dollish looked at Stone and glanced over his shoulder at Temple. Stone said, It's okay, Spacer Dollish. It's strange, since she never let me call her anything except Commander. But if she says Danny, then that's okay. Danielle said, That isn't exactly how I remember our conversations, Mr. Stone. Speaking of strange, what the heck are those? Chapter 4 Stone put a hand on Dollish's arm, signaling him to break. They eased to a stop next to the perfectly formed rows of piglets. There were hundreds of them, all standing at attention, still wearing their mismatched handmade straw hats, their mirrored sunglasses reflecting the bright sun. Stone said, Jay, would you introduce Danielle to our friends? Danielle looked at Stone in surprise. Jay can talk to them? I mean, I've gotten reports that they understand a good bit of the standard language, but nothing I read indicated Draskos have a means to talk. Stone said, The Draskos do understand us when we speak to them, but they can't communicate back to us. He glared at Dollish, ignoring his snort of disbelief. Still, if we tell the Draskos something, they have some way to communicate with the piglets. The piglets seem to understand us as well, but we can't hear them when they speak. The Draskos apparently do, so they work well as interpreters. Sort of. Wait, Danielle said. Those things, piglets, you called them, are intelligent? Suddenly they were surrounded by a mob of piglets. Jay said, They want to look at the Emperor's representative. They don't know who the Emperor is, but I said he was the most important human in all of space except you, Mama. So they want to see her. Temple frowned at the press of bodies. What do they want? I've never seen this many at the same time. Ensign Stone, should I call for security? Stone shook his head. No, Admiral. They're just interested in seeing an Emperor's rep. He gestured for Danielle to stand up. Go ahead, Commander. I mean, Mrs. Wright. Or, sorry, Mrs. Storovich. Danielle struggled to her feet with a delicate grunt, propping a hand in the small of her back. She laughed at Stone. You better just call me Danny, too, you goof. Or should I say, Governor Goof? She waved at the crowd, who waved back enthusiastically. How intelligent are they? Stone said, According to Wizzer, who? Danielle interrupted. Wizzer is Dr. Emiliano Wisniewski. He's the head scientist here, and— Temple interrupted with a snort of derision. Putting Wizzer in charge of anything is like putting the monkeys in charge of the zoo. Stone shook his head. A what, Admiral? A zoo, Ensign. Surely you know what a zoo is. You're in charge of a whole planet that's little more than a zoo without cages. No, Admiral, Stone replied. I know what a zoo is. I saw one once, back on Altiverse Station, I think. 3D holograms of animals from all over— No, Temple interrupted. I was thinking of one of the old-style zoos with actual live exhibits. Stone nodded. Yes, Admiral. I didn't know there were such things, but what I meant was, what are those— What did you call them? Monkeys. Ah, a long-tailed animal that just sort of looks like a human. Danielle added— Actually, they're a primate from old Earth. From the ones I've seen, their main pastime seems to be throwing their own feces at any observers. Temple laughed. See? That sounds like wizard. The man is more menace than scientist. 
Stone thought of defending his friend, but didn't want to contradict a four-star admiral selectee and an official emperor's representative. Instead, he said, Anyway, Wizard says the piglets are more intelligent than they have a right to be. He ranks them somewhere above politicians, but only slightly below humans. Danny, ask Jay to ask the piglets something. Jay swung her neck around until she was nose to nose with Danielle. There was barely a mouse breath of space between them. Jay said, Mama, of course the piglets are smart. They just aren't big and strong. They shouldn't have to prove themselves. She glared at Danielle, almost as if daring her to ask. Danielle said, Um, Stone, did I do something to make Jay angry? Stone shook his head. No, Danny, I did. He gestured for her to sit, and once seated, he pointed with his chin to have Dollish continue driving. The Draskos and the Piglets are protective of each other. As the only intelligent non-humans around here, they've bonded. Jay was upset that I thought the Piglets should have to keep proving their intelligence to us. Jay and PB were running along with the floater. Danielle reached out and gently patted Jay on the head. I'm sorry, Jay. Your friends are obviously smart, and I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. I was just surprised at seeing them. Why don't you give them data ports? They have phalanges, um, fingers, to type. I've seen laboratory rats typing out commands to talk to researchers. They only ask for food or water, but with an intelligent species, they just need an avatar to talk back, so you wouldn't need an interpreter to quantify their intelligence. Stone slapped his forehead with his palm and shook his head. Dollish just nodded, his forehead furrowed in thought. Temple said, Giving human technology to a relatively unknown alien species might not be a wise idea. I know of a dozen Navy regs and civilian laws that prohibit such a thing. Still, their formations have proved their intelligence to me. You know, no one ever taught them to stand in rank and file at attention. I've seen human clusters who can't line up that straight and perfect. They've learned it just from watching us. I don't believe it's mimicry. I just wish their stupid hats matched better. It makes them look like they're out of uniform. The sunglasses are a nice touch, though. Stone nodded. I know they make their hats themselves. I've watched Shorty make one. He's sort of my assistant, or aide, or maybe my liaison officer to the piglets. I don't know what he is, really. He just shows up every day and does things. Anyway, I know about the hats, but I've been wondering about the sunglasses. He showed up with a pair one day, and now they all have them. I don't know where they're getting them. Dollish hesitated, but spoke up. Sir, they make them sunglasses themselves. Danielle leaned forward. Really? Do they get the parts from a kit or something? No, ma'am. I mean, Danny. They make them from scratch, sort of. They've got a little factory set up in their main village. They smelt their own glass from sand, and then a bunch of them sit around cutting and polishing them until the lens fit the frames. Stone looked surprised. Tim, I don't know what shocks me more about what you just said. Dollish pulled the floater to a stop in front of the VIP visitor's beach bungalow. Um, here we are, folks. Maybe Danny would like to rest up a bit before she sees the rest of the planet. I had some guys collect all her luggage and bring it down here. He pointed at a team of six piglets standing by the front door. Spacers Adams and Chizuli were assigned to act as stewards for the Storoviches, but Shorty and Sissy chased them away and assigned some of their own... Um, people. Stone shook his head. That's all well and good, but you can't just change the subject, Spacer Dollish. Dollish sighed. Yes, Governor. Sorry. What do you want to know? First, Tim. They are smelting glass? Who taught them that? Dollish shrugged. I don't think anyone taught them. Shorty read the directions about how to do it on his personal assistant, and he just told the others. Stone said, Wait, this is just getting deeper. Maybe you and I should talk about this later. Danny, would you like to go inside and put your feet up? Yes, I would, but I'm not going anywhere. I want to hear this. Temple nodded. I must admit, I'm more than a little curious myself. Does Shorty have a military-grade data port or a civilian PA? Dollish said, He has a used civilian model, sir. I don't know where he got it for sure, but I think Wizard gave it to him, as an apology for some poking and prodding that one of the scientists did without asking Shorty's permission. Temple grunted, that man is a menace, giving human technology and information access to an alien species. Stone said, I'll talk to him about it, Admiral. But how are they smelting? What are they using for an oven? Dollish looked down at his hands and wouldn't look up. I sort of, um, gave them one? He turned his face away from Temple. 
I didn't think giving them old scrap was against the rules or something. We had an oven in the kitchen that was acting a bit glitchy, so I ordered a new one. I gave the old one to Shorty and Sissy. They fixed it and have been using it since. Stone said, What about their sunglasses frames? Dollish said, A bunch of them catch shuttle rides up to rusty hinges every now and then. Commander Butcher lets them rummage through the scrap piles that accumulate due to the retrofit. Temple glared a warning at Dollish. Enough about the rusty hinges, spacer. He glanced at Danielle. Sorry, Mrs. Storovich, but please forget about that. It's classified Navy business, and it's best you never mention anyone said anything about it. Danielle said, Admiral, I may have retired from the Navy, but my brain didn't go to mush. I don't care that you've captured an enemy spaceship and you're tearing it apart for intel. My husband is a retired Emus agent. He heard all about your retrofit of an enemy ship on Brickman's station when we stopped off there, and he heard it from a bartender. What he couldn't find out was why. I'm not curious about it. I've had all of the Navy business I care to hear about. She glanced at Dollish. Tim mentioned the Piglet's main village. I want to know more about these villages. Dollish looked up in surprise. Sure. They got all sorts of little towns and villages scattered all over by Cyrus Bay on the leeward side of the island. He looked at Stone. Where do you think they live? No one ever built them their own barracks, so they built their own. They've practically turned the whole valley over there into one big garden. Where do you think all our fresh vegetables come from, sir? Stone shook his head. Maybe I've been locked up in my office too long and need to get out some. Peavy wonked. Mama should go over for one of the piglets' parties. Jay lay her head in Stone's lap. They play games and give us lots of food. They do it a lot. Stone didn't want to publicize he and the Draskos regularly conversed, and he'd gotten quite good at answering them without directly speaking to them. Well, Tim, maybe we should take a drive over there soon. Maybe you can drive me over if they have a party or a cookout or something soon. Danielle said, That sounds like a fun trip. But first I have a private encoded message for you from the Emperor. I don't know how he knew Ivan and I were going to make a trip here, but he sent me a message to give to you. I'm anxious to get rid of it, so you should listen to it before you do anything else. Chapter 5 Stone couldn't contain his grin when he came back into his sitting room. Storovich was still at the beach. Dalish had rushed back to his kitchen to put together snacks for Danielle and Temple. The two were relaxing in Stone's overstuffed chairs. Drinks sat sweating on small wicker tables. Danielle had one of Shorty's specialty fruit smoothies— and Temple had one of Sissy's alcoholic wonders on ice, but neither of the piglets was in the room. Jay and Peavy lay in their usual spot, surrounding his chair. He plopped down and propped his feet up on Peavy. She twisted around and pulled his shoes off, putting his feet back up on her knee. Jay said, "'We've been listening, Mama. Danny and Admiral Temple just talked about traveling and going places. They both liked Risa, but neither of them liked Kinder.' Peavy said, I like it here, but I want to travel, too. Can we go travel, Mama? Stone had been so anxious to take a vacation with Allie, he hadn't even thought about taking his Draskos with him. Their plan had been to leave them in the care of First Lieutenant Hammermill and Corporal Barb Tuttle. He didn't know if the Draskos would enjoy Peach's rest, but he should have at least thought to ask them. Maybe now he could take them. He was going to miss his cattle hauler out of Brickman's station— but he was sure he could make some connections that could accommodate him, Jay, and Peavy. He stopped and realized that if he took Jay and Peavy, he would need to take their daughters as well. Traveling with eight Draskos would be a challenge, but nothing his family money couldn't overcome. Temple asked, Well, Governor Stone, did you review the message? Anything you care to share? Danielle said, Anything you can share? Let's not be giving away any Emperor confidences, Governor Stone. Stone laughed. I'm sorry, Danny. I don't mean to laugh at you, but that is the crux of the matter. Temple said, Out with it, Ensign. What is the crux? Yes, Admiral. I'm no longer the governor of Ali's world and the surrounding system. I've been relieved of my position by Emperor Fiat. I'm just a normal Navy Ensign now. Temple snorted. You may not be a governor, Ensign Stone, but you are far from being a normal Ensign. You and your family still own 65% of this whole solar system, not to mention being the chief heir to the largest privately held fortune in human space. Stone shook his head. Excuse me, Admiral, I don't want to contradict you, but the chief heir is my mother. I'm in line behind her. 
Both Temple and Danielle made rude noises, expressing their disbelief. Anyway, Admiral, I have been set aside for a new appointee. That means I'm at your disposal for whatever duties you assign me. Danielle said, Before you two discuss your next deployment, I have a question or two. I may only be a minority owner of Alley's World, but I do own 25% of this planet, and the surrounding solar system, Stone added, and the surrounding solar system. So I have a personal interest in who the Emperor is appointing to run things. I don't want my fortune in the hands of some political hack who will give away the goats and the barn door to boot. Temple said, I'm being reassigned soon, but I'm sure my replacement will be able to work quite well with whoever the Emperor appoints. Danny rolled her eyes. No one believed Temple's politically correct statement, knowing that rarely did the military get along with civilian authorities. So, who is going to be running things? Stone grinned. You are. However, according to the Emperor's message, you're not going to be Governor Storovich. He's been after me for quite a while to upgrade the appointment in a manner that takes control of the planet out of the hands of politicians. He tossed the message crystal to Danielle. You check this for yourself. I've decoded it and removed the password protection. What Emperor Garza has ordered is for you to take over as, well, right now, as Queen. So, may I be the first to say, long live Queen Danielle Elizabeth Wright Storovich, Queen of Ali's world and the systems surrounding her. May your reign be long and fruitful. Danielle stuttered, But I don't want no backsies, Stone laughed. Oh, I hate to dump this in your lap, but I've been stalling Admiral Temple about what we're going to do with the hundreds of Hyrocanian prisoners we have on another island. They're too smart to leave trapped on an island, and we don't want them getting loose on the planet, or even worse, stealing a shuttle or a ship and getting off the planet. We can't keep feeding them. They're going to eat the planet bare. I couldn't figure out whether to kill them or order the Navy to take them somewhere else. Now, it's your problem. Temple joined Stone, laughing at the horrified look on Danielle's face. Congratulations, your majesty. Shaking her head, glaring at the message crystal as if the message itself was at fault, Danielle patted her distended belly. Majesty comes from the old Latin meaning greatness. I guess I'll be called your highness, but the next person who calls me your greatness in any language will be in big trouble. Wait, I'm queen, right? Off with their heads! Chapter 6 Stone packed his personal items from his bungalow to carry to his new quarters. He was prepared to clear his office, making room for the new queen, but Danielle declared her VIP quarters were nicer than his quarters, and she planned on staying put. Nevertheless, he did what all junior officers had done since Alexander the Great had been Alexander the New Guy, and began carrying his belongings down the path to the bachelor officer's quarters. A tiny room in the B.O.Q. was set aside for him, as befitting a low-ranking ensign. His room was the third smallest room in the whole building. The smallest room was a broom closet at the end of the corridor. The F.N.G., the ensign from Admin, who had a lower promotion date than Stone did, occupied the second smallest room. Unfortunately, Stone's room had a view of the parking lot, whereas the other ensign had an ocean view. His new quarters were also far too small to share with any of his Draskos, his new room was barely big enough for him and a bad gas attack. As an ensign, he didn't rate any security guards, so the marines were pulled off that detail and assigned to protect the queen and her escort. Maggot was slightly upset about his wife being crowned queen. Stone thought he was miffed only because he was relegated to consort or escort, not king. He did rate military protection, until Queen Danielle was able to hire and train her own protection detail. The Draskos were his responsibility, just not a part of an unnecessary protective detail. No one doubted their intelligence, but he'd dragged them out of their natural surroundings, and they couldn't go back to living in the wild. He would have to find quarters for them. All eight of them walked along beside him, each carrying their own possessions, chatting lightly amongst themselves. Elle tried to tie her bundle of personal goods on her cousin Anne's tail. Anne shook them off and chased L in a circle around them, until B tripped L, letting Anne jump on her cousin, holding her head down and administering a furious tickling. Emily and T threw big rubber balls at the two rolling in the grass along the path. The pummeling by balls degenerated into a wild melee of dodgeball by all the Draskos, including J and Peavy. A giant aquamarine ball zinged past Stone, close enough to ruffle his hair, 
but he kept his steady pace toward his new barracks. Charlotte caught an errant red ball and flipped it back to her Aunt Peavy. She giggled, I want to go live near the piglets at Cyrus Bay. Emily giggled with her sister, Me too. Like, they have the best food, for sure. Stone shook his head at the girl's choice of words. He'd tried to get them to stop saying, like, you know, and for sure, with no success. Either they spent too much time with low-ranking enlisted and young military dependents stationed on Allie's world, or they sounded like young teenage girls from watching too many late-night videos. Maybe teenagers always sounded that way to anyone older. The girls may not be teenagers in years, but there was still an emotional maturity phase they were passing through. PB said, Hush, girls, you can't live there without asking the piglets permission. That's right, isn't it, Mama? Stone accidentally dropped a heavy Hyrocanian skull he kept as a souvenir. Picking it up, he wondered if he would have to get rid of it now. Keeping body parts of an intelligent species was a direct violation of military regulations. He'd gotten around the regulation because he was the governor, but things would be different now. He hated to get rid of the skull, as this particular Hyrocanian had personally tried to kill him. He looked at Charlotte. Your Aunt PB is right. You can't go and expect the piglets to take care of you without asking. Anne said, But we could help them move, like stuff, you know? Carry, um, stuff, and like, things. Emily and Charlotte nodded. B wonked in great disagreement, shaking her head as if trying to clear something unsavory hanging off the end of her chin. She threw a big ball at Emily, who caught it and threw it back. B said, The piglets don't fight. I want to go stay with the Marines. While Emily was distracted throwing the ball at B, L hit her in the back of the head with a ball. B added, I like it when they take us to the gun range. I like it when we make things blow up with big guns, you know? Stone hadn't realized the Marines had taught his Draskos to shoot. He would have to talk with Hammermill about their progress. Draskos were smart enough, but he wondered if the younger ones were mature enough to handle high-powered weapons. T sat in the grass, pulled up a mouthful to eat, and scratched the soft, tender spot behind her back leg. Don't care. I have to go poop. Leaving her goods on the ground, she raced off into the bushes, followed by L and Anne. J said, We will stay together. We stay near Mama. PB agreed. Mama will take care of us. Jay and I will take care of you girls, but we do it all together. Stone nodded. My room is hardly big enough for me, but we'll find some place for you girls to stay. He shuffled forward with his stuff, actually amazed he could carry everything he owned in one trip. PB said, There is a small grove of trees across the parking lot from your new place. We will... Emily and B shouted together, Camping! We get to camp out! Jay raised herself up, wonking happily, stretching to her full height. Good idea. It's too stuffy inside. I like outside better. Emily raced ahead. Last one there is a stinky head. Stone laughed as all eight Draskos raced across the parking lot, B, L, and Anne racing to catch up. So much for any sort of protective detail. Letting the Draskos sleep outside was good. That way he wouldn't have to clean up Drasco poop if they were cooped up inside. They were housebroken, but there is only so long any person of any species can hold it. His data port buzzed. He stopped, set his personal goods down, and tapped the data port open. A message said, Contact Commander Butcher's office immediately. Stone sighed. Immediate didn't leave him any wiggle room. Tapping open comms, he called up Commander Butcher's office on the rusty hinges. He was sure word had spread around the planet that he wasn't governor anymore. He could only imagine Butcher knew he wasn't in charge, even though he hadn't sent a message to all the ships in Allie's world space, leaving it to Queen Danielle to make her own presence known. He and Butcher had gotten off to a rough start back on Lazaroni base, but having the same creatures try to kill you tended to bond people. Stone admitted that some of the people he surrounded himself with in his tenure as governor were odd. Butcher wasn't just odd, but changed. Everyone who'd known him for a while said he'd lost his sense of military bearing in the jungles of Alley's world, and even later as the commander of Rusty Hinges during the military's investigation of the alien technology and the subsequent retrofit of the spaceship. The consensus was that he'd lightened up or pulled the stick out. Either way, Stone liked the man, and even if he wasn't governor anymore, he would see if he could help Butcher until he got his new assignment. Master Chief Thomas here. 
Master Chief, this is Ensign Stone, returning Commander Butcher's call. Stone, even without the picture projected by the data port, could have heard the smile in the Master Chief Petty Officer's voice. The man's welcoming grin was evident. Congrats on the promotion back into the Navy, Ensign. Now maybe we can get a little work out of you. Master Chief, if anyone would recognize work, it would be you. You've certainly watched enough other people doing it to identify it when you see it. Why, you young snot, how have you know I was in this man's navy before you were a twinkle in your mother's eye? Stone picked up his goods and continued on to the B.O.Q. He said, well, I will certainly let my dad know you've been close enough to his wife to know about the twinkle in her eyes. And it's two eyes, Master Chief. She still has both of hers. I'm sure she needed two eyes to watch you as a toddler, just to keep your backside out of trouble, sir. Speaking of trouble, Master Chief, the commander's message? Thomas tapped a series of files on his desktop. He opened a list of file names and pointed at one. The file size was immense compared to the others near it. Having been read by dozens of people, there was a long list of access codes included. This is your service file, Ensign Stone. The Emperor help us. I don't know how you managed to get a file that's twice the size of mine. Vice Admiral Temple has reverted your chain of command back to your last Navy supervisor. That is Commander Butcher. He wants to see you in his office at... Oh, wait a minute. There isn't any time on his schedule for tomorrow. No, here. Zero six hundred hours tomorrow, Ensign. Yes, Master Chief. Stone shuddered. Six o'clock in the morning was early for meeting anyone, much less a new or retread supervisor. He was distracted enough to trip over a small root growing up through the sandy path. Someone should have reported that tripping hazard and had it fixed. He'd get a detail out. No, island maintenance was now up to the Queen. He would report the hazard, but that would be all he could do. Is that ship time or my time? Ship time. Come on, Ensign. You should know without asking. It's his meeting, in his office, aboard his ship. What other time would you expect? Yes, Master Chief. Listen up, sir. You aren't governor any longer. No more meetings with cold fruit drinks in a beach cabana. It's Navy now. The Master Chief Petty Officer was still smiling, but Stone knew he was making a point. Navy, Master Chief, got it. Zero six hundred. Thank you, Master Chief. He closed the communication as he reached the B.O.Q. and slowly climbed the stairs to the second floor. Higher-ranking officers filled the cabins on the first floor. The narrow corridor would be a tight squeeze if his Draskos tried to get to his room. The farther he went down the corridor, the closer the doors were together, signaling smaller and smaller rooms. He palmed open the door lock and pushed his way into the room. He dumped his personal goods onto the bunk and sorted through them, putting everything away in the tiny cubby holes and an even tinier closet. Mission accomplished in less than three minutes, he turned in a slow circle. He'd been in command of one of the Navy's largest spacecraft, larger than many space stations. He'd been the governor of a planet. He'd been in charge of a whole solar system. Now, he was in charge of a room so small he could almost touch both walls at the same time. The room did have an undersized patio with a stellar view of a fern-lined ground vehicle parking lot. He tried standing on the patio, taking in what view there was, but the heat coming off the plasticrete seemed to funnel directly into his room. He stayed long enough to catch sight of his Draskos playing and setting up their campsite across the lot under the trees, or rather under one tree, as it was a single plant with numerous branches and trunks. He glanced down. P.B. wonked and raised up on her hind legs. Stretching to her full height with her neck extended, she looked him in the eyes. He reached over and rubbed a fistful of knuckles across the top of her head. His thick skin felt her rusty pig-iron-wrapped sandpaper hide, but it didn't hurt. You girls get all settled in? Yes, Mama. Some of the girls are complaining that we are too far from the beach. But not you. No. Where you go, I go. I like our new campsite. There is a fresh stream and lots of bushes to eat, even for my pig-like daughters. But if you say go somewhere else, I go somewhere else. I don't know where or if I'll be going anywhere, Peavy. I expect it'll take the Navy a while to decide what to do with me. Since his change of status had been news to him, he was sure it would be a surprise to the Navy. His status was first on his list of things to discuss with Commander Butcher. He needed a Plan D regarding his vacation with Allie. But a leave, as short as it would be by now, was a high priority. 
Promise me that you won't let them take you without us coming too? You know that I can't promise, Peavy. I do promise I will do what I can, but it isn't up to me any more. He recalled the Navy regs about keeping pets. A dog, a cat, or a goldfish was what the regulations had been designed around. There were regulations on certain bases and some ships where he would be within his rights to bring a wife and children along, should he ever accumulate such things, but eight full-grown Draskos was a different matter altogether. If he couldn't keep them, maybe Queen Danielle would keep an eye on them. Chapter 7 Stone wrapped his knuckles on the hatch leading to Commander Butcher's office on the rusty hinges. The knock rang hollow along the bare corridor. He double-checked, again, his uniform, knowing it was as perfect as a Navy ensign could make it. He flicked off a few invisible pieces of fluff and straightened the immaculately placed gig line. The hatch lock popped open, displaying a two-inch gap. A mechanical voice said, Enter, Ensign Junior Grade, Blackman Perry Stone. Stone pushed the hatch the rest of the way open. Keeping his eyes on the hatch, he stepped into the cabin, and facing the hatch, he pushed it shut. Snapping to attention, he spun around in an about-face maneuver, prepared to say the tried-and-true traditional announcement, Ensign Stone reports as ordered, sir. The words caught in his throat, leaving him gawking. Months had gone by since he'd visited the rusty hinges. With Admiral Temple in the system, the old Hyrcanian warship was a navy matter, and his tenure as governor only mildly touched upon the retrofit of the ship— He'd known that every nook and cranny of the ship had been secured by Major Numos's armed marines, inspected by Commander Butcher's Navy technicians, and investigated by Dr. Wisniewski's civilian scientists. But Rusty Hinges was a huge ship, even by Navy standards. He hadn't realized how much room there was until he saw Butcher's office. Bare of any decoration, carpet, or wall covering, the commander's office was bigger than many warehouse bays. Butcher had an old metal desk against the far wall. And far was exactly that. Far. Stone marched across the cabin, estimating the distance at close to a hundred yards. He passed remnants of high walls and cages the Hyrocanians used to contain the living creatures they dined on. The commander had broken the pens down and had them removed, but the outlines of the old structures were still visible on the rusty deck plating. Stone wondered if this cabin had been the highest-ranking Hyrocanian's office, containing the creature's personal dining room. Even as large as the room was, the retrofit would have been made easier by Butcher putting his own office in the same location as the previous ship's commander. Any hard-wired communications systems wouldn't have to be changed, and it was conveniently located near the bridge, engineering, and command and control. He hesitated in his march to reach Butcher's desk, but the commander waved him on. Standing in front of Commander Butcher's desk were his three Marines. He shook his head. They were no longer his Marines. They belonged to the Emperor. Even though chairs were arrayed around the desk, Major Numos, First Lieutenant Hammermill, and Second Lieutenant Escamilla stood. Stone amended that. Hammermill and Escamilla were standing in a stiff at ease. Hammermill's face was poker face neutral, but Rain Escamilla allowed her concern to show through. Numos was bent over Butcher's desk, propped up on tense fists. Neither man was bothering to keep his voice in check, and echoes raced around the empty room like gossip around an old lady's sewing circle. "'At least consider it, Dash!' Butcher shouted. "'You're not even giving it a second thought!' "'I don't need a second thought!' Numos shouted back. "'You aren't giving me enough information to think about, Tom!' "'What's to think about? My sailing orders say I have to have a marine company aboard. I just want your outfit to volunteer!' "'That's the problem, Tom,' Numos pounded an iron fist on the beat-up old metal desk. Stone wasn't close enough to see if the man's knuckles were putting more dents in the thing— but he doubted it would hold up under a Marine's onslaught for long. Numos continued, You aren't telling me what we're volunteering for. You know I can't, of course you can't tell me, but Marines are built for combat. We've been stuck in the Alley's World system and on rusty hinges for a couple of years now, since we captured this ship. All we've done is swab floors and guard doors. Look at us, man. Hammer is practically getting fat and lazy. Escamilla is going to forget how to kill if we don't get some action. Stone snapped to attention at the edge of Butcher's desk. He didn't need to look at Hammermill to know the man didn't have an ounce of extra fat anywhere on his body. The man was still recruiting Poster Perfect. He doubted Escamilla had forgotten any of the skills she'd learned as a Marine sergeant before accepting an officer's commission. Numos was exaggerating, but he got the point, as did Butcher. 
Allie often complained about the same thing. Marines were built from the brain out for combat. Moving his gubernatorial seat to an island made sense, considering how dangerous the rest of the planet was to humans, but it also made for soft marines. Soft marines were useless to the Corps and to the Emperor. Corporal Tuttle was even frustrated as part of his security detail, because no one tried to kill Stone often enough to suit her tastes. Butcher waved Stone into a chair. He sat, even though it felt strange to be sitting when the marines were towering over him and Butcher. Seated, he looked at the three marines closely. Numos was angry. Escamilla was concerned about the two men shouting at each other, echoing his concern. It felt like being in the room when his parents argued. Hammermill's face was impassive, but rather than watching Numos and Butcher, his eyes flicked to Escamilla and back. Stone almost laughed. Hammermill was smitten. Stone could smell it. Waves of dark, wet chocolate washed over him. Second Lieutenant Rain Escamilla wasn't as tall as Hammermill, but she was as fit as any Marine. Her dark hair framed her dark eyes and mocha-colored skin. He tried to look at her objectively, but he couldn't help comparing her to Allie. Escamilla's skin was smooth and without blemish. She was taller than his girlfriend, but no less muscle. Allie's damaged eye had been replaced with a Marine-issued bio-unit, giving her enhanced vision upon command. Allie had elected to keep the deep scar running across her face. She said it reminded her that the Hyrocanians were still out there, and that they'd given her the scar. Butcher said, I'm not at liberty to say where Rusty Hinges is being ordered to go. I can't until we sail. But we have a good working relationship. I want you with me. Numos shook his head. He turned and looked at Hammermill and Escamilla. Both looked back at him silently. I can't even run this past my second-in-command. First Lieutenant Vedrian is on leave, goofing off on Peach's rest. He hooked a thumb at Stone. Where he should be. I can't help Stone with that, Dash, any more than I can give you what you want. I'm just asking you to volunteer. I'm not volunteering my Marines to go on some whirlwind media tour around human space, selling war bonds and showing off our shiny medals. Butcher said, Dash, just wait a minute, please. He turned to Stone. Ensign, I have the same question for you. I have been given command of Rusty Hinges, and I have been ordered to collect an all-volunteer contingent for an unspecified voyage. Stone hadn't slept all night, wondering about his next assignment. It could be anything from data processing on the ice world of Thule to supervising the mucking out of pig barns at the Navy Supply Depot on New Iowa. As a low-ranking officer, he doubted he'd be offered a choice. Butcher continued, I have a slot for a tactical officer. It requires at least a senior grade, Ensign. Since you had enough special tutoring to pass your college boards, Admiral Temple can promote you, regardless of your time in grade. Stone almost jumped up and shouted yes. Anything would be preferable to being assigned to answer civilian complaints about drunken sailors on Ratchet. He held his tongue, trying to look as if he was considering the offer. Sir, may I ask about the Drascos? I don't need them as a protective detail, but I would hesitate to leave them behind. There are eight of them, sir. Butcher snorted. Look around, Ensign. This was the smallest office I could find on Rusty Hinges. You could bring a dozen times that many Drascos, and it wouldn't put a dent in the open bays we have. If you volunteer for this assignment, I was going to offer you a bay on Deck 16. It's an overgrown hydroponics area that even the Hyrocanians didn't have much use for. There is a small closet for you to convert to sleeping quarters, but there should be plenty of room for all of your friends. Stone jumped to attention. Commander Butcher, I volunteer for service on Rusty Hinges. Contrary to what Numos wanted, he thought a nice long voyage through the safety of human space sounded like a good idea. Butcher smiled. Nodding, he entered Stone's name on the ship's roster. Thank you. Numos interrupted. Okay, I'll volunteer too. All his earlier hostility had melted away. The Major looked at his two officers. Hammermill said, Yeah, what he said. Escamilla just nodded. Numo said, I'll send a recall notice to Vedrian, but knowing Allie, she'll go along as well. Since this is a volunteer-only assignment, I'll ask each Marine in my company. With as many ships in the system as we have, I can replace anyone who doesn't volunteer quickly. Butcher said, Okay, Dash, I appreciate that. It'll make my job so much easier. Why did you change your mind? Numos pointed a jagged finger at Stone. Marines are the point of the spear, the sharp end of the knife. If you're taking that boy along with you, you're going to need the toughest Marine company in the Corps, because our Ensign Stone is a trouble magnet. 
Chapter 8 The last ten days were trying, and today wasn't any different. Stone didn't need to pack much before taking his billet on rusty hinges for whatever the Navy planned. Newly appointed Queen Danielle of Alley's World was harder to keep off the beach than his Drascos. Time after time he'd tried to show her records, reports, and registers covering the solar system, but every time he turned around, she and Maggot were off playing in the sand and surf. She poo-pooed the idea that she needed to know everything, only that she needed to know how to hire the right people. Stone said, But Grandpa always says that you don't pay someone to do something for you that you can do yourself. Danielle snorted, He isn't my grandfather. Stone thought about reminding her that one of her past hires, a young officer named Skippy, had tried to kill them both. He didn't say anything about it, because by the time he thought of it, she and her royal consort had scooted off to Cyrus Bay on the leeward side of the island for a luau with the piglets. His failure this morning was trying to get his Drascos to troop up the shuttle ramp. The ramp was built for Rusty Hinge's old Hyrocanian shuttle and ended six feet off the ground. The tetrahedron shuttle hung overhead about twelve feet above the ramp. The Drascos didn't need the ramp. They could jump the eighteen feet without any effort. They had done so a dozen times before. Stone would need a running jump, but he could get high enough for the shuttle's artificial gravity to grab him. All the Drascos, J and PB included, liked to run up the ramp, catch the gravity shift rim along the edge of the shuttle, trying to fly along the edge, flapping their vestigial wings, seeing who could ride the tiny gravity wave between the two opposing forces. T was able to swing along the wave for dozens of yards before flopping back to the ground in a tangle of arms, legs, tail, and long twisty neck. J and PB, heavier than their daughters, were not able to catch as much of the shift, but tried time after time anyway. Stone threw his few personal belongings up. Before the planet's gravity dragged them back down, the shuttle's artificial gravity caught them. They crashed to the outside of the shuttle. He pushed his way into the Drasco line, but rather than try to catch the gravity wave, he leaped up, twisted in midair, and came down feet first near his gear. Shouting down, or up, at his Drascos, That's enough! One more, Mama! PB shouted. Not yet! T is in first place, but there is a tie for second! Emily added. Come on, girls, it's time to go! No! B whined. Let's go to the beach next. Yeah, like, you know. We've got time, right? Anne added. Stone decided to try a different tact. I'm not in command anymore. I can't order the shuttle to wait for you. If it takes off without you, I will send a message to Queen Danielle that you are staying on Allie's world and won't be going with me. He glanced at the spacer on hatch duty and shrugged. He didn't recognize the young girl, and she obviously didn't recognize the Draskos. She tore her eyes away from the Draskos. Sir, the pilot says we don't leave until you say so. Stone could smell the spacer's minty fragrance of loyalty, but the odor was tinged with a bit of citrus overlay, indicating she was a little fearful about something. Stone knew the fragrance well. Most people exuded that odor when seeing Drascos up close for the first time. He shouted again, The shuttle pilot says he's going to leave without you if you don't get up here now. Jay wonked in laughter. Liar! Mama, you can't fool us, PB joined in. Besides, we can't leave until Shorty and Sissy get here. Stone was surprised. He hadn't seen the two piglets since he'd been deposed as governor. He assumed they were either serving the new queen or had taken an early retirement. Nodding, he wondered if the two piglets were coming to say goodbye. He wasn't familiar with piglet customs. Communication with them was difficult, not because he didn't have interpreters. One or more of the Draskos was almost always around to help translate, but the Draskos were not the most patient or accurate in helping. They were good in a fight, all of them having trained for the past two years with the Marines. They were good at playing, as that was their normal state when not eating and sleeping. They were good at eating, as that was their favorite pastime. But getting them to actually perform a standard duty like interpreting was like trying to hold a rope vertically by grasping only the bottom end. Stone turned to the spacer. Please ask the pilot to be patient with us. A few piglets are coming by to say goodbye to their Drasco friends. The spacer held her hand about piglet high. You mean the little vent runners, sir? Yeah, we have a few of them already on rusty hinges, working with the engineers. Smart little fellows. They can get into places the human engineers can't. I've seen them a couple of times in the chow hall. Stone nodded. Vent runners? Yeah, that would be right up their alley. I hadn't realized there were any on the ship. Sir, they are friends with... Um, 
Those? She pointed at the Draskos. Stone smiled. Yes, Baser. Those are Draskos. They're an intelligent species, although I have my suspicions that the piglets, vent runners, are a bit smarter. B shouted, obviously overhearing Stone's conversation. They are not! L wonked in laughter. Smarter than you, sister! Emily huffed. Smarter than all of us! Are not! Charlotte added. Stone continued as if his Draskos hadn't interrupted. A few piglets have been quite close to— The spacer interrupted and pointed a finger across the spaceport. That ain't a few, sir. Stone looked. He hadn't had much to do with the piglets since setting them free from the Hyrocanians. With the exception of Shorty and Sissy, who had volunteered to follow him around, his plan for the piglets was to allow them to lead their own lives, doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. A platoon-sized group had glommed onto Alley, with other groups attaching themselves to various people. A second platoon-sized group attached to Hammermill, and a trio of piglets followed and helped Spacer First Class Tim Dollish in the kitchen. A dozen piglets following Dr. Cat Emmons, the Emperor's assigned behaviorist, in such a symbiotic relationship, he wondered whether Doc Emmons was studying them, or they were studying her. This morning it looked as if all the piglets were marching in neat orderly ranks and rows across the spaceport headed for his shuttle. Well, I believe they've decided to say goodbye a little bit formally. He was surprised at the number of piglets. A complete census of their population had been attempted and proved to be a futile exercise, as the piglets refused to stand still and be counted. The spacer shrugged, as if to say that what officers did wasn't any concern of hers. She tapped open her data port, sending a quick report to the shuttle pilot, adding in a wide-angle vid of the approaching piglet formation. Over the last couple of years, Stone managed to learn to give speeches without much preparation. As governor, he'd been called upon many times to say a few words. Today wouldn't be any different. Nice to have known you. Thanks for coming by. Live long. Prosper. Good health to your children. Blah, blah, blah. He was about to vault back to the ramp when the piglet ranks reached the bottom of the ramp. Before he could jump, PB, T, Anne, and Emily jumped up to join him on the shuttle. L grabbed the first piglet and tossed it into the air like an underinflated ball. The piglet crossed the wave from the planet's gravity to the shuttle's artificial gravity, spun in the air, and dropped upward toward the deck. Emily caught the piglet, set it down gently, and turned back to catch a piglet thrown by B. Before he could react, piglets were tossed skyward by J, B, Charlotte, and L. They were caught without fail by the four Draskos on the shuttle deck, and set on their feet. Each piglet had a bundle of goods held tightly in their arms. They turned and raced through a dilating shuttle hatch, disappearing below. The spacer called the shuttle pilot, shouting into her data port, "'It's raining, vent runner, sir! Just hold her steady for a bit!' She stepped back, away from the Draskos, and stood watching as if it was a common occurrence for huge scorpion-like dragon things to toss small piglet-type creatures across a gravity shift. It might be normal for her, but it was a surprise to Stone. He wanted to say something, but he wasn't in charge any more. He hoped if Commander Butcher already had vent runners on rusty hinges, he wouldn't mind a few more, assuming anyone anywhere considered about five hundred alien creatures just a few. The man hadn't minded Stone bringing eight Draskos along. Surely he wouldn't object. Finally, the piglet rain ended, and his Draskos clustered around him on the shuttle deck. Shorty and Sissy stood next to Stone. Their little shoulder pouches bulged with odds and ends. Dark mirrored sunglasses reflected his image when he looked at the two. PB said, Shorty says if you're going, he is too. All of them? Jay shook her head. No, Mama, only about half are here. The others wanted to stay and follow the new queen. PB added, Sissy says they like it here and want to make it home. They don't understand what queen means, but we told them Danielle is nice and in charge now. Do they understand that we don't know where we're going? Shorty and Sissy looked at each other and shrugged. Stone said, Well, I guess they don't care. He looked at the spacer. We're good. Tell the pilot to release the brakes. Let's get this floating menagerie on the road. The spacer made the call and dashed inside before the shuttle moved. Stone settled on the deck. The trip to Rusty Hinges was short, so he leaned against a gun port, putting his feet up on his backpack. Jay and PB hustled their daughters inside. The younger Draskos were full-grown, but no one was sure they were smart enough to not jump too high when the shuttle was in the vacuum of space. Life support extended only so far, past the shuttle's exterior deck. Stone watched Allie's world move away. 
The shuttle was moving, but without the sensation of motion it looked as if the planet was shrinking away. In no time he could see the ocean surrounding his large island. Smaller island. Smaller yet. Tiny. There in the distance, surrounded by blue water, was the island prison of the Hyrocanian prisoners. The flat horizon curved and rounded as the planet receded. Before he could see the full sphere of the planet, the shuttle spun like a four-sided die rolling across the black felt of space. Rusty hinges popped into view, surrounded by UEN spacecraft. The Navy ships were heavy and ominous, all angles and jutting protrusions, compared to the huge egg-shaped Hyrocanian ship. But they didn't look threatening. The Navy vessels looked like big brothers watching over their none-too-smart baby sister. The pilot aimed one of the shuttle points at a square shuttle hatch in the ovoid ship and guided it expertly inside. Stone's ears popped slightly with the change in atmosphere as the shuttle adjusted its life support to match the internal conditions on the ship. A cluster of human shuttles lined up in neat rows filled the huge bay. The Hyrocanian shuttle, with its unusual tetrahedron shape, slid over to its usual deck space. He glanced below him, remembering the first time they'd entered the enemy ship. A desperate cluster of walking wounded had attacked the Hyrocanians with a suicidal fury that, to the surprise of everyone, succeeded in capturing the ship. They had begun their attack by falling from the shuttle deck to crash onto the hangar deck. Now there was a large series of nets stretched below them. Stone threw his gear into the nets and quickly followed them with a huge leap, turning in midair to land in the nets. He grabbed his belongings, vaulted off the hanging nets, and slammed flat-footed onto the hangar deck. He was surprised when Dollish grabbed his belongings. The spacer said, Hey, sir, I'll wrangle your stuff to your new digs. J and PB can follow me, too. Spacer Dollish, what are you doing here? Volunteered, sir, just like you. What did you expect, sir? You saved my life, and I ain't done paying you back yet. Nonsense, Tim. He was interrupted by a rain of piglets and drascos dropping off the edge of the nets. I'm going to have to check with the captain about getting a place for Shorty, Sissy, and their people. Dollish said, I got it taken care of, boss. There's room for all of them at your place. You don't worry about it. You've got an officer's call to get to. Stone's data port interrupted the spacer. Ensign Stone, report to Captain Butcher's office on the double. Running through the corridors, dodging spacers, marines, and civilians alike, felt wrong, but on the double required nothing less. He waved at a few people he knew, although he was surprised at how many people were aboard that he didn't recognize. Everyone seemed to be going somewhere and doing something. Two fire teams of Marines, led by First Lieutenant Ali Vedrian, passed him, running full tilt in the opposite direction. They reversed course and surrounded him. Grunting and chanting in typical leatherneck fashion, they encouraged him to fall into step with them. Stone was stunned. He hadn't known Ali was back from Peach's Rest. He'd sent her a flurry of urgent messages, but hadn't received a response. She grinned at him and winked with her good eye. Her marine issue eye glinted in the overhead lights, the pale iris dilating, as it recorded and downloaded his image for her later review. Unlike many military personnel, Allie had elected to retain the scar running from her eyebrow, across her cheek, and down to her chin. The thin, jagged line seemed to change color depending on her mood. Today, it looked positively festive. "'Pick up the pace, Ensign!' Allie shouted. "'Come on, boy, run it!' Stone's enhanced military-grade nanites kept his body in tip-top condition, but a couple of years doing desk duty had his muscle memory lapsing. Allie shouted, Point runners out! Stone thought they were running full out at a sprint, but two Marines, a married couple named Al Julie, raced ahead of the group, shouting, Clear a path! and Make a hole! The Marines moved faster, their feet hitting the deck in a pounding rhythm. Following the Al Julies and ignoring the elevators, Corporal Barb Tuttle hit a hatch with a broad shoulder, slamming it open against a bulkhead, and they took a wide ladder down six decks. Stone took the steps four at a time, but the Marines simply vaulted down landing to landing. His data port announced his arrival at Captain Butcher's office hatch. The Marines didn't slow their run. Tuttle waved goodbye to him with her new biomechanical hand as they continued their run. Allie's voice faded into the distance, "'See you later, lover,' as they sprinted around a corridor curve. The hatch was propped open, and Master Chief Thomas was standing as if he was watching a parade flow past. "'Love to make an entrance, don't you, Ensign?' Stone said, "'Good morning, Master Chief. Actually, running with the Marines wasn't my idea.' "'It never is, sir. Best hustle on in. The rest of the officers are waiting on you.' 
Stone ran across the open space to where dozens of officers were sitting in concentric semicircles in front of Captain Butcher. Like all such meetings, the officers were seated by rank. All it took to find his new seat was a quick glance. He was no longer an Ensign Junior Grade. His two-day-old Ensign Senior Grade tabs shined with a glow that dared anyone to question his right to a chair in front of a half-dozen Ensign Junior Grades. An empty chair was waiting for him at the bottom end of the Ensign Senior Grade ranks. He smiled to himself. Since he was no longer governor, he didn't have to sit up front where everyone stared at him. Butcher said, Well, we're finally all here. Welcome, Ensign Stone. With his addition, we have a full ship's complement, and we're ready to begin operations. Everyone turned to stare at Stone. Butcher continued, We comprise the Navy officer staff of the Rusty Hinges. I've met with each of you individually, but I want to welcome you all as a group. For a ship of this size, we will be operating with minimal staff. Our key staff are Lieutenant Commander Gupta, XO and First Watch Officer, Lieutenant Commander Lee, Second Watch Officer, and Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya, Third Watch Officer. Each officer rose in turn and waved or nodded at the assembly. Major Dashiell Numos is in command of our Marine Company, he gestured at another officer. Our chief engineer is Lieutenant Commander Graciela Zavella. Continuing on, he listed officers for quartermaster, intelligence, astrogation, etc. Stone only perked up when Butcher introduced Lieutenant Junior Grade Vera in charge of tactical and weapons. She would be his direct supervisor. Butcher shook his head. We've been saddled with a dozen civilian scientists for our first mission. They're led, sort of, by Dr. Wisniewski. I'll say Wizard runs a loose shop, so give the civilians some leeway if you have to deal with them. Speaking of leeway, with Ensign Stone signing on, we also have eight Draskos aboard. They can be a surprise if you haven't met them. Give them leeway in the corridors, or their rough epidermis will peel a few layers off your skin. Don't worry, they're intelligent. Sometimes I think more so than Wizard and his bunch. As most of you know, we also have a couple of dozen vent runners, piglet type alien creatures. He glanced at Stone, and with an exasperated voice said, What, Ensign Stone? You have that constipated look you get when you've got something to say. Stone stood to attention. Sir, I need to report that approximately five hundred piglets came up from Allie's world with me. Five? Well, ain't that a kick in the head. Okay, Ensign Stone, you're now responsible for them. See if you can get them housing, keep them busy, and out from underfoot. Stone wondered where Dollish had taken them. The spacer seemed to know what to do, so he kept his mouth shut and sat back down. Butcher took a deep breath. Down to the real business. Every person on this ship volunteered for duty aboard Rusty Hinges on blind faith, not knowing what the Navy has in store for us. The prevailing scuttlebutt is that we're going on a media tour, propping up the population's flagging approval for the war against the Hyrocanians, giving tours and interviews. That is false. We're going to be the Navy's Q-ship. Stone caught his breath. A few of the lower ranks around him looked confused. Butcher said, For those not familiar with Q-ships, they were, or rather now are, merchant ships with hidden weapons sent out to catch pirates, acting as their own bait. We will not be hunting pirates. We are going to jump through the navigation point the Hyrocanians used to infiltrate this system. We are to hunt the enemy— seek to find his home planet, destroy his shipping where we can, and if we can't fight, we'll try to infiltrate his fleet in disguise to gather intelligence. It's the Navy's plan that we do this and report back without getting killed. Chapter 9 Stone said, Be careful with those. You could get us killed before we enter Hyrocanian space. A small team of enlisted crew was yanking mines out from various piles scattered around the open bay and dumping them into a cart. A couple of the men had gotten lazy. Moving mines from one place to another was monotonous, but the men were doing everything short of throwing the basketball-sized munitions. Stone picked up a mine. The Hyrocanians had stolen the mine design from humans, but they hadn't bothered to copy them exactly. The explosive could be set to blow up if fired from a shotgun barrel cannon, or when it came in range of a spacecraft if tethered to a stationary point in space. The mine would arm itself once it reached a certain speed and a specific distance when fired from a cannon. Like human mines, it could attach itself to a ship or the shield of a ship. 
If it managed to reach a ship, it exploded. If it glommed onto a ship's shield, it would stick there until joined by others, then explode in a massive blast of radiation, soaking an enemy vessel. All assuming that one side or the other hadn't interdicted the mine with an IFF signal. He rolled the mine around in his hands, holding it up for his team to view. We all know human mines won't go off, no matter how roughly handled, until armed by a weapons technician, right? Yes, sir, was the chorus response. You learned about these mines both in basic training and in your munitions school, right? Before the spacers could answer, a petty officer second class spoke. Yes, Ensign Stone, I don't know about these other knuckleheads, but I had a whole section in both places on the proper handling of explosives. Stone smiled at the woman. She was quite a few years older than he was, and probably had four or five times his years in service. Yet he was theoretically in charge. Thank you, Petty Officer Juarez. I've actually dispensed more of these against the enemy than I could count in a lifetime. Thinking back to his time commanding the UEN period on Titus, he wasn't sure how many billions he'd spilled against the Hyrocanian fleet during the incident at Point Alpha Beta. This is the first time I've had to hump them from one place to another inside a ship. Yeah? Why is that? Um, sir, a spacer asked. If the Hyrocanians are smart enough to steal our designs, why aren't they smart enough to store their munitions close to the guns that need them? Another spacer nodded. Yeah, if they were smarter, then we wouldn't have to manually pick them up and move them. Juarez sighed. Listen up, you goobers. I will personally ask the captain to let you interrogate the next Hyrocanian we run across. But until then, pay attention. I don't want to die because you're goofing around or your hand starts shaking from too much jungle juice last night. Stone said, My point in holding this explosive up is to ask you where the safety switch is. Anybody know? The room was silent as everyone looked at Juarez. She sighed. On human minds there is a red dot on the top. It's there for simple orientation purposes, so we know which way is up. A small panel on the bottom can be manually accessed to reach the safety switches, or they can be remotely accessed by code. Outstanding, petty officer, Stone said. The woman nodded as if the compliment meant little. Okay, the rest of you, what is different about these mines, and why you shouldn't be chucking them around like last year's dirty laundry? No answers? He pointed at a spacer third class. The man was holding the mine in one hand, propped up on his hip. You, go ahead and open the safety protocol access panel. The man sputtered. I don't remember much from tech school about mines, but I do remember that we were told to never open the panel. Get a repair tech if it needs to be opened. Excellent memory. I've read exactly the same thing. We're going to make an exception because of Petty Officer Juarez's expertise. Go ahead and open the panel. The man spun the mine in his hand. There ain't no red dot. How can we tell where the panel is without the red dot? Everyone look at the mine in your hands. Find the panel. He stood watching as everyone on the team scrambled about, turning mines this way and that way, looking for the panel. Everyone except Petty Officer Second Class Juarez. Petty Officer, you're not looking. Waste of time, Ensign. Really, would you care to share with the rest of the team why it is a waste of time to look for the access panel to the safety switches on a Hyrocanian manufactured mine? Juarez shrugged. Because there ain't none, sir. Stone grinned. Exactly. The biggest change the Hyrocanians made in their design was to eliminate the safety switches and protocols. The spacer holding a mine with one hand paled. There ain't! His voice trailed away as the mine slipped from his hand, clanging on the deck. Stone closed his eyes and gave a little shiver. He opened his eyes and glared around the room. There aren't any safeties on these explosives. We don't know for sure if, when, or what will set them off. His voice rose to a bellow. So stop dropping them and stop throwing them around! He caught the odor of wet, dark chocolate over his shoulder and knew Allie was behind him. Preparations for getting underway and navigating through the jump point had kept them both so busy they hadn't said more than a dozen words to each other. Taking a step backward without looking, he bumped into her, hard. She didn't budge, and he didn't move away. It wasn't the type of contact he wanted with his girlfriend. He wanted to grab her, wrestle her to the ground, and kiss her into submission. The problem with that was that if he grabbed her, she was liable to kick his butt. Stone said, Petty Officer Juarez, please take control of this pack of hooligans. We have to get this bay clear and get all of our munitions to the bay next to aft cannon 11. 
and I will feed the next one of you who drops a mine to my Drascos for supper. Juarez replied, Aye, aye, sir. Trusting the petty officer to manage the munitions, Stone spun in place, not moving away from Alley. Standing face to face, they were little more than a whisker apart. He was actually about two inches taller than her six feet two, but he looked deep into her eyes. The iris in Allie's artificial eye spun, shifting color, and the pupil dilated, adjusting to his proximity, recording every minute muscle twitch and his pupil response, feeding data about his excitement at seeing her directly to her brain. Her other eye, the natural one, seemed to bore into his soul, flaying open his heart. "'How may I be of service, Lieutenant Vedrian?' He heard a snort from behind him. "'Something to say, Juarez?' Come on, Ensign Stone. There isn't a creature on this ship with a working brain who doesn't know you two are a couple. Stone continued to stare at Alley, but he spoke to Juarez. Do you have a problem, petty officer? Oh, no, sir. I think it's a good thing, but you're standing in the hatchway, so if you're going to be playing kissy face, please go somewhere else so us working stiffs can get these mines moved. Aye, aye, petty officer. Stone knew an order when he heard one, even if spoken by a mid-ranking enlisted. He grabbed Allie by an elbow and directed her back into the corridor. Once a team pushed a cartload of mines out of the hatch and around a corner, the corridor was empty. He took the occasion to kiss Allie, long and soft. She sighed. That was what I needed. My batteries were running low and I needed a recharge. She placed a flat palm on his chest and backed up to arm's length. I'm free for a couple of hours, but I have duty at sixteen hundred hours. You? He shook his head. I don't know. I don't think I can get away until o three hundred tomorrow morning. If I didn't know better, I'd think you're avoiding me. At the panicked look on his face, she laughed. I'm only teasing, boy. Stone said, Good. I want some free time, but Rusty Hinges is a huge ship, and the Navy hasn't been slack in their attempts to retrofit it for human use. They have done some incredible things since we first came aboard. Engineering is a shining marvel of upgrades. Communications is a seamlessly secured wireless system— the bridge is an amazing example of military perfection. However, our tactical weapons positions are still a tangle of rust, broken equipment, patched and repatched systems. I'm not an expert at Hyrocanian weapons systems, but if we meet the enemy soon, we might as well throw rocks at them. Stone laughed. We've been there. The ship's shotgun-style mine-throwers work, but barely. None of the dozens of barrels on Cannon 11 will fire more than five or six times without jamming. Of course, that was dry-firing them. They were in hyperspace, having transited through the jump point, and no one wanted to fire active munitions into the gray. No one knew what would happen. We have plenty of mines, both the ones in storage scattered around the ship, plus those scooped up from around the Brickman's station jump point. But the big problem is they were stored all around the ship. She laughed. I can see that. There are feeder tubes from every storeroom to the various gun emplacements, but the tube from this one is jammed tight. The vent runners are working to get it cleared without blowing us all up. I would appreciate not getting blown up. Me too. She gave him another quick kiss. I was hoping that we could have time together on Peach's Rest, getting you away from your job as governor. Now you're not in charge, but busier than ever. I'm sorry about Peach's Rest. I don't worry about it. I had a good time anyway. I met a real nice couple there. We got along great, and we talked about you a lot, until I got orders from Major Numos to return— we had fun, and I'm sure you like them. Well, gotta go. She was gone before he could reply, racing down the corridor at marine top speed. He realized he hadn't seen a marine on board moving at any pace slower than a sprint since... He stopped. Wait, he thought. What did she mean by that? She didn't say that she thought I would like them, but that I did like them. He was about to call her on her data port when his buzzed open, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Vera's face popped into view, hovering in midair. Anson Stone, we have a situation in the shuttle bay. I've been told that you have experience with the acid sludge throwers in the Hyrocanian shuttle. Please get your ass down here. We've got this shit stuff leaking all over the place. Chapter 10 Stone grabbed the long breaker bar. Leaning into it, he twisted and pulled. The acid sludge feeder belt slipped back onto its cog and chunked forward a few beats until it stopped. Releasing the pinched belt broke free a damaged acid bulb. It gushed slime all over him. Backing away from the machine, he stood still while a spacer sprayed him with a concoction of purified water and baking soda. It bubbled, but rinsed off the acid sludge. 
Dr. Kat Emmons grinned and poked Dr. Emiliano Wisniewski in the chest with a sharp finger. Told you it would work. Mother always gave Dad a glass of this stuff whenever he had heartburn. She said it was better than the over-the-counter medicine, not to mention cheaper. Wizzer said, It works for that half of the acid sludge, but that mild solution won't work if he gets covered in the other half. That stuff is a lot more corrosive. Emmons nodded. In that case, we use this other sprayer. Wizzer said, But what if he gets covered in both? Stone spoke before Emmons could reply. In that case, you hit the big red button on the wall, slam the door closed, run like hell, and send a letter of condolence to my family. Emmons looked up at him. Her long blonde hair shook as she gave her head a little shake. He still hadn't been able to tell if her hair color was natural, genetically altered, or if she used something out of a box. Not that it mattered. It looked pretty. She said, Interesting response, young man. Pulling out an ancient-style spiral notebook and pencil, she jotted down a few notes. Stone said, Quit that. Quit what? Emmons asked. I know you are a behaviorist, but aren't you here to advise us on Hyrocanian behavior, not study me? Wizzer grinned. Cat knows Hyrocanian behavior, but it's only a sideline. Emmons nodded. I am primarily a human behaviorist, and your behavior interests me. Stone said, My behavior interests me, too. But when you jot things down in your notebook, it makes me think I'm some kind of lab rat you're studying for some report. Emmons said, I do write reports on you, and on Wizard, and Spacer Dollish, the Hammer of God, and a dozen other people I've met since we got trapped on Allie's world and you saved all our lives. Writing reports is what I do. That's how I justify my tiny salary as a scientist. Okay, but... No, who? Stone was baffled. Wizard asked, Which who? Stone answered, You said you write reports on, and I quote, The Hammer of God. Emmons and Wizard laughed. Emmons finally said, That's just my personal little joke. Sorry, I'm supposed to write reports on a few specific people for various entities. One is First Lieutenant Theo Hammermill. Marine higher-ups think he has potential for long-term promotion and advancement up the ranks. They've asked my opinion, so... Hammer I get, short for Hammermill, Stone interrupted. Why is he the Hammer of God? Emmons said, Theo is from an old Earth language called Greek. It means God. Seems appropriate, since he kind of looks like a Greek god. Ares, maybe? The god of war? Wizard made a bad attempt at flexing his muscles. What about me? Emmons laughed. I sleep with you, you old coot. You'd be gone in a heartbeat if Theo Hammer came to call. A voice shouted, Are you clear? Stone shouted back. Yes, Lieutenant. The kink is clear and the area sprayed down. Vera peeked around the corner. Dang foolish thing, banging on that feed chain when it's filled with acid. Stone replied, Just so long as the two bulb types don't get mixed, you're okay. That's what Spacer Dollish said. What? Dollish? He's who told you I had experience with this thing? Sure, Vera replied. He said it was your turn to pound on the ammunition feed chain. Well, I'm going to have to have a talk with him. No, you don't. That man makes the best carnitas I've had since I left home. I don't care what anyone else says. As far as I'm concerned, you're much more expendable than he is. Stone asked, Do we really need the shuttle weapons, Lieutenant? Vera shook her head. We don't know, Ensign Stone. That's the point. Wizard said, There's a lot we don't know at this point. We've managed to glean and interpret data from the Hyrocanian navigation computer about their jump into Allie's world. However, we don't know what they were doing. It looks like they jumped from somewhere else, did an immediate second jump, and landed in our backyard. Stone said, A double jump? What does that mean? Wizard shook his head. It's not my field of expertise. My team broke the codes and strangled it for the interpretations. Why any rational thinking being would jump, then jump again right away, is unknown at this point. Captain Butcher thinks that it may be an empty system with two close navigation points that allowed the Hyrocanians to jump from a controlled system, then double jump to reach us. But he's only guessing, as their reasoning is still unknown. Vera said, Too many unknowns. Without knowing what we'll find, we don't know what we need to deal with. So we want all of our tools in some sort of working order. Having said that, are we clear? She pointed at the acid sludge feeder chain. Stone nodded. You should be able to put the belt in reverse to clear the ammunition before tearing this down to rebuild. Vera shook her head. We don't have enough time to do a complete rebuild. We've only got another couple of weeks in hyperspace before we jump into Hyrocanian space. All we have time for is to shore up this flooring and reconfigure that chair where the acid ate through. 
I don't pity the Hyrcanians one little bit, but the guy they had in that chair got a lap full of his own acid sludge. Stone grinned. That wasn't a Hyrcanian, Lieutenant Vera. That was me in the chair. Dollish manned the ammo feed chain. I suggest you put an acid-resistant hood over the trigger puller. Stupid effing weapon system, Vera cursed under her breath. Wizzer said, I haven't heard anyone lately accuse the Hyrcanians of any great intelligence. Vera looked at the three. I'm surprised that the idiots who designed and used this crap didn't kill themselves off long before they ever ran into humans. It'll probably kill us all just trying to repair their messes. Chapter 11 Stone stripped off his utility uniform. It had been a long day, a long night, and another long day. Things were shaping up, but they were all going to be tired when they finally jumped from hyperspace into a Hyrocanian-owned system. He threw the uniform in the direction of the hatch to his bedroom. It landed in a crumpled pile and lay there. He stared at it, as if offended that it hadn't opened the hatch on its own and found its own way into the uniform recycling hamper. The uniform was perfectly clean and fresh-smelling, even though he hadn't taken it off for days. Sissy picked it up and carried it into his cabin to hang it up in the closet. In his skivvies, Stone stepped across a well-manicured lawn to an overhead watering system nozzle. Reaching down into a recessed cup in the grass, he slapped the water handle and stood in a torrential downpour. His shower system was a tad bit unconventional, but so were his entire living quarters. Wiping the water out of his eyes, he looked through the jungle of untamed foliage. With the exception of Shorty and Sissy, the piglets were working double overtime to clean up the hydroponics and gardening bay they all shared. Shorty and Sissy had resumed their duties as his aides, and he'd given up trying to convince them they didn't need to cater to him any more. He used an old shack at the edge of the hydroponics bay for his cabin, and he was delighted the piglets were helping him. He'd spent the past two weeks working to get Rusty Hinges' weapons operational, and the piglets made the old tool shed livable for him. The Draskos and piglets made camps all around the huge bay. Almost two kilometers by two kilometers made for a huge overgrown jungle. Under the Hyrocanian's oversight, the main hatches had rusted shut, and the hydroponics and gardens had grown wild. The piglets had cleared dozens of acres, with the Drasco's help, plowing, planting, and watering enough land to feed them all, plus twice the number of humans on board. The piglets with vent runner skills had cleared the life support tubes of clogging vines and dead leaves, sending fresh oxygen throughout rusty hinges. The piglets were also putting a dent in the hordes of rat like creatures infesting the ship. Stone thought the rats smelled horrid when cooked, but the piglets enjoyed barbecuing them. He saw Charlotte, Emily, and Anne across the bay working with the piglets. They were yanking down a row of half-dead trees covered in some type of vine. Their size made them easy to spot, even from a kilometer and a half away. PB, L, T, and B weren't in sight. They were probably off with the Marines in some training seminar. J lay in the grass at the edge of the small meadow, soaking up the rain. Stone said, you can go help tear those out if you want. I know you'd rather do that than hang around with me. Jay snorted. There isn't anywhere I would rather be than with my mama. There are lots of trees to tear down. She rolled over onto her back, letting the rain soak her belly. I can tear down trees later. Stone could tell that no matter what she said, she was anxious to be doing something instead of babysitting him. I don't need security anymore, Jay. I can take care of myself. You always could, Mama, but you might need me to talk to Shorty for you. Stone looked over at the two piglets standing by, waiting for him to need something. Shorty held a bar of soap, and Sissy stood with a towel much too big for her to carry. He pointed at the soap, and Shorty tossed it to him. He said, See? Shorty and I have an understanding. We don't need to talk. But it reminded him that he wanted to look into getting the piglets and the Draskos some kind of data port they could type into for speech conversion. Both alien species easily heard humans speaking and understood Empire Standard, but human hearing had a limited frequency range, and Stone, even with his enhanced hearing, could only hear the Draskos. Jay wonked in pleasure. You would be the first human I've ever met who doesn't need to talk. Stone laughed. That's like the sweater calling the sheep fluffy. What's a sheep, Mama? Never mind. It just means that all of my girls chatter on more than I ever do. Jay wonked. That is because we are more human than others of us. The water running down his body was room temperature, and it felt wonderful against his skin. He wondered if he could find a chair and just sit in the warm rain. 
Finding a chair wasn't hard. There was an excess of equipment all over the ship. Every third cabin, bay, or corridor had jammed, locked, or rusted shot hatches. Behind each hatch was a myriad of strange and not-so-strange items. The military had finally opened every room, securing it for inspection, but no one had been able to catalog even part of what treasure might be buried in any room. However, Stone realized that every chair he'd ever seen on the ship had been welded onto the deck plates. Stone closed his eyes, finally relaxing, almost asleep on his feet. Maybe a chair isn't such a good idea. I might just fall asleep out here. Shorty wants to know if you want him to get you a chair. He says he can either find one, or they can build you one. Stone shook his head. Tell him thank you, but no. He stripped off his skivvies, tossing them to Shorty. The piglet wandered off with them. Stone was sure they would come back dry and fresh-smelling. He scrubbed with the soap, letting the rain rinse the suds away. If I had a chair, I would likely fall asleep right here, naked. It might be embarrassing to be caught naked. His voice faded away. He was planning on saying that he didn't want to be caught naked outside. Then he realized he wasn't outside. There was a decent ceiling overhead. Besides, no one except his Draskos and the Piglets had entered his personal jungle since Dolish led the aliens here. It might be nice if I did have company. I'll bet Allie would like this type of rain shower. Like most couples, they'd showered together, but most military-designed showers were designed for one person, and didn't leave the two of them much room to experiment. It is a bit open here, but neither of us are particularly shy. We would make sure you weren't interrupted when you did your sex thing, Mama. Has Corporal Tuttle been letting you watch her have sex again? Jay shook her head no. The Marines are too busy to have sex, even Barb. Jay looked at Stone and flapped a wing in his direction. Or even Allie. Barb says they have too many new Marines and need... enter... something. Mama, I forgot her word. Integrate? Yes, Mama. Integrate. Are we integrate? She just means they need to learn to work as a team. We are a team, Jay. Me, you, and PB, all of your daughters and the piglets. We work together. Jay asked, Why can't we help you with your Navy work now? It's for the Navy to do. You help me everywhere else. Maybe you and the piglets can build me a gazebo or something. Maybe with a place for fresh towels and soap, so that Shorty and Sissy don't have to cater to me. He tossed the soap off to the side. Jay said, Sissy says that Shorty has already made plans to add a shower room to your cabin. He wants to know if you want them to stop gardening and build it first. No, I would like something nicer. He looked over at the piglet. Shorty, you are to decide what you want done in here first. He shut the water off and took the towel from Sissy. A gazebo might provide a little privacy when Allie does finally get time to come and visit. Thinking about Allie, he spoke aloud, more to himself than Jay or the piglets. What did Allie mean about the couple she met on Peach's Rest? Did I hear her wrong, or was she implying something when she said, I like them? Jay shrugged her massive shoulders, rustling her wings. I can help you with talking to Shorty, but I can't help you with Allie. You should ask her, not me. I will, but I haven't seen her since she said it. Jay looked at Sissy, and then back at Stone. Sissy says Allie is sleeping now. She will go bring her here if you want. Now let her sleep. I need to do that, too. Good. You sleep. I will go tear up some trees. Stone stopped. He could hear his data port buzzing from the cabin. In quick order, Shorty ran out of the old tool shed and handed the device to him. He made sure the video pickup was blocked and tapped it open. Ensign Senior Grade Stone here. An image of Master Chief Thomas popped up. Sir, you've... Ensign, is your data port broken? Your comms isn't transmitting a picture. I was in the shower, Master Chief. With your data port? No, Master Chief, it was just nearby. Ensign, I realize you don't have much experience being an officer on a Navy warship, even one as decrepit as this old P.O.S. Actually, I don't have any. Although Stone had earned the coveted red stripe on his trousers, denoting commanding a Navy ship in combat, he'd only been assigned to a warehouse ship and taken transport on an Explorer-class vessel. That was the extent of his experience. The Master Chief nodded. Leave your visual on. It's a security measure. That way the caller can see if you are in distress or under duress. Stone unblocked the visual. Yes, Master— Good grief, Ensign! Angle the vid pick up, would you? You aren't the first Navy ensign I've seen naked, but I would rather not repeat the incident. Stone sighed. Yes, Master Chief. What can I do for you? Officers call in thirty mics. Get a move on, sir. The captain is on the warpath about something. 
Chapter 12 For the first time in a long time, Stone was not the last person to arrive at the captain's office for officer's call. He managed to get there in time to walk past the plethora of higher-ranking officers waiting in the corridor for the junior officers to arrive and seat themselves first. Navy tradition dictated that the lowest-ranking person enter first and take their seat. All would stand again upon the arrival of the highest-ranking officer. As governor, Stone had done away with that protocol, but once again he realized he wasn't in charge any more. Taking a seat to the left of the highest-ranking Ensign Junior Grade, he nodded to the Ensign Senior Grade, taking her seat just to his left. She plopped into her seat a fraction of a second after his butt hit his chair, and she nodded to the Ensign Senior Grade seating himself on her left. Thinking about foolish traditions, Stone realized this one might have an intended benefit. Rusty Hinges was a Navy combat vessel. They were a Q-ship on an intelligence-gathering mission, but the captain obviously expected to need weapons, or wanted them should the need arise. Even on a ship this big, combat meant that people died. Command personnel shifted. He'd been assigned as a low-ranking midshipman on the UEN period on Titus, but he'd jumped up to command, replacing a corrupt admiral. The investigators found other criminals on the vast warehouse ship— Reintegrating the innocent officers into the active ranks was easy, because they had time to study everyone's rank and date of promotion to determine position reassignment. He glanced down the line of officers. Lieutenant Junior Grade Vera was just seating herself, nodding to the next highest-ranking lieutenant. She was Stone's direct supervisor. If she was taken out, he would step into her position. That was easy. If there were some disaster that wiped out a long string of officers, the officer just to his left would take command of the ship— just as the lower-ranking officer to his right would take command of the ship if Stone died. Stone shook his head. He didn't have any plans to die, but he was glad the Navy had a tradition in place to smooth violent transitions. He checked his schedule on his data port. This meeting wasn't on the schedule, so Captain Butcher must have something on his mind. The Master Chief said he was on the warpath, so somebody's backside was going to be caught in the ringer. He didn't think it was his. Trying to remember everything since their last officer's call, he couldn't think of anything he'd done wrong. That didn't mean L, N, or T hadn't done something girlishly silly. He wasn't worried about the piglets. As vent runners and rat catchers, they were much more helpful than they were underfoot. However, he realized he would much rather be the chewer than the chewy at any chewing out session. The ensign on his right interrupted his thoughts by tapping him lightly on the shoulder. The man, probably older than Stone by a few years, stuck out his hand. "'We didn't get a chance to meet yet. I'm Zisk Tander, sir.' "'Nice to meet you, Ensign Tander. I'm Ensign Stone. Yes, sir, I know. I'm really glad to meet you. Would you autograph my book?' "'Autograph your what?' "'My book, sir. Or rather, your book.' Stone looked baffled and shrugged. "'I don't—' Tander tapped on his civilian personal assistant. Flicking through a few menus, he pulled up a novel. "'See?' That's you, right? Stone stared at the cartoonish picture of himself. He was standing shirtless, oiled muscles rippling in the overhead lights, battling a seriously flawed representation of a mass of Hyrocanians using only a glowing sword. Beside him, cartoon versions of Jay and Peavy stood in their fighting stance. The cover shimmered as the cartoon version of him swung the sword, decapitating a Hyrocanian as the alien held a ray gun in the hand sprouting from the middle of its chest. Jay and Peavy roared with anger, a noise he'd never heard either of them make, and leaped forward to bite the heads off aliens, their huge fangs dripping bright red blood. The title marquee proudly displayed the book title as Metal Boxes. Tander said, almost like an apology, It's not really written very well, kind of trashy entertainment, sir, and I'm sure it's not really accurate, but golly, it's exciting. He tapped a nap on the side of the book. A small square popped up, just sign across here, that would be great. He pulled up another square and pointed at a scrawled signature. Look, I already got the author's signature when I bought his book. It's a number one bestseller. Everyone wants to read about how you beat the aliens. I've got the sequel, but I haven't had time to read it yet. Stone didn't know what to do. He reached across and signed his name with a finger. Can I borrow the book? Tander grinned. Really? I'd have thought you— Yeah, sure. He grabbed the book with a finger and pointed the finger at Stone's P.A. I have the book autographed, and I'm going to keep it. When you're done, just delete it, and it'll come back to me automatically. His grin widened. I'm not going to sell this, but I could get top credits at a comic con with the author's signature, and yours, too. Stone was saved from responding when Lieutenant Commander Gupta, 
the XO and First Watch officer, jumped to his feet and called the room to order. Rusty hinges, gentlemen! Leaping to his feet and stiffening to attention was more muscle memory than conscious thought. Stone barely registered that he'd moved when the captain, Commander Thomas Butcher, marched into the room. Sit, Commander Butcher ordered. The room was silent as Butcher glared at the people around him. Enough of the pleasantries! He flashed a dozen reports open from his data port, scattering them about the air in front of him and the gathered crowd of officers. He waved his hand in a wide sweeping motion, swishing the reports away before even the closest officer could read more than a word or two. I have stacks of reports from dozens of departments stating Rusty Hinges is ready for duty. I believed my officers and reported it to the Navy. The Navy believed me and gave us orders. Now I find that more than one of these reports was, shall we say, artfully enhanced. I will give kudos to engineering. You've got that wreck of engines and power sources in shape. They'll get us where we're going. Whether we'll ever get home again under our own power is anybody's guess. Life support is improving. At least the air smells fresher. But I have been told that is more due to additional vent runners cleaning air ducts and due to Ensign Stone bringing more piglets aboard and having them clean up hydroponics than it is due to the repair of malfunctioning air exchangers. Stone kept his face forward, but tried to look out the corner of his eyes at the officers whose departments were being mentioned. The fragrance in the room had changed from spearmint to a light citrus odor. More than one officer was worried about their performance. He could smell the officers' loyalty to the Navy, and specifically to Butcher, but they were worried for themselves and their careers. For once, Stone was glad he was far enough down the food chain that when Butcher chewed ass, his would be safe. Still, he'd been mentioned by name. It didn't matter that he'd been complimented for something that wasn't his doing. Being mentioned at all, in this type of meeting, was never a good thing. Butcher jabbed an angry finger at Lieutenant Vera. Weapons is the only department that I'm getting good reports on. By good, I don't mean that everything is working. We're only at 50% weapons capacity. By good, I mean straightforward and honest reports, not fluff. Lieutenant Vera is consistently honest about her failures to get her department up to 100%. He held up three fingers. That is it, gentlemen. We have three days before we jump out of hyperspace and into... What? Anybody know? Because I sure don't. Communications has the IFF functioning to spoof any Hyrocanian in the system, and our civilian translators have put together enough fake message responses that we shouldn't be blown up just for showing up. If we get into a shooting match, we're dead meat. Vera jumped to her feet. Sir, weapons will be ready, I swear it. Butcher glared at her until she sat down again. No, you won't, Lieutenant. I've had some of the gun emplacements inspected, and you won't get them ready in three days or three years. Stone could see some of Master Chief Petty Officer Thomas's hand in those inspections. No one had seen the captain inspecting anything, but the Master Chief seemed to be visible whenever he turned around. He'd been so used to Thomas watching over his shoulder, he'd become immune to his presence. Butcher paced back and forth in front of the officers. Occasionally he grabbed a report from his data port and threw it at an officer. Finally he signed. Okay, that ends the angry captain portion of this meeting. We've had three weeks in hyperspace, and we've accomplished a great deal in the time we've had. The Navy would have accomplished much more if we'd been allowed to take rusty hinges to a real spaceport repair depot. But the powers that be wanted to keep our retrofit as quiet as possible so the enemy wouldn't get word of a Q-ship in their midst. He pointed at Stone. Without thinking, Stone jumped to attention. Butcher said, There are very few military personnel who've had more direct contact with the Hyrocanians and survived than our own Ensign Stone. Therefore, as much as he's been helpful to Vera in weapons, I want him with us on the bridge for our jump into Hyrocanian space. Ensign Stone? Sir, if it comes to shooting, Petty Officer Juarez on my team can pull a trigger just as good as I can. I'll be on the bridge if that's where you think I'll be most helpful. Butcher grunted. I don't know where anyone will be most helpful. I've asked Wizzer to join us on the bridge. The man is a goofball, but his team has put together our Hyrocanian translators. Dr. Emmons will also be joining us. She's a good human behaviorist, and she's also the best Hyrocanian behaviorist we have at our disposal. You tell me now, Stone. You've outranked me for the past few years. You've held an admiral's position on a ship in combat. Can you step back from that and act as an advisor to me? Yes, sir. Stone was surprised at the question. He was relieved he wasn't in charge any more, and wondered what kind of nut would be upset at a change of position. The change wasn't a demotion, the change was simply an alteration of duties. Butcher smiled. That's what I thought. Just to let you know, 
Cat Emmons told me the same thing about you. Stone was really surprised. He knew Dr. Emmons wrote reports on lots of people, but she specialized more in groups than individuals. He hadn't realized she'd paid that much attention to him beyond a few casual reports. Butcher pointed at Tander. Ensign, you are relieved of your duties in the kitchen. As soon as we break here, report to Lieutenant Vera as a replacement for Stone. Do you think the cooks can get by without you? Tander laughed. Without me? Sir, they'll probably get along better without me being underfoot. I couldn't boil water without burning myself, so mostly I've just tried to stand back and let the enlisted people do what they've been trained for. In a stage whisper that carried across the room, Exo Gupta said, I can tell that boy has the makings of a good officer some day. In a reply whisper, Lieutenant Commander Lee said, I didn't learn that lesson until I was a butterbar lieutenant. Butcher ignored his two officers and said, I got the same report from Spacer Dollish, Ensign Tander. Not that you were in the way, but he said you've been a big help expediting things they can't do for themselves. Sir, I didn't know you knew Dollish. The man is better than most of the petty officers in the kitchens. I know that, Ensign. He's why I can move you. I'd promote him above those petty officers if his last boss hadn't already promoted him as far as he can go with his education and time in service. Stone was still standing. Sir, we can't do anything about his time in service, but Tim and I have been working on his education. He should get his standard high school diploma before we get back to Ali's world. Butcher nodded. That'll be a good idea, if we survive this assignment. Yes, sir, if we survive. Chapter 13 Bolted to the floor around the new bridge conference table was a small cluster of overstuffed Hyrcanian chairs. Seating was first-come, first-seat choice. The conference area was an obvious addition, but in the hodgepodge of mismatched equipment and odd bits of strung wires, it didn't look too much out of place. Stone grabbed a seat next to Whizzer, ignoring the scientist as the man nibbled on Emmons's earlobe while whispering softly to her. Whatever the man was saying caused Emmons to giggle, a sound not usually associated with a woman of her years. On the other side of the table were Major Numos, who sat directly across from Stone, and Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya, the third watch commander. Numos, the only person on the bridge not exuding any strong fragrance of worry or caution, smiled a greeting at Stone. The man was positively calm, giving off his normal minty odor, indicating he was fully loyal and ready to do whatever was necessary and required. Butcher sat in the standard three-chair bridge configuration, overwatching the consoles. Gupta and Lee flanked him. In place of the one push-button console the Hyrcanians favored, the Navy had installed a dozen consoles for a myriad of functions. The captain rose from his chair and paced along the workstations, addressing each operator by name, getting a go-no-go no go, thumbs up or down. Stone caught a strong whiff of vanilla as Butcher walked over to the conference table, where he stopped pacing to rock back and forth on the balls of his feet. His nervous energy appeared to bleed out through his fingers as he flexed his hands. The vanilla fragrance was entirely too bland to represent determination and utter commitment, but Stone believed that was what Butcher was feeling. If there was any lemony scent of concern, the odor was lost in the citrus lime odors of fear and caution coming from others on the bridge. Butcher said, I appreciate each of you volunteering to be here. With the exception of Lieutenant Missy Maya, we've all encountered Hyrocanians. No one knows how they think, and since we don't know what to expect when we jump out of hyperspace, I want you to speak up if you see something I might have missed. Do not stand on protocol, just say something, and say it fast or it might be too late. Understand? Everyone agreed, except Wizard, who still had his nose buried in the nape of Emmons's neck. Stone didn't think it mattered, since Wizard had never learned not to speak up when a thought came into his head. Stone wasn't jealous that the scientist got to have his girlfriend on the bridge with him, but he missed his girlfriend. Allie was in her combat suit, formed up with the Marines, ready to do whatever she might be called on to do. Stone stared at a small screen set up on the conference table. The gray flat view was more than familiar to anyone who'd ever jumped into hyperspace. Beyond the bubble generated by the ship's jump engines, there wasn't any light, heat, matter, or even time. All anyone ever saw was a gray nothing in hyperspace. Stone had spent his childhood as a freighter's kid, jumping through hyperspace from one station to the next. He'd seen more gray than he'd seen open planets. He'd made more jumps between planets than he'd made visits to those planets themselves. Some people claimed to be able to feel the jump, but he doubted it. There wasn't any sensation. You were in hyperspace one moment, and the next you weren't. 
Galactic time never registered any change while in hyperspace, because time didn't exist there. The only time recorded was by the ship's internal sensors, located inside the normal space bubble encapsulating the ship while in hyperspace. A ship jumped out of hyperspace at the same time they'd jumped in, no matter what the people inside the ship thought. Time continued to click by in the hyperspace bubble, but the bubble dispersed the moment the ship jumped out of hyperspace back into normal space, taking any passing moments with it. No matter how much math and physics Stone studied and been tutored while earning his online degree, he still didn't understand the time thing. Wizzer claimed to grasp the concept, but no one believed him, not even Dr. Emmons. Something about the nothing had always fascinated Stone. The whole thought that he could look at a video of nothing wasn't right. It wasn't a blank picture picked up by the ship's external sensors, but the cameras were taking a picture of nothing. No matter what most planet-bound people thought, space wasn't empty. There was always something, such as light from a distant star, dust, or gas. But nothing existed here. Staring at the display, he missed Butcher retaking his seat. The petty officer at the navigation console shouted, "'Nav here, Captain! We are at—' The man held up five fingers, then four, then three. Butcher said, "'On your mark, Nav!' One finger. The man used that finger to hit the button on his console. Stone expected to see a solar system blink into view. He'd seen more than his share of planets, space stations, raw suns, and in one case a space station so close they almost clipped a corner of it. The monitor flashed a bright green, and then blanked back to the gray. Butcher shouted, Nav, report! Did we miss our jump point window? No, sir. Nav reports a perfect exit exactly where the Hyrocanian computers said we had an exit. Butcher called to another console. Engineering, did we have jump engine failure? We're in the green, Captain. Engines report that we made the transition. Stone remembered Wizard telling him about the Hyrocanians performing a double jump. Butcher said, we are off the mark, folks, and getting farther from our destination by the second. Somebody tell me what happened. Stone said, Captain, jump out of hyperspace now. Butcher asked, What? Stone interrupted, Right now, sir. Butcher shouted, Navigation, exit hyperspace now. Engineering, bring us to a full stop relative to any spatial bodies. Nav, Captain, aye, aye, full stop relative to any... Sir, there aren't any bodies. Engineering, sir, full stop, aye, aye, sir. Butcher turned in his chair to face the conference table. Ensign Stone, what are you thinking? Sir, Wizzer said the Hyrocanians made a double jump, right? Wizzer, with a shocked look on his face, nodded. Stone wanted to laugh. The man's shocked look was probably not at their navigation predicament, but at not having jumped into the middle of a Hyrocanian fleet and been killed immediately. Stone thought the man had planned and expected to die while nuzzling his girlfriend's neck. Stone continued, It's just a theory. What if the Hyrocanians were jumping into the same system we just tried to jump to, and they got thrown back, just like we did? So, after a time, they jumped out at random, just like we did, and that random jump out landed them at Allie's world. Nav interrupted. Wait, what do you mean they were thrown back? We didn't make a jump. Something went wrong and we never left hyperspace. Stone shook his head. No, I don't think so. I had my eyes glued to the display. We got a flash of color. Numos added, I concur. I saw a blue flash. Blue? Stone asked. Huh, I thought the color was green, but then it happened really fast. At first I didn't think I saw anything. Imagined it, you know? If I'd blinked, I'd have missed it. Missy Maya shrugged. I was watching the nav console and didn't see anything. Butcher said, Give us a playback. All screens. Every monitor on the bridge showed a gray screen, replaced by a flash of color and a quick return to gray. Shouts of color volleyed around the room. Everyone saw a different color, from yellow to deep purple. Butcher said, Play it again. Minimum speed. Frame by frame, if you please. They watched as the monitors showed gray. Then, at a pace almost too fast to see, they caught a picture of a solar system with a small planet in the background, surrounded by four rocky moons. A dot in the middle of their screen exploded in a flash of light. The light expanded until it covered the whole screen, and then returned to gray. Someone on the bridge cursed. Stone wanted to join in. They'd been hit by a mine that, instead of killing them outright, thankfully pushed them back into hyperspace. UEN mines, and by extension Hyrocanian mines, were either shot at an enemy ship like a bomb, or tethered in space near a navigation point. This mine was tethered near enough to the jump point, it repulsed the rusty hinges, shoving it away from the system. 
Jumping out of hyperspace quickly might or might not have kept them from going too far. Time in the gray didn't hold any relationship to distance in normal space. They might end up anywhere, although they would end up exactly at the same time they entered hyperspace. Now they were stuck in the middle of nowhere. Another trip into hyperspace was a gamble. Anywhere they jumped to might be the place that kills them. Going into hyperspace without hitting a jump point and traveling for an exact amount of time was a practice in drawn-out suicide. When the time to jump from hyperspace came, they might jump into a sun, into a planet, into the middle of a meteor storm, or inside a black hole's event horizon. Chapter 14 Stone grunted as his mind whirled with weird possibilities and stupid ideas on how to recover from their predicament. He didn't have enough information. No one else appeared to know either. Butcher said, Astrogation, can you do a chart and find out where we are? Already on it, Captain. Hopefully we're in our own galaxy. Wizard snorted and said, Even being in the same galaxy might leave us screwed. Our galaxy isn't even one of the big ones, and human space only covers a tiny fraction of it. Emmons patted his hand. We got here, we can get back. It's just a matter of knowing where we are, where we're going, and the math in between, right? She didn't look too sure of her own analysis. Wizard said, that, and finding the right jump point. Without that, we won't know how far we have to go in hyperspace. I may only be a geologist, but I've been to space before, you know. Emmons nodded. And I may only be a behaviorist, but I'm not a complete idiot, you know. Her voice imitated and mocked him, but he didn't appear to be upset by it. Stone said, Jumping into hyperspace without finding a standard navigation point, and without knowing how long to stay in the gray, can throw the ship back into normal space anywhere. We need a clear nav point to know where to enter hyperspace. Wizard said, A ship can jump out of hyperspace anywhere, but you must know how far to go or you won't know where you'll end up. Stone shook his head. Actually, it's not how far, but how long. There isn't anything in the gray. Not time, not distance. Without any distances, a ship travels a certain amount of time. Wizard was about to protest, but Stone waved him down. He stood up and pointed at Missy Maya. Say the lieutenant is Allie's world and the Major is Brickman's station. Pulling his civilian personal assistant from his pocket, he continued, The Navy has identified two separate nav points for jumping between these locations. He put the PA on the table in front of Missy Maya. This is a ship. Taking the normal jump, a ship will only have a few days in hyperspace between those two systems. Flicking the PA with a finger, it scooted across the table to stop in front of Numa's. That's one of the quickest jumps I know of, although the systems themselves are a long distance from each other. Stone reached across the table and picked up the PA. If the ship takes the other nav point and jumps to Brickman Station, it can take weeks. He walked around the table and set the PA in front of Numa's. Same distance, but time in the gray is a factor. Emmons asked, How do you know when to jump out of hyperspace to get where you're going? Numa said, That's a question for computers and the navigation geniuses. He hooked a thumb at the cluster of officers gathered around the nav console. Stone nodded. I think the Hyrocanians tried to jump into the same system we did, and they were rebuffed just like we were. We don't know how long they stayed in hyperspace or where they came out. Wherever they were, they found a navigation point to jump into hyperspace, and then jumped out again at random. That last random leap put them at Alley's world. They didn't know where they were, but if they could have retraced their steps, they could have led a fleet to our doorstep. Numa said, that's why we had to capture or destroy the rusty hinges. Stone agreed. We just met the problem in retracing their steps, a system we can't access. Wizard said, I doubt if they could have backtracked their course. Their navigation records are so spotty we didn't find out about them being refused access to that system. Missy Maya had looked thoughtful throughout the discussion. That's what I was wondering about. How did that work? I mean, I've never heard of a weapon that can throw something the size of a spaceship into hyperspace. That isn't a Hyrocanian trick that I've ever heard of. I would love to get my hands on that tech to see how it works. Numa shook his head. It's a nice trick, but it still leaves your enemy alive and in an unknown location. Living enemies are dangerous. I prefer a nice field of mines that can eliminate any hostiles. Missy Maya said, You've got to admit that a repulsing technology would have some wonderful applications. Numa grunted. I don't have to admit any such thing. I don't send my marines into combat with tasers to disable the enemy. We meet them with bombs and bullets. 
Stone was still standing beside Numos, and that might make it appear he agreed with the marine officer, but he didn't want to move and give the impression he disagreed. He tried to look thoughtful, as the two officers scowled at each other. Miss Imaya said, Marines do carry some non-lethal weapons. Numos said, Yes, when we need to capture. But this repulsor mine didn't capture us. It simply removed us from the field of battle, completely unharmed and combat-ready. What good is combat-ready when we don't know where or who to fight? Combat-ready is always, right, because you don't know where or when. Miss Imaya looked thoughtful. I still want to get my hands on that tech. If there was some way to steal it— Stone started to interrupt, but the two officers weren't done arguing. Stone was rather distressed that a naval officer would be talking about taking technology from an alien race rather than attempting to trade for it. So instead of getting between two senior officers, he moved next to the monitor at the end of the table. The display showed a completely unremarkable star field. He flicked a few control buttons and managed to find a replay of the astrogation monitors. The computer was comparing the stars in their current location to known star charts— the screen was flashing through chart after chart, faster than he could register, as the computer sought to find a match using known distances and easily recognizable star signatures. He started to say something to Wizzer and Emmons, but the two were arguing about some theory or another. Wizzer said, "'If this had happened, then we would know—' Emmons interrupted, "'But that didn't happen. However, knowing what did happen, maybe that system's aliens, maybe—' "'No, Cat, how can you guess about aliens?' I'd be a better guesser than you. They aren't rocks, you know. I don't know any such thing. But maybe— Rather than interrupt either argument, Stone walked over to Captain Butcher's chair and stood waiting to be recognized. He was surprised to hear that the captain, the XO, and the second watch officer weren't discussing their current predicament, but reviewing next week's duty roster, a singularly boring task. He realized they needed more information to make a good decision, and rather than devolve into guesswork, they were doing something practical. Finally, Butcher looked at him with a raised eyebrow. "'Sir, I was wondering if we could have someone work on getting a fix on the system we were just denied access to while we wait for a good location fix?' Gupta asked, "'I agree, Ensign Stone. That would be a good thing to know. How would you propose we do that?' Stone said, "'Sir, when we replayed the high-speed video of exiting hyperspace, we caught two or three clear frames of the solar system.' Admittedly, we can't see much in most of them, but the first frame does show us a planet and its moons, as well as their star field in the background. Lee asked, What good is it to know the location of a solar system we can't go to? Butcher looked at Lee. Seriously? I can think of a dozen good reasons, the best being that nav points aren't the only way to reach a star system. They're just the easiest and quickest way. Butcher nodded at Gupta. The XO replied, I'm on it, Captain. With a nod, Butcher dismissed Stone, and spoke loudly enough for everyone on the bridge to hear. "'Major Numos, please have your Marines stand down. Commander Gupta, please take us off general quarters. You have the con. Everyone not working on our location problem can clear the bridge. I think we're going to be here a while.'" Chapter 15 Stone plopped into a seat at an open table. He remembered this room from the battle to capture Rusty Hinges. The vast room was a Hyrocanian cafeteria, with walls, pens, and cages to hold live creatures. The four-armed freaks preferred to listen to their victims' screams as they ate them. The walls had been removed during the retrofit, turning the space into one big dining area, with a new kitchen set to the side. In the month they remained idle, waiting for the computers to determine their location, someone had painted the walls a pleasant, neutral beige— he could still see marks on the floor where the former cages and pens had been. The memory turned his stomach and almost made him lose his appetite, but he had to eat. His body seemed to churn faster than it did before his DNA got mixed with Drasco's spit, blood, and sperm, not to mention whatever it was that caused his military nanites to malfunction. He felt like he was hungry all of the time. The medical staff said his hunger was because he was a nineteen-year-old male, and all such creatures were hungry all of the time. They did admit they still didn't know what was happening to his body. He hadn't grown any taller in the last two years, nor had his muscles bulked up more, yet his body seemed to be getting heavier, more dense. He was a little faster, and a lot stronger, but the average Marine could still kick his butt, as Hammermill repeatedly demonstrated in the gym. Hammer always laughed and said it was training, not brute strength, but Stone thought it had more to do with the will to fight than anything else. Still, the changes in his body made him hungry. 
He wondered if the changes in his body were what made him constantly think about sex. He hoped that was normal for a man his age, but he was too embarrassed to ask the medical staff about it. Allie said it was normal, but what did she know? She'd never been a nineteen-year-old male. "'Hey, boss,' Dawlish interrupted his thoughts. The spacer carried two trays. "'I noticed you hadn't filled a plate yet, so I brought you one.' Stone grinned. "'Thanks, Tim.' He pointed at the cafeteria buffet line. "'I thought I'd wait until the crowd eased up some.' Dawlish slid a tray in front of him. "'I made this up special for you. That stew is a little higher in carbohydrates than we normally feed the rest of these chowhounds. I fortified up some of the Cajun jambalaya I made today. Have a seat, Tim. Join me. Dollish shook his head. I can't, sir. You're sitting at a table reserved for officers. I'll just go sit over there somewhere. Only if you want to. If I invite you to stay here, then you can. It won't be the first time we shared a meal. Dollish dropped into a chair. That's the truth, boss. The first time I fed you, we were sitting in the dirt. I will admit the seating here is more comfortable than back on Allie's world. Yes, sir. Good times. Stone said, Spacer Dollish, you have a different definition of good times than I do. Dollish laughed. We ain't dead, sir. How bad could it have been? The spacer had a large salad in front of him, and began to shovel the greens into his mouth, still chuckling with his mouth full. Stone laughed with him. Yeah, starvation, attacks by wild creatures, bombed back to the Stone Age by the Hyrocanians, and a traitorous bitch in our midst. How could I forget all those good times? He dug into his stew with relish. It was much more flavorful than the first stew Dollish had made him on Allie's world. Governor, I mean, Ensign, we might be facing starvation here if your piglets weren't supplementing our supplies. Stone looked around, expecting to see Shorty and Sissy, but they weren't there. Tim, the piglets aren't mine. You have to tell them that. I've tried, but they won't listen. Changing subjects, Stone asked, Are their gardens that helpful? He took a bite of celery and green pepper. They tasted fresh, not dehydrated or frozen. He pointed at the bowl. Their vegetables? Yes, boss. We're getting half our supplies from them. It'll make what we brought last much longer. We've been idle for a month, right? Well, we have a chicken breeding farm a few decks down. That'll provide us with fresh protein in time. But it takes five to six weeks to go from chick to chicken parmesan, and we ain't been stuck that long. Yet. So we're running out of chicken. He took a bite of andouille sausage, the spicy meat filling his mouth with heat. Dollish looked around and said conspiratorially, We ran out of chicken last week. The chicken in our chicken parmesan is more rat than fowl. Remind me to stay away from the chicken. Dollish pointed at the bowl. Boss, I make my jambalaya with chicken, andouille sausage, and shrimp. The shrimp is frozen and preformed, but we ran out of andouille a week ago, the day before we ran out of chicken. Stone let that sink in. He pointed at the bowl. Chicken and sausage? Dollish shrugged. Sort of, boss. Whoever planned this snafu didn't plan on us being stuck in the middle of nowhere this long. We've learned to make do before, right? More than once, Tim. Can I ask how much longer we might be stuck here? I don't know. The computers are on their fourth iteration, seeking a destination we can reach before our grandchildren are too old to enjoy it. There just aren't any known systems in this region. There are a couple of systems nearby that we can get to in a couple of months, but at this point all we know is they have suns and a few rocky planets. So nowhere we could resupply with moss or the odd bit of rat. Not that we can tell from this far away. The optics just aren't that good on the rusty hinges. Nothing is, sir. This old crate is— Both men were startled when Butcher gently slapped Dollish on the shoulder and dropped into a seat next to him. What's on the menu, gentlemen? The captain's steward, a low-ranking ensign, stood patiently behind him. Butcher pointed at the bowl of stew in front of Stone. I'll have what he's having. Dollish stopped the steward. That exact item isn't on the menu, sir. It's fortified special for ensign stone with extra carbs and vitamins. There's some regular jambalaya or a nice chicken parmesan on the line. He glanced at Stone, who simply rolled his eyes at Dollish's menu suggestions, noting that Dollish had restricted himself to a salad and nothing else. Butcher shook his head. I'm the captain of a ship, and it's a sad state of affairs that I still don't get my own chef. What do I have to do to get a meal specially made by the famous chef Tim Dollish? Save my life a few times, Dollish answered, then realized who he was talking to. Blushing a deep red, he stammered, Sir, sorry, I— Butcher laughed. Well, if that's all it takes, I'll have to see what I can do. Missy Maya and two other officers set their trays down and dropped into chairs, each nodding respectfully at the captain and Stone. They began eating, each ignoring Dollish as if the man wasn't there. 
Dollish stared at his plate. Stone looked around him. He hadn't realized the dining area had become so stratified. Lower enlisted were at the far end of the cafeteria, senior enlisted were in the middle, and the officers were near the far end, as if trying to remove themselves from the lower ranks. The Marines were off to one side. At least they didn't separate their officers from enlisted. Second Lieutenant Escamilla was eating with her platoon. On the other side was a gaggle of civilians. As segregated as they were, Stone knew Dollish would be uncomfortable here, and his intention had been to eat with a friend, not make the man embarrassed. He started to say something, but Butcher interrupted. Tim, did you make the chicken parm? Dollish didn't look up, but shook his head. No, sir. I did manage to keep the cook from putting too much basil in his marinara, but the only thing I made was the Cajun jambalaya and rice. Oh, and the fruit cobbler and key lime pie are mine, sir. Butcher nodded to his steward. Bring us some of those, Bob, and bring some for yourself. Stone realized that would be more officers sitting at the table. Captain Butcher, I'm sorry, I must have missed the orders about reserving tables for officers only. Butcher frowned. There aren't, but... He looked around, seeing what Stone had just seen. When did this happen? Missy Maya looked up from his chicken parmesan, grinning proudly. I set this up a week ago, Captain. I hoped you'd notice... Since we might be stuck here a while, I wanted to set things up as traditional as possible. This should work until we can build some temporary walls. Butcher smiled and nodded approvingly. Stone had known Butcher for a few years and easily recognized that the smile wasn't real. Missy Maya apparently didn't. Missy Maya added, Surely it wouldn't be to anyone's benefit to mix Navy and Marines together, especially since their offices really are just trumped up enlisted, and we know that enlisted and offices really don't mix well. He glanced at Dollish. No offense, Spacer. I'm sure you were invited to the table for a valid reason. Stone asked, No offense? Lieutenant Miss Imaya, how do you figure that isn't offensive to an enlisted man? Miss Imaya snapped, Watch your tone, Ensign. Yes, sir. I meant no offense. No one at the table could miss the sarcasm in his voice. He glanced up as the captain's steward slid a tray in front of Butcher. The steward backstepped and took a seat at a nearby table. Stone hoped he could remember to commend the man on his observation skills, noting that this table was going to rapidly dissolve into a place for anything but a quiet meal. Butcher snapped at Stone. Ensign, do you agree with your superior officer, Lieutenant Missy Maya, that Navy and Marine personnel shouldn't mix? His tone sounded like Dr. Wisniewski when the scientist was trying to trap Stone with a trick question. No, sir, I disagree. Missy Maya said, You think Marines are as good as Navy? The man sounded surprised. No, Lieutenant, I disagree that you're a superior officer. You are a higher-ranking officer, but not better. The man sputtered as Butcher chuckled. Stone waved Missy Maya quiet when the man tried to respond. A man won't follow you because you have a higher rank and have lorded your position over him. He will follow you because you have earned his trust. How can a man learn to trust you when he doesn't know you? My relationship with Marines has saved my life more than once because they know me. Spacer First Class Timothy Oliphant Dollish makes me special meals because he knows me. Even the piglets do what I ask, not because I order them to, but because they know me. Butcher nodded. Lieutenant Missy Maya, that sounds like something you could learn from Ensign Stone. Stone said, Thank you, Captain, but I learned that from a Marine. And I'll tell you this, sir. Marine officers aren't just trumped up enlisted. They start as enlisted, and move up through the ranks, to become an officer once they've proven themselves. Missy Maya sniffed his disapproval. I think your personal, he looked pointedly at Butcher, and ill-advised relationship with a marine officer has colored your judgment. Don't you agree, Captain? No, I don't, Lieutenant. I know Lieutenant Vedrian. You obviously do not. Not only is she an outstanding marine, she is intelligent, creative, and witty. As to ill-advised relationships, on my home planet, your sexual relationship with both of these gentlemen would get you stoned on the village square as a sodomite. I left home because of their narrow-minded views, and have tried ever since to let people be in their personal life. He spun on stone. Except your Corporal Tuttle. Can't you get her to at least be a bit more discreet? Stone shook his head. I would, sir, but she isn't mine any more. I'll speak to Allie, Lieutenant Vedrian, her platoon commander, and see what we can do. Besides, I don't think we can control Tuttle without a muzzle and a leash, and I'm afraid she'd like that. Missy Maya sputtered. Be that as it may, Captain. Ensign Senior Grade Stone is younger than his rank would indicate, 
it would be in his best interest and the interest of his family to protect him from an obvious gold digger who's just out for his enough, Stone roared. Your comments have gone beyond bounds. One more personal insult and I will... I will... His voice faded away as he realized he wasn't the governor of all he surveyed any more. The cafeteria had suddenly become quiet. Everyone's eyes flicked towards Stone, Missy Maya, and the captain, although a scant few actually turned to face them. "'You what?' Missy Maya sneered. "'I'm a superior officer, whether you accept that or not. Even with the captain here, you can't do anything. Everyone knows you were a favorite of the Emperor, but you're not now. Everyone knows you screwed up the exploitation of the Alley's world system. That's why the Emperor fired you and sent you on this failure of a mission on this piece of crap old ship.' Butcher looked at Stone. Yes, Anson Stone. What will you do if Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya continues to personally insult you? Sir, I don't care if he insults me all day long, but if he insults Lieutenant Vedrian or my friend Tim Dollish, I will file a formal complaint of abuse. Missy Maya laughed. You may be a rich kid, but my family isn't without resources or influence. No one would endorse such a complaint. Butcher looked at Stone. He is correct in that his family does have influence. I believe his great-grandfather is still an advisor at the Emperor's court. He's been there through the last Emperor, and this one too, right? Missy Maya nodded, as if he were somehow more powerful for the recognition of his great-grandfather's accomplishments. However, the lieutenant is wrong in one regard. I would endorse Ensign Stone's formal complaint. Missy Maya said, That is your prerogative. But just a warning, Captain. An attack on me will be seen as an attack on all of my family. I can guarantee it will be the end of your career. Butcher laughed. Of course it will. My career has been on the skids for years. Besides, what makes you think we're going to live through this voyage? Look around you, Lieutenant. We're stuck in the middle of so far away from nowhere that we don't even know what direction to go. Instead of trying to work together to find a way to get home, you're working towards segregation and division. Standing, Butcher's voice lost his laughing tone. You may never see another human face except those around you for the rest of your life, and your first thought is to piss them off. He walked around the table behind Missy Maya. I don't give a fart in a whirlwind about your family, or his, he jabbed a finger at Stone, or even his, jabbing a finger at Dollish. I care about what they can do to help us survive. And one more thing. Spacer Dollish, your middle name is Oliphant? What the hell is that all about? Chapter 16 Dollish grunted but kept his face toward his bowl. Butcher said, Never mind, Tim. He raised his voice so that everyone who was struggling to eavesdrop could actually hear without the struggle. This is an all-ranks dining facility. As of now, there are no reserved tables or segregated seating. Missy Maya stood. Sir, then I will be taking my meals in my cabin. I refuse to eat with riffraff. Butcher nodded. That's your prerogative, Lieutenant. However, you will come here to collect your meals. No one will deliver food to you. But— But nothing. You're not an invalid, nor too busy to fetch your own meals. Missy Maya turned to go, but Butcher stopped him. One more thing. Officer, enlisted, and civilian will carry their own dishes to the cleaning stations. The lieutenant, followed by one of his boyfriends, grabbed their dishes. They turned to look at the other officer with them. He shook his head and nodded at the captain. The two men threw their dishes at the cleaning station with bad grace, missing the cans. Dollish raised a tentative hand. Sir? Butcher asked. What, Oliphant? Dollish looked at Stone. Thanks for that, boss. Anyway, what about aliens? We were ordered not to prepare anything for the vent runners or the Draskos. They're as much a part of this crew as humans. They're equal partners. In fact, someone see if you can get some booster seats in here for our piglet friends. There was a smattering of applause that grew louder as Missy Maya and his friend left the dining hall. A couple of engineers spoke into their data ports, and before long the main hatches were pushed back and a dozen vent runners entered the hall, crowding around various tables to be with their human friends. Although the humans couldn't talk to the piglets, the little aliens didn't have any trouble hearing and understanding their human counterparts. The whole situation reminded Stone again that it was beyond time to bring up the suggestion of giving data ports to the piglets. One-way communication was frustrating, time-consuming, and foolish. The piglets and Draskos may be alien species, but they were clearly allies. 
The piglets flooding the dining facility were vent runners, recognizable by the tiny vests they wore, filled with a variety of tools. Shorty and Sissy walked across the chow hall, and to his surprise were applauded and patted on the back by a variety of humans glad to have them back in their company. The pair climbed into the chairs vacated by Missy Maya and his companion, putting their shoulder bags on the seat to boost them up to table height. The piglets were followed into the chow hall by eight Draskos. Jay and Peavy headed for Stone's table, while their daughters raced straight for the Marines and began roughhousing until Escamilla yelled at her Marines to settle down. She did not yell at the Draskos. Jay stopped at the table, raised herself up to her full height, and wonked loudly, "'I hate this room, Mama! The bad aliens killed some of us here!' Peavy lay down and buried her head under her wings. "'It makes me sad!' Butcher asked, "'What's with Jay and Peavy?' Stone didn't want to publicly announce that he was able to talk to the Draskos. As governor, their communications were an easy-to-keep secret. It proved to be useful on more than one occasion when someone spoke freely in front of Jay or Peavy, not suspecting they could repeat their words back to him. He was saved from responding by Dollish, when the spacer said, "'Captain, they don't like this bay. They were with us when we fought the Hyrocanians in here.' Missy Maya's remaining companion sputtered, "'You were part of the assault team?' I didn't know that. Then you fought them hand-to-hand -hand in this very room. Dollish shrugged. It wasn't so much hand-to-hand -hand as it was clubs and knives, sir. Marines and Navy, officer and enlisted, human and Drasco, sir. Piglets and civilians, too. Jay and Peavy tried to rescue some other Draskos the Hyrocanians were planning to eat alive. The other Draskos died. Jay and Peavy get sad when they think about it. The man asked, How do you know they're sad? They look angry to me. Dollish said, they're my friends, sir. I just know them. Stone patted his pockets. If I had some candy, I might give them a piece. Shorty pulled out a small bar of Allie's World solidified tree sap and tossed it to Stone. Thank you. How did you— Dollish said, I managed to bring along some of my replicator recipes from back on Allie's World. It's pretty easy to make. Here, boss. He pulled a knife from a pocket and cut the bar in half. Sissy spoke. The humans at the table could see she was speaking, but no sound escaped her mouth. Peavy said, "'Mama, Sissy wants to know if it's okay if she goes and gets something for her and Shorty to eat. It's okay, isn't it?' Both Peavy and Jay stared at him with anticipation. Stone was trying to figure out how to phrase the answer, when Dollish said, "'You might as well fess up, boss.' Butcher asked, "'What's going on, Ensign Stone? Why does everyone at this table know something is happening besides me?' Stone sighed. He didn't see any way around it. Captain Butcher, the truth is, I can communicate with the Draskos, not just talk to them, but converse with them. Dollish laughed. It's about time you admitted that. Some of us have known it for a long time. Butcher looked shocked. Well, I didn't know it. Dollish said, I'm sorry, sir. I assumed that Governor Stone would say something if he thought you should know. Butcher said, well, as Ensign Stone, not Governor, he should have spoken up before now. What other secrets are you not telling me? Stone said, Sir, I can't talk to the piglets, but the Draskos can, and they interpret for me. Yes, sissy, you can get anything from the food line you want. Even Dollish looked surprised, but the looks of amazement changed when everyone saw the look of amusement on the piglets' faces. They'd obviously been enjoying the deception. Stone said, Sir, a while back it was suggested that we give data ports to the piglets for communications. They can type onto a keyboard, and voice recognition software can broadcast their messages to us. It should speed up a lot of things all across the ship. Butcher nodded. It sounds like a good idea, except for the fact that officially they're still a non-aligned alien species. Giving them tech would violate Navy regulations. I'll take it under advisement, but until then, we'll get by as is. Stone decided it was best to change the subject before Butcher realized he'd been subject to J and PB presence in more than one secret conversation. Sir, any news on the computer finding star matches? Butcher shook his head, but glared at Stone. We're not done talking about your secret communications, Ensign Stone. The computer has located our position, but we don't have any charted navigation jump points close enough to even do our grandchildren any good. The computer has found a couple of systems a few months away. They may or may not have usable jump points. We won't know until we go there to investigate. Even if we find navigation points, we may not know where they'll take us or how long to stay in hyperspace. Stone asked, any luck on identifying the system that rejected us? 
Butcher nodded. We've located it about three months' travel from here. He tapped open his data port and called up a display of the system. The view wasn't much, as they only had one frame of high-speed video before they were repulsed back into hyperspace. Matching our teleoptics with the video picture gives us a pretty good view of that system. In the middle of the picture was a planet behind the Repulsar mine. Four rocky, undersized moons surrounded the blue and green planet. The picture was too indistinct to see any signs of civilization, although everyone agreed it had to be occupied by a technological society. Stone said, Well, sir, we know there are jump points in that system. Butcher agreed, That is true. However, the jump point we used is protected by some kind of weapon that throws us into hyperspace at random. Even if we spend three months driving through normal space and sneak into this system without a hyperspace wake, we still can't use the navigation point. Accessing the nav point may get us thrown back into hyperspace in a worse mess than we are now. Sir, what could be worse? We don't have a way to get home. Butcher shook his head. We can't go home anyway. There is a mission to finish first, and... What now? Jay was dancing from foot to foot in excited anticipation. Mama! 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 What is it, Jay? Jay blurted, Shorty says he knows that system, and he thinks he can get the people there to let us use a... a... he called it a tunnel or a long hole thing. Mama, is that right? I don't know. Chapter 17 Stone stepped out of his shower gazebo, draping a robe around him. His private garden had turned into an after-hours park. In the past three months, the piglets had manicured the entire hydroponics deck to perfection. Not even a blade of grass was out of place. The vegetable gardens were producing foodstuffs at a prodigious rate. A grove of trees had been found in a back corner, and when cleared, they began producing bushels of fruit. The fruit looked weird, but tasted good, except the yellow ones that tasted like Brussels sprouts. The piglets still lived in their little village on the far side of the bay. They were now working on cleaning another unused hydroponics bay a few decks down. There were never more than a few piglets around during the day, but humans by the dozen used the bay for recreation, thus requiring his using a robe between his new shower gazebo and the old tool shed he used as a bedroom. He sighed. Sitting on a little bench, under what looked remarkably like a blue spruce fern, were First Lieutenant Hammermill and Second Lieutenant Escamilla. They were holding hands, neither looking embarrassed at being caught engaging in a public display of affection. Neither was in uniform, unless someone counted Hammermill's overly garish flowered shirt as a uniform of some kind. Stone raised a questioning eyebrow. Hammermill laughed and held their clasped hands in the air as if in triumph. "'Come on, Stone!' You're the last one to question a little PDA. After a couple of years of avoiding each other, you and Allie finally gave up fighting it and became a couple. Escamilla shook her head. Don't think I've quit fighting you, Hammer. A little hand-holding is as far as you are going to get today. Hammermill smiled. I'm glad you think so. Still, I didn't file an official statement of relationship intent for nothing. Stone asked, An official statement of what? Hammermill answered, An official statement of relationship intent. You know, when you tell your commander that you intend to pursue a relationship with someone in the same command? Stone shook his head. No, I didn't know. I've never heard of such a thing. Hammer, why didn't you tell me? Hammermill shrugged. I thought you knew. Lieutenant Vedrian filed her paperwork back on the period on Titus. It keeps you from getting into trouble when dating someone in your command. I thought that was frowned upon no matter what the circumstances. Escamilla said, It takes two forms, one from each party involved. If you didn't file reciprocal documents, Allie couldn't pursue you. Hammermill laughed. Lots of good that did you. What Allie wants, Allie gets. Stone said, But we wasted so much time. Hammermill shook his head. Allie didn't think so. It doesn't look like a waste to me. You two have been a couple for about four years now, right? Stone snorted. Not a chance. We danced around each other for the first couple of years. Now you tell me we could have been together from day one if I'd have filed the right forms? Hammermill laughed. You know our Lieutenant Vedrian better than that. Before she met you, she was ready to bed any swinging dick. You changed that. She didn't want to rush into anything with you. Stone said, But Hammer, I never looked on her as a... Uh... Escamilla said, A one-night stand? Stone said, Of course not. I may be young, but that doesn't mean I didn't treasure her from the first day. Just because a guy stumbles on a gold-encrusted diamond on his first day at the mines doesn't mean he can't recognize a gem when he sees it. 
Hammermill glanced at Escamilla. That's what I said. Just because a guy spends years digging for diamonds doesn't mean he's too much of an idiot to keep digging once he finds his jewel. Escamilla laughed. Okay, I get the point. But you just keep your drill out of my shaft until I say different. Hammermill laughed at her, continuing the crude analogy. You know you love me and want me. Speaking of that, Ensign Stone, may we borrow your little shower gazebo? Stone reached behind him. The windows were already set for opaque, but with a few flicks on the controls, the gazebo lighting changed from a bright daylight glare to a gentle dusk-like shadow. Extra waterfalls and fountains gushed from the walls, splashing and tinkling into poolless piles of river rock. A variety of flames leapt to life, from tiny candle flickers to twisting flares that seemed to climb the waterfalls. A gentle chime of fairy music harmonized with the water's jingle. Stone said, The door locks on the inside for privacy. You two have fun. I'll be gone in a few minutes as soon as I get dressed. I've got a meeting in engineering. A few minutes later he was dressed and on his way to engineering. He and Allie were a couple, and had been for quite some time. Their relationship had progressed nicely once she'd gotten back from her trip to Lazzaroni Station, where they'd repaired her broken back and given her a new eye. He'd not filed any forms, and she'd not asked him to. He'd just pressed her to grow their relationship into more, not more of this or more of that, just more. He had received a message from Grandpa and his father, telling him to avoid any relationship with a subordinate. He'd kept it, along with the message from his grandmother and mom, telling him to go after her if he truly wanted her. Somewhere in his personal assistant, he had the recording of a meeting with Major Numos, Allie's direct supervisor, where he'd asked the Major's opinion. The Major said that if he knew what he was getting himself into, that he should follow through. He remembered Numos saying that a man can't swim in ankle-deep water. He was fuming. Allie, or someone, should have told him there was a form he could have filled out that would have cut through all of the crap. Just because he'd been in Allie's chain of command didn't mean he loved her any less— there wasn't anything he could do that she couldn't stop him from doing. He almost grinned. She could stop him with extreme violence any time she felt harassed or pressured. He didn't grin. He was mad at her and wanted to stay that way for a while. Hey, Governor. Oh, hello, Corporal Tuttle. You've got to stop calling me that. I'm just an ensign now. She fell into step with him as he continued toward engineering. You will never be a just anything, sir. You were never just a freighter's kid. You were never just a regular midshipman. You were never just a governor. Major Numos wouldn't have volunteered his company for this snafu assignment if you hadn't volunteered to go. Don't you think he's following you, whether you're a civilian, a governor, or an ensign? Stone shrugged. How do I know? Maybe Major Numos knows something I don't. Tuttle laughed. The Major knows a lot of things both of us don't. That's why he is a Major and we ain't. What are you referring to? A while back he called me a trouble magnet. She slapped Stone on the back. Stone had muscled up quite a bit, and his thicker skin protected him, but her biomechanical hands still stung. He barely managed to keep his feet. Tuttle said, Well, he's right there. I'd say that about half of his command is good at finding trouble. The thing is, Ensign Stone, this command can find the trouble, but we're also good at taking care of what we find. That's why we're here, right? That's correct, Corporal. I find the trouble, and you get me out of it. Speaking of trouble, you're headed to engineering, right? Right, Barb, how'd you know? They were marching in step along the corridor, leading to engineering, but he could have branched off anywhere. I saw PB and Shorty heading that way a few minutes ago. I'm not just some grunt trigger-puller, you know. I is a corporal. Stone laughed. That you are. You headed that way? No, sir. I had a date a while ago and thought I'd head off to the gym some of the Marines built on level 29. Had a date? Did you get stood up? Stone couldn't imagine anyone standing up, Tuttle but the needs of getting the ship ready to reach the system ahead of them and ready to jump home had interrupted more than one of his dates with Allie. Tuttle shook her head. Nope, date went fine, just over is all. Poor fellow got confused. He thought that just because he got a little taste of the barb, it meant we were soulmates. Stone said, sorry it didn't work out. Tuttle gave a little shudder. Getting exclusive now doesn't sound reasonable to me. I mean, if we aren't ever going to get home again, what does it matter? Um... Are we going to get home again, sir? Of course we are. He reached out, grabbed her arm, and pulled her to a stop beside him. He was surprised that her bicep was as taut as steel cables. Her natural muscles were no weaker than the metal under the skin on her biomechanical hand. Why would you ask that? Well, we've been stuck out here in normal space for months. Some of the people aboard are getting jumpy, because we can't, you know, jump. 
We have to move through normal space to reach a navigation point where we can jump. Trust me, Barb, we are going to get home again. He hoped he hadn't just lied to a friend. Chapter 18 Stone was back on the bridge, sitting next to Dr. Wisniewski, but instead of Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya on the other side of him, Shorty had claimed that seat. The little piglet had stopped wearing his handmade straw hat, but his sunglasses still reflected the overhead lights. Jay lay behind them both, having won a game of dodgeball against PB and the daughters, to earn the spot as bridge interpreter. They all wanted to be here, all except Elle and Anne, who were more than happy to suit up with the Marines, but there wasn't room for more than one Drasco at a time on the bridge. Glancing around, Stone didn't see Missy Maya anywhere. He leaned across the table and spoke quietly to Major Numos. Sir, we've passed through this system's Oort cloud, the heliosphere, and their Kuiper belt. We're getting ready to enter communications range for the solar system with the Repulsar technology. Shouldn't the third watch commander be here? Numos said, This morning the lieutenant senior grade made a formal complaint to Captain Butcher. He claimed aliens shouldn't be given access to a UEN bridge. The UEN was for humans only. The Major looked pointedly at Shorty and Jay. Stone shook his head. UEN bridge? This tangled equipment mess is half human, half Irocanian, and half who knows what. For all I know, Shorty understands this technology better than I do. I hope he understands it better than I do, Numos added. Missy Maya made his complaint formal, insisting it be on the record. The captain relieved him of bridge duty, putting him in charge of waste disposal. Sounds like a good place for him. Even so, Butcher should have replaced him, and the commander of Third Watch should be here. Numa smiled. He is here. Or rather, I'm here. Captain Butcher asked me to take over as Third Watch commander. Stone gaped in surprise. A Marine? In charge of Navy personnel on a Navy ship? Numos nodded. Well, you just pointed out that this isn't your traditional ship, right? Besides, we all know that Third Watch is really just a bookmark with the watch commander trying not to let anything happen until the captain or the XO can get back to the bridge. That's crap. No one would ever accuse you of being a bookmark. I didn't say I was. I said that's what Missy Mile was. I'm a Marine. The gods help any aliens who attack my ship during my watch. Stone pointed at the planet on the monitor. The glowing orb was too far away for close-up visuals, but their optics were able to pick up the planet clearly. They still couldn't see any signs of civilization, but all four of the rocky moons were bristling with energy signatures, huge factories, and spaceports. It almost looks like the aliens here have abandoned the planet in favor of their moons. Numa said, It looks that way. Let's not make any plans until we find out for sure. You should know by now that all plans end just as soon as someone gets punched in the nose. Stone leaned in closer, although he couldn't see anything new on the monitor. That makes sense, Major. I'd just rather be the puncher than the punchee. Numas stretched back in his chair. I'm a Marine. You get no argument from me. Wizard patted Emmons on the hand, ending his conversation with her. Obviously, having listened to Stone and Numos, he said, Cat and I agree that these people are more xenophobic than warlike. We don't know the technology behind their repulsar beams, but exploding mines would be much easier to build. They could have killed us. Instead, they just sent us away. Emmons nodded enthusiastically. Jay laid her head in Stone's lap. Shorty says he wouldn't be too sure about these people not being dangerous. Stone relayed the message to everyone at the table. He asked Shorty, You said you know these people. How well do you know them? Jay interpreting, Shorty reported, I don't know the ones in charge. Too much time has passed, and too much has happened to me and to them to be sure of anything. We will see. I am Privet, but the people in charge may not recognize that any more. Jay looked at Stone as he relayed the message. Mama, what is a Privet? Stone replied, I don't know. Did you ask Shorty? Jay said, I did ask, and he used a lot of words that I don't know. He said it may be good, and it may be bad. They were joined by Captain Butcher. Everything still good with our piglet friend? Numa said, Yes, sir. Nothing we haven't known from earlier conversations with Shorty, except he told us he is a privet. That didn't translate through Jay. Privet may be what they call themselves, since I doubt they refer to themselves as piglets. Stone said, Captain, as we've reported through Jay, every time we ask Shorty or any other piglet what they call themselves, their response is always, The people. Stone patted Shorty on the shoulder with a friendly, gentle tap. Smiling at the piglet, he said, Privet may mean that he is a long-lost monarch, 
or a leper of some untouchable caste. Jay said, Shorty said that neither is correct, but anyone touching him as you have would have lost their hand. Stone yanked his hand back. Tell him I meant no offense. He repeated what Jay had said to his human companions. Butcher shook his head. That doesn't tell us anything. You could lose your hand touching a monarch or someone from an untouchable caste. Shorty slipped the sunglasses down his stubby piglet nose and looked over the top at Stone. His eyes were clear brown, with a hint of humor around the edges. Jay laughed. Shorty says that he forgives you for touching him. He says he will forgive you one touch for every piglet life you saved from the Hyrocanians. Stone laughed. Wait! Shorty's been around me for a couple of years. I can't remember how many times I've touched him. Or a sissy, for that matter. Not to mention we never got a good count on the piglets we saved from the Hyrocanians. Jay looked from Shorty back to Stone. He says not to worry. He's keeping count and will let you know when you've reached your limit. Everyone laughed in sympathy at Stone as he relayed the information. Numos added, That warning should be a comfort as long as you get a decent countdown. Jay added, He says that you can touch Sissy all you want. He says that since he owns her as a slave, he wants to know if you want her for your own. A stunned silence settled around the table as Stone relayed the information. Jay broke the silence. What is a slave, Mama? It's a person who is owned by another person. It's something that humans have worked to erase from our societies for centuries, but it still exists on a few worlds. Emmons nodded. As a doctor studying behavior, I can say that it exists more often than most humans want to know about. Some world governments put people into slavery over debt, some for crimes. Some can earn their way to freedom, some are given specific terms to serve, and some die as slaves. The slave must do what they are told, when they are told, and can be sent to their deaths at their owner's command. Jay nodded and wonked in understanding. Sissy is like your enlisted Navy and Marines. Butcher sputtered, Of course not. Our military are all volunteers. Jay asked, But they must do what they are told, when they are told, and can be sent to their deaths at your command, correct? What happens if they want to leave or say no? Butcher said, They can be— His voice faded away. Numos finished, Court-martial and a death penalty in time of war. Stone said, She's got us, Captain. I don't know how to explain the difference. Jay said, not me. I'm happy to be Mama's slave. It's Shorty asking the question. Stone asked, Did Shorty say if Sissy asked to be his slave? Jay interpreted, I took her by force and claimed her as my slave. Shorty put an end to the conversation by tapping the monitor on the table with one of his three opposing fingers. I know this place, and I know these people. Contact them, and I will speak with them. His tapping fingers enlarged the picture. Everyone could see a trio of massive warships heading toward them. The ships were growing larger with each passing second, their speed in normal space much faster than Rusty Hinges could manage. If pursuit was the warship's goal, Rusty Hinges couldn't run fast enough. If a confrontation was the warship's goal, it didn't look like Rusty Hinges had what it took against three ships that were each twice their size. If a genial greeting was the plan, the inhabitants wouldn't have sent warships. Butcher sprinted back to his seat and said, "'Exo, sound red alert!' The ship was already at general quarters for the solar system insertion, but the alert would wake up any drowsy personnel. "'Tactical, shields up! Navigation, is there a jump point near?' "'Exo, Captain. Aye, aye, sir. Red alert!' "'Tactical, sir. Aye, aye. Shields up! Nav, Captain. No, sir. We've picked up a few signatures, but we can't reach them before those ships reach us.' Butcher said, "'Helm, full stop!' "'Helm, Captain. Aye, aye, sir. Full stop now!' Butcher tapped a finger once on his forehead. Comms, no message, but keep all channels open for incoming. He glanced over at the table. Dr. Emmons, in your opinion, if these aliens are severely xenophobic, what would be their reaction to seeing a human? Emmons said, It could be anything from shoot first to run away. We don't know enough to even guess, Captain. Butcher nodded. I don't think running away is their plan. He pointed at the main monitor, displaying three warships bearing down on them. Do you think they will— Jay interrupted him. Shorty says they will try to chase you out of the system. He isn't familiar with their Repulsar technology, but he thinks they may have their ships built with the same thing. Showing yourself is not a good idea. Butcher said, Comms, keep visual off until further notice. He looked at Stone. Can we trust Shorty? Stone nodded. He hasn't cut my hand off yet, Captain. 
He's had more than one opportunity to do so over the past couple of years. Maybe he can be our front man. Jay said, Shorty has called for Sissy to come in. She's been waiting in the corridor. He says that showing his face may be good, or it may be prejudicial. What does prejudicial mean, Mama? Stone answered, Bad. Very bad. Jay said, Play music to them. Shorty tossed a memory stick to the captain. It sailed across the bridge. Butcher caught it, shoved it into a slot in his command chair, and hit play. Comms, broadcast this and allow us all to listen in. A tinkling of instrumental music filled the air. There wasn't any rhythm or beat to the sounds, but the jingling sounded like wind blowing through well-crafted wind chimes. Stone thought it was almost like the fairy music he'd piped into his shower gazebo, restful, calming, and soft. Shorty stood when Sissy entered. He took her by the hand, and the two piglets went to stand in front of the video pickup by the main monitor. Both looked at each other, pulled their sunglasses off, looked deeply into each other's eyes, and nodded in agreement. Either they were quiet, or Jay didn't interpret their speech. "'Nav, Captain, the three warships have halted outside of weapons range.' Butcher snorted. "'Nav, do you mean out of our weapons range, or out of theirs?' Nav laughed. "'Yes, sir. I mean ours. Sorry, Captain.' Jay said, They say go away. They say go away, please. Butcher said, Tell them we can't without getting access to one of their jump points. Will they allow us to use a navigation point? Jay said, They say go away or they will make us go away. They are sorry, but it won't be pleasant if they have to make us go away. Chapter 19 Stone said, Captain, can we try running for a nav point? Butcher shook his head. Without proper calculations, jumping into a random navigation point is just as dangerous as jumping out of hyperspace without a destination in the equation. Calculations will take more time than those warships will give us. Numos asked, Jay, ask Shorty if he knows what weapons those ships have. Jay said, The last time Shorty was here, they didn't have ships like these. They only had freighters and exploration craft. Nothing that massive. The XO said, Captain, if we back out of this system, we'd have to backtrack months to get to another system that may or may not have usable jump points. Butcher said, I'd rather not plan on months that could turn into years or generations if we can work something out. Maybe we can convince them that we aren't a threat. Shorty said through Jay, That might not be possible, since we are in a Hyrocanian ship. They're more than familiar with the Hyrocanians. Butcher said, Are you willing to try talking to them for us? Shorty said, That is why I've asked Sissy to join me. A female, even a slave, will show them we are not on a mission that is a danger to them. Butcher said, Comms, on Shorty's command. Shorty said, Show a video of just Sissy and me. No one else, certainly not Jay. No sound, please. In three heartbeats, a return video flashed on every bridge monitor. A lanky, red-in-the-face piglet glared hatred at Shorty and Sissy. Suddenly, Spittle hit the video pickup. Jay interpreted, and Stone repeated for the humans, Privet, how dare you! A second voice said, Enhance your calm, Captain, my friend. Another piglet stood at the angry piglet's shoulder, a light hand on the piglet's shoulder. The first voice replied, But you don't understand what he did, priest. The priest said, I understand that this privet stole from you and threw your home farms into turmoil. Stone made the connection that privet was a piglet word for a criminal or pirate. He liked pirate better and began correcting Jay's translation. The piglet captain replied, My elder great father lost his lands and now works as a lowly field hand for his cousin. This pirate did that, and he flaunts his piracy even now. Calm, Captain. You will do more damage to your eternal heart by this anger than the pirate ever did by his theft, kidnapping, rape, and plunder. Stone couldn't help but smile as he repeated the conversation through Jay. Jay's voice quivered at the word rape, as she'd experienced it firsthand. It wasn't Jay's response that amused him, but Shorty's shrug. The way he rolled his eyes said wonders about what he thought of the charges. Stone patted Jay on the head and told her it was going to be okay. He wondered if things were really going to be okay. Apparently, letting Shorty speak for them was making things worse. Tactical, Captain. One of the warship's weapons just went hot. They... No, scratch that, sir. They're cold now. What the... Weapon's hot, sir. We've been targeted. No, cold again. 
The piglet captain's face lost some of its redness. From the looks of it, he dissipated his anger by sheer willpower. Pirate, you should have stayed gone. There are those who have not forgiven you. Your piracy against other races was atrocious. Your actions brought the eaters into our system to plunder and kill us worse than you ever could. That could be forgiven, but your kidnapping and enslavement of Sissy is unforgivable by my family and by hers. You must leave with your eater friends now, or we will be forced to take action. Now. Sissy said, I will say two things, Char Tim Luz. Stone was surprised that she knew the man, but her tone made it obvious they'd met more than once. He was also surprised that she spoke. She rarely spoke, unless spoken to by Shorty or Stone. He realized that was probably due to her status as a slave. Her tone now was anything but submissive. She said, The ones running this ship are not eaters. These creatures are not my enemies, nor yours. They are from a great warrior race, who has beaten the real enemy and wrested this ship from them. They hunt them, even now, in their own ship. It's only by their hands that I and many more piglets are alive. Shartim Luz dipped his head in acknowledgment. You wouldn't lie to me, sissy. You never did when we were children, and I doubt you would now, if you could help yourself. How do I know you aren't under the eater's control? Skipping over to the table, sissy grabbed Stone by the arm and tugged him into video pickup range. You've seen eaters. They are not as ugly as this creature, but— With strength Stone didn't know she had, she spun him in a slow circle, mainly by grabbing his butt because she couldn't reach much higher. You can easily see this creature only has two arms, not four. Look, his ears, if that is what you call those strange flaps, are not hinged. Show them your teeth, boss. Stone obeyed her command, happy that she was too short to reach into his mouth and hold it open for inspection. He peeled his lips back, giving Char Tim Luz a clear view, showing he only had two sets of teeth, not the four sets the Hyrocanians sported. Sissy said, You may be angry with Shorty, but these humans have rescued not only us, but hundreds of our fellow piglets. Hundreds, Char Tim Luz. Hundreds that are on this very ship you wish to send back into deep space to be lost again in the stars. Shame on you. I know that is not the way your family priest taught you to behave. Jay managed to get Sissy's emotional content translated to stone, but he didn't do as well translating Jay's interpretation into Empire Standard. Shartim Luz looked at the priest at his shoulder. The priest piglet nodded back. He sighed and waved a hand. Navigation, Captain. Two of the warships are peeling off. They appear to be heading back to the nearest moon base. Shartim Luz said over his shoulder, Get me a communication line to Bayes. Have them hook me into the Thrizzlet farmstead on home. He glared back at Shorty. Whatever the outcome, with Sissy's elder great-father, Pirate, I will see you arrested and in your family's own humiliation stocks. Piracy of other races is one thing, but the kidnapping and rape of Sissy is unforgivable. Nor will I have truck with any who protect him. The last was addressed pointedly to Stone. Sissy said, I said I had two things to say. I have said one. You will forgive me if I point out that you are judging another without hearing all the facts. You have already found Shorty guilty and passed sentence, yet you've never given him leave to explain. You condemn these humans without learning their heart or seeing their actions. Is this our way now? Have we so lost the path to harmony in my absence? Shorty shrugged and looked up at Stone. I ain't got nothing to say, boss. Turn me over to them. I can take the humiliation stocks, if that is what it takes to get you home again. Stone was about to say something when Butcher spoke up. Shorty, we don't give up our own without a fight. Shorty said, Thank you, Captain. Sissy interrupted him. Shut your mouth, Shorty. You too, Shartim Luz. I wasn't kidnapped. I was— She was interrupted by a screech as the monitor split, showing two pictures— the piglet captain was on one side, and the other showed a trio of piglets. Sissy, you're alive! It has been so long! Sissy sighed at the interruption, but was obviously pleased to see the group. Mother, I am more than pleased to see you well. Great mother, you are looking blessed. 
Elder Great Father, I am sorry to see your body hasn't been fed to the compost pile. The Elder Great Father snorted in a typical earth pig like manner, impudent as always, but everyone could tell he was happy to see her. Sissy said, I was just pirate, the Elder Great Father shouted, pointing at Shorty. Someone arrest that piglet. He kidnapped my younger great daughter and raped our land. Stone put a hand on Shorty's shoulder. You really are a popular fellow. Shorty pointed at Stone's hand. That's one more time, boss. I'm still keeping count. He smiled in a bizarre imitation of a human grin. Stone said, Wait, you raped their land? Shorty shrugged. That was the only thing I could think of as a distraction when I kidnapped Sissy. The elder great father shouted, Even after all these years, that land still doesn't produce fruit. He appeared to harumph exactly like a human politician. Well, not like it used to, anyway. Sissy shouted, Everyone shut up! Strangely, everyone became silent. I have something to say, and you will listen. Shorty did not kidnap me. I paid him to help me get away. He rescued me from you. That land he raped was mine. You gave it for me to garden on my thirtieth birthday, when I became a young girl. Shorty said, you don't... He let his words fade away under Sissy's glare. She continued, Elder Great Father, you betrothed me to Shar Tim Luz's Elder Great Father, a man hundreds of years older than I am, a piglet too old to grant me children, all in exchange for a few more fields of garden. Shar Tim Luz sputtered, Elder Great Father, I was told you'd been betrothed to me. Sissy laughed. That sounds like a face-saving lie. Our betrothal wasn't ever likely. You always said you wanted to go into space, as I see you have. You weren't a farmer, a gardener, not even a rat rancher. You had no land to trade for my hand. As the youngest great-daughter in the family, such a trade for land was the best my elder great-father could hope for. I expected nothing less, but never to marry such a man. Such a marriage would take away my womanhood. She looked up at Stone. I don't know your human laws, but the damaged land was mine to keep or to give. I gave it to Shorty in exchange for rescuing me from a marriage to an old pig. He raped the land for me and left it fallow, for me. Stone said, Because he loves you, right? That's what he means when he made you a slave. Sissy looked shocked. Shorty sputtered and shook his head. No, boss, I'm even older than the old piglet she'd been betrothed to. I may be a pirate, but I'm not a pervert to take a child to my bed. Not that it mattered. The Eaters captured my ship and crew, along with every piglet they could get their slimy hands on. I'm afraid I led Sissy from the compost pile into the manure. Sissy said, I asked to be his slave. That meant that any male who wanted to have sex with me would have to ask Shorty for permission. A female alone— without even a greedy elder great-father to protect her, would be fair game for any male who asks. With Shorty's protection, I could choose my mates as I wish. Sissy's mother spoke up. Daughter, have you returned to us with heirs? The eaters in the Space Corps have taken more of our young men than we can afford to spare. Sissy nodded. Stone was surprised when she said, I have a dozen children of my own with me, counting my own younger great-children. We lost a dozen more to the eaters before this human set us free. A dozen more have stayed with humans on one of their homes. The elder great-mother spoke. Praise the harmony. You've come home with family to help us garden the land, to bless and keep it. Sissy shook her head, her voice cold and hard. Not freaking likely. I'm here with the humans to hunt down and kill as many of the eater SOBs as I can kill. Chapter 20 Stone looked around the farmstead. He didn't know what to expect. This one didn't look any different than Sissy's family's farmstead had. There were small buildings, too short for humans and too tiny for Drascos, barns, sheds, well-manicured fields, and orchards as far as the eye could see. What made this different was that every piglet working wore colored sashes, indicating their rank in the piglet space corps. Ninety percent of the piglets on Rusty Hinges refused to do more than visit their family's farmstead. Most of the piglets had heard only the rumors about home, their species' birthplace, 
They were born into the breeding pens for Hyrocanian consumption. Rusty Hinges was their home, and had been their whole lives. A few elders who did remember gratefully embraced their families and kissed the ploughed fields of their home farmsteads. Some few, like Sissy, refused to leave the ship. She even refused to allow Shorty to vacate her slavehood. Shorty, by necessity, was with Emily and Stone at the Piglet's Space Corps headquarters. Being an interpreter to a translator was numbingly boring. He managed to parrot everything to Butcher and Numos that Emily repeated to him. It didn't take much for Stone to tell she was bored. I mean, really, Mama. Like, why did I try so hard at that soccer game, you know? Like, if I knew this was going to be such a snooze-fest, I'd have blown that last goal, right? Like, you know what I mean? Stone nodded. He didn't want to say so, but he was just as bored. The negotiations were going so slowly, it was almost like Butcher and the Space Corps commander didn't really want to get to the point. He was here under orders to assist in translating, not to help in the negotiation. The piglet commander said, This may not be the best time to entertain guests. The Ander Nut Harvest won't be with us for another three months. Maybe you should come back then. Butcher said, Sir, let's take a break for a few moments, and I'll consider going away and coming back. Shorty rolled his eyes to the sky. He whispered to Emily. She giggled. Shorty is so funny. Stone said, What did he say? Emily said, Like, I'm not supposed to tell. It's a secret, you know. Stone said, Emily J. Drasco Stone, you tell me right now. Okay, okay, okay. You don't have to get your tail in a knot. He said we should tell the piglet commander that his trouser fly is undone. Stone shook his head. He isn't wearing any trousers. The older piglet got up from the table and wandered into a nearby garden to help pull a few weeds. His bare fanny wiggled in the hot noonday sun. Emily rolled her eyes. Well, yeah, that's what makes it funny. Wizzer and Emmons were already in the garden, enjoying the sun rather than working. At least Wizzer seemed to be doing little to nothing. Emmons was studying the piglets, looking for behavioral patterns. She stood, wiped the dirt from her bottom, and strolled back to the human conference. Wizzer leaned back against a fence post and appeared to sleep. Stone said, We should do something to get the ball rolling. We seem to be stuck at an impasse. All we want is to get access to the jump point that gets us home. Butcher shook his head, having overheard. Ensign Stone, we have two options here. One is we go home with our tails between our legs, failing our mission. But it isn't a failure, sir. We've clearly determined that the Hyrocanians found Allie's world by accident, and with the piglets' new repulsar technology, they can't duplicate it. Numa said, That was only part of our assignment, Ensign Stone. He leaned against a fence rail, propping one foot on it, looking for all the world like anything but a marine. Butcher nodded as he walked over to a table and gulped down a cold glass of some fruit juice concoction the piglets set up as refreshments. He nibbled on a small, cookie-like confection. I think these folks could use a good infusion of coffee and chocolate. The captain looked at Stone. Sure, we could go home, but is that the best course of action? Shorty answered through Emily. It wouldn't be my choice, Captain. Look, boss, we've got an opportunity here to get a little payback. Numa said, I'm not thinking revenge but we may be able to strike a blow against the Hyrocanians and stop this war. Butcher said, That is my thought exactly. We have a Q-ship that might get us deep into enemy territory, maybe close enough to find their homeworld, maybe close enough to disable their fleet in this region of space, maybe close enough to find some way to stop them from attacking human space altogether. We don't know, but if we go home, we'll never know. Stone nodded. Yes, sir, I got it. Forward, not back. Numo grunted. Ura. Butcher said, This old coot may be beating around the bush, but if you listen between the words, you can hear a lot. The piglets were a space-going race, but they never went far. Shorty was more explorer than pirate. He'd visited a neighboring solar system through a navigation point. Apparently, he jumped into the system just after the Hyrocanians arrived. Shorty said, In all of the confusion, there were a few pieces of odd technology laying around. I took them and scooted home. I'd already been labeled a pirate for taking Sissy, so I thought that a little extra tech might be a good thing, with unfriendly cannibals in the area. Unfortunately, I was followed home and scooped up. Butcher said, That little excursion into this system started fifty years of Hyrocanian raids. The four-armed freaks were so busy with the neighboring system, they didn't bother coming here in full force until it was too late. By then, the piglets had developed their repulsar minds. Emmons joined the conversation. 
The piglets have almost a religious belief that hurting another intelligent creature will do them more harm than they commit. Numa said, As a marine, I can understand that belief. I don't agree with it, since some creatures just need to be put down. However, I do understand it. He hadn't moved from his resting position at the fence. Emmons said, That is why the piglets developed a repulsar mine. It throws an enemy into hyperspace, but it won't kill them. Stone shook his head violently. That's bullpucky. Throwing someone into hyperspace may just be a death sentence. I should know. Someone tried to kill me that way once. These piglets did it to me again when they threw the rusty hinges back into hyperspace. Butcher said, That is true. If we hadn't quickly jumped out when we did, there is no way to know where we would have jumped out. The odds are high against us jumping into the heart of a black hole, but it could have happened, since a black hole's massive gravity well does have a huge impact on normal space. Stone said, just because someone doesn't pull the trigger themselves doesn't mean they don't kill. Emmons walked over and put a hand on his arm. I understand, Ensign Stone. It's a fine distinction, but it's one they've made. Rather than kill creatures that have captured and eaten thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of their people, they threw them so far away they might never get back, leaving them to die at the hands of space. Butcher said, they built a few spaceships with massive repulsar beams, just in case someone or something does exactly what we did find their way into the system without using a navigation point. Their ship's repulsars would have sent us into hyperspace without the benefit of any jump point at either end. Who knows where or if we could have ever gotten out again. Emily looked at Shorty and back at Stone. He, like, really wants to know what we want? Butcher said, I want them to identify which jump point the Hyrocanians were using to conduct their raids. That should lead us one step closer to their fleet. Shorty said, I know that. I can show you. Butcher said, That is step one. Step two is to get them to grant us access to that nav point. We can't move more than a nanometer without Shartim loses repulse our warship on our tail. Emily snorted in laughter. Mama, he said tail. Humans, like for sure, don't have no tails. Stone didn't bother to translate her joke. Butcher said, I don't expect them to put together a fleet to go with us. Emmon said, I can guarantee they wouldn't do that. At this point, they don't trust us, nor anyone coming into their system. Butcher agreed. Looking around the table, he picked up another confection. Looking at it, he shook his head and put it back. I'm too old to start getting fat now. Major, if I eat another cookie, you have my permission to slap me silly. Aye, aye, Tom. It'd be my pleasure. Don't take too much pleasure in it, Dash, Butcher said. What I do want is to get concession three. If we do go through after the Hyrocanians and survive, can we come back through here to head home? So far, I haven't been able to get the Space Corps commander steered toward that communication. Shorty grabbed a butcher by the wrist. With surprising strength, he jerked the man down, bending him at the waist. He grabbed the captain's ear, leaned close, whispered loud enough for Emily to translate, and said, You're being too subtle. You humans never get to the point. He let go, spun around, and faced the Space Corps commander. Listen up, you old bag of ass wind. These humans are here to fight your enemy for you. You will let them go fight. You will give them the codes to disable the repulsar mines for when or if they ever come back, and you'll allow them to pass through so they can go home. The commander stood in his field and shouted back, Pirate, if we give them the codes to the mines, they may be followed here by the eaters, as the eaters followed you all those years ago. Stone said, Hey, Shorty, ask him if they can give us a code that only works for one ship at a time. That way anyone following us without a code will get repulsed. Butcher nodded. I haven't any intention of coming back if anyone is tracking us. I won't lead Hyrocanians back into human space. Followed by the rest of his staff, Shorty and Emily, the captain walked across the field where the piglets were working. They all stood along the fence rail in various poses, waiting for a response. The commander was thinking, but not saying anything. Stone asked Emily, Anything? No, Mama. They are talking with each other to see if such a thing is possible. Stone gestured out into the middle of the small field. A group of piglets were using axes and levers, trying to work a thick tree trunk out of the ground. Numa said, I could blast that out of here in a second if I had any weapons with me. Stone said, Emily, would you help them? Oh, Mama, why should I help them? Like we aren't doing enough for them? Stone said, For me? When she didn't answer, he said, For a bar of ooze all to yourself? 
The ooze was Drasco candy infused with carbon dioxide. The Drascos fought over pieces like it was gold. Emily vaulted over the fence, tap-danced across the field, not even rustling a leaf on any plant. Squatting, glaring at the tree stump, she raised her tail over her head. Slamming her bone spike deep into the stump, she grunted and jerked. The tree stump ripped out of the ground with a screech. Shaking it loose from her tail, she threw it over the fence, where it slammed to the ground away from the crops. The commandant asked, "'What will you give me if I give you the codes to come back?' Butcher said, "'What do you want?' "'You have no lands to trade.' Stone said, "'I do. I will give you—' "'How much land do you want for the codes?' "'Where is this land?' Stone said, "'Allie's world is a short space jump from here.' Shorty said, "'You would give him land on Allie's world? Praise Harmony, I've seen that land, you old asswind. It's better than this ancient rock-strewn weed-covered patch you call a garden. It won't be easy to farm, but everyone knows you're a tough old man and can tame a wild world.' Stone laughed when he heard the translation. Throwing insults and compliments in the same sentence might be a strange negotiation tactic, but it seemed to be working, especially the religious reference to harmony that Stone doubted Shorty believed any more. "'Come on, you old gas-bag! How much land do you want? It's just a small code. I want a field half the size of this.' He threw his arms about him, pointing at the area inside the fence. It couldn't have been more than five acres. Stone shook his head. I cannot give you that much now. However, if you give us the codes first, I will trade you ten times that much land when I come back. Before you answer, I also want a repulsar mine so humans can learn to fight their enemies without killing them, and I want to keep the codes and come back to your world for trade between our peoples. Ten times! Shorty, can we trust these humans? Shorty picked up a small dirt clod and threw it at the commander. The old piglet easily danced out of the way. Shorty shouted, "'You thick-headed rat butt for brains! You can trust them more than they can trust you!' He stretched and jammed a finger into Stone's chest. "'This one owns most of a whole planet. He can grant you your ten times this field and still not even know it is missing. If he says he will give you your payment, he will do so, and gladly. You and your whole family can garden and farm a new world, stretching and growing beyond even your wildest dreams.' Deal. Shorty threw another dirt clod at the old man. You old limp dick, mother always liked me best, and I'm going to kick your wrinkled old bottom when I come back, harmony or not. He looked at Butcher. We aren't going to survive anyway, are we? I hope not, because he could always give me a big licking when we were little ones. Chapter 21 Stone tried to look pleasant, but keeping a smile on his face was difficult. Today was his first full off-duty day in months that matched up with Allie's day off. They'd planned to spend it together and alone. Now he found himself dressed in his fanciest navy uniform, replete with medals, ribbons, and braid. Even though Allie was on his arm, dressed in her finest marine uniform, drinking fruity little umbrella drinks at some wealthy piglet's farmstead was not where he'd hoped this evening would go. Allie said, Come on, Stone, lighten up. This is a first contact diplomatic event. We're making history here, and this whole shindig is done up for you. The hero of Piglotville, the savior of the stolen, and the slayer of the Hyrocanian hordes. You know that isn't how it happened. You were there. So was Dollish, Tuttle, and even Jay and Peavy. I know I was there, and that I was nearly useless because of my injuries. It wasn't me who led the charge against the Hyrocanian compound. It wasn't me either. Major Numos was in charge. You were the one who leapt onto the Hyrocanian shuttle to stop them from using it against us. Sergeant Lee carried me. You were the one who ordered the piglets' cages opened up. But Al Julie in January did it. You led the charge into the rusty hinges. Shulbit! J and Peavy led the charge. I was barely able to keep up to them and the Marines. You stopped the killing in the Hyrocanian slaughterhouse. Not by myself. Corporal Tuttle and Spacer Dollish did that, too. You figured out how to get into engineering to capture rusty hinges. No. Well, okay, I pushed a button. Big whoop. It doesn't deserve another medal. It was a tiny button. He looked down at the new ribbon hanging around his neck. This medal is bigger than the button. Allie laughed. Give the piglets a break, okay? Giving medals and awards are new to them. They've never had a planetary hero before. Yeah, I know. That isn't really what's bothering me. 
He grabbed her hand and walked around the back of a nearby shed. We had more time together, he kissed her lightly on the nose, when we were in the same chain of command. He kissed her gently on the point of her chin, and weren't supposed to, he grabbed her lower lip between his teeth in a tender nibble, be involved. Now, when we're... He held her face in his palms, lightly stroking her cheekbones with his thumbs. In different commands, and can be together, he kissed her softly on the lips, we can't seem to be together. Allie sighed, her warm breath invading his nostrils like a warming glow of wet, dark chocolate. Our duties just don't match up right now, Ensign. The harder we try, the farther apart we get pulled. I'm not going to quit trying. You better not, Stone. A long kiss interrupted their conversation. Allie finally said, I really wish things would have worked out better for our leave on Peach's rest. I really hated sleeping alone. It sure isn't what I had planned. He held her by the shoulders and looked into her face. I've been meaning to ask you about Peach's rest. You mentioned something about meeting another couple? He caught a scent of licorice and mint mixed with her chocolate. He knew that wet, dark chocolate fragrance well. It woke him at night and often kept him awake. Her love was undeniable. Mint signaled her trustworthiness better than her words ever could, so questioning her loyalty was foolish. Licorice indicated she was hiding something from him. It was subtle, just a hint of fragrance, but the odor was there. She chuckled, I thought you forgot about that. So who were they? Just a married couple on vacation. I guess for them it was a last-minute holiday, but things didn't work out like they expected. They'd hoped to meet someone there who didn't show. So we ate together and talked a lot while we sipped beers on the beach. He tapped her on the forehead with a finger. Listen up, Marine. You said you talked about me a lot, right? Allie smiled. Of course. I like talking about my boyfriend. And they had a bunch of questions about you. Me? Why would they ask about me? Come on, Stone. You've been in the news more than once. You may not be a musician or an actor or something, but you are a celebrity, and people know who you are. You'd have been swamped with requests for autographs if you'd been there. Stone shook his head, staring at her as if she was crazy. Why would anyone want my autograph? Then he remembered Ensign Tander wanting him to sign his book. It's that stupid book, right? Grabbing his hand, pulling him back around to the party, Allie squeezed his hand. And yes, it's partly that book. I even got tracked down by that squid, or, I mean, Ensign Tander, and signed his book. So did Hammer, but Numos almost tore his head off for even suggesting it. I think he's still trying to get up the nerve to ask Jay and PB, but I know he's gotten candid vids of them and attached them to his copy of the book. She waved at a group of piglets and pulled away from him. Over her shoulder, she said, I like a little kissy face as much as the next girl, but we have to mingle. Stone felt a tug at the bottom of his jacket and turned. A group of tiny piglets hovered around his feet. These were small children. No human was an expert in piglet, and he was no different than anyone else, not having a clue how old the youngsters might be. Glancing around, he could see hundreds of conversations going on between piglet and human. That was surprising, because even if a human could hear a piglet, the small aliens didn't speak Empire Standard. Shorty and Sissy could hear him and understand what he said, but piglets native to home didn't have any basis for understanding humans. Their only two-way communication was through a chain from any one of hundreds of piglets to one of eight Draskos, then from any one of eight Draskos to a single human, and from Stone, relayed to any one of hundreds of humans. He was a communications bottleneck. However, both humans and piglets seemed to find common ground around food and drinks at the picnic. Rather than wait for Wizard's crack scientific team to find a mechanical answer to the translation problem, he squatted on his heels and held out an open hand to the youngsters. Each in turn took a finger on his open hand. They touched it, smelled it, rubbed a little dirt on it, and one tiny youngster even licked it. Giggling, they passed his hand back and forth like a newfound tool. He poked a few petite piglet bellies with a delicate finger, tweaked a couple of noses, and pulled a few ears, to the delighted laughter of the youngsters. He couldn't catch any fragrance coming from them to signal their thoughts or emotions. Struggling with his improved hearing, he still couldn't catch any noise from them. Hand signals were useless, as there wasn't any frame of reference to tell whether an upright middle finger meant you're the best, or if it meant what it did to humans. A pair of human legs followed a peppermint scent. Stone shooed the youngsters away and said, Lieutenant Hammermill, how's the party going? Sedate, Ensign Stone. Not at all like the first party we attended together. Marines fought hard, played hard, and partied harder. I didn't mean to interrupt the thing you had going with those little guys. I just wanted to ask you something. Fire away, Hammer. He stood up. 
Even at six feet four inches, Hammermill still towered over him. Hammermill looked around, gesturing with his chin at dozens of groups of piglets watching the two of them. You just scored big points with the native politicians playing this little piggy goes to market with a handful of junior piglets. How did you know that was the right note to hit? Stone shook his head. I wasn't trying to score points. Didn't you ever have to go to a picnic as a child because your parents wanted you there, even if you wanted to be somewhere else? What kid hasn't? Sometimes you were bored to no end, and you couldn't play because your parents made you dress up in your fancy clothes. Hammermill tugged at his marine blouse, pulling it straight, even though there wasn't a wrinkle or a speck of dust anywhere. I grew up on cattle ranches. Most barbecues were rowdy affairs, but I went to enough of this kind of affair to know what you're talking about. Well, I was dragged to more of those than I can remember. I was just being nice to some bored youngsters. I didn't think about making points with anyone. Stone glanced around him. Can I ask you a question? Why are we still here? We've restocked everything we were short of. We have the coordinates to the navigation point we need. We even have one of those humongous repulsar mines for the crew and munitions to reverse engineer. Hammermill shrugged. Damn fino. Politics, maybe. I'm just anxious to get out of here and get back to doing what a marine is trained to do. He held up a glass of some fruity drink with a little umbrella. These kitty drinks are going to kill me before I get the opportunity to kill more Hyrocanians. Chapter 22 Stone had barely gotten to sleep when his data port began beeping with ever-increasing urgency. He let it beep as he swung his feet over the side of his bunk. It had been a long couple of shifts working with Tactical, trying to get all of their weapons systems replaced with human weapons, or at worst getting the Hyrocanian weapons online. Sometimes ripping the old ones out was more work than it was worth, but leaving them in place often meant hours of scraping rust off cogs, hinges, or panels. He'd fallen asleep with no more effort than it took to kick off his boots. Putting them back on seemed to be more of a challenge than when he'd taken them off. It had been weeks since they'd been welcomed on the piglet homeworld of home. In between picnics, barbecues, dances, and meetings with their space corps, the crew of Rusty Hinges worked to bring the ship up to Navy specs. The task wasn't easy. There were still decks that hadn't been touched except to survey and secure. Captain Butcher exhorted them to greater effort every day, determined to be as ready to meet the Hyrocanians as they could be. Stone had been asked more than once why the Navy hadn't done a complete overhaul before sending them out. He always passed along Butcher's answer when he'd asked the same question. Two reasons. Alley's World doesn't have complete overhaul facilities. Sending rusty hinges to Lazaroni Station would increase the likelihood that word might get back to the enemy that we were building a Q-ship. Further, strategic considerations always outweigh our tactical issues. High Command and the Emperor himself wants this war ended as soon as it can be. That's why we're pressing on, rather than taking the opportunity to head home. We must find the Hyrocanian homeworld, or at least find what they might be using as a base within a few jumps of human space. It all made sense until he had to pull his boots back on in the middle of a sleep cycle. The data port beeping reached a painful decibel before he finally shut it off and answered, Ensign Stone here. Sorry to disturb you, Ensign. This is Main Deck Hatch Security. We have a problem down here. Stone clicked on the video display. He saw a chief petty officer he recognized, but didn't know by name. Behind him stood a fire team of armed marines, braced at the ready. He doubted the marines were necessary to repel boarders. The native piglets were so bent on harmony that they steadfastly refused to take the last biscuit at a buffet, leaving it in hopes it would bless the next person more than it would have blessed them. Attacking an armed ship would have been out of character. It wouldn't be out of character for their own piglet pirate and a few of his mates, but those few dozen piglets had open access to the ship. Still, Numos had assigned teams of marines at every entrance on round-the-clock watch, more to give them something to do than real security. Stone could see on the faces of the marines that they hated busy work as much as he did. What watch is it, chief? Third watch, sir. Did you call third watch commander? Yes, sir. Major Numos is on his way. He said to call you to the hatch and have you bring one of your dragons. Draskos, chief. Dragons are mythical old earth creatures. These are Draskos, intelligent creatures from Alley's world. Yes, sir. Stone could hear the whatever tone in the man's voice. He decided to ignore it. I'll be down on the double. He stepped over Peavy, who was lying stretched out in front of the door to his shed. She rolled her eyes up at him without moving her head. Peavy, do you want to come with me? Jay was stretched out in the grass, asleep on her back, with her feet stuck in the air. 
None of the daughters were anywhere in sight. "'Where are we going, Mama?' she asked. "'Just down a couple of decks to the main hatch. Should I call my girls?' "'Where are T.L. and B?' "'Hammer and Rain are running night training on ship-to-ship -ship boarding. Hammer is attacking, so my girls joined his team. Rain is defending, so Emily, Ann, and Charlotte are with them. Hammer will win with my girls.' Jay rolled over as they walked past. Shaking like a wet dog, a shiver beginning at her head rolled down her neck, across her body, and ended with a little tail quiver. "'He won't win. My girls are better defenders than your daughters are at attacking.' Following along behind Stone and Peavy, she added, "'Hammer is hampered with Drasco's on his team. He has to use shuttles to breach the hull. He can't jump and scatter. L, T, and B don't have space suits.' Peavy nodded. We don't breathe like humans. We can breathe lots of stuff, but we have to have something to breathe. We could hold our breath long enough to jump and breach a hull, but T and L can only hold their breath for four or five minutes. But once they shuttle across, they will be tough for rain to stop. Jay rumpled, hooted, and finally wonked her disapproval. No, Charlotte is the one to watch. Emily is smarter than she lets on. If they work together, they can beat your daughters. Phoebe spun her head around, but didn't stop walking next to Stone. Want a bet? Deal. A full bar of ooze. Peavy wonked excitedly as they crowded into a ladderway, taking the steps down three or four at a time. Deal. But only for which team of Drascos comes out on top. Hammer will win the exercise. Jay wonked. Of course Hammer will win. No one can beat our Hammer. Once on the right deck, Stone picked up his pace. Instead of a stately walk, he sprinted down the corridor. He could smell the humans long before he reached the hatch. The lemony scent of concern was easy to pick up. The fragrance of grapefruit and lime was absent. There was concern, but no fear. Skidding to a stop at the rear of the assembled Marine Security Fire Team, he was hit from behind when PB didn't stop fast enough. Neither did Jay, and they sprawled into a pile at the feet of the Marines. The fire team of four was facing the main hatch. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they blocked the main corridor access to the ship. Their weapons were held at the ready, but Stone could see from his position on the floor that they held their weapons lightly, as if unconcerned about whatever the chief petty officer had called about. Corporal Tuttle turned, laughed, and held out her biomechanical hand. Stone grabbed the hand, using it as a brace to pull himself to his feet. Graceful, Ensign! Really awe-inspiring to the troops! Stone shook his head and slapped her on the shoulder with good humor. Thank you, Barb. We've been working on that move for months. I got some moves you could practice on. She leered at him and gave a comical wiggle of her eyebrows. Sir? Thanks, Corporal. I'll see what Allie thinks about that. I'll ask if you don't. Maybe she'll give me a note that it's okay to practice a little slap and tickle on her boyfriend. She wrapped an arm around his shoulders, pulling him in close. You'll have to get that note countersigned by me, Barb. She grabbed her heart in feigned pain. Oh, you're going to kill me, sir. I know you two have an exclusive thing going, but if you're that stuck, why haven't you made an honest woman of her? That's a question for a later time. Why? Why what? Tuttle sighed. Why a different time? This little dust-up ain't nothing to get concerned about. She hooked a thumb over her shoulder at the direction of the hatch. Somebody, and I ain't saying who, just got a bug up his butt about something. Shorty and some of his team are there, and they ain't in any rush, boss. Stone turned to J and Peavy. Why don't you girls go on and talk to Shorty? See what's going on. He turned back to Tuttle. My life isn't that easy, Barb. It never is, sir. Really, what can I do? You know about my family. Tuttle snorted. Your family or your money? Look, sir, you know by now that Lieutenant Vedrian isn't after your money. If that worries you, use the prenup. Hell, she's already gotten one written up and signed. If you're worried about your family, so what? Your parents like her, so who else matters? What do you mean my parents like her? Oh, she didn't tell you. Well, ain't my place to say, sir. I could order you to tell me. Tuttle gave his shoulder a little shove, sending him toward the hatch. It's strange that you still think that. Why do you think I'm still a corporal? Before moving more than a few steps, he turned and said, I thought you're still a corporal because of your extracurricular activities as the unofficial morale NCO. Get on with you now, sir, before you embarrass me in front of my own team. The three Marines with her laughed as if it was impossible to be embarrassed by anything their corporal could do. Stone turned back and said, Chief, what is the issue that's so difficult to handle that you had to get me out of a nice warm bed? Anson Stone, these aliens want to bring equipment aboard that doesn't have a manifest. Stone rolled his eyes toward the ceiling. Manifest? What kind of ship do you think we're on? Navy, sir. Human Navy. 
Stone said, Chief, we're Navy, but look around you. You've got Marines at your back, standing security watch on a captured Hyrakanian ship. Yes, sir. About that, isn't it a violation of regulations to have a Marine officer as a watch commander on a Navy ship? Chief, that is the point I'm trying to make. This ship isn't your typical Navy ship. We have Navy, Marines, Draskos, and Piglets on a bastardized Hyrakanian ship. Our plan is to pretend to be an enemy ship and get close enough to them to obtain valid intelligence? Sir, I understand that. The sniffer alarms went off when these creatures tried to bring their cargo on board. Lieutenant Missy Mayo was telling a bunch of us the other day that we're all going to get court-martialed for sharing human tech with an alien species. That is, if the aliens don't kill us in our sleep first, sir. What did your sniffers find? Traces of explosives, sir. Traces, chief? Not enough to be a bomb or anything, but enough to set off the alarms. Maybe they're bringing on a device, but plan on getting the explosives from our own armory. You know those creepy little aliens are all over the ship. They get into everything, running through the vents. Lieutenant Missy Maya said they could use the vents to take over the ship, sir. Stone left the chief standing at the main hatch and walked up to Shorty. May I see what you're bringing aboard? Shorty shrugged. Sure, boss. We never said he couldn't. He pointed one of his three tiny fingers at the chief. He gestured for some of his team to open the crates they were attempting to dolly into the hatch. He said we've got to have a manifest. I've wiped my ass with more manifests than that toad has ever seen. I'm a pirate these days, remember? I don't do paperwork. Jay translated and managed to get a tone of disgust to match his words. Your doorman hates us because we aren't human. He doesn't like your Draskos any better. Stone thought back to his first Navy assignment. I'm not saying paperwork is a bad thing, but I had a batch once that almost got me killed, but without it people would have continued robbing and stealing. Shorty pointed a finger at his own chest. Rob and steal? Pirate, remember? He shook his head. We could have gotten this equipment on the ship without anyone ever knowing it was here. We're not trying to hide anything, bringing it through the main hatch. This is equipment we need, considering where we are going. The sides of the first crate fell open. Stone gawked at the racks of piglet-sized combat suits. They were obviously designed after a marine combat suit. They would double the size of a piglet, with weapons bristling from every angle. They didn't appear to have a camouflage element like the marines, but the suits were a flat black that would work well in the dark of space, or in a dimly lit ship. Numos walked past Stone. Stone hadn't heard him approach. Are these causing the issue, Ensign Stone? They appear to be nothing more than EVA suits. Major, the automated sniffers detected explosives. Shorty replied through Jay. Well, we did test fire them, wouldn't you? Numos nodded. I wouldn't get into a suit that hadn't been put through its paces. Exactly, Shorty said. We have the equipment and base components to build our ammunition, but our jump into Hyrakanian space will take about three months, so we plan on making our own supplies as we go. Numos looked at Stone. Ensign? Sir, apparently the sniffers picked up explosive residue on the suits. I see no reason not to allow our allies to pass with their equipment intact, but I would like a demonstration of their suit capabilities as soon as possible. Numos grinned. I agree. I know my officers will be excited to have new toys to play with. Shorty waved his team past the chief, their loaders bringing in crate after crate of supplies. He watched for a moment and then said through Jay, Boss, I hope you don't mind, but I borrowed your new suit, and we copied a few pieces to modify our suits. Stone looked shocked. You took my combat suit. Shorty said, Sure, why not? We put it back when we were done. He had a special new suit sent by his family when he was governor, back when he could wear anything he wanted and not worry about the different odd bits. The special suit Grandpa had built for him would put even a Marine suit to shame, but he was trying to fit in and learn, not stand out. He hadn't mentioned the new suit to anyone except Allie, although he was sure many people around him knew about it. Shorty said, We didn't figure out everything on your suit yet. I know you haven't spent much more time in that combat suit than we've spent in our new model suits. Still, as different as it is, it does look like a normal Navy suit. Almost. Stone nodded. Well, I am Navy, remember? Shorty replied, You're more pirate than squid, boss. Better get used to being a little different. Oh, by the way, I have approval from that old ass-bag of a brother of mine. We can jump any time, so you have about three months to get used to your new suit before we jump into enemy-controlled space. Stone kept his voice low so the sound didn't carry. Jumping in isn't a worry. We need to gather intel. Intelligence doesn't do us any good unless we can get back home alive with it. 
Chapter 23 Stone sat in his regular seat next to Whizzer at the bridge conference table. He tried to look nonchalant, but was having trouble prying his fingers off the arms of the chair. Whizzer and Emmons didn't look any less nervous. The tension across the bridge and throughout rusty hinges was more than palpable for Stone. For the past few hours the odor of citrus was almost overpowering. The scent of lime eased slightly when Butcher ordered general quarters. Giving the average spacer something to do, something they were familiar with, common duties, eased their sense of fear and caution about the impending jump into Hyracanian-held space. Stone wished his general quarters duty was where he could be doing something, but Butcher continued to want him on the bridge as an advisor, where he sat with nothing to do. Butcher didn't have a red stripe on his trousers, never having commanded a navy ship in combat. Stone believed the captain should have received it for his actions while commanding the Hyrocanian shuttle when they captured Rusty Hinges. The Navy disagreed. Their refusal stated that the shuttle was an enemy vessel, not UEN, although it was under human command at the time with Butcher at the controls. They'd also pointed out that the shuttle was actually commandeered by Governor Stone acting in a civilian capacity, and no formal or informal change of command ceremony had taken place. There was confusion in the after-action reports as to who had really been in command. Stone, Butcher, Major Numos, or, as some suggested, no one specific individual was in control. It happened as command by committee. Stone doubted Butcher was jealous about the Red Stripe, just as he was sure other officers were. Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya had been vocal about the award more than once, stating that Stone was nothing but a jumped-up Ensign Junior Grade and wouldn't be where he was without his family's money and influence. Stone hadn't said so, but he thought it was the fire calling the flame hot, since Missy Maya appeared to be underqualified to manage the human waste systems, constantly requiring senior enlisted help to get him out of trouble. The Master Chief laughed it off, saying that was what senior NCOs were for. Thomas pointed out that Captain Butcher might want Stone on the bridge because of the stripe, not in spite of it. The man was not foolish enough to disregard any possible advice from a combat-certified commander over petty jealousy about a fancy gee-gaw on a uniform. The only two people on the bridge who didn't appear nervous were Major Numos, seated across from Stone, and L, lying on the floor behind him. The Drasco's shiny metal armor wasn't any less perfectly polished than the brass on Numos's uniform. No human knew the piglets better than Stone, but he still had difficulty reading their facial expressions. He thought Shorty would be calm as ice, but the little guy kept fiddling with his sunglasses like a nervous twitch. Seated in his command chair, Butcher's voice carried across the bridge, "'Settle down, people. We've been practicing this insertion for the three months we've been in hyperspace. We know what we're doing.' Just remember to think like you're a Hyrocanian. Shorty snorted. I would, but I'm not that hungry. The reference to the Hyrocanian's practice of eating flesh while their victim was still alive, especially piglets, caused a brief spate of nervous laughter across the bridge. It was slightly delayed as Stone relayed the translation of Shorty's comment from L, the current piglet translator. Butcher said, Dr. Wisniewski, are you ready? Wisniewski looked at Emmons. She nodded back. He said, Yes, Commander Butcher, we have hundreds of optional replies to dozens of possible inquiries ready. Assuming we find the Hyracanians and they challenge us, we should be able to answer any query. He patted a small portable console in front of him. Butcher nodded. XO, are you ready? Butcher turned up the sound on his data port. Everyone on the bridge heard Gupta's response. The shuttle is prepared and the engine's hot. You give the command and we're gone. There was a tiny pause in the XO's voice. Sir, I... Everyone waited for the XO to complain once again about being the safety valve, but the man didn't finish. If the excrement hit the fan, his job was to jump back through the piglet's system and dash for the navigation point to Ali's world. Someone had to get what intelligence they'd already gathered back to the UEN. Butcher said, I know, XO. It's a crappy job, but... Everyone on the bridge finished with him in unison. Someone has to do it. Butcher continued, You have the packet? Everyone aboard had recorded a last message home, just in case. I carried it onto the shuttle myself, Captain. Good. You can give mine back to me at breakfast, after the insertion. The XO said, Aye, aye, Captain. Butcher said, Communications. Are you synced up with Wizzer? Calm, sir. We are in sync. We can broadcast video and sound direct from his console. 
Tactical, are we a go? Tactical, sir, we are a go. Weapons are online and hot. Lieutenant Vera has a steady at 57%. That's not high, sir, but she's pulled off miracles getting us that ready. I do want to renew my objection to making this jump without shields up or camouflage. Butcher looked at Emmons. She looked back and shook her head vehemently. He said, Sorry, Tactical. It feels wrong to me, too, but Dr. Emmons insists that a Hyrocanian wouldn't jump into his own system with shields up and camouflage active. Our chief behaviorist claims it would offend other ship commanders. Emmons said, The Hyrocanian command structure is still unclear, but we have more than one example in our files and from our own observations that offending a senior officer can get you killed without repercussions from the higher commander. Stone remembered watching a fat Hyrocanian kill a smaller one without compunction or cause. He doubted a higher-ranking officer had to wait to be offended before striking to kill. Still, he agreed with Tactical. Jumping into an enemy camp without shields made him feel naked. It was a dream he had all too often of showing up as a midshipman cadet for a formation without his trousers. Butcher made a few more calls around the bridge. Everyone was a go. That wasn't a surprise, as everyone was ready an hour ago. He looked at the conference table. Major Numos, Marines ready? Numos nodded. Yes, sir, always are. Lieutenant Vedrian reports we're good to go, whether we need to repel borders or we need to board another vessel. Shorty, anything you want to add at the last minute? Shorty shrugged. L didn't need to interpret the gesture. Butcher looked at Stone. Ensign, any final suggestions? No, Captain. Stone wished he had something to suggest or report. He felt useless, just sitting and waiting. Butcher said, Navigation, time to jump. Nav, sir, time to jump is fifteen minutes. The fifteen minutes creeped by much slower than hyperspace time distortion or the theory of relativity could explain. It was a quiet fifteen minutes, interrupted only when L loudly passed gas and Wizard pretended to gag on the noxious fumes. Nav, sir, jump pending. Butcher nodded. On your mark, Nav. Everyone on your toes. Stone had been on his toes for so long he felt like an overworked ballerina. His fingers gripped the chair arms with white-knuckled intensity. He glared at the little display on the table. All it showed him was gray. He glanced at the main bridge display. It showed gray. His eyeballs snapped back, returning his glare to the table monitor. It was still gray. 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 Black, with stars strewn across empty darkness. Butcher asked, Comms? Calm, sir. Nothing. Not even on standard ship-to-ship -ship bands. Spinning the dial now, sir. Tactical? Tactical, sir. Nothing. No mines? No ships guarding the navigation point? I don't think they expect anyone but Hyrocanians. Butcher sighed. Okay, people. Let's start feeding data to my display. Start with planets and moons. Then I want the location of all Hyrocanian ships and bases quicker than ASAP. A chorus of aye, aye, Captain rang across the bridge. Butcher said, Helm. Let's move up above the elliptic relative to our present position. Nothing is coming through this nav point behind us, but no ship's master deliberately sits in front of an open door. I think... An exceedingly obese and harsh-looking Hyrocanian face popped onto the main bridge monitor. Wizard's console translated in real time. Admiral Grebnetzel, where have you been? How did you get back through that jump point? Explain yourself now or submit to feasting. Chapter 24 The main bridge monitor split down the middle. The angry-looking Hyrocanian officer glared out one side, and the other side filled with an equally angry-looking Hyrocanian officer, although this one was slightly less rotund. Wisniewski punched a few quick buttons, and the thinner Hyrocanian said, Sir, Admiral Grebnetzel is dead. I hope the anal-retentive Cretan didn't get the pleasure of dying at the hands of his food— Wisniewski's avatar replied, No, I killed him for getting us lost in hyperspace. Who are you? I am Wisniewski, and I promoted myself to Admiral. Stone was worried the Hyrocanians were going to be upset at the self-promotion, and he'd argued with Wisniewski and Emmons about it. They insisted they didn't understand Hyrocanian ranks enough to adopt another rank, and they believed Hyrocanians advanced through murder and one-upmanship. The Hyrocanian appeared to be fuming, but said, what kind of name is Wisniewski? Wisniewski's avatar replied, Communications are fuzzy, Admiral. Emmons prodded him with an elbow. She pointed at a display next to her. Their system's facial recognition must have found the on-screen Admiral in the Hyrocanian database. Wisniewski added, 
Admiral Cut, we have many damaged systems. Report. Sketch. Soon. Overloading engines. Imminent explosion, sir. Report to you soonest. He shut down his side of the communications. Outgoing communications are off. Butcher said, comms off. Stone said, no, sir. Sorry, Captain, let's leave the incoming comms open. Grandpa always said eavesdropping isn't polite, but I do think this might be a fine opportunity to disobey Grandpa. Calm, sir. Ensign Stone has a good point. Recording now. Listen to this. The communications officer turned up the volume. They could hear more than one conversation going on around the Hyrakanian Bridge. As long as they forget to shut off their outgoing calls, who knows what we might pick up? To prove his point, a thinner Hyrakanian plopped into the seat recently vacated by Admiral Cut. It either ignored the open comms in front of it, or didn't care they were open. It looked at a Hyrakanian on its left, speaking to a Hyrakanian out of visual range. Did you see, Cut? I swear the old bastard is losing weight. The reply was quick. Yes, but his hearing is still as sharp as his penis. You will be lab net feed if he hears you talking about him behind his back. That's just the point, you fat crack. His back is shrinking. He looks almost like a teenage girl. Disgusting. The voice came back. What's with the three six twenty seven twelve? A stubby hand came into view and tapped the monitor. The Hyrakanian shrugged. How in the world of late lunches should I know? They've been gone down the asshole of this solar system. Everyone else who's gone there disappeared like they did. Now they're back. I'm not a mind reader. You couldn't read your own mind if someone else wrote it down for you. Did you see that skinny-looking leftover loser they got in charge? Made me hungry just to look at him. Speaking of hungry... Butcher said, Keep it running, comms. Feed it to Wizard Emmons and their team for analysis, with constant updates fed to the shuttle, in case they have to bug out. He slipped out of his chair and walked over to stand behind Stone. Nice call, Ensign. You seem to have a right devious mind. Why, you might even make a good politician some day, if your Navy career doesn't work out. He chuckled at his own joke. Okay, people, let's get every communications tech we've got on this ship, looking for and recording any signal we can find. Numos asked, Stay on general quarters, Captain? Butcher nodded. Let's not relax just yet, Major. We still don't know what's out there. Chapter 25 Stone swore his eyes were bleeding. He doubted he'd had more than twenty minutes sleep in the last forty-eight hours. Empty meal packs were scattered around like debris after a tornado. His head was pounding, and his heart was so tired he knew it had quit beating. Communications poured into their collectors from a dozen different workstations. Butcher took a gulp of coffee and spit it back into the cup. Did we run out of coffee and someone's idea of a good replacement is Hyrocanian acid sludge? Numos was the only one on the bridge who didn't look worse for the wear. His marine utilities looked fresh and pressed, of course. The uniform was made out of material designed to survive everything short of an outing on Alley's world. Still, the man was freshly shaven and wide-eyed. Captain, we've been at general quarters for two days. I suggest we start giving some of the crew rotational rest. Butcher laughed. Your Marines getting tired, Dash? No, sir. All the Marines except me are in combat suits. Any one of them has had more rest than any Navy. Butcher shook his head. This bridge is starting to smell like my old man's compost pile, and the coffee is starting to taste like compost pile squeezing. Okay, section heads, let's keep on alert, but start breaking it down so people can get some real rest. Major Numos, can you spell me for about an hour or so? Numos laughed. Take two, Captain, if you promise to give me four when you get back. Butcher shook his head and chuckled. No promises in combat, Major. All right, people. Major Numos has the con as third watch commander. Ensign Stone, would you meet me in my office next door with Shorty and... whichever Drasco that is? Aye, aye, sir. Next door. And this is L, PB's middle daughter. Middle? How do you know? I thought they are triplets. He walked out the bridge hatch before Stone could answer. Stone hustled to catch up. Well, sir, they were born in a specific order. L is the middle, but she is only seconds behind her sister B and seconds before T. I still don't know how you tell them apart. There are some minor differences, sir. The easiest is by the color of their metal armor. L's armor is magenta. T's is a dark pink. B's armor is almost a purple. Butcher stopped at his hatch. I just got it. After all this time, I just got it. All this time, I was trying to figure out what their names meant. LTB. I couldn't figure out who was Lieutenant B. Stone smiled. Yes, they're just named after three things that go together, like J and PB. 
Butcher slapped his palm against his forehead. I missed that, too. What about Jay's daughters? No, don't tell me. I'm going to look them up. He pushed open the hatch to his office and stepped back, gesturing for Stone, Shorty, and L to enter. They trudged across the wide expanse. Stone was struck with the realization of how idiotic Hyrocanians were. They built the captain's office much larger than the bridge, but apparently had no compunction about killing an admiral to take over the position. The captain looked at Shorty. The piglet had been awake on the bridge with the crew since the rusty hinges jumped into Hyrocanian space, and the strain was becoming evident. This little guy is asleep on his feet. Shorty, go lay down somewhere. I promise to wake you up before the enemy kills us. He looked at the Drasco. I have no way to know if you're sleepy or not, L. Feel free to rest, go eat, or whatever. L plopped down on the deck, rattling her magenta and chrome armor against the rusty deck plates, but her eyes never left stone. Mama, I won't leave you alone with this human. It's not like I don't trust him, you know, but it's my job to watch you. It's... Well, it's a stupid job, because no one here is going to hurt you. But, you know, I like gotta do it. Butcher gestured to a chair. Sit, Ensign. Stone sat. Butcher said, I have a job for you that's a stupid job. Stone almost grinned that the captain had unknowingly repeated L's words. There aren't any stupid jobs, sir. Not if it's something that needs doing. If you don't do this, no one and nothing will be hurt except my reputation as a Navy commander and the captain of Rusty Hinges. I need you to watch me sleep. I mean, I need you to make sure I do not sleep longer than forty minutes. I'm not sure I trust any alarm short of a thermonuclear device to wake me up. Sir, Major Numo said you could take two hours. Forty minutes, Ensign. That will give me twenty minutes for a shower and a quick meal. The captain must set the example. Forty minutes, aye, aye, Captain. Butcher lay down on the deck and immediately fell asleep. There was a partitioned bunk and bathroom area off to one side of the captain's office, but, to Stone's surprise, he opted for the floor right in front of him. Stone didn't want to take the chance that he might fall asleep in the chair, so he stood up. He turned on his data port display, set a countdown timer, and froze it in the air over the deck. Calling up the updated system map, he expanded this piece and that. For all practical purposes, Rusty Hinges was in the middle of a huge fleet of Hyrocanian warships— most ships were static, some in orbit around various planets, some near navigation points, and some just floating in the middle of nowhere, as if they didn't have anything better to do. The astronavigators had clearly identified all known jump points on the map. Ships coming and going through each point were marked, tagged, and tracked across the sector. During the time Rusty Hinges observed, only a few jump points were in use, with one exception. The system contained twelve planetary bodies— Smaller rocky planets were closer to the sun, inside the Goldilocks zone. The rest were gas giants. The twelfth planet was massive, almost as large as the sun. A small dwarf planet caught between the gravitational pull of the twelfth planet and the centrifugal force of the sun trailed the twelfth planet like a tiny kitten following a massive Colorado elk. Unlike most, a navigation point was located in the solar orbit ahead of the dwarf planet, untethered and trapped between the gravity poles of the two planets. This untethered jump point caught between these two planets was a veritable union station of activity, with Hyrocanian ships coming and going. Some ships would enter the space, dart across to another jump point, and disappear to the gods' new where. Other ships would enter, only to duck back out again a few hours later, as if they'd been looking for something and forgot why they entered the solar system in the first place. Like most systems, there were a couple of planets far enough from the sun to keep its water from boiling away, yet close enough that it would be liquid. The Goldilocks zone was where humanoid life and planets capable of supporting life were found. Drake's equation numbers had held true over the centuries. There were millions of planets capable of intelligent life, but for every single planet with intelligent life, there was a million planets with non-intelligent animal life. For every single planet with non-intelligent life, there was a million planets with no animal life, but an abundance of plant life, perfect atmosphere, liquid water, and a reasonable gravity. This system had a planet right in the middle of its Goldilocks zone. Orbiting it was a huge space station, bristling with weapons, capable of sweeping the system clear of dangerous meteors, hostile spaceships, or even rogue planets. The planet below it was a rocky nothing, with a yellowish, sickly-looking atmosphere. The station sat in geosynchronous orbit over a planetary installation whose sole purpose appeared to be the protection of the orbital station. Stone spread the screen wider to take a closer look at the planet. 
Void of any major bodies of surface water, the planet was nothing more than dust, rocks, and blowing sand. There were a few liquid pools, but spectroanalysis was unable to identify them at this distance. Dr. Wisniewski, a geologist, had noted that the planet was still volcanically active, with huge tectonic shifts across many regions. His notes on the planet appeared as little sidebars, with arrows pointing toward eruptions, quakes, and massive continent-sized storms. A note hovering over the fuzzy edge of the atmosphere around the curve of the planet said the scientists believed the yellow tint indicated the air was highly toxic, possibly chlorine-based, yet the planet had a low-pressure atmosphere with temperatures barely above freezing. This system might be good for mining, but certainly not colonization. The Hyrocanians didn't appear to be moving in, with the exception of the one minor base on the planet, but from the amount of traffic, the solar system was an important fleet transfer point. The Rusty Hinges crew hadn't found the enemy homeworld, but they were one step closer. Stone glanced at the clock and sighed softly. His eyelids felt like they'd been swapped out for a pair of power sanders with high-grit paper. The clock had creeped only a few minutes closer to the forty-minute mark. When he was active, his enhanced DNA kept him awake and alert, but standing around doing nothing wouldn't keep him awake. He was on his feet, but his eyes were drooping and his knees threatened to buckle. Shaking his head, he refused to sit down. He backed away until he couldn't see Butcher or Shorty sleeping on the floor behind the bulk of the desk. L watched him from a distance as he did jumping jacks to get his heart beating just a little bit faster. Breathing hard wouldn't happen unless he did a few thousand, but the movement cleared his head for a short while. He focused on jumping quietly, something not easy on a rusty metal deck. He never noticed before how noisy it was just walking across the floor— Trying to be quiet and alert at the same time wasn't something he practiced. He made a quick mental note to add that practice to his training schedule. He was about to begin another exercise set, squat thrusts this time, when a delicate hatch chime interrupted his thoughts. Stone rushed to the hatch, trying to avoid someone ringing the doorbell twice. He hit the manual hatch release button, braced to attention, and nodded stiffly to the higher-ranking officer and his companions, but didn't move out of the archway. His intention was clearly to deny them entry to the captain's office. Stone said, Lieutenant Missy Maya, gentlemen. He didn't acknowledge the two officers with Missy Maya by name, but he did speak to them as Navy tradition required. Missy Maya said, Ensign Stone, we are here to see the captain. Please step aside. Captain Butcher is not available, and has asked not to be disturbed. He knew both statements were not exactly the truth, but he didn't care. The man hadn't been off the bridge in two days, and needed sleep. Disturbing him while the ship was technically at general quarters, just to talk to the officer in charge of the human waste systems, wasn't a career-enhancing move. Not for him, nor for the three officers demanding admittance to the captain's office, or even for a captain away from the bridge during GQ. Stone was more than familiar with Lieutenant Missy Maya, a self-important, self-righteous xenophobe. He was slightly surprised to see Ensign Tander— the man was older than Stone, but something of a nerd, and easily persuaded to try just about anything. Stone recognized the third officer, but he couldn't remember his name. Though Rusty Hinges was big, and its officer complement wasn't comparable to its size, Stone hadn't interacted with each member of her officer corps. Missy Maya said, "'We know he's here, Ensign.' The man managed to sneer the rank like an insult. "'We were told that he left the bridge a few moments ago, and was seen entering this very hatch.' Are you telling me he isn't here? Are you honestly going to stand there and lie to me in front of our fellow officers? Stone said, Sir, perhaps you misunderstood me. I didn't say he wasn't here. I said he was unavailable. Don't play semantics with me, Stone. It's Ensign Stone, if you please, sir. All right, Ensign. Did Commander Butcher, as captain, tell you specifically that he wasn't to be disturbed and to turn his officers away from his hatch? No, sir, he did not. However, I believe his intention was quite clear. If this is an emergency, you should report to the third watch commander, Major Numos, who has the con. Missy Maya glared at Stone. I will not take ship's business to a trumped-up marine who has no business on the bridge of any of the Emperor's ships. He put a hand on Stone's shoulder, as if to push him out of the way. Stone didn't budge. He shrugged his shoulder with enough force the lieutenant took a step back to maintain his balance. Missy Maya hadn't pushed hard, or hard enough to move him, at any rate, but any contact was a breach of protocol, no matter how light the contact. Stone was unconcerned about the physical contact. He'd been pushed harder by better. 
Psychologically, he was set on not moving. The push increased Stone's resolve. He wouldn't move out of the way now, no matter what, Missy Maya said. Let me pass, Ensign! The hatch was wide enough that Missy Maya and his two cohorts could squeeze past Stone on either side, but it appeared the man wanted to bluster his way in to bolster his own sense of self-importance. No, sir, he said quietly over his shoulder. L. This is an order, Ensign Stone. Move out of my— Stone sensed a shadow at his back and glanced over his shoulder. L was rising onto her hind legs, filling the entryway. She spread her wings, heaving her chest, but remained eerily quiet. The overhead light made her metal armor shine and flash silently. Missy Maya gave a slight shiver. His bluster cooled. Ensign Stone, we believe Captain Butcher is under the control of alien creatures. He is a danger to himself, his crew, and this good ship. The fact that you, as an agent of these aliens, are keeping me from the captain is proof enough that this belief is valid. You will move, or I will call security and have you moved. Stone could see the man rise up on the balls of his feet and clench his fists into tight knots. L flattened low and her tail shot over her head. The chrome-capped bone tip slowly creeped forward until it was a fraction of an inch from Missy Maya's chest. The man took a step back. L's tail stretched forward further, staying within inches of the lieutenant's body. Missy Maya said, Call off your dog, Ensign. You can't threaten me this way. Stone pushed L's tail to the side. You are correct, Lieutenant. I apologize for the Drasco. She's tasked with protecting me, and she must have mistakenly sensed a danger to me. Missy Maya looked at his fists and with evident force relaxed them. I've ordered you to let us pass. Are you refusing an order from a superior officer in time of war? Stone nodded. Yes, sir. I believe interrupting the captain at this point, just to talk to the officer in charge of toilets, is contrary to his orders, especially when said officer, per Navy regulations, is supposed to be at his general quarters station. This isn't over, Ensign Stone. The man stormed away, followed by the other officer, whose name Stone still couldn't place. Stone was too tired to make a snappy retort. He would eventually think of something, even if it was nothing more than mentioning unusual items stuck in unusual body cavities, but it would be hours too late. Ensign Tander dithered, apparently not knowing if he should follow Miss Imaya or run the other way. Stone said, Tander, you need to find a different class of friends to hang with. Tander glanced at Miss Imaya's retreating back. He has some convincing arguments. Maybe, maybe not. Whether he does or not, do you think you should be questioning the captain when we're at general quarters deep within the heart of enemy territory? Tander shook his head. No. What if Lieutenant Missy Maya is right? Stone said, Make an appointment to see the captain. Go through Master Chief Thomas. He's Commander Butcher's chief of staff. Talk to the captain. But I don't suggest doing that when you should be at your station. Chapter 26 They were no longer at general quarters, and the captain had changed the normal duty shift from eight hours to sixteen hours on and eight hours off to reduce crew tension. It left enough free time to sleep and shower. It didn't leave much time to get into any trouble. It also didn't leave time for socializing. Stone hadn't seen Allie in the three weeks since they jumped into the Hyrocanian system. His duty station was at the conference table on the bridge, and was limited to giving advice to the captain and bridge crew. Sitting on his butt, doing nothing but staring at a monitor and a 3D holographic system display hovering over the table, was so boring it was beginning to grate on his nerves. "'What do you think, Ensign Stone?' Numos asked. "'I think that Hyrocanian ship looks just like every other Hyrocanian ship we've casually wandered by and scanned since we started slowly meandering around the system.' Numos asked, "'Do you think we're wasting our time trying to get a close-up survey of every ship in the system?' "'No, sir, not at all. This survey is not only within the letter of our orders, but clearly within the spirit they were given, and dropping off a camouflaged repulsar mine at every known jump point— is positively sneaky. Butcher was sitting nearby in his captain's chair. Well, I'm glad I have a sound endorsement of my orders from Ensign Stone. The words were acerbic, but a thick overtone of humor spread across the sarcasm. Sir, no disrespect meant. I'm just beginning to envy Dollish in the kitchen. At least he has something to do all of the time. Butcher said, You're doing an excellent job, Stone. But if you really want something to do, I can have you swap places with Lieutenant Missy Maya. I hear the toilets are starting to back up and cause him some concern. 
No, sir. On second thought, I like it here just fine. It's just that we spend hours slowly meandering around the system from one enemy ship to the next and one jump point to the next. It's mind-numbing hours of waiting, then a few minutes of furious activity, then nothing again as we wander on to the next location. Numos nodded. That's the life of a marine. It isn't all combat and whorehouses, you know. We spend months, many times years, in training and preparing for war. Combat is only a few brief flashes of action in a long career. Some Marines train their entire career to meet the enemy and never get closer to combat than a simulated exercise against other Marines. Wisniewski said, Scans are complete, Captain. The scientist grinned, leaning back in his chair. We've hacked into another ship's comms. We've cloned everything and can hear everything they say, both internal and external messages. This ship didn't have security set on any of its systems. We also duplicated all their data files. I think we can even empty the personal bank accounts of every crew member, assuming they have bank accounts. Butcher said, Good work, Wizard. Can you spoof comms on this one? Spoof? Oh, Captain, my Captain, we can send a Dear John letter to the lowest-ranking deckhand from his wife and send a sext message with nude photos from their captain to the fleet flagship. This is the most open communications system we've found yet, and that's saying something, since the whole Hyrocanian fleet seems to think that because they're in one of their own sectors of space, they're secure. Butcher nodded. Comms, are we getting any hails from the ship? Comms, sir, no challenges. Nav has us under 50 kilometers, hull to hull. That's so close we've had to shut off our collision alarms. We're still creeping closer, though. Nav. We aren't on a collision course? Nav, sir, negative. We should be at barnacle scraping distance of less than six kilometers on our present course. They're still stationary. No movement from the targeted ship. Stone said, Captain, I was wrong. This ship doesn't look like every other ship we've slipped past. He grabbed the 3D image from the hologram dancing over the conference table. He pushed the rest of the display over to the side and flexed his fingers outward. The image of the ship he'd captured in his fist expanded in the space vacated by the system-wide display. Pinching the edges of the image, he yanked it wider apart. Wizard, how good is the computer's extrapolation of the far side? Wisniewski shrugged. Do you want me to call the mapping team and get an estimate? It's a best guess at any rate. Why? Stone said, This is an ovoid craft, just like some of the others we've seen. Even the rusty hinges is this basic shape. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any consistent size or shape in the Hyrocanian fleet. This egg shape is common, as we've seen half a dozen of this design. Look at this hatch. He pointed at the image. A square hatch was in the same place all other warships had shuttle bay hatches. It looks normal, right? Numos leaned in to stare at the indicated hatch. Butcher left his command chair to stand behind the Major, glaring at the image as if daring it to keep its secrets. Wisniewski pulled up a second image and overlaid it against the one Stone had enlarged. Wisniewski said, The hatch looks the same to me. Numos added, It looks just like the one you blew away on the rusty hinges with your acid sludge gun. Stone removed Wisniewski's image. That's what I thought. It looks the same. But what is that hatch there? And that one? And what is that other hatch near the front of the ship? Rusty hinges has one, just one shuttle hatch. If our computers are right, this ship has six hatches, and none of them are the same size or shape. Butcher shouted over his shoulder, Helm, all stop. Prepare to get us the hell out of Dodge on my command. Tactical, weapons and shields on standby. Keep your finger on the trigger, Duke. He leaned his fists on the table, alternately staring at the ship's image and glaring at stone. Okay, we haven't seen this before. I'm thinking this may be a carrier for some kind of fast attack craft that we haven't seen yet. Numos asked, Fast attack craft? Butcher nodded, FAC for short. They were small craft long before our time. Back when humans used them, they were about a quarter of the size of a current marine shuttle. They had a crew of one or two pilots. They were all engines and weapons, able to swarm an enemy ship from all directions at the same time. Stone didn't remember reading about FACs in any of his military history classes, but it sounded dangerous. Tiny ships in space would be more deadly to their own crew than against a huge enemy ship. Admiral Temple's carrier was loaded with cruisers and corvettes, full-sized fighting ships with complete complements of officers and crew. Butcher evidently agreed. They went the way of the dinosaurs when shield technology was perfected. They were too small to breach the shields of a big ship, and big ships flicked them away like mosquitoes. Stone didn't know what dinosaurs or mosquitoes were, but made a mental note to look them up later. 
He was getting good at making mental notes and actually remembering them. Still, he understood the captain's meaning from the context. The extra hatches could be additional shuttle bay openings, but he doubted it. Sir, I realize it may be a guess on my part, but the Hyrocanians are weird. That's your guess? This style of Hyrocanian ship is round, or rather oval, kind of egg-shaped. The ones we've seen have square hatches and tetrahedron-shaped shuttles. That's weird enough, but each of these extra hatches is a different shape. That one's round, he pointed at the front of the ship. This one is more rectangle, but much smaller than the shuttle hatch on rusty hinges. See, they're all different shapes. Weird. Okay, Stone, different hatches for different fast attack craft. Humans had a hundred different FAC configurations. Stone pointed at the round hatch. What is that, sir? Can we get a closer look? Someone in mapping enlarged the view of the indicated area. The bridge was small enough that everyone could listen to the conversation. Tensions were high, but they'd scanned dozens of Hyrocanian ships, and this was the first time anyone noticed this configuration. Different was a change. Different was exciting. Stone said, Those are external docking clamps, Captain. Look at those. He pointed at a long row of metal contraptions braced along the outside of the ship. Spinning the image, he saw dozens of other rows. Many of the contraptions were hidden behind a bristling forest of odd-shaped boxes. Those look a little different than human clamps, but those are external storage pod clamps, and those metal boxes are freight containers. Everyone was looking at him. Sir, I grew up on freighters. Many of the ships owned by the Stone Freight Company are little more than tractors pulling trains of trailers. We clamp external storage pods to the outside. Suppose someone on the planet Risa orders a huge shipment of 2,000 thread-count sheets from Egypt for their hotel rooms. Egypt puts all of the sheets in one container. We pick up the container, clamp it to the outside of a Stone Freight Company ship, and tow it to Risa. We may reroute the container through a dozen other ships. No one has to handle the freight. The container is passed from ship to ship until it reaches a ship heading to Risa. Our freight companies have standardized all shipping containers into rectangular-shaped boxes for easy stacking and stringing together in long trains. Wisniewski said, The metal boxes on that ship are all different sizes and shapes. They wouldn't be able to string them together. Stone shrugged. That's what I mean by weird. What would you expect from a species that makes a square hatch on an ovoid ship for a tetrahedron-shaped shuttle? He looked around the table. Sirs? I think this is a warehouse supply ship. Chapter 27 Butcher asked, Wizard, does our computer hack go deep enough to find out what cargo they're carrying? Stone said, Captain, that's why they use containers capable of attaching to the outside. If cargo doesn't need atmosphere or gravity, it can be clamped to the outside. A ship like this could carry anything, but since it's almost as big as the rusty hinges, the inside with gravity, air, heat, and light, they could carry everything. Wisniewski said, We've duplicated their entire database. It might take us a while. Shorty interrupted, and Charlotte interpreted for Stone, They might have some of my people in there. Newmas nodded at the thought. We need to find out. If so, we should attempt a rescue. Shorty said, Not attempt. Succeed or destroy it. Butcher said, Let's not jump the gun, people. Wizard, see if you can find a complete translation on their stores, he called across the room. Helm, hold our position here, but keep your finger on the button for a hasty getaway. Wisniewski said, Captain, we have a lot of the Hyrocanian vocabulary on file, but it could take weeks or even months to get a complete breakdown. There may be words we can't translate without actually looking at an item to see what it is, and even then the word on their inventory manifest may not give us any clue. Butcher asked, Ensign Stone? Wizard is right, Captain. When I worked third shift in the warehouse on the Old Toothless, we had a load of, if I remember correctly, missile parts for a TAD-16 XL munitions retrofit. He remembered correctly, because he'd had to testify about those parts dozens of times, and write twice as many reports, because when they opened the container of missile parts, they'd found rocks. A long part number on a manifest didn't tell me anything, and a matching part number on the manufacturer's packing box wouldn't tell me anything either and that was on a UEN ship. I doubt if the Hyrocanians mark everything as clearly as bottom sheet fitted one each, like UEN supplies. I get your point, Ensign. Wizard, I want you and your team to get everyone not performing other tasks to help you. One, find and pinpoint 
with a nod toward Shorty, any possible intelligent creature listed as foodstuffs. Two, any war materials and supplies. He pointed a finger at Numos. Major, I want you and Ensign Stone to work out a rescue scenario, a resupply mission, and a way to put a dent in that Hyrocanian's supply mission. Numos grinned. All that without getting everyone killed, Captain? Butcher laughed. Well, Dash, if you could work it that way, I would be personally grateful. Chapter 28 Stone stood at attention in front of the captain's desk. He was dressed in his Class A formal uniform, replete with a chest full of medals earned for his part in the unfortunate incident at Point Alpha Beta and his actions in defeating the Hyrocanians and capturing their ship at Ali's World. He was uncomfortable being in front of Captain Butcher, but not because of the red stripe on his trouser leg. Commander Thomas Butcher was likely to earn his own stripe for commanding the rusty hinges behind enemy lines as a Q-ship, although a hostile shot had yet to be fired. He was uncomfortable because he was on trial. This wasn't the first time Stone was the subject of a captain's mast. He'd faced a dozen of them for everything from stealing a shuttle from the period on Titus, to desertion for being thrown from that ship while it was in hyperspace, to mutiny for relieving Admiral Shalako on the old Toothless and taking command, although that was done by Emperor Edict. This was the first time he was guilty, and that made him more than nervous. Captain's mast was a non-judicial punishment disciplinary hearing, Commander Butcher, as the captain, could order everything from immediate dismissal from the Navy and prison time, to recommending charges for a court-martial, to demotion, loss of pay, or nothing, should the captain so desire. Butcher shook his head as he called the mast to order. An open file hung in the air before him. Its backside was blanked out, making it impossible for anyone but him to read it. "'Lieutenant Senior Grade Roscoe Missimaya, is it your desire to proceed, or do you wish to retract this complaint?' Missy Maya snapped to his feet. Proceed, Captain. I feel— How you feel is evident in your formal complaint, Butcher interrupted. Is this report complete, or do you have more to add? Sir, it is complete as far as the issue with Ensign Stone. However, I renew my objection about not including the information about alien— Butcher waved a hand, forcing Missy Maya to silence. I have already ruled that your belief concerning alien influence in the command structure isn't germane to your complaint against Ensign Senior Grade Stone. If you wish to pursue that course of inquiry, you must do so under separate cover. Sir, but— Butcher interrupted again. Exactly. Put yours in a chair. He sighed and tapped his fingers on his desk. This captain's mast has three responsibilities. One, and what I think is most important, is to give the accused a hearing to the charges, allowing him an opportunity to respond and to face his accuser. Two, is to ascertain the facts about the allegedly committed offenses. Three, is to dispose of said charges— whereby I can dismiss the charges, impose punishment, or refer the case to a court-martial. Do you understand this, Ensign Senior Grade Stone? Yes, sir. Ensign Stone, I want you to understand that this isn't a trial, although I reserve the right to affix punishment, mild or severe, for your action, or lack of action, as the case may be. Nor can the outcome of this captain's mast be construed as a conviction or an acquittal, whether punishment is imposed or not. Do you understand this? Yes, sir. You have the right to refuse this captain's mast and demand a court-martial. However, should you choose that, I am required to confine you to the brig. Wait, we don't have a brig. I would be required to order you to build a brig, then spend the rest of this voyage in there, until such a time as enough officers of sufficient rank could be assembled to oversee your trial. Do you still wish to proceed? Yes, sir. Son, and I stress this again, you have the right to have a senior officer act as your counsel. They wouldn't be a lawyer, and couldn't answer for you, but they could render advice. Exo Gupta has the con on the bridge, but I could still call for Major Numos. He waved a quieting hand at Missy Maya. I have the authority to do this over Lieutenant Missy Maya's objection about allowing a Marine access during a Navy captain's mast. Do you still refuse counsel? Yes, sir. I restate my request that I be allowed the counsel of Master Chief Thomas. Would that I could, Ensign Senior Grade Stone— this is a captain's mast, with an officer standing as the accused by another officer. Should you be found innocent and return to your duties, having an enlisted person even view these proceedings could impede you or your accusers' effective implementation of your duties. The master chief cannot be called into these proceedings. Butcher spun the accusation document, giving Stone his first official view of the charges against him. He wasn't surprised. Butcher told him what they said when he was first asked if he wanted a court-martial or a captain's mast. Butcher said, 
Take your time, son. Read it carefully, and review the attached files. Aye, aye, sir. Stone did as he was ordered. The document was clear on its face. Missy Maya had detailed his attempts to see the captain three and a half weeks ago, and Stone's willful stubbornness in refusing him access to Butcher's office. It clearly showed L backing Stone's refusal. Stone wondered what took Missy Maya so long. Their confrontation occurred almost a month ago as they drifted and wandered about the Hyro Canyon-controlled system, gathering information and recording data from ship after ship. The report was letter-perfect, not a comma out of place. Missy Maya must have rewritten and edited it dozens of times. Lieutenant Junior Grade Barnes, as a witness, the other officer who'd been with Missy Maya that day, countersigned the accusation. Ensign Tander's signature was glaringly absent, although he was mentioned by name more than once. Stone watched Missy Maya and Barnes's data port videos submitted as evidence. Stone nodded when he finished. Done, sir. Butcher asked, Ensign Stone, is this report complete and accurate? Sir, it's true on its face. However, nowhere does it mention the timing of this incident. Butcher said, Lieutenant Missy Maya, do you have anything you want to add to the official record, or call any witnesses who have not been recorded here? Missy Maya said, I would like to call Lieutenant Barnes, sir. Butcher closed his eyes. Really, Lieutenant? Are his addendums to this report incomplete? Think about this. We are still behind enemy lines, in a very tenuous position, and we have other duties that demand our time. It's your right as an officer to press this point, but let's not belabor it. Missy Maya nodded. Yes, sir. However, I reserve the right to call him as a witness, should any facts in dispute be, um, in dispute. Do you have any questions for Ensign Senior Grade Stone? Yes, sir. He shuffled through a few documents displayed by his data port. Stone shifted his weight from one foot to the other without breaking his at-attention stance. He tried to control his breathing. He was guilty, and being punished for being right, whether he was guilty or not, was starting to wear on his nerves. He wondered why Missy Maya was dragging this out. The man had three weeks to prepare his questions and statements. Why was he delaying? Then it occurred to him, Missy Maya was trying to strut his stuff in front of the captain, as an audience of one. He guessed Missy Mile was one of those irritating individuals who asked questions in meetings, although he already knew the answers, just to hear himself talk. Butcher took a clock display from his data port and set it to hover over his desk. He expanded it so even Missy Maya could see it. The lieutenant senior grade continued to shuffle through reports, ignoring the captain's not-so-subtle hint about the time. He continued saying, Hmm, or Hrmph, over various reports, until the captain cleared his throat and glared at him. Missy Maya asked, Ensign Stone, do you dispute the facts on this report? Stone said, Captain Butcher, I've already answered that question. Butcher said, So you have. Any new questions or comments, Lieutenant Missy Maya? And by new, I mean something not already asked and answered. Missy Maya nodded. Ensign Stone, did you order the Drasco known as... His voice faded away as he shuffled through documents seeking a name. L, Lieutenant. Yes, thank you, Stone. Butcher said, It's Ensign Senior Grade Stone to you, Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya. This is a formal hearing. When you and Ensign Stone are drinking cold beers on the patio of the Billy Bob's Backyard Barbecue and Booze Bistro on New Alabama, you can call him anything you want. Not now. Rank observances are at the heart of your complaint. You will be mindful of the same. Yes, sir. Ensign Stone, Ensign Senior Grade Stone, did you order the Drasco known as L to attack me? No, Lieutenant. No? No, Lieutenant. I called her name, but I didn't order any attack. In fact, I called her to me to avoid her taking action without my explicit instructions. L can be somewhat impulsive at times. Ensign Stone, was the Drasco known as L being impulsive when she attacked me with her tail spike? No, Lieutenant. No? Stone wanted to roll his eyes, shrug his shoulders, and flip Missy Maya off with a single-digit salute. Instead, he said to Butcher, Asked and answered, sir. Butcher nodded. Ensign Stone is right, Lieutenant Missy Maya. Let's skip the courtroom theatrics, shall we? He looked at Stone. Rest easy, Ensign Stone. Missy Maya said, Yes, sir. He played the relevant snippet of video, pointing at it in triumph. Are you telling me that the Drasco known as L wasn't being impulsive and didn't attack me? Stone glanced at the display. L wasn't being either, Lieutenant. She is tasked with defending me. Your stance was aggressive, as you clearly rolled onto the balls of your feet and clenched your fists. Her reaction isn't an attack. You'd be dead if Elle attacked you. 
Her stance in pointing her tail spike at you was an indication she was evaluating whether you were a valid threat or not. The fact that she let me push her tail spike out of the way was an indication that she didn't think you were much of a threat to her or me. Yet, you and the Drasco known as L clearly denied me access to the captain's office, despite my direct orders. Is that right, Ensign Stone? Yes, Lieutenant. Missy Maya seemed to swell up with self-importance. That is a clear admission of guilt, Captain. I think we are done here. Butcher said, Ensign Stone, do you have anything to say in your defense? Stone said, Captain, the report by Lieutenant Missy Maya is complete and true as far as it goes. However, it doesn't reference the timing of the action. The rusty hinges was... Missy Maya said, I object, Captain. Whatever else was happening shouldn't have any bearing on Ensign Stone's disobedience to a lawful order from a superior officer. Stone shook his head. It doesn't excuse my disobedience, Captain, but it does explain the circumstances about why I didn't do what I was told to do. Butcher asked, Mitigating? Stone thought. It had been a few years since the legal trials he'd attended after the fiasco at Point Alpha Beta, and uncovering a ring of thieves and killers on the old Toothless. Mitigating circumstances might get him broken down to spacer third class, rather than put to death for refusing an order in time of war on the battlefield. Yes, sir. Mitigating. Proceed. Stone said, Rusty Hinges had jumped into this system two days prior. Everyone had been on Red Alert General Quarters for two full days— you had just ordered the red alert rescinded, keeping the crew at general quarters, but allowing division commanders to give short crew rest. You'd given the con to Major Numos and had retired to your office for a quick nap. You instructed me to wake you after forty minutes. You'd only been asleep for ten minutes when Lieutenant Missy Maya rang the hatch bell for admittance. He looked at Missy Maya. Lieutenant Missy Maya, your video of the incident in question has been edited to remove the part where I asked you if your interruption of Captain Butcher's rest was an emergency. Do you recall that conversation, Lieutenant? Missy Maya nodded. I do. Your suggestion was that I take my problems to a Marine. He managed to make the word Marine sound like an insult. Stone asked, Who had the con on the bridge at the time of your interruption, Lieutenant? Missy Maya said, Marine Major Dashiell Numos was acting as third watch commander, and I am led to believe he had the con. Stone said he was, Lieutenant. Did you tell me that your interruption was an emergency? Missy Maya said it wasn't at the time, Ensign, but I believe it is now, and is threatening the lives and safety of this ship. Butcher said that is a separate issue, Lieutenant. I have already ruled that you must present any claim that I am a puppet of an alien conspiracy as a formal report with documented proof. Stone said, Captain, I submit that Lieutenant Missy Maya wanted to interrupt your vital rest about a subject that wasn't an emergency. Butcher nodded. Anything else? No, sir. Butcher said, Having heard from both parties, and being satisfied that their statements are true and correct, I am ready to pass judgment. Ensign Stone, stand at attention, please. Ensign, by your own admission, you are guilty of failing to obey the lawful orders of a superior officer. Further, as the commanding officer, I have made it widely known that I wish to maintain an open-door policy, offering access to any officer or crew member who believes they need to see me. Do you understand this? Stone's heart sank. He was guilty and knew it, but to hear it spoken aloud was painful. Yes, Captain Butcher. Even at attention, in his peripheral vision, he could see Missy Maya smirking in victory. Butcher said, Further, it's within my discretion to determine if the timing is inconvenient, or if any subject is irrelevant or frivolous. Such decisions aren't within the preview of any gatekeeper, unless the time, the subject, or the applicant is specifically listed. Do you understand this? Stone said, Yes, sir. I understand that I overstepped my bounds. Are you then prepared to accept punishment? Missy Maya let a snicker of triumph escape. Butcher glared at Missy Maya and said, Lieutenant... I thank you for bringing this egregious lack of military courtesy to my attention. However, this complaint is far and away too long in coming. Any further such complaints should be filed in a timely manner. Before Missy Maya could speak, he continued, That will be all, Lieutenant. You may return to your assigned duties. Missy Maya's eyes flickered from butcher to stone and back again. But, sir, shouldn't I be allowed to be present for the administration of the punishment? Butcher asked, Why? Surely you don't wish to revel in the misery of a fellow officer, or, gods forbid, be the master of the whip? Stone almost lost his composure at the mention of a whip. 
Corporal punishment was still on Navy books as an acceptable punishment, as was hanging for certain offences, but he hadn't heard of anyone being punished with either in his short time in the Navy. Could he take a whipping without breaking down? Could he even stand it? Missy Maya obviously wanted exactly what Butcher had suggested that he didn't want. No, no, sir, of course not. I just thought that— His voice faded away as Butcher's face told him he wasn't staying. He began pulling his reports back into his data port. Butcher said, Ensign Stone's punishment is between him and his captain. I will not subject a fellow officer to the humiliation of a public chastisement. He waited until Missy Maya had gathered up his things and left. Glaring at Stone, he said, I believe that man would have you submit to a public flogging. I know enough about your medical condition to know your thick skin wouldn't raise a scar from a whipping. Stone almost smiled. His skin was probably tougher than standard Navy whips, thanks to his mixture of Drasco DNA and military nanites. It was as tough as inch-thick leather. Not that he wouldn't feel a whip against his skin. It just wouldn't hurt. Butcher nodded, seeing the relief in Stone's eyes. So, whipping you is out. Not that it was ever really in. However, there are appropriate punishments I can mete out. Are you ready to accept chastisement? Chapter 29 "'Master Chief Thomas on the bridge!' someone shouted. Thomas wasn't an officer, so no one jumped to their feet or snapped to attention like they would for the captain or a watch commander. As the highest-ranking enlisted on the ship, acknowledging the Master Chief's presence was a tradition dating back a few hundred years, when a woman of similar rank took over a Navy spaceship after all the officers had died, saving the ship and crew. No one expected Captain Butcher or the other officers to die, least of all Captain Butcher and those officers— but everyone knew it could happen. No one doubted Master Chief Thomas's ability to guide the ship to safety, if needed. Thomas patted Stone on the shoulder on the way past. How's it going, boy? Stone smiled up from his seat. Since Thomas wasn't assigned to babysit him, like his early days on Lazaroni Base, or his first few months as governor on Alley's World, Stone decided the man wasn't a complete pain in the rear. It's slow, Master Chief. Wizzer and his team have had their computers cranking through the inventory database of the Hyrocanian warehouse ship for a week now. Nothing unexpected has popped up, so now we're manually trying to match any visuals to words or numbers that we don't have in our database. Stone noticed Lieutenant Missy Maya waiting at the hatch. Without the captain's permission, he and the three officers with him couldn't set foot on the bridge. That was fine with Stone. He hadn't liked the man even before he'd dragged him before a captain's mast. His smile of greeting to Master Chief Thomas turned into a grin as he remembered Captain Butcher's punishment, having to stand at attention in front of the captain's desk for ten minutes, time off given for time already served. There was an official letter of reprimand in his file. It had an expiration date and would be expunged in six months, assuming the Hyrocanians didn't discover them and kill them first. Lieutenant Missy Maya was obviously antsy waiting in the corridor, shifting from one foot to the other. Lieutenant Barnes, the officer who had countersigned the complaint against Stone, looked relaxed and comfortable. Tander wasn't one of the officers. The two midshipmen looked too old for their rank, and appeared more than a little nervous about coming to the bridge without a specific invitation. Stone nodded to Missy Maya, recognizing the man's rank. He actually had to put a calming hand on Emily's head to keep the Drasco from hissing at the man. The Master Chief hadn't slowed his stride, since his first real order of business on the bridge was to report to the captain or watch commander, depending on who had the con. Coming to a stop slightly to the side of Butcher, so as not to block the captain's view of the bridge, the monitor, or the conference table, he said, Captain, we have... Communications blaring from the monitor interrupted him. A fat Hyrocanian, naked from the waist up, wearing hideously colored pants, popped onto the monitor. What in Fliblicker's name do you want? Comms, Captain. Incoming transmission is on, but outgoing is off. The Captain turned slightly in his chair. Wizzer! Wisniewski turned in his chair and looked at Dr. Emmons. Cat? Emmons nodded. We're prepared for this call, Tom. Dr. Emmons had taken to calling everyone by their first name, even the Captain. I don't know all the words the Hyrocanian said, but from the context, I can guess they were obscenities. Butcher shook his head. Really, Dr. Emmons? As a spacer, I would never have guessed. Emmons took the sarcasm in stride and answered, "'Playing response now.' The Rusty Hinge's Hyrocanian avatar appeared on the split screen. Their avatar was as fat as any Hyrocanian admiral. 
Its upper body oozed a slick film of slime that collected and pooled in the creases between the rolls of fat cascading from its hinged ears down to the blubber rolling over its garishly colored pants. The pants' color was taken from a shirt often worn by First Lieutenant Hammermill when he was off duty. It had the usual double set of sharp cutting teeth, one set designed to chew horizontally and the other set to chew vertically. An artistic scientist had actually managed to add a dangling piece of meat with a small blood vessel hanging from its teeth. The meat looked about half rotten, and even from a distance a viewer could swear they smelled the stink. Like all Hyrcanians, their admiral had four arms, the first two hinged in front and the second two hinged at the shoulder to grasp behind. The admiral avatar grunted in disgust. We're busy here. What do you want? You called me, remember? Your ship is closer to mine than it is supposed to be. Back off, Gazornin Platt. Hey, right back at you. Look, we were coming to get resupplied, but our engines glitched. Give us a minute. The warehouse ship caller said, All right, just this once. What do you need from stores? The avatar looked around as if searching for something. I got a list around here somewhere. I'll get it to you as soon as I find it, okay? We're out. Emmons shut off the monitor. Everyone sat waiting for the warehouse ship to call back, to raise their shields or power up their weapons, but nothing happened. A collective sigh of relief was heard across the bridge. Butcher said, Tactical, is your finger getting tired of hanging near the trigger? Tactical captain, yes, sir. We've been poised to shoot and throw up shields for a month now. Our finger is getting a bit cramped. Butcher grunted, Use a different finger, then. Stay alert, people. We have a plan. He looked at Thomas. What now, Master Chief? Thomas nodded his head toward the hatch. Lieutenant Missy Maya and friends have a petition to float past you. Bring it on, Master Chief. Missy Maya, Barnes, and two other officers traipsed past the conference table. Missy Maya made a wide circle around Emily laying at Stone's feet. They lined up in front of Butcher and stood at attention. Stone easily caught their odors. Missy Maya was oozing a mint fragrance with tinges of vanilla. His feelings of loyalty were strong, and he was determined in his set course of action. Barnes was exuding a strong grapefruit smell. His fear was clear, but not as strong as the almost overpowering lime scent of fear from the two midshipmen with them. Stone had long since learned that just because a person emitted the minty odor of loyalty, it didn't mean they were loyal to him, the captain, or even the emperor. Evil men always thought they were justified, and what they were doing was the right thing. Barnes's fear may be a simple matter of being nervous about approaching the captain on the bridge, or it may have everything to do with the fact they were behind enemy lines, in the middle of an enemy fleet and in an enemy ship, or just that he had to step carefully around Emily. Not all crew members were used to Drasco's running free on the ship. Butcher said, Gentlemen, what can I do for you? Have you gathered enough data on me to prove that Shorty is controlling me mentally? Shorty laughed. Emily translated something Shorty said. Stone wisely decided to keep Shorty's comments to himself about how someone should be controlling Missy Maya's mind for him, because he wasn't doing a good job of it. Missy Maya said, No, sir. We've been unable to document any proof that the control link is real, although I believe it's a contributing factor in your command. Butcher said, I really appreciate your honesty, Lieutenant. Captains should always have someone like you to keep them on their toes. He rolled his eyes upward when Missy Maya missed the sarcasm. So... What can I do for you? Missy Maya called up a file on his data port and passed it to Butcher. The lieutenant said, Captain, the undersigned officers believe our continued presence in Hyrcanian controlled space is contrary to our, your, specifically cited orders. We've been unable to locate the Hyrcanian homeworld or cause any damage to their ships. However, we have collected more than enough information to consider this mission a success. Butcher asked, You believe we have done all we can do? Is that right, Lieutenant? He looked at the petition on his data port. So of all the officers on this ship, you managed to find four of you who agree, correct? Stone had long since returned to scanning through screen after screen of data on the Hyrocanian warehouse ship's stores. Everyone was trying to identify useful items to determine if it would be worth boarding the vessel to steal what they needed. A full company of Marines was sure they could take the ship without any other ship in the sector realizing it had been done. He was listening with only one ear to Butcher. Missy Maya said, We four may not be a majority, but we are in such agreement that we believe our voices should be heard, sir. Oh, I'm hearing you, Lieutenant. I want to ask a question of every officer on this bridge, you four included. While this ship isn't a democracy, I want your honest input. 
How many of you think we have accomplished all we can on this deployment? Missy Maya and Barnes rapidly raised their hands. One of the midshipmen raised his hand tentatively. The other midshipmen hesitated long enough to see that no other officer on the bridge even made a hint of movement with their hands. A good many turned their backs on the conversation, resuming their duties. The second midshipman kept his hand at his side, nudging his companion, who finally lowered his hand. Butcher said, If this was a democracy, you'd be so overruled it would hardly be worth time getting on the ballot. Midshipman, get off my bridge. He waited until the two left. Now, crap! Stone interrupted with a shout. You've got to see this. He looked up, realizing he'd yelled, Sorry, Captain, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you need to see this. Stone could hardly contain himself. Shorty was standing behind him, yanking on his arm, silently yelling. Emily raised herself up on her hind legs, wonking excitedly. She flapped her wings, snapping them back and forth, obviously startled by Shorty's excitement. Stone shouted, Emily, settle down! Get Jay for me! Easy, Shorty, I see it! He waited while Emily exited the hatch. Everyone heard her wonking down the corridor, shouting for Jay. Captain, sorry for the interruption. Butcher said, One moment, Lieutenants Missy Maya and Barnes. What do you have, Ensign? Stone said, Sir, we're working through the Hyrocanian inventory list as the computer flags various items for review. This list popped up as urgent, but it must be at the bottom of the Hyrocanian's priority lists. This is what I first saw, sir. It's what set Shorty off. Jay skid past the hatch, her speed down the corridor causing her to miss the hatchway. Her talons screeched on the rusty deck plates as she scrabbled to correct her course. Mama! Mama! Emily said you were in danger. She said Shorty said he was going to kill someone. Shorty, I saw what you saw. Jay, please talk to Shorty. Tell him to remain calm. He punched a few buttons and sent a picture to the table monitor and to the main screen. There was a picture of a small, one-armed piglet. Captain, this is a listing of available foodstuffs. Someone muttered something about a-hole sons of bitches. No one disagreed. Stone said, Jay tells me that Shorty actually knows this piglet. Emmons looked like she was about to vomit. They... they ate his arm! Stone looked at Emmons and back at Shorty. No, Dr. Emmons. Shorty said the lazy old bastard, his words, not mine, lost the arm in an engineering accident about fifty years ago. The fellow looks older, but Shorty says it's him. He understands this is a sample picture, and that this fellow may not still be alive, but others probably are. Butcher said, I'm sorry, Shorty. Hyrocanians have eaten both our races. We will— No, Captain, Stone interrupted again. I'm as upset as Shorty is about the piglets, but I saw more— he turned another dial, changing the picture. The next item was a pair of humans, standing naked. The man was scratching his eye with a middle finger. The woman had both arms crossed across her breasts, but both middle fingers were extended. Even Jay had the good sense to honor the deep silence that settled over the bridge. Chapter 30 Stone said into the silence, "'Wizard, can you run facial recognition on these two? He prodded the scientist in the ribs. Wizard, come on, get to it. We've seen them dine on humans before. Get to it. Missy Maya took that moment to say, Captain, they are holding human prisoners. We need to get back to Empire Space as soon as we can to report this so they can send in a fleet to attempt a rescue. Butcher looked at Missy Maya with dead cold eyes. We are their rescue, Lieutenant. Get off the bridge and back to your toilets. No one spoke until Missy Maya and Barnes had left. The XO followed them as far as the hatch, slamming it shut and sliding the locking mechanism into place. Stone thought the air smelled cleaner without the two nearby. Stone said, Captain, the Hyrocanian foodstuffs list say they only have twenty-three humans. It looks like the same number they came into the system with. A note says this species is considerably difficult to control for dining. They are reserved for, well, for some high rank that the computer can't place yet. Dr. Wisniewski said, we have a facial recognition hit on the woman. She is Lieutenant Commander Dorothy Nessiet, missing in action for eighteen standard months from the Roanoke, Explorer Third Class. Nothing on the man yet. Stone relayed from Jay. Captain, Shorty says he's surprised that any humans survived this long, since we breed so slow. Female piglets can have up to eight offspring per year, and it only takes them six months to reach adult size. They're still children mentally, but they get big quick. He thinks the Hyrocanians may have tried to start a breeding program with humans, just like they did with his people. Butcher asked, How many piglets are on their inventory? Several thousand, sir. About half of what they started with. Butcher said, Any other intelligent species on their list? Still scanning, Captain. 
Stone shook his head and wrapped a comforting arm around Shorty. None that we recognize yet, but there are a few species that we've never seen before. Butcher got up from his chair and marched to the main monitor. He was inches from it when he said, Several thousand piglets and twenty-three humans to rescue. Hold on, Dorothy. We're coming for you. Chapter 31 Butcher turned to the officers assembled on the bridge. I want suggestions from anyone. How do we effect a rescue without putting our own mission in jeopardy? And that includes without getting everyone on the rusty hinges killed. Numos stood up. Sir, I volunteer to lead a team of Marines. I never thought anything different, Major, Butcher interrupted. I'll make it an official order when it comes time. Still, I appreciate your volunteering. He looked thoughtful. That warehouse ship is almost as big as the rusty hinges. Even as quick and efficient as your Marines are, I think it would take you far too long to find the prisoners using any type of stealth action. Even if we take all of our trigger pullers, Navy and Marine, we run the risk of discovery. We still need to get our collected data back through the jump points to UEN space. Wisniewski said, Assuming we can backtrack to get home. Butcher said, But we know the Hyrocanians got into human space, right? So we should be able to follow their navigation coordinates and timing. Right, Wizard? Wisniewski nodded. Right, Captain. Nevertheless, I don't trust the Hyrocanians or their databases any farther than I can spit up wind. Stone said, Sir, the warehouse ship's database doesn't have complete ship schematics. He pulled up what they had found in the hacked information. Pushing all the other information aside, he laid the diagrams out as a three-dimensional image on the tabletop. Look here. He swirled his hand, painting a large portion of the ship red. These areas aren't on any blueprints we've found yet. Most are just listed as warehouse or storage space. He used a finger to paint a couple of small areas green. This is engineering, and this one is central command. Anyone not manning a workstation clustered around the image to get a clear look. A dozen conversations competed for listening ears. Stone listened with only half an ear. The most prevalent suggestion was a massive attack, followed by a run for the gate. Thinking aloud more than actually speaking to anyone, Stone said, Engineering and Central Command are deep inside that ship, just like they are here. Taking rusty hinges was more desperation luck than overwhelming force. I think asking luck to ride with us again might be too much. He tapped the green engineering and central command dots. Rusty Hinges was commanded by Hyrocanians who were lost and alone, and their forces were split between the planet and their ship. We don't even have a clear count on their complement yet from the— He let his voice fade away as he thought about the database. Butcher was looking at him when he looked up. The captain said, You have a thought, Ensign? Sir, two thoughts, actually. He drove an elbow into Dr. Wisniewski's side. Wizard, we got close enough to that ship to clone their database, right? Wisniewski shrugged, pointing at the video display and the picture of the humans on the monitor. Self-evident, young man. Stone smiled. Of course, sorry. You also said we can spoof them. I know we broadcast a Hyrocanian avatar to stall them and give them a valid reason for our hanging around in their little chunk of space. But how much spoofing can we— He was interrupted by a rumbling explosion. The floor vibrated. Everyone began shouting. Alarms rang. Jay grabbed Stone, wrapping her body around his. Lights flickered and popped back on brightly. Butcher's voice carried over everyone else. Tactical? Tactical, Captain. Negative. Helm, did we hit something? Helm, sir. Negative. We were dead stationary relative to the Hyrocanian ship. We're drifting slightly now away from them. A Hyrocanian popped onto the main monitor. Our sensors show you had an explosion on board. Do you require assistance? The alien wasn't the fat admiral they had faced earlier. This was a low-ranking, only slightly obese Hyrocanian. Emmons pushed Wisniewski and Stone out of the way. She punched a few buttons on the table console, and their avatar popped back into existence. She waved everyone quiet and spoke into a microphone. What are you doing questioning me? Do you know who I am? I'll run my ship, and you run yours. The Hyrocanian shrank slightly. No offense, great one, but your ship is drifting. Stone reached around Emmons, put a hand over the microphone, and said to Butcher, Captain? Before the captain could speak, an ensign first grade said, Helm correcting now, sir. Ship responding per normal. Engines appear undamaged. Stone said, Dr. Emmons, ask the Hyrocanians to stand by. The Avatar spat at the other ship. We do not have any problems. Everything is perfect. Do not doubt my word. Do nothing while we investigate your malfunctioning sensors. Everyone looked at Emmons as she basically put the other ship on hold. What? 
Their command structure will not tolerate failure. Any admiral admitting any failure would be tantamount to offering his body up for a buffet. I believe their military culture is based upon a Hyrocanian succeeding or be eaten. Stone said, How long can we keep them on hold? Emmons shrugged. Our admiral avatar is fatter than their captain. I can't guarantee it, but we should be able to keep them doing nothing until someone bigger shows up. Butcher said, Damage control? Damage control, sir. We're getting reports from all over the ship, but nothing definite yet. The explosion was internal. Butcher looked around at the gathered crowd of officers. XO, sound the fire alarms. Everyone else not at a workstation, get out and find out what happened. Report to the XO. Shorty, please get your vent runners scouring this ship. Something blew, and we need to find out what went wrong, and we need to find out quickly. Chapter 32 Stone sent Jay racing away with Shorty in her hands. Wonking loudly, she called for PB and their daughters to come help. Corridors cleared as she ran, her wings flapping, holding Shorty so her rough hide didn't scrape all the skin off his body. She raced toward their quarters on the hydroponics deck. Exo Gupta pulled a screen up in front of him. Gathering incoming damage reports from various locations, he shouted numbers at people, and they sprinted away. He pointed Stone in the direction of the main hatch and sent him off. A nearby ladderway would take Stone down a few decks where he could access a cross corridor, then run back up another ladderway to reach the corridor to the main hatch. Stone shouted into his data port comms as he ran, Main hatch, report, do you have damage? There was no response. He ran faster, dodging around clusters of spacers and marines running in other directions. The farther he ran, the more people he saw in combat suits or emergency EVA suits. His suit was up in his quarters, and he wanted to go get it, but he'd been ordered to check on possible damage first. Hoping there weren't any hull breaches, his mind did a little stutter step as he had a flash of inspiration. Maybe a little damage at the main hatch would be a good thing. His nose started to complain the closer he got to the main hatch. It was an odor every human knew, but his delicate sense of smell was ratcheting the intensity of the odor to almost unbearable levels. He'd hoped he could catch the fragrance of anyone on main hatch duty, but the stench was overpowering all others. Nevertheless, he ran as fast as he could along the last stretch of corridor, pushing his way through the next to the last hatch before reaching the main hatch receiving area. Stone tried to come to a quick stop, but his feet slid on a thick layer of human excrement. Human waste covered every inch of the last few feet of the corridor, from the deck to the ceiling and both bulkheads. The last set of large double hatches before reaching the open area were twisted on their hinges and hung like balls of wadded paper. Feces dripped from the ceiling to splash back to the deck. Sliding through the open hatch, waving his arms to keep his balance, he came to a stop in the main area. Someone should have been on duty. Two crewmen were on duty at the main hatch, except when the ship was in hyperspace, per Navy regulations. All he saw were piles of dung. The captain had ordered everything moved from the receiving area into various bays, but there were still small clusters of goods that hadn't been moved. Somewhere under the duty may be an injured spacer, unable to move or call for help. Stone ignored the piles, dancing his way across the deck, carefully skirting a gaping hole in the middle of the deck, and a series of twisted, damaged piping poking up through the deck. Inspecting the main hatch and the hull, he was relieved to see there wasn't any evidence of a leak. Any rupture in the hatch or hull around the hatch would suck the sewage into space. Instead, the feces dripped along the bulkhead, sliding down to the deck. Stone tapped his data port for comms. Exo Gupta, we have damage at the main hatch. There was an explosion of some kind under the deck. Maybe the deck below. I need help looking for possible injured, sir. Gupta said, Can you specify the damage, Ensign? We're in deep shit here, Exo. Gupta replied, I understand the seriousness, young man. No, sir, I mean literally. I think we had a methane backup in the waste system, and something caused an explosion. Whoever designed this snafu'd ship ran the toilet waste system pipes under the deck plates near the main hatch. Something blew a hole in the pipes. We're covered here, sir. Slowly turning in a circle to give the XO a clear look at the main hatch area, Stone flashed a video of the damage. The XO said, Oh, crap. Exactly, sir. Help is on the way, Ensign. I'll be there shortly with the medical team. We should have a spacer and a petty officer on duty down there. See if you can find them. Aye, aye, sir, looking now. He backed to a bulkhead and started a spiral search pattern, poking at any pile of dung big enough to be a human. XO, this explosion couldn't have just been internal if the ship was pushed off course. We must have a breach somewhere. Is there a waste system expulsion sphincter near the main hatch? Ensign, are you asking me if the ship has a butthole near the main hatch? It was obvious the man was trying not to laugh. 
his stern face struggling to reflect the seriousness of the damage. Um, yes, sir. Checking schematics, no. Stone halted as a pair of dung piles raised up from the deck. He moved closer. Take it easy, people. Help is on the way. Trying to tear off a piece of his uniform would be useless. They weren't designed to tear. Instead, he used a reasonably clean sleeve and wiped it delicately across a spacer's face, trying to clear the eyes, nose, and mouth. He used his other sleeve and wiped it across the other person's face. Hold on, you two. We'll get you cleaned up and checked out soon. Were you the only two at the main hatch at the time of the explosion? The shorter of the two human-shaped dung piles nodded. Spitting in disgust, a woman said, Petty Officer Jakeson, sir. Just Bob and I were down here. What happened? Stone ignored her question. Petty Officer, are you injured? Jakeson shook her head. The action sprayed feces in all directions. Negative, um... She wiped a dung-covered hand across Stone's shoulder, trying to clear his rank tab, but it was covered in human waste, and she only made it worse. She must have finally noticed the red combat stripe on his trousers, and figured out who he was. Um, Ensign Stone. Bob, you okay? Bob shrugged. Jakeson asked again, Sir, what happened? Stone said, Just what it looks like, petty officer. This is one of the few times in history when we got hit by a shitstorm, literally. Methane must have backed up in some piping under the deck, causing the explosion. We'll investigate how this happened later. The petty officer nodded. Yes, sir. Can we shower first? Without waiting for an answer, she slogged through the mess until she reached the twisted deck plates. Staring down into the gaping hole, she asked, What kind of idiot designs a ship with the plumbing laid right under the main deck hatch? Where was all this shit being pumped to? Exo Gupta called from the last clean spot near the main hatch deck. We're checking into that, petty officer. The medical team can hose you down enough that you don't track this mess across the rest of our decks. Then you and Spacer Gibran are relieved of duty. Go get showered and take the rest of your shift off. Stone began making a data port recording of the torn deck plates from every angle, even reaching down to try for video between decks. XO, it doesn't look like the deck below has been damaged, but I can't tell how far the damage goes between decks. The pipes are really mangled. Gupta nodded. Damage control is on the way. They'll install some temporary bulkheads and deck plates, seal the area, hose it down, and flush the waste out into space. Wait, sir, I have an idea. Leaving this like it is might be a good... A warning klaxon interrupted him. His data port flashed an emergency screen a few feet in front of him. Tactical here. Red alert. Shields up. Butcher's voice overrode the tactical officer's call. Tactical? Tactical, Captain. The warehouse ship's shuttle hatch opened. I hit shields as a precaution, sir. Nothing happened. Their shuttle hatch remains open. We're constantly scanning for a possible shuttle attack. Nothing came out, Butcher asked. Tactical captain, nothing, but... Stone interrupted. Captain Butcher, can you send me a direct feed from Tactical? Let me take a look. Everyone was familiar with his ability to talk to the Draskos, but few people were aware of his heightened sense of smell and enhanced vision. These were secrets shared with only a few close friends, mainly those who'd survived the wilds of Ali's world with him. Butcher was one of those few. Butcher said, Do it, Tactical! A view of the warehouse ship popped onto Stone's screen. The shuttle bay was open, and empty space surrounded the ship. Stone tried to move the view, but it was a static display. Please give me a 360 view around the rusty hinges, sir? The screen exploded into a ball around Stone's head. There, sir. Using a finger, he highlighted the Hyrocanian shuttle. They're camouflaged, but circling around us. Tactical captain, our weapons are hot. Butcher said, Easy on the trigger, son. What do you think, Gunston Stone? I think they weren't satisfied about why we were hanging around and why we started to drift before correcting. Stone's screen was still in a circle around him. Butcher and the tactical officer's faces were inset in windows. A third window popped open, and Dr. Emmons joined the conference. Stone could feel Exo Gupta over his shoulder, watching from behind. Emmons said, I concur, Tom. The Hyrakanian mindset would be to search for any weakness. Their admiral may be probing for a way to force a transfer to a larger combat ship and get off the warehouse ship. It might be able to exploit a weakness if it can spot one. Butcher said, Dr. Emmons, prepare a message from our Admiral Wisniewski, telling the admiral we are fine and in working order. Stone said, Sir, I think we should tell them we did have a problem. Here's what I think we should do. Chapter 33 Stone was back at the main hatch. This time he wore his combat suit and wasn't standing in piles of human excrement. 
Dried feces still littered the walls and ceiling, but the deck had been scraped clean. Sort of. Although the stench was palpable, Stone wouldn't have been able to smell anything if he closed his faceplate. He could have the suit filter out certain odors, but he didn't trust his new suit as much as he trusted his own nose. Only his face was visible with the faceplate open. Stone's new suit wasn't exactly Navy issue, or even a modified Marine combat suit. His grandfather had hired a private company to design and build a special combat suit for him during his time as governor. The suit was as strong as a Marine's suit, but not as bulky. It had extended capabilities, but still met Navy suit standards. Somehow his grandfather had managed to get the suit outfitted with classified Marine camouflage settings. A platoon of Marines lined the main hatch bulkheads, each sealed in their combat suits, weapons ready, and fingers twitching on the trigger guards. He grinned in the direction of Allie's suit. She waved back. Keep it focused, Ensign Stone. Allie's voice boomed through their suit's internal platoon comms frequency. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. He almost chuckled when Corporal Tuttle slapped Allie on the back of her helmet. Allie rubbed the back of her helmet, although she would have barely felt the contact. Tuttle said, I told you that we should have let Hammer's platoon have this job instead of us. You're just way too much of a distraction to that boy. Allie said, Good. Let's keep it that way, Tuttle. And Corporal, staying focused, means you, too. Roger that, boss lady. Allie asked, Stone, anything yet? Before she could finish, a hiss and clank filled the air. Stone glanced behind him, spotting Shorty crouching down, hidden behind a small crate. The piglet was naked as the day Stone first saw him. Shorty nodded, giving Stone as much of a go-ahead signal as he was going to get. Stone hit the main hatch override button, allowing the Hyrocanians on the other side to begin opening the hatch from their side. At the first opening crack, Stone leaned in and took a deep whiff. He slid his helmet closed and said, "'Lieutenant Vedrian, hold, please. I think the Hyrocanians are going with Scenario B. There are only a few unarmored aliens on the other side of the hatch. They're bringing their human captives to us.' He stepped back from the hatch as it cycled open a few inches at a time. Scenario B was their best bet. It was certainly better than Scenario A, where the Hyrocanians simply flooded the rusty hinges in an all-out assault. Dr. Emmons hadn't thought that scenario likely, because their rusty hinges avatar was sending messages hinting at only minor internal damage resulting in the drastic loss of living foodstuffs. It demanded every human and piglet it could. He called to the bridge using his suit comms, Captain, we're going with Scenario B. Wizard send your coded messages. Wisniewski's voice shook with excitement. Cat! Emmons' voice replied, Messages sent. We're overriding comms on the shuttle and the warehouse ship. No one else in their fleet will know anything we don't want them to know. You have a clear window for Scenario B, Blackman. Stone really wished she wouldn't use his first name. Even Trey was more comfortable than the old family moniker his parents stuck him with. Before he could say anything, Butcher's voice flooded their comms. Butcher said, Keep it tight, Ensign. Let's see if we can get our people off that ship without any incident. Any scenario they'd thought of, from A through G, might be deadly to Shorty. The little guy was unarmed. If he was spotted, he might become an impromptu Hyrocanian snack before Stone could react. But Shorty had volunteered and couldn't be persuaded to be anywhere else. The first two Hyrocanians through the hatch were armed. Their usually ugly faces twisted in apparent disgust at the dried feces on the bulkheads and ceiling. They backed up slightly and began pushing a small knot of humans through the hatch. They probably expected other Hyrocanians to be at the dock to herd the foodstuffs to their new cages. They seemed reluctant to enter the rusty hinges. Stone doubted if they cared that it meant letting the humans roam free on the ship. The attitude was one he'd run into among humans more than once. It wasn't their ship, and therefore it wasn't their problem. Stone wanted to greet the humans, to welcome them to safety, hand them something to cover their nakedness, and give them a good meal, but he stayed buttoned up in his suit. He counted, his HUD marking each person, photographing them, and sending every small scrap of physical description to the bridge computers for immediate processing and identification. The Hyrocanians prodded the human captives forward, pushing them away from the shuttle's hatch and into the rusty hinges. Most of the humans looked too numb to be concerned about the smell of the ship they were being sent to. Stone was sure they knew they were being transferred as foodstuffs. He spotted Lieutenant Commander Dorothy Nessayet. She looked around, curiosity evident in her eyes, as was a sharp edge of frustration and fury. She stopped to dig a calloused toe at the edge of the hastily replaced deck plates, shaking her head in obvious criticism over the sloppy job. Stone said, Twenty-three. Hammer, if you please. He kept his voice low, although the Hyrocanians and humans wouldn't have heard him if he shouted. 
His external microphones picked up a pounding noise. Clang, clang, clang. Clang, clang. Clang, 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 clang. Clang. Nessa Yet's face shot up, her head turning. The old Morse code signal began again. S. A. F. E. She said, Look alive, people. Heads up. Those four-armed freaks haven't licked us yet. Stone chuckled at her pun, intended or not, but remained closed up. The humans were just the first part of their expected delivery. Nessa yet shoved her people into a semblance of order and marched them down the corridor out of the main hatch receiving area. He thought they were in trouble when he saw the last three rescuees stop moving before turning the last corner. They froze in surprise. Stone flipped open a channel to see the corridor from Hammermill's point of view. The humans were being welcomed by a platoon of marines who were scooping them up and carrying them full tilt down the corridor to safety. Once they realized what was happening, many of the naked humans ran leaping into the open arms of the marines. Hammermill kicked on his camouflage and leaped into the corridor, pulling the last few to safety despite their startled reactions. There were muffled cries of excitement. The Hyrocanians didn't appear to register the gleeful calls as anything other than the usual screeches of terror from their foodstuffs. The closest Hyrocanian shrugged its shoulders. It was a perfect imitation of a human shrug, except the alien's four arms spoiled the effect. It stood looking with disdain at the main deck area, refusing to step into the smelly mess. Its back arms began waving the next shipment forward. Squeals of pain and terror accompanied a small flood of piglets. The Hyrocanians were using long, rod-like shock sticks to prod the piglets forward. Stone counted. If they could get the piglets in and get the main hatch closed, they might be able to disconnect from the delivery shuttle and back away without being caught. A full company of marines was fewer than usual for a ship the size of Rusty Hinges. Even though the warehouse ship was smaller, there weren't enough marines to seize control of it. They believed they had more weapons systems than the warehouse ship, but with many of them out of operation and with untrained operators, they were at a disadvantage should any conflict break out. Stone was ready if it came to a fight. So were the Marines, the tactical officer on the bridge, and Lieutenant Vera, the weapons officer. Even Spacer Dalish had sharpened his knives. It only took a quick minute before a cluster of piglets swarmed into the main deck area. Without waiting for a signal, Shorty stood up and backed into the middle of the piglets. It looked as if he had been a part of the crowd the whole time. He stood still for a moment. Dozens of piglet faces turned toward him. Stone wondered what Shorty said. The swirling cluster settled down as Shorty spoke, then the piglets began rushing pell-mell down the same corridor the humans had taken. They ran as fast as possible to get away. The Hyrocanians just backed out of the way, letting the piglets run. Stone's suit picked up a distant conversation. His computer could only translate one word, stampede, and then a harsh gargle translated as a laugh. The rush of piglets almost reached its end. A few stragglers had yet to cross the threshold, most limping, helping the lame or carrying youngsters, when a Hyrocanian jumped into their midst. It grabbed a tiny child from a piglet, pushing the parent away. It gurgled and opened its maw, preparing to bite into the neck of the baby piglet. Stone's fist, secure in the combat suit and hidden by camouflage, impacted the Hyrocanian mouth before it closed around the baby. Stone grabbed the helpless piglet with his free hand and tossed it to a startled female. The piglet, the last of her kind on the delivery shuttle, grabbed the baby and ran. Stone said, "'2617. Scenario B is broken.' He twisted his fist, trying his best to break every tooth in the Hyrocanian's mouth. Suddenly his fist broke free from the shattered teeth. Opening his fist, he felt something soft and squishy at the back of the alien's throat. He closed his fingers around it and yanked. Turning, ready to fight the remaining aliens, he saw Allie's platoon flooding through the hatches into the shuttle as they swarmed over the remaining Hyrocanian herdsmen. With nothing more than shock sticks against armored marines, the Hyrocanians might as well have been weaponless. Stone backed against the wall, flicked off his camouflage, and let the Marines do what Marines do. He hadn't thought. He'd just acted. Rescuing one tiny piglet might have just doomed them all. Chapter 34 Stone said, Sorry, Captain Butcher. I blew it down there. The Marines are taking over the delivery shuttle. Butcher said, I saw your actions, and we'll deal with you later. Major Numos, order your Marines forward. You've taken a shuttle before. I'm confident you can do it again. Doctors? Emmons said, Tom, we have a blanket on their comms. 
And Dashiell, all any Hyrcanian knows at this point is that the supply transfer is going slowly and without incident. Butcher said, Keep the main warehouse ship in the dark for as long as possible. Stone heard Emmons chuckling. They're going to be so busy answering stupid calls, they won't know whether to shit or wipe. I got a good call into them now from what they laughingly call their own IT department, asking about the viruses running on their own computers. Hammermill's Charlie platoon quickly followed behind Vedrian's. Numos's Alpha platoon pounded their way past Stone. Many of the Marines gave Stone a thumbs-up or a clenched fist salute on the way past. Escamilla's Delta platoon skidded to a stop at the main hatch to secure the Marines' line of retreat and act as reinforcements. Everyone knew the Marines wanted Scenario C. Their preferred scenario involved a direct attack. Both Stone and Escamillo were surprised when Shorty and Thirty Piglets, all wearing small copies of Marine combat suits, sprinted through the access entryway directly into the Hyrcanian shuttle. The Piglets had set up a workshop on the deck below his hydroponics bay, but Stone hadn't seen the suits since they'd left the Piglet home system. Escamilla said, "'Well, what do you know? Major Numos, you have thirty-one Piglets in combat suits on your six. I doubt they're acting as reinforcements, sir.' Frankly, they look pissed, and I imagine they have their own agenda. Stone smiled at the various vocal marine comments. Hoorah! That'll do, pig. Even, Suey, pig, sick em! This was Stone's mess. He was about to turn and follow Shorty when he spotted a lone Navy combat suit lumbering up the corridor. Spacer Dollish's faceplate was up, and he was grinning. Where do you think you're going, Ensign? Dollish said. We didn't do all that work together on Alley's World for you to run off and leave me now. Stone said, Spacer Dollish, you got my back? Dollish laughed. Oh, hell no, sir. I'm on your left side. She's got your back. He pointed behind Stone. Stone turned and saw a massive marine combat suit. Corporal Tuttle popped open her faceplate. I got your back, Ensign Stone. It's the only part that your girlfriend said I could watch. She ordered me to stay with you, knowing you wouldn't sit this one out like you're supposed to. He reached up and slapped her faceplate closed, turned and closed Dollish's. Let's get a move on before all of the Hyrcanians are dead. Tuttle said, Nice and slow, Ensign. Lieutenant Vedrian said that if I let you get hurt, she would make sure that my next assignment was protecting a convent. She said she has a particular interest in your body parts. All of them, sir, not just the few parts that interest me. Dollish said, You know, Barb, if you really need the Navy to help you with your interests, I'd be glad to volunteer. The man skipped ahead of them, merrily slapping Tuttle on the shoulder with a loud clang. Although three platoons of advancing marines had cleared the corridor, he peeked around the corner at an intersection. Stone saw the infrared markers sprayed on the bulkheads by the marines. Part of Alley's platoon had gone right, Numos had gone left, and Hammermill's platoon split into four fire teams, racing away in all directions. He let Tuttle and Dollish verify the corridors were clear before moving forward. Okay, you two. We helped take the rusty hinges before, and this shuttle should be easier, but we have to stay out of the way. The Marines have specific assignments. Well, we get to freelance a bit. Barb flexed her biomechanical hand in apparent anger. The hand was abnormally strong, but inside a suit gauntlet its power was amplified. Lead on, Ensign. Stone said, Up. This looks like the same configuration of the first shuttle we confiscated. Two decks up should get us to the command center. Tim, you're on point. Barb, you stay right behind me. The hatch at the ladderway was jammed open. A quick weld fixed it to the bulkhead. The weld was at piglet height, but infrared markings were at marine height. The quickly sprayed drawing was one everyone had seen everywhere. Kilroy was here. However, instead of Kilroy, the marine had drawn the face of a piglet peeking over a wall. Additional markings showed the platoon ahead of them had stopped to weld closed a nearby thick hatch leading to the central shuttle component. The four-part tetrahedral exterior was armored and wrapped around a smaller tetrahedron core. Charlie Platoon was racing around welding closed the hatches to that core. That would effectively seal off any main body of Hyrocanians. The plan for this scenario was for Alpha and Bravo to capture the command centers on the four external pieces, locking them down before their assault could be discovered. Once the command centers were controlled, all platoons would break into fire teams to search and secure the rest of the shuttle. Stone didn't want to get between the Marines and their assigned goals, but Allie was right. He wouldn't, couldn't sit this out any more than he could have let that baby piglet become a snack. He let Tim lead them to a blind intersection. Marines waved at them from across the corridor. A ping warned them of action ahead. Stone felt more than heard a muffled explosion, the vibrations tickling the bottom of his feet, 
fed by sensors in his suit. Barb flipped a vis bubble around the corner. The tiny camera fed them a view of smoke boiling out of a command center. Standing behind a shielded tripod-mounted cannon, two massive-suited Hyrocanians blocked the corridor. Tracers boiled through the smoke in a blind torrent of hostile fire. Two others were starting to set up a shielded cannon facing the opposite direction. It would be functional before anyone could go around the long way. The Marines were pinned down, but looked ready to make the assault regardless of the probable deadly outcome. A piglet wrapped inside a tiny combat suit raced forward. He scrabbled low to the deck on his hands and feet. The vis bubble showed them a clear view of the action. Rather than attack the two aliens firing the cannon, the little fellow vaulted upward. A Hyrocanian grabbed him from the air at the height of his arc. Before he could be tossed aside, the piglet lobbed a grenade into the command center. A muffled whump and a new wave of smoke seethed from the center's hatch. Stone dropped to the deck to see beneath the smoke. The Hyrocanian threw the piglet back down the corridor and pushed the cannon barrel in the piglet's direction, apparently to use the little guy as target practice. Like all Hyrocanians, it was a terrible shot. The piglet hit the deck with all four limbs clawing to get out of the torrent of fire directed its way. Without thinking, Stone shot a hand out, grabbing the piglet by an ankle as the creature slid past. Yanking hard, he pulled the piglet out of the central corridor and tossed it behind him. Directing fire at the piglet had the effect of easing the barrage pinning down the marines. With trained muscles enhanced by nanites encased in suits magnifying their tiniest movement, the marines moved. Before they were half a step into the main corridor, a loud screech filled the air, followed by an explosion. Tiny pieces of hyrocanians showered everywhere. Tuttle's vis bubble was knocked out of the air by what looked like, and probably was, a hyrocanian knee joint partially wrapped in armor. Stone rolled on his side and stuck his head back into the corridor at deck level. Piglets rained out of the vent just above the former Hyrocanian cannon emplacement. Whatever they used to take out the cannon had warped the deck and bulkheads. Stone was on his feet, racing into the command center, only a step behind the piglets and marines. Tuttle and Dolish were on his heels. The four Hyrocanians inside the command center weren't a match for the marines, except the marines couldn't get at them. A swarm of piglets was dragging three of them to the ground, tearing and stabbing with vengeful rage. The fourth Hyrocanian was fat enough to be the shuttle commander. It fought back with a fury born of self-preservation. A piglet buried a shotgun barrel deep into the fat creature's gut and pulled the trigger. The Hyrocanian screeched. The blast of pellets succeeded in chewing out a chunk of fat, but didn't hit any vital parts. It grabbed the piglet, but couldn't damage him inside a suit. It threw the little creature across the room, sending him crashing into a knot of piglets, ripping at another dead or dying four-armed freak. The fat commander ignored the slashes of knives digging at its corpulent butt. Slapping the console, it tried to override the vid signal on the main monitor. The vid displayed a chubby Hyrocanian offering shares of a Nigerian prince's large fortune being held for back taxes, saying all the commander had to do was click on the attached link. Stone doubted the Hyrocanian knew where Nigeria was any more than he did. No matter what button the alien pushed, the message on the monitor wouldn't go away. Every time the Hyrocanian pushed a button, a piglet reached around him and reset it. Remembering the simplicity of the Hyrocanian shuttle controls, Stone knew colored lights meant on, white lights meant off. It was that easy. The piglet resetting the controls was trying desperately to keep the white lights lit. The Hyrocanian grabbed the piglet by an arm and swung him like a club. Knocking down a trio of piglets, it threw the piglet at an advancing marine. Instead of ducking away from the armored piglet, or simply swatting it aside to get at the enemy, she caught the dazed piglet and spun around to set him on the deck. Before the Hyrocanian could grab another piglet, who was trying to disembowel it, Stone leapt forward. Throwing all of his combat suit's weight onto the back of the alien's neck, he drove it face-first into the deck. Dolish pushed forward, a massive handgun at the ready, but before he could pull the trigger, Tuttle pushed him aside, reached down, and simply crushed the Hyrocanian's skull. Tuttle said, Dolish, that hand cannon you have will throw ricochets around this room like angry bees after fresh honey. Keep it holstered, would you? This room isn't anything but a metal box, and I don't want to get shot in the ass by friendly fire. Stone jumped up and slapped all of the console buttons, making sure they were all white. A piglet reached up to hand him a roll of duct tape. He taped down all the buttons but the first few. Those were the internal communication buttons. A portly Hyrocanian had just finished a spiel about refinancing mortgage rates when the screen blanked. Stone pushed the first four buttons, turning the lights from white to red. One at the time, he saw the smiling faces of Sergeant Lee, Major Numos, and his favorite view, First Lieutenant Allison Vedrian. 
He ignored the last face, a Hyrocanian spitting angrily about being welded into the central shuttle piece. Their computer was translating its threats about dining on their cold bones when a massive armored fist holding a relatively tiny gun put a bullet in the back of the creature's head. Hammermill leaned in and grinned through his open faceplate. Core secure, Major. He ignored a pinging sound behind him. Just a few corners to mop up here, but we're good. Numus smiled. Make sure we're clear to the nines, people. Ensign Stone, good to have you aboard. You seem to be in shuttle section one. Do you think you can drive this beast into the rusty hinges' shuttle bay? Yes, sir. Numos grunted. Then do it. Stone smiled, punched a few buttons, and set a slow course. Aye, aye, sir. Hyrocanian shuttles used a point-and-click helm and navigation system. It took little skill and less concentration. He glanced up at Allie's picture on the monitor. While I have you, Lieutenant Vedrian, what did you mean when you said you met some people on Peach's Rest who already liked me? You keep ducking my question. Allie smiled. I'm not ducking the question, Stone. I just don't have time right now. Sorry, but I have to go make sure there aren't any Hyrocanians hiding in dark corners. Isn't that right, Major? Numos shook his head. How the hell do I know who you met on Peach's Rest? I've never been to the place. I just prefer that we have all Hyrocanians, dead or detained, before we park this thing inside our ride home. Chapter 35 even behind enemy lines, parked in space a few kilometers from an enemy spaceship, after-action reports were the order of the day. Everyone filed reports. What did they see? Who did they kill? Which way did they run? How did they overcome resistance? Where did they encounter the most resistance? When did they enter the shuttle? Before Allie's interview, Stone tried to get the intelligence specialist to ask Allie about Peach's rest, but the woman ignored him and ducked the question stating that she didn't give a rat's ass about the planet, as the whole place was too rich for her meager Navy salary. His curiosity about Allie's time on what should have been their vacation together was set aside as he was called into the captain's office. Again. He'd already been chewed out for screwing up Scenario B and putting the ship in danger, after which the piglets threw him a party for saving one of their own. They made him an honorary member of their species. He'd already been chewed out for racing into an enemy ship, again without orders, after which the captain awarded him another medal he didn't need. The captain surprised him by presenting him an additional cash award for aiding in the capture of a second shuttle for the rusty hinges. He didn't need the cash any more than he needed the medal. He secretly added the cash to the intelligence specialist's pay account, earmarking it for an all-expense-paid vacation to Peach's Rest. He'd already been chewed out for flying an enemy shuttle into Rusty Hinges before the captain had verified all enemy combatants were dead or detained, after which Master Chief Thomas gave him an attaboy plaque for finally driving something into a garage without hitting the walls or ceiling. He didn't think there was anything else he'd screwed up, at least nothing he could recall. Everyone was getting antsy lying doggo so close to an enemy ship but doctors Wisniewski and Emmons said their control of the Hyrocanians' computer systems kept the four-armed freaks so confused they wouldn't care about a ship they thought of as one of their own. They swore the Hyrocanians believed the stolen shuttle was in their own hangar instead of safely locked down in the Rusty Hinge's shuttle bay. Knocking on the captain's door, he was quickly ushered into the room by the Master Chief. Thomas wasn't the ogre he'd appeared to be back when Stone was a lowly ensign junior grade. Now that he was an ensign senior grade, Thomas was downright friendly. Usually. Not today. Thomas pointed at a chair with a thick finger. Park it, sir. Stone slid into the indicated chair. He nodded at Lieutenant Junior Grade Barnes as he followed him into the room, plopping down on the chair next to him. The rest of the congregants continued gathering in ascending rank order, as tradition required. Barnes gave off an odor of boiled cabbage, his odor of curiosity was mixed with lime's caution scent and a hint of licorice. The licorice fragrance was a clear indication he was hiding some information from someone. The odor could mean anything from hiding a secret sexual fetish to his really having blonde hair instead of today's bright pink. Whatever he was hiding, it wasn't his main concern, as the odor was so light he obviously didn't expect to be questioned about his secret. Stone nodded to Missy Maya, as required by naval etiquette. Not liking the man, he would much rather have ignored him, but rules were rules. He nodded to half a dozen others, just as he'd received nods from Ensign Junior Grade Tander and two midshipmen. The only officer who smiled while nodding was his old boss Vera, the weapons officer. 
He almost laughed out loud at what they all looked like, nodding and bobbing their heads in coordinated unison. Set to music, they would easily appear to be enjoying a rather raucous neo-tempo dance bop. Master Chief Thomas shouted, Room! Ten! Hut! Captain Butcher, Exo Gupta, and Chief Engineer Zavella marched into the room. They sat in the three chairs at the front of the room, their backs to Butcher's desk space. All three immediately opened reports in front of them, blanking out the backside, so the assembled officers couldn't see the data. Butcher didn't appear pleased. Zavella made an obvious show of turning on her recorder. Watching someone turn on a recorder had long since stopped surprising Stone. He always recorded everything per his grandfather's edict, but realized many people valued their personal privacy over the caution of having a record of everything. Still, Zavella's movements indicated an official and formal tone, a warning to everyone in the room. Butcher commanded, "'As you were. Take your seats, people. Damn it, let's get this moving.' Everyone's head jerked around as if they were on strings when the Master Chief slammed the hatch closed as he left the room. Stone felt his backside sphincter tighten up. He didn't know what he'd done wrong, but this meeting couldn't be anything less than an investigative hearing. Racking his brain at this point, imagining a litany of horrors, he clamped his jaw shut to await his fate. He didn't have long to wait. Butcher said, Ensign Senior Grade Stone, front. Stone snapped to attention in his chair. Standing stiffly, he squared his shoulders and every corner in his march, stopping to stand at attention in front of the three most senior officers on the ship. Sir, Ensign Senior Grade Blackman Perry Stone reports as ordered. He held his stance, staring at a blank spot on the far distant wall. Zavella snapped, At ease, Ensign. I have been led to believe that you, against all common sense, record everything. Is that right? Yes, Commander. My grandfather insisted doing so was CYA. You're in the Navy, Ensign, not at your grandfather's knee. Stone nodded stiffly. Yes, Commander, but that doesn't make Grandpa any less wise. Indeed. She shuffled through a few reports on her data recorder, leaving Stone standing. He wondered if he'd recorded something he shouldn't have. He was always careful to never record classified information, and to purge certain conversations quickly. He'd even learned that much of his alone time with Allie shouldn't be recorded, no matter how much he wanted to video them as souvenirs, how private he thought he could keep them, and no matter what Grandpa said. But aboard ship, his data recorder or his civilian personal assistant could have picked up something he shouldn't have. Butcher said, Come on, people. We have better things to do than this bull. Let's get it moving. Stone, you were the first officer at the main hatch after the recent methane explosion, correct? Stone nodded stiffly. A thin, cold trickle of sweat slipped down behind an ear, although the room was actually cooler than Butcher usually kept it. It didn't matter how close he was to the three officers. He could judge their mood by their fragrance from a hundred yards away. But they weren't evidencing any hint about their feelings toward him, although all three were angry about something. Sir, Exo Gupta sent me to the main hatch to investigate for damage control. Gupta nodded. Yes, Captain. He pointed at a report hanging in the air two feet in front of the trio. Ensign Stone didn't get there as fast as I would have liked, but that was his assignment. Butcher said, Stone, did you deviate from your path? Stone had a brief flash of cadet training, where he'd taken the most direct path from one deck to the one below by tearing a hole in the deck. He could have done that here, but tearing holes in a ship in space sounded like a way to get in more trouble than he was already in. Captain, I took the most direct route I know. It involves going down a few decks, cutting across the ship, then back up and along another long corridor— Saying it aloud made him realize he should have cut through from one deck to the next. Zavella snorted. Some day I hope to come face to face with the Cretan who designed this piece of crap ship. That is the fastest way I know of to go from the bridge to the main hatch. She managed to mutter a few more curses while Butcher spoke. Do you recall seeing anything unusual between the bridge and the main hatch? No. Play your recording, Ensign Stone. Stone popped open a monitor from his data port. Grabbing the edges of the view, he pulled it apart until it was a large window hanging in the air. Quickly scanning through the dates he pulled up that day, slipping along at high speed until he reached the point where Gupta ordered him to the main hatch. The assembled officers viewed the monitor, watching him run. As always, it felt eerie watching himself doing something from his own point of view. Occasionally, Butcher, Gupta, or Zavella ordered him to slow down as they made notes about people or things he ran past. No matter how hard he thought, he couldn't imagine what he'd done wrong to be called in front of this assembly. He'd run much faster than he thought possible. 
Watching himself, he realized the resulting mixture of military nanites and Drasco DNA made him so fast the bulkheads were almost a blur as he ran. Gupta caught his breath and hissed slightly when Stone managed to squeeze past a group of spacers in emergency EVA suits. He'd slipped by them without slowing his pace, although he'd had to vault over one of them and slip sideways between two others. Watching him push through the last set of hatches, he realized now why he'd slid so far on the human waist. He'd been moving at an incredible rate of speed. Stopping hadn't been easy. Gupta said, "'Slow the recording down, Ensign. Let's try eyeball speed for this next section.' Stone slid a finger along the playback buttons, dragging the speed slower and slower until it looked like normal speed. He watched himself pull the data port off his chest and slowly record the mess. He saw his arms stretch forth as he kneeled down next to the twisted deck plates near the hole caused by the explosion. A gasp from the crowd behind him made him glance at his forearm. In the video, he'd dragged his arm across a sharp piece of jagged metal that should have sliced him to the bone. His arm wasn't even scratched. His thickened skin wasn't a surprise to Stone, Butcher, or the medical staff, but the average officer wasn't privy to his bodily changes. Zavella said, "'Slower yet, Ensign Stone. I'm going to copy this part of the damage.' Together they watched as the recorder showed each twisted pipe and tube. Many were color-coded for easy recognition. The coding must have been done during the Navy retrofit, because Stone recognized the standard coloring for various functions. Butcher and Zavella chuckled when the replay broadcast Gupta's voice as he asked, "'Ensign?' Are you asking me if the ship has a butthole near the main hatch? Zavella shouted at the display, Stop! No! Back it up! There! She stood up and moved closer to the display. Not satisfied, she looked at Stone and asked, May I? She pointed at the controls for his display. Yes, Commander, of course. She hadn't needed to ask, as it was the Navy's data port, not his civilian personal assistant. Damn it, I can't see from this angle. Stone shook his head. I may have a way to enhance this, if I may? Zavella glared at him. So you don't think I know how to use data port controls? No, Commander. I mean, that's not what I mean. He pulled his personal assistant off its normal place on his collar tab. Can I use this? At Butcher's nod, he pulled up the same date time group. He overlaid the PA's recording over the data ports. Tapping a few controls, the view snapped to a life-sized 3D representation of the damage. For all the normal I could tell, he and Zavella were standing inside the twisted metal hole in the deck. Zavella spun in a circle and pointed. There, that's it. She waved her hands in front of her, trying to move the 3D images so she could see the captain and the XO. Stone easily saw through the hologram image, but tapped the controls until they were hazy. The chief engineer continued, The accumulated waste in this piping is purely the result of bad design, allowing leakage from the main waste recycling system. That valve is another bad design. It's an automatic butterfly valve— designed to allow excess methane buildup to be expelled into space out of a sphincter near the main hatch. She glared at Exo Gupta. Yes, the ship is designed to fart, but that valve is closed and will remain closed during a methane buildup. The only way that can happen is if someone shuts it off from the waste system console a dozen decks down. Butcher said, Shutting this valve has what effect? Zavella looked around stone to glare at Lieutenant Missy Maya. If the methane builds up high enough, and the wrong switch is thrown, a heated pressure wave will travel along this tube. Normally it will just scrub the piping clean as it goes, and blow heat out the ship's butthole, but if this valve is closed, the accumulated methane will explode. Sir! All heads swiveled as Miss Amaya jumped to his feet. Regardless of how this happened, the damage to the ship's waste recycling system is serious. I submit that we must abandon our mission, return to human space, and file our reports. The information we have gathered is too valuable to trust to a damaged ship. Butcher nodded. I will take that under advisement, Lieutenant. Sir, advisement, Lieutenant, Butcher interrupted. Zavella, how long will it take to get that system operational again? Zavella shook her head. With the equipment we have here... Who knows? We may have to rip up miles of decking and bulkheads, surveying and replacing pipe. We— Stone shook his head, then realized contradicting the chief engineer in front of the captain was a stupid thing to do. But he'd done it without thinking. He clamped his jaw shut, swearing not to say anything, and hoped no one had seen him shake his head. Butcher sighed as Zavella stopped her damage repair litany. All three officers stared at Stone. Finally, the captain said, Okay, Stone, out with it. 
Sir, I spoke with Shorty this morning. He said they'll have all systems back to normal by this afternoon. They've replaced all piping that appeared to be stressed, and they put a new butterfly valve in that will activate in the event of a gas buildup. Zavella said, How could they fix it? I mean, okay, they're small enough to crawl around the spaces without tearing up the decking, but... Okay, I guess, but why didn't he tell me? Stone shrugged. I don't know, Lieutenant. Did you ask any of the piglets to help? Zavella shook her head. No? Well, wait, I did ask one of them if he thought he could crawl through and check the pipes for damage control. Damn it, he can't answer me back, so how do I know whether he could or not? Stone said, They do respond. We just can't hear them. I have been around them long enough to know that even the slightest indication that they thought you wanted something done would cause them to go ahead and do it. Besides, I think Dottie, I mean Lieutenant Commander Dorothy Nessayet from the Roanoke, has been working with them. Dottie? Butcher asked. Stone said, Well, she is pleased that we rescued her, sir. She offered to have my children as a way to say thanks. Butcher laughed. She does seem a bit overly grateful. I imagine your girlfriend didn't take to that offer too well. Stone shrugged. Allie said she understood, but after a brief conversation with Dottie, the offer was rescinded, sir. Well, Commander Nessayet has requested a personal meeting with me, so maybe I'll take her up on her offer before I'm too old to enjoy my great-grandchildren. Stone laughed with Butcher, but their laughter died when they realized the rest of the officers were staring at them as if they'd been caught dropping rabbit turds in the raisin bowl. Butcher grunted, It was a joke, people. He looked up and noticed that Missy Maya was still standing. Lieutenant Missy Maya, Rusty Hinges will not be turning around and heading for home space. However, you do make a logical point. We have collected the data we were sent to find, and more. I propose we send one of our shuttles, the human-built ones, back to Ali's world, taking all collected data with them. It might be a rough trip for such a small— Missy Maya snapped to attention. Sir, I volunteer to pilot that shuttle. Butcher pointed a finger at the man. You will not be going anywhere until we find out whether the methane explosion at the main deck hatch was an accident or deliberate sabotage. I will say, if it was an accident due to your oversight, you will be just as screwed as you will be if I find out you deliberately threw that switch, causing the explosion. Sit down and shut up, Lieutenant. Guilty or not, you're relieved from human waste disposal officer duty. He looked at the gathered officers. Ensign Junior Grade Zisk Tander? Tander shot to his feet. Sir, I do not know if Lieutenant Missy Maya deliberately— Shut up, Tander, Missy Maya growled. Butcher said, No, Tander, please go on. Sir, he asked me if I knew of any systems we could damage that wouldn't put us in serious jeopardy, but would be bad enough that we had to go home. Missy Maya was red in the face, but didn't say anything. Tander said, Sir, Barnes was there, ask him. Barnes shot to his feet. Captain, I do not recall any such conversation. He sat back down with a thump. Butcher looked at Stone. Stone, with an exaggerated shrug of his shoulders, said, In my opinion, he's lying. Butcher said, I think we have enough reasonable evidence to order a court-martial for Lieutenant Missy Maya. Since such an event requires higher-ranking officers than we have present, I am relieving the lieutenant of his duties. Young man, you will confine yourself to quarters and have no contact with any member of this crew, human or alien, except at posted meal times. And just so you don't think that I don't know what is going on aboard my own ship, Lieutenant Barnes will immediately vacate Lieutenant Missy Maya's quarters and move back to his assigned cabin. Barnes grew red in the face, jumped to his feet, and said, Captain, there isn't any regulation against my relationship with— Sit down, Barnes, Butcher said. I don't care if you've slept with every officer and half the piglets on this ship. I— He looked at Stone and grinned. Good night, nurse. I do think I've been hanging around Corporal Tuttle too long. I really don't care. He looked back at Barnes and Missy Maya. He is under house arrest, and is under orders not to have any contact with fellow officers. He can't do that with you in the room. Exo Gupta said, Done, sir? Okay, meeting dismissed. Stone turned to shut off his data port and personal assistant. He found Zavella trying to access his personal assistant. Chief Engineer? Damn it, Stone, I need that 3D app you have. Tell this blessed thing to give it up. He made a quick copy of the app and tossed it to her. Closing down his devices, he was about to join the line of officers exiting through the hatch when the officers were pushed aside. Two dozen piglets in armor, with two dozen unarmored piglets, jammed through the space. They were followed by Jay, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne. Shorty was leading the gaggle. Master Chief Thomas rushed into the room waving his arms. 
Sorry, Captain. They came out of nowhere, and I couldn't stop them. Chapter 36 Shorty walked to the front. With a wave of his hand, his armored friends spread out around the captain's office. He held a data port in his hand. Stone hadn't realized Shorty had one of his own. He made a mental note to ask Dollish where the piglet had gotten a standard-issue Navy data port. The piglet tapped the data port, causing a virtual keyboard to float in the air in front of him. Stone was close enough to see Shorty type in a quick command in Empire Standard and pull up a digital clock, displaying it to the officers in the bay. The clock was counting the seconds up, clearly using human standard time. Busher said, What the— Shorty waved an arm. He typed in a short data port command on his virtual keyboard, and a gruff voice broadcast, Wait one, please. The sentence was longer than the short command he had typed, so Stone concluded it was a preset response. He wondered if Wisniewski or Emmons had helped him design the communicator. The unarmored piglets, each holding an engineer's grease pencil used for marking pipes and bulkheads, walked around the room. Calmly and without haste, they marked a big X on everyone's chest. Butcher said, Master Chief Thomas. Thomas shrugged. Sorry, sir, I don't know. I've already broadcast a Situation C. Situation C meant the captain was in danger. Armed Navy security forces and armored marines would come boiling to the bay in short order. Butcher looked at the assembled piglets. Are you sure? They don't appear armed, Master Chief? Thomas said, Armored is armed, sir. Those suits are small, but they could tear through us like wet tissue. Stone asked, Shorty, what are you doing? Shorty just pointed a tiny piglet finger at the rapidly ascending clock. Stone looked at Jay for a response. Jay answered, Mama, he asked me to translate, but he isn't saying anything. He insisted that my girls come along, but even they won't talk to me now. Look, they have their own communicators. Stone hadn't noticed that all the unarmored piglets and Jay's daughters had tiny data ports strapped to their wrists. Each data port had a virtual keyboard floating nearby that gave the Draskos and Piglets the ability to type in a few words for voice translation. He'd had the thought back on Allie's world about doing just this thing, but regulations had prohibited him from following up. He was surprised the Piglets and his Draskos picked up the concept of typing. Not that punching buttons was hard, but it involved learning to read and write Empire Standard. Jay and Peavy could read, because he'd been reading to them and teaching them to read since they discovered they could talk to each other. Jay's favorite book was Jane Eyre, a book that made Peavy grimace. She preferred reading science fiction. He remembered Tim Dollish mentioning the piglets on Allie's World reading an oven manual when learning to make their own sunglasses, so he shouldn't be surprised that the piglets read and write. Everyone stared at the clock. Instead of the numbers racing by with eye-blurring speed, they seemed to slow to a speed reminiscent of a metronome set at its slowest speed. Jay said, Shorty just said that Sissy has taken control of the bridge. I don't think he wanted me to translate that, but he was telling his own people. Stone repeated the statement to the startled group of officers. Shorty, what? Shorty interrupted by tapping the edge of the clock. The frame turned a bright, pulsing red. A shot of oorah filled the air. The hatch flew open and a fire team of four armored marines crashed into the room, weapons at the ready, fingers on the triggers. Their camouflage was in full operation, but Stone easily saw their outlines. A flood of nearly invisible marines boiled through the room, spreading out to cover everyone and everything in the captain's office. Though Stone could see the marines in camouflage mode, he couldn't see name tags, dents, scrapes, or unrepaired combat damage that he usually used to identify who was who. He saw only a faint outline, not unlike a child's coloring book line drawing. He saw their weapons. He saw their fingers on the triggers. No one else in the room could see that much. Shorty tapped the clock again, stopping it. Every piglet in the room, and Jay's daughters, stood still. Each raised their hands in surrender. No one fired. Stone was thankful for that. Most marine weapons were designed to do one thing. Kill. Friendly fire and dead hostages were events the military worked to avoid. But such regrettable consequences of live fire in tight spaces was often unavoidable. Scientists had tried for centuries to develop bullets that could tell the difference between a hostile combatant and an innocent bystander. So far, everyone had failed. 
Stone felt a huge presence at his back, followed by a heavy weight resting on his shoulder. Glancing back, he saw a camouflaged gauntlet laying there. The gauntlet was attached to a giant marine combat suit, but in their ghillie setting he couldn't tell whether this was Tuttle, Hammermill, or any specific one of the 256 marines on board. The hand gave a gentle squeeze. This marine was First Lieutenant Allison Vedrian, his girlfriend. A heavy weight rested on his other shoulder. A huge handgun was using his body as a support, its barrel pointed directly at Shorty. Even though the piglets had signaled surrender, the gun's bore didn't waver a fraction of an inch, and the marines remained in camo mode. Shorty tapped a few commands on his keyboard. The gruff voice said, Three minutes and twelve seconds response time, Captain. He pointed at the X's already fading on the officer's stain-proof uniforms. Each X represents a dead officer. You're dead. You've lost your executive officer and your chief engineer. I will admit we mistimed our attack and only managed simulated kills on seven additional junior officers. However, Sissy reports that you lost every officer on the bridge except for Major Numos. We were unable to surprise him, but we did manage to capture him and get him tied up. Boy, is he pissed. Shorty glanced around the room, unable to see the camouflaged Marines, but everyone knew they were in the room, and more were gathering every moment. I hope you all give me time to apologize and explain. Butcher said, I'm giving you leeway because you've been an asset to me in this ship, but I'll admit that I'm baffled, curious, and a little bit pissed off. Shorty said, It took me and a small group of my people a little over three minutes to take your ship. Oh, Sissy reports that... Butcher's data port comms blared. Numos here. We were invaded by armored piglets. They took the bridge, didn't say anything. Well, anything I could hear. They were here for two minutes, and then they just left. No injuries on our side, although a few of the piglets may need some medical attention. Damn things attacked me, and... Butcher interrupted. Sorry to cut you off, Major. We've had much the same thing in my office. As long as you're good for now, get the Marines on guard, in armor, and lock the damned door. Shorty said, Captain, you humans reacted slow to our invasion. Three minutes is too long. But you responded twice as fast as a Hyrocanian would react. I know. I've studied them for years. And? Butcher asked. And in all of those years as their captive, I didn't have the equipment I needed to do what I needed to do. Now I do. And? You know what my people call me, right? I'm a pirate. I don't deny it. I'm proud of it. I want to use one of the captured shuttles. Some of my people, and these three young Draskos, want to take that warehouse ship away from the Hyrocanians. Chapter 37 Stone glanced at the armored marines lining the captured shuttle corridor. They appeared relaxed, joking and jostling each other, as marines often do when combat is imminent. The rookies of Charlie Platoon joked harder than their veteran counterparts, mostly to cover their own nervous energy. This wasn't Stone's first time in combat, with or without a suit. His nose itched. The irritating tickle was the same one that had plagued humans for thousands of years. The minute one's hands were occupied elsewhere, the nose rebelled and started to itch. Being inside his armor didn't stop his nose any more than it did anyone else's. He leaned his head forward slightly, scratching his nose against the proby bar, relieving the itch. The customized armored suit wasn't built exactly to Navy specifications, though it did have a proboscis scratch bar just below the faceplate and all of the other standard equipment. Navy suits were slight upgrades from commercial-grade EVA or miners suits, except for the weapons. His suit wasn't designed to combat Marine specifications as a weapons platform because Grandpa urged him to avoid combat. However, Grandpa had sent a note along with the man who delivered the suit, stating that if he couldn't avoid combat, the family wanted him protected and able to shoot back. A Marine's suit was designed to handle dozens of different weapons. Stone's suit was the weapon, and its armor was thick and puncture-resistant. Stone doubted a male Drasco in a rape-fueled rage could damage it. The pressure-reactive interior would keep Stone from rattling around inside should he do anything more taxing than dropping from a few kilometers up onto a plasticrete shuttle pad. The specialized interior significantly shortened the breaking-in period, making it almost plug-and-play, or wear-and-kill depending on your point of view. His suit also had a camo setting. Stone didn't ask how his grandfather managed to get the classified design specifications. He never discussed that feature with anyone, lest Grandpa had done something unethical to protect his grandson. 
Everyone knew he had camouflage, but they tactfully ignored how he might have gotten it. He also didn't discuss how his firepower was a match for any Marine without the need to carry handguns, rifles, grenades, or even a thick stick. The suit's enhanced visual capabilities and odor receptors worked in conjunction with Stone's own abilities, although he trusted his own senses more than the suit. With a few minor exceptions, Stone didn't look any different than the Marines surrounding him in this corridor, though his suit cost more than all of theirs put together— he knew the price because he'd tried to get his grandfather to order one for Allie. As much as his grandpa wanted to provide a suit for someone who might become the mother of his grandson's children, Allie refused to stand still for a fitting. Allie said Marines party together, eat together, and fight as one. Until every Marine had a special suit, she wouldn't wear something that wasn't Marine issue. The Marines around him lined the bulkheads. Their camouflage was off as the shuttle slid into the hangar bay of the Hyrocanian warehouse ship. Many of the Marines had their faceplates up. Stone smelled a wide variety of odors. He caught the fragrance of lime from a young Marine, his sense of fear and caution evident on his face. Sergeant Jansen leaned into the Marine, saying something that caused the young man to laugh. Stone smelled rancid grease as more than one Marine worked up his hostility against the Hyrocanians. He identified a strong odor of roses dipped in maple syrup, indicating murderous intent, but he couldn't work up any sympathy for the aliens who would face those particular marines. The familiar smell of pepperoni pizza with jalapenos reminded him of a pretty young marine he'd known a few years ago. She was dead now. Combat marine forces attracted more than their share of borderline sociopathic killers. Stone didn't mind having them along, as long as they focused their urges toward the enemy. "'Hey, boss!' A voice popped into his ear through his suit's communications net. He turned and saw Spacer Dollish looking up at him through his closed faceplate. His armor looked like a walking armory, with dozens of weapons hanging off every possible hook. "'Going somewhere, Tim?' "'I'm off duty, so I thought I'd take a little walk. What about you?' "'I'm just going along with these fellows as a translator.' Dollish's comms gear relayed his disbelieving grunt. His disbelief was well-founded now that the Piglets and Draskos could communicate through their new data ports. Is that why they're coming along? He hooked a thumb over his shoulder. Three Marines dropped into the corridor from the deck above. Hello, sweetie, Tuttle said through her open faceplate. We really should stop meeting like this. Stone grinned. Sweetie, is that how Marines greet each other these days? He nodded at the other Marines. January, al Julie, it's good to see you too. Even though the couple had been married for a few years, he still had a tendency to call the woman by her maiden name. Tuttle laughed. When they're sweet little navy nuggets, yeah, we do. Stone asked, why aren't you with Bravo Platoon? Tuttle answered, Lieutenant Vedrian said we should keep an eye on you so you don't do something stupid. Dollish said, that seems likely to me, sir. Given your past history, I mean. Really? You too? Stone asked Dollish. Tuttle said, I told the lieutenant that she has me watching over your body so often that she ought to let me use it once in a while. She said that I can use any part that I let get shot off. Stone said, Shot off? What did you say? I'm thinking about it. Don't rush me. Stone waved his gauntlet-covered hands around him. I'm embarking with Charlie Platoon. Doesn't Lieutenant Vedrian think that Hammer's whole platoon can keep me safe? Tuttle looked over his shoulder. Sir! Stone turned back around, coming face to face with First Lieutenant Hammermill. Hammermill said, "'Sorry for listening in, folks, but Lieutenant Vedrian is right. Charlie Platoon has our own orders and objectives.' Stone smelled the strong mint fragrance of loyalty wafting from the small crowd around him. He wasn't worried about any of them deliberately putting him in harm's way, but combat was as close to chaos as any human endeavor. The plan was for Stone to stay with Charlie Platoon. But, as every sane combat veteran knew, no plan ever survives first contact with an enemy.' Hammermill continued. Corporal Tuttle, stick with Ensign Stone no matter what the rest of Charlie does. Sir, that's my... Stone quit listening when L started shouting, Mama! 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 I can smell them! Whee! Like, they have B.O. bad! He spun around to see L hunched low to the deck, her back legs planted, with her front legs dancing in excitement. Her neck craned upward as she stared at the closed hatch. Stone slammed his faceplate closed and activated his suit's enhanced fragrance receptors. He caught the scent of hostility, a normal Hyrocanian odor. A Marine private shouted over Charlie Platoon's communications net, Drasco alert, Lieutenant! L went on alert! The Marines couldn't hear any of the Draskos, but all eight had worked with the Marines since they were youngsters. 
Their body language was easy to read. L was so excited, she'd completely forgotten she had a new communicator. Peavy's talons scraped on the deck as she slid to a stop next to Stone. Easy, daughter. Don't rush too far ahead. Stay with your Marines. They need your protection. Right, Mama? Stone said, Teamwork, L. You've trained with the Marines. Your job is to protect them. He patted Peavy on the head. She'll be fine. Your daughters will all be fine. He looked down the long corridor. T was hunkered down like her sister. B was up on her back legs, wings flapping, wonking loudly. I know, Mama. They're just excited. Stone didn't look around for Jay. She was with Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, attached to the Piglet assault troops. He flashed a quick thumbs up to Hammermill as they heard over the comms, Helm here. We've crossed their hangar bay threshold. Thirty seconds to clearance. Marines on my mark. The thirty seconds were gone before Stone could take a second breath. The call came loud and clear. Mark! He was chomping at the bit to flick on his ghillie setting, race forward through the hatch, and drop into the Hyrcanian shuttle bay. But he held his place, trying hard not to dance from one foot to the next, like L and T. Doctors Wisniewski and Emmons were spoofing the alien comms, so they should be expecting the shuttle. The plan was to block all outgoing comms from the warehouse ship until they had complete control. The Hyrocanians wouldn't expect Alpha, Bravo, and Delta platoons to come rushing out of the shuttle. Almost two hundred invisible marines in full armor were about to drop from the shuttle, swarming through the big bay, locking it down to secure it. Stone had hoped to activate his camouflage mode and drop in behind one of the front assault waves. That hope died when Dollish joined him. He didn't have the heart to send the spacer away, and Dollish's suit didn't have a ghillie setting. His presence with the front assault group would give away the initial surprise. Besides, his part of the plan was to stay with Charlie Platoon, PB and her daughters, and act as translators for Shorty's troops. He tagged Dollish and the three Marines on his HUD so they could all see him, even when camouflaged. They didn't have to wait long. A slight vibration shivered through the bottom of Stone's feet. The comms popped open. Shuttle, tactical here. They know we're here. Their weapons have gone hot. Go, go, go! Stone didn't wait for anyone. Vaulting through the closest hatch, spinning in midair, hitting his ghillie setting, he landed on his feet. Things were blowing up all over the shuttle bay, with hyrocanians of all sizes falling to the deck in limp piles of dead flesh. The marines remained in ghillie mode, moving about almost unhindered, except for an occasional hyrocanian shooting at random, trying to hit what it couldn't see. Peavy landed next to him. L, T, and B dropped to the deck from the bottom of the shuttle. Each was accompanied by a team of marines in ghillie setting. Hyrocanians could only see four Draskos dropping into their bay. A loud screech echoed, and a piece of deck plate peeled away at L's feet. Stone spun around, spotting a Hyrocanian on a high catwalk. He pointed a finger at the creature, and squeezed his pinky finger closed. A small bullet described a straight line from the palm of his other gauntlet to the chest of the four-armed freak. Six inches after impact, the small bullet exploded, leaving a pair of Hyrocanian legs standing on the catwalk after a rain of body parts. Stone watched a Marine take a direct hit to the middle of his chest, blowing him backwards in a tumbling somersault. The Marine managed to stop his skid and crawl behind a stack of shipping containers. His ghillie setting had failed, and Stone saw a deep dent in his chest. The Marine gasped for air, flipping up his faceplate trying to breathe. The man was lucky the hit was on the chest plate covering his torso. An impact that hard would easily tear off a body part if it hit a limb or a joint. He was gasping for air, but he was in one piece. The suit's medical system would have to suffice for now. Until they completely secured the shuttle bay, Major Numos wouldn't allow the medical corps into the combat zone. Stone closed his eyes quickly, trying to remember where the shot had come from that knocked the Marine off his feet. Up and angled. He looked up and spotted a high control room at the far end of the hangar. Hyrocanians inside the room were remote controlling a pair of Gatling gun cannons mounted high on the bay's bulkheads. The clear shields over the control room must have been special plexiglass, as the Hyrocanians inside were targeting specific marines, even though everyone was camouflaged. Major Numos's fire team spotted the control room at the same time he did. They reacted quicker. Each fired at the plexiglass with whatever weapon they had at hand— but nothing even scratched the plexiglass. A Hyrocanian spotter jabbed fat, stubby fingers at Numos. A gun operator swung the cannon using its back arms to rotate the machine while its front arms depressed the muzzle and hit the trigger. A long stream of bullets splattered against the deck. Numos and two of his team were gone before the bullets reached the spot. 
The fourth marine was slow. She disappeared in a pink mist amid a swirl of broken, twisted suit. Stone pointed a finger at each of the bulkhead-mounted cannons and fired by squeezing the ring finger of his other hand against the palm. A pair of pencil-sized mini-rockets streaked upward from the middle of his chest. Before they were halfway across the open space, he pointed his finger at the plexiglass and squeezed a finger three times. Three quick jolts pushed his arm backwards. The mini-rockets slammed into the cannons at the same time the much faster bunker-busters hit the plexiglass with a splat. The mini-rockets blew deep cavities in the bulkhead, ripping the Hyrocanian cannons into tangled masses of useless metal. The mini-rockets provided a clear trail from his chest directly to the cannons, giving the Hyrocanians a clear view of who had shot at them. The bunker-busters plastered across the plexiglass, spreading out like spitwads on a window, blocking the Hyrocanians' view. They glared at him from around the blobs blocking their view. Using his enhanced suit optics, he saw a fat Hyrocanian shouting at another— Another cannon slowly lowered from the ceiling of the hangar. The fat alien pointed at Stone and shouted something at its companions. Stone smiled and waved goodbye as the three bunker busters finally melted their way through the plexiglass, blasting the interior with heat and a shock wave that pulled the whole control room away from the bulkhead. It crashed to the hangar bay deck. The interior of the plexiglass was painted with blood. It was undisturbed, except for three tiny holes. Stone nodded in satisfaction. He'd learned the suit functions in a sim, and was pleased they were easier to use in reality. Hearing a screech, he turned and saw PB throw a Hyrocanian to B. The Hyrocanian was trying to get into its combat suit, but was only partially covered. B ripped it the rest of the way out and drove her armor-tipped bone spike through its skull. PB shouted at TNL, "'Training, girls! Block that hatch, and do not get ahead of your teammates!' Stone nodded. PB had learned. The first time—no, the second time they'd invaded a Hyrocanian ship, she and her sister had raced so far ahead, some people had died trying to keep up. He shook his head at the thought that this was actually his fourth time inside a hostile alien ship. That was crazy. What was a rich kid like him doing such things for? He glanced up and chuckled. At least this is inside. Catching movement out of the corner of his eye, he turned and watched B jump into a knot of Hyrocanians, trying to get through a small maintenance hatch. Most were too fat to fit through the hatch more than one at a time. She scattered them and yanked the hatch shut. The Hyrocanians, suddenly faced with an enemy they could see, yanked knives and wrenches from hidden spots in their hideously colored trousers. Stone said, This is stupid. He leapt into the middle, covering the thirty yards in one distance-eating shallow leap. He triggered the welding flame on the suit's left wrist and flexed out a double-edged dagger from his right gauntlet. Grabbing the nearest Hyrocanian, he killed it before he could squeeze his hand into a fist, the high temperature of the welding torch burning into its brain. His right hand jabbed into the eye socket of a Hyrocanian, trying to jump on B. B grabbed a pair of Hyrocanians and threw them to her mother. Oh, like, you know, tag your it. PB only caught one with her hands. The other she skewered with her tail spike before it hit the deck. Rather than keep the one she caught, she threw it onto her other daughters, turning back to charge into the knot of aliens surrounding Stone and B. Stone's suit reported added weight on his back. A pair of Hyrocanian hands wrapped around his head, blocking his faceplate. He was about to activate the counterattack switch when the hands and the weight disappeared. He spun around in time to see Dolish put a boot against the creature's neck, pinning its head to the deck. The spacer put a quick bullet into its brain. Tuttle patted Dolish on the back as she and her two companions strode past him, nearly knocking him to the ground. She slapped stone on the back of his helmet. The suit protected him from damage, but the clanging rang loudly in his ears. I'm supposed to be your support, Ensign. You get ahead of me again like that, and I'll tell the lieutenant you asked me to give you a blow job because you didn't think she was any good at it. She, January, and Al Julie waded into the rest of the Hyrocanians, struggling to run away. Her voice took a different tone as she put a fist through a Hyrocanian throat, in one side and out the other. I'll do it too, sir. Don't keep testing me. Gripping a Hyrocanian under each arm, she stopped and looked back at him. Wait, I mean, I'll tell her, not the blowjob thing. She twisted and dropped the two bodies to the deck. Wait, I mean, I'll do the blowjob thing, but I won't tell her if you want. But if you get ahead of me, then I'll tell on you. Allie's voice popped onto the comms. Private Tuttle, I'm listening in. What did I tell you about propositioning Stone? Tuttle chuckled. Sorry, Lieutenant, but it's Corporal Tuttle. 
Not if you keep trying to get into Ensign Stone's pants. Now shut up and go kill something. Stone turned to the maintenance hatch as a knot of Hyrocanians dwindled to a few panicked stragglers. His welding torch was still lit, so he melted the hatch closed with a quick tack of liquid metal. It wouldn't hold long, but he didn't need it to hold long. Before he could comment about the women not fighting over him, Numos announced over the comms, Anger Bay is secure. All hostiles eliminated. Marines, stand by. Chapter 38 Stone was privy to the rest of Numos's conversation as a member of the officer's comms net. The major said, Rusty Hinge's bridge, are we still a go? Butcher here, Dash. Wizard and Cat say yes, you're still a go. No one on the warehouse ship knows we've captured their hangar bay. They think there was a minor explosion, but the hangar deck crew has it under control, and they've locked the bay down for safety reasons. The rest of the ship is busy running around filling out a flurry of phony warehouse orders. The number of supply requests Wizard and Cat sent should empty their stores completely. Numo said, Phase two is a go. Looking back up at the shuttle they had arrived in, Stone watched a torrent of piglets, both in armor and unarmored, exit and surround Jay and her daughters. An armored piglet pointed at a life support grate set high in a bulkhead. Shorty typed a quick command into his virtual data port keyboard. His simulated voice said, I want up there. Stone hadn't recognized Shorty in his armor. Jay grabbed the piglet around the waist and lifted him as high as she could. He reached up, grabbed the grate, and pulled. It popped away so easily he lost his balance, falling backwards. Jay prevented him from hitting the deck. She then inserted him into the gaping hole. He dropped a flexible ladder, allowing half a dozen armored piglets to climb up to him. They disappeared into the ship's life support system, followed by a dozen unarmored piglets, each carrying a full bag of tools. An armored piglet pushed stone. It pushed with all its might, but he didn't move. Jay said, Mama, he says you're in his way, and to move your bloated human body so he can go to work. Stone stepped to the side. The piglet cut the tiny weld away from the hatch, yanked it open, and disappeared into the bowels of the ship, followed by a couple dozen of its companions. Anne shouted after them, Like, you all be careful, you know? Emily said, I wish I was small like them, for sure. I mean, like, then I could fit through these small holes. Do you think I have a fat butt? Anne wooted, of course you have a fat butt, but like it matches your fat head. Charlotte plunked down on the deck and hung her head. Should have stayed with the Marines. We didn't get to fight Hyrocanians like PB and her girls. PB and her daughters had scattered with their Marines. Charlie Platoon reforming near the doors. Second Lieutenant Escamilla's Delta Platoon was disappearing into a second shuttle parked in the bay. First Lieutenant Vedrian's Bravo Platoon was swarming up into a third shuttle. Both platoons would ensure no Hyrocanians were hiding in the shuttles. Jay said, Easy, girls. We aren't done yet. Emily said, They stink like they need to be killed. Anne asked, Mama, is it true they eat us? Stone signaled his team to follow him. They joined up with Charlie Platoon and a growing contingent of piglets. Most of the unarmored piglets had disappeared through various maintenance hatches, even cutting into the decks to disappear into the bowels of the ship. Stone said, L, it's true that these creatures eat Draskos. If we don't stop them, they will cut off your tail spike, tie your hands, and cut chunks out of your bodies to eat while you watch. Ew, gross! He wasn't sure whether it was Anne, Charlotte, or Emily who responded, but he had to agree. They eat humans and piglets, too. Emily said, That's, like, not right, you know? Stone couldn't agree more. Jay said, Girls, remember your marine training. Stay with your assignment. Remember to use your comms when talking with any human except Mama. Jay's daughters spread out, each pairing up with a small group of piglets. Jay slid into place next to Peavy. The two sisters hung their heads close together. They didn't like being assigned to different spots, even for a short time. For the initial phase, Jay had been assigned to the piglets, more to ride herd on her daughters than interpret, and Peavy had been assigned to Charlie Platoon with her daughters as shock troops. Being separated was hard for them, and Stone had to agree. Jay and Peavy would remain with Stone for the next phase of the operation. If either Jay or Peavy was killed, the remaining Drasco would begin the conversion to male. No one wanted that. They could lose any one of the Drasco trios, but having two killed would be disastrous. 
Males were known to be raging, raping idiots. The prevailing theory was that Draskos always came in threes. When one of the triplets died, the remaining two would grow to a larger size, like J and PB. If one of the remaining two died, the last of the trio would begin the conversion to male. No one knew how long the change would take. Various scientists wanted to test the theory, but during Stone's tenure as governor, he had steadfastly denied permission for those scientists to capture three wild Draskos and kill them off one by one, just to see what would happen. Shorty's voice boomed in Stone's ear through the comms. We're at the bridge, and engineering will lose all power in five mics. Stone keyed his comms for all Marines and the Rusty Hinges Bridge to hear his relay. Shorty reports phase two complete in five minutes. Stone expected the gathered assault troops to get ready. Then he realized they were all in place and ready. At Numos's call, Baker and Delta platoons came swarming back from searching the two shuttles, their numbers swelling the ranks of Marines, Draskos, and Piglets, all waiting for Shorty to give them the go signal. Shorty's gruff voice simulation shouted, Go! Chapter 39 Stone shouted, Go! Soon every Marine NCO was shouting, Go! 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 Marines blasted through hatches, spreading into the ship, flowing like water from a broken dam, seeking every nook and cranny. Piglets followed behind, digging into every bit of technology they could find, shutting down this, turning that off, and putting locks on the other. T raised up on her hind legs, wonking excitedly, pounding on a wide hatch. Two Charlie fire teams clustering behind her raced past her when the hatchway gave in. The eight marines entered the bay with weapons blazing. T followed on their heels. Suddenly a Hyrocanian flew out of the hatch to the far side of the corridor, slamming into the opposite bulkhead. It crumpled to the deck in a broken heap. T stuck her head back out of the hatch and, with what looked like a typical human reaction, spit on the lifeless body of the dead alien. However, considering Drasco physiology and their fertilization method, the spitting thing probably had a different meaning to T. P.B. said, "'Left, Mama! Down that way!' Rather than point, she raced away from the bulk of Marines. Jay shouted, "'Yes! Yes! There!' Stone raced after his girls. He was confident Dollish, Tuttle, January, and Al Julie were following him. P.B. crashed into a wide hatch, the thick metal door giving way under her weight. She jumped high, almost flying through the open hatch, while Jay, only half a step behind her, slid beneath her. Screeches and cries of terror echoed back out of the cabin. A pair of obese Hyrocanians ran out of the hatchway into the corridor. Their tiny eyes were wide with fear. Spotting the advancing humans, they turned and fled the other way. Fat folds wobbled as they ran. Tuttle said, January and Al Julie. Without waiting for a command, the two Marines raced after the runaway aliens. January took great bounding leaps, while Al Julie actually managed one long, shallow bounce. He killed both Hyrocanians before his wife could catch up to him. Not rushing, Stone stepped into the bay through the wide hatch. Jay and Peavy had eliminated a pair of exceedingly fat Hyrocanians, officers from the size of their waistlines. Jay wore a deep cut across her face. Her chosen target had been holding a long knife when she attacked. She had stomped him into little more than a puddle. Peavy was methodically backing a Hyrocanian pair into a corner. The long-bladed knives they held in each hand whirled and swirled as the eight blades clanged against Peavy's tail spike. She hunkered low to the ground, attempting to spear either or both of the four-armed freaks. Angry and in pain, Jay held a Hyrocanian in her arms. She was slowly pulling its arms out of its sockets one at a time. Stone understood her feelings, but he couldn't condone torture. A quick bullet from his suit put the creature out of its misery. Jay wonked angrily, shaking the dead body in frustration. Tuttle reached around Stone and shot one of Peavy's cornered hostiles through the chest. Peavy vaulted on top of the remaining alien, crunching bones and breaking parts. Her angry, triumphant wonk was so loud, Stone's suit dampened the noise to protect his ears. Stone recognized the dead remains in the middle of the cabin. Bloody pieces were scattered carelessly about. The remains were human. He raised his arm to shoot this last officer. The Hyrocanian, the fattest one they'd seen to date, held a long-bladed knife. The creature was poking its blade through the slats of a cage set against a bulkhead. A blur sped past him. Dollish leaped into the arms of the remaining Hyrocanian, blocking Stone's shot. The Hyrocanian caught Dollish in mid-leap with its back arms, while still trying to jab his knife into the cage. The weight of Dollish's suit caused them both to crash onto the deck, with Dollish on top. 
Pulling knives from hooks at his waist, the spacer shoved them deep into the Hyrocanian's neck, nearly decapitating him. With all the hostiles dead, Stone turned his focus toward the cage. Three naked humans huddled in the cage. One of the two women was more than a little pregnant. The male was cut across his hands and forearms from trying to prevent the Hyrocanian's knife from reaching the women. Blood dripped from his arms, splattering the bottom of the cage. Stone flipped up his faceplate. The Emperor's forces are here. Take it easy, folks, and we'll get you out of here as quickly as we can. The women started babbling, but the man just stared. Stone grabbed the door to the cage and yanked. The lock gave way with a creak and snap as the metal twisted. Let's get you out of there. The man pointed at the Draskos. What kind of hell-spawn demons are those? Are they dangerous? Stone looked at Jay and Peavy. Yes, they are, sir. However, they're on our side. He pointed at the dead Hyrocanian under Dolish's blade. I'm sure you'll prefer their company to that. The man nodded. Of that I have no doubt, sir. How many are you? How do we get— Stone interrupted. One moment, sir. He turned from the man to make a comms call. This is Ensign Stone. The Hyrocanian database was wrong. We've found more humans on board. My locator is on. Please send medical corps to my location ASAP. We have three civilians in hand, one injured. He looked around. January, can you and Private Al Julie see about getting first aid? Dolish interrupted. I got it, boss. He made the man sit down next to the women. Pulling a pair of thermal blankets from some deep pocket in the thighs of his suit, he covered the women. Sorry, sir. I've only got two covers. I do have a first aid kit, so let me see what I can do for those cuts. Stone said, Thanks, Tim. January and Al Julie, please backtrack and make sure we get medical safely in here as soon as we can. The two Marines got a confirming nod from Tuttle and bolted out of the cabin. He keyed his comms. Major Numos, I think we stumbled into an officer's banquet. Pardon my language, but the fat bastards had four humans on the menu. We were too late for one, but we have three civilians with us now. I suggest we keep our eyes open for more humans and piglets. Numos asked, Are you sure they were officers? Stone replied, No, sir, just that they were fat enough to be officers, and their pants are so bloody garish they're hard to look at. I'm not even sure Hammer would wear something that gaudy. Besides, who else on this ship would have the authority to fudge their warehouse database to keep a few tasty human morsels for their own enjoyment? Numos said, We've encountered a lot of workers crammed into barracks or shuffling cargo in warehouses. Fat, but not obese. You may have finished off the officers. What does Shorty say about the bridge? Stone looked around. Sorry, Major, I haven't heard from him. I've tried calling, but I don't get an answer. We need to find a piglet in armor. He looked at Tuttle with a raised eyebrow. She shook her head. Not a chance, Ensign. I have no intention of leaving you to go find a communications link to the bridge. PB was licking Jay's cut. They looked at him expectantly. Stone said, Jay, would you and PB please go find me an armored piglet and bring it back here? Jay raced through the hatch, followed quickly by her sister. Tuttle stood in the hatchway, her back to the cabin, weapons at the ready. An explosion caused her to duck back into the cabin. She stuck her head back into the corridor quickly, the muzzle of her rifle swinging back and forth, looking for something to shoot. Stone turned back to the injured man. Dolish had most of the cuts bandaged, although the wrappings were quickly soaking through. Sir, do you know how many other humans were on this ship? The man shook his head. We started with seventeen. Just us three now. How many were military? The man looked surprised. Military? No, sir. All seventeen were from the skiff we were on. We was out past Holloman's Rift, headed toward Epimides Four. They was three crew and fourteen of us refugees. You weren't taken from a military ship? You were in deep space in a skiff? He made a mental note to look up where Holloman's Rift and Epimides Four were in human space, but it sounded like they were at the edge of human space, far enough out and off the normal space lanes that they hadn't ever appeared on a Stone Freight Company manifest. He knew a skiff wasn't designed as anything more than an intrasystem runabout, most not even hyperspace-capable, although smugglers often retrofit them. These three, and probably their whole ship's company, might never have appeared on the Hyrocanian ship's warehouse logs. The man said, "'These two girls are my daughters, sir. That's all that's left of my family now. I expected God's saving hand before now, but his will be done.' We was running from Eden's side out beyond Holloman's Rift. Had to. It was either deny our God or be slaughtered by the prophet. We surely never expected to be scooped up by alien devils. Stone shook his head. Wait, you were religious refugees before you were captured by Hyrocanians? 
Religious freedom was one of the basic tenets of an individual's full rights as an empire citizen. There were lots of reasons for citizens to become refugees, but religious oppression generally wasn't one of them. The man nodded and pointed at the bodies of the four armed freaks. Ira Canyons is them things that been killing and eating us? At Stone's nod, he continued, Might as well stayed at home, even though the prophet's men would have put us through the testimonies. I am sorry, sir, Stone said. The prophet? Testimonies? He glanced around. Dollish and Tuttle shrugged, but Dollish didn't stop trying to keep the man from bleeding to death, and Tuttle never took her eyes off the corridor. We sent word to the emperor for help, but he don't care nothing for us poor folk far out at the edge of human space. He let out a long sigh. The prophet is the self-appointed leader of Eden's side. Says he be appointed directly by his god and has a right to rule. He claims his obligation is to convert all of human space to worshipping his way. His testimonies are how he done gets folks to convert. I tell you, many a person come out of the testimonies with their eyes poked out, missing fingers, toes, or a whole hand. He miraculizes some to replace an eye or a hand here and there, but some folks who refuse to give in don't come out at all. Weans was running from that, but I guess we should have stayed. Death by these animals or by the prophet be all one and the same, excepting the prophet wouldn't have eaten the children first. Stone started to speak, but the man had a faraway look in his eyes. I don't guess getting eaten would be much worse than being worked to a slow death in the prophet's spaceship factories. Spaceship factories? The man nodded. The prophet and his men are building a huge fleet of ships. He says it's to spread his gospel across human space, but he's already built more ships than he has people to use them. He looked thoughtful. I don't rightly know where all his extra ships go. Stone spun around at a loud crash. January and Al Juyi raced past the open hatchway, guns blazing. A medical corpsman trailed behind them. Tuttle grabbed the medic by the collar of her flak jacket and dragged her into the cabin, pushing her toward the rescued humans. The medic squeezed past Stone and shoved Dollish out of her way without regard to their rank. Dropping to her knees, she began working on the man's wounds. She yanked Dollish's first aid attempts away with disgust, spraying the cuts with anticoagulant. Stone turned back to the hatch. January and Al Juyi had returned. They bracketed the hatch to the corridor, each facing a different direction. Tuttle stood a few steps back from the hatch, but no less alert. Stone opened his comms. Stone here. I'm sending the three rescued humans back to the shuttle. Numos's voice interrupted. Negative, Ensign. We aren't secure yet. Shorty's gruff voice blared out. We have the bridge, but our people can't get into engineering. They've blocked us. Stone marveled. The piglet must be a wizard with a keyboard. The voice translation was almost without hesitation. Numos said... We've cleared or locked down almost everything else, but without engineering, we're at a standstill. I need all hands to help break through to engineering. Stone, lock your captives in for their safety, then get down here with your team. Aye, aye, sir. He turned to the medic. Did you hear? Not looking up from her work, the woman nodded. Just lock the door behind you when you leave. It only took a moment to slam the hatch behind them. January welded a quick tack of metal to seal the door, as Al Juyi used a spray can to make a huge note on the wall about humans being inside the cabin. Before any of them could draw a second breath, they had left the cabin behind them, sprinted down the corridor, and vaulted down a ladderway. Tuttle leaping to a point position, Al Juyi and January following behind, with Dollish right on Stone's heels. After a few decks, Tuttle shouted a warning, and Stone screeched to a halt, almost bumping into Jay and Peavy coming up the ladder. Jay held a squirming armored piglet in her arms. He started to wave them on to follow him, but stopped and called to his small band, Wait! Tuttle looked up through the ladder well. One more deck, Ensign Stone. Come on! Jay shouted, No! Mama! Bad ones down below! Peavy pulled up a virtual keyboard on her dataport translator and typed in a code. Down. Her simulated voice was barely a match for the one Stone was accustomed to hearing in his head. Dollish said, you're the boss, Ensign. You have a better idea? Turning from the ladderway, Stone sprinted down a corridor past his team. They sped after him. Calling up the ship's schematics, he verified he was headed the right way. The whole corridor displayed marks on the bulkheads. 
Each room had been cleared, sealed, and marked by marines or piglets. Stone smiled when he saw a pictograph of a Drasco throwing a Hyra Canyon. It was drawn at piglet height. He didn't slow his sprint. He spotted a group of armored piglets. "'Follow me!' he shouted. He continued running, not bothering to see if they obeyed him. He didn't even know if they were part of the piglets who'd been around humans long enough to understand Empire Standard. He did notice that Jay turned loose of her armored piglet with reluctance, almost as if she were letting go of a contest prize. He skidded to a stop in front of a welded hatch and pounded on it. "'In here! Get this hatch open!' Tuttle said, "'Aye, aye, sir. We're on the wrong floor, Ensign, but—' She didn't get to finish her sentence, as Jay and Peavy both grabbed the hatch and yanked. The hatch warped, but held. Stone reached a hand between his Draskos. He grabbed a handle and pulled with all the might of the suit, managing to rip the handle away from the hatch. Tuttle pushed him out of the way. "'Watch him,' she admonished her fellow Marines. Flexing her gauntlet-covered biomechanical hand, she punched a hole through the hatch. Grabbing the edges of the new hole, she wrenched the hatch from its hinges. As a group, they stormed through the hatch. Racing between their legs, dozens of armored piglets joined them. January and Al Julie stopped at the gaping hole where the hatch had been. The two marines spread wide as a large herd of unarmored piglets were herded into the room by a marine fire team. The piglets were unarmed and without tools. Their eyes grew wide seeing others of their species in combat suits. PB's data port voice said, The piglets from Rusty Hinges are telling these others that they've been rescued by you, Mama. Stone listened with one ear as he scanned the deck plates around him. He took the time to reply, We don't have time to coddle them. Tell them we'll get them to safety as soon as we can. One of the armored piglets passed along his words. In a flash, the former captives began scouring the open bay, jerking a pipe loose from here, tugging a metal bar loose there, and wrenching a long staff from somewhere else. The way the piglets swung their improvised weapons, it left no doubt that they wouldn't be recaptured without a fight. Stone jabbed a finger at a deck plate. Here. Without waiting for help, he dug his fingers into a tiny crack between the plates and pulled. The warehouse ship had not been subject to the same level of poor maintenance that Rusty Hinges had. Steel screws squealed and complained as the deck plate slowly gave way. An ever-widening gap gave Dollish room to squeeze in and get a grip. With a grunt, Dollish pulled, his suit adding strength to stones. Tuttle shoved a long pipe into the gap. A pair of marines grabbed the end of the lever and pushed. The plate held. Stone dropped to his hands and knees under the pipe. Stiffening, he acted as a fulcrum, with Tuttle shouting at the marines to push the end of the pipe down, not up. The thick deck plate rolled back as they worked their improvised pry bar deeper and deeper into the gap. Stone grunted as a loud crack, similar to weapons fire, sounded when the deck plate finally peeled away. Jay shouted, forgetting her data port, Mama, I can smell them now. They're below us. Peavy used her comms and declared to the room, Down. We go down now. Stone glared at the hole. There were myriads of pipes, conduits, and wires running between the decks. Engineering should be right below us. We have to get through this mess without tearing up something vital. An armored piglet jumped into the hole. He pointed at his chest as his voice transmitter said, Vent runner. He grabbed a wire and pulled it free. He tossed the long wire piece to a second piglet. The second piglet used the wire and spliced into another wire in two places, cutting between the splices. The vent runner pointed at a pipe. Cut! Turning his welding torch to high, Stone slashed through the pipe. The metal melted away like water flowing downhill. Dollish leaped into the hole, yanking the pipe out of the way, throwing it to the side as Stone cut again where the piglet pointed. Point and cut, point and cut. In a flash, Stone cut a wide gap. He ignored the sparking ends of live wires and dripping fluids from a couple of pipes. Grinning, he didn't think he'd cut through anything important. This time. Doing a quick mental calculation, he twisted the knob on his wrist to reset the depth of his torch. Slicing a deep groove into the bottom deck plate, he hoped it would hold until he was ready to break through. Stone here, Major Numos. He glanced up. Seven Marines and Dollish stared at him from the rim of the hole. Each had weapons ready. Each had fire in their eyes. Each gave him a thumbs up. A ring of armored piglets surrounded the marines. Behind them stood a thick crowd of unarmored piglets, each armed with a stick, a pipe, or a staff. A three-fingered piglet gave a thumbs up. It was a little disconcerting, since it looked like getting the finger, but Stone understood the message. They were ready. Numos here, Ensign. What's your status? Major, I'm ready to make ingress into engineering. In five... 
four, three. Numo shouted, You're what? Damn it, Ensign. Hammer, ready on the left. Alley, ready on the right. Two. Stone leapt straight up. His suit piston muscles took him all the way to the ceiling above. He pushed off the upper deck ceiling, shoving as hard as he could. The extra thrust and the weight of the suit sent him hurling into the hole, adding momentum to his weight. One. The final piece in the deck plate let go. Stone crashed through into engineering, his suit taking the thirty-meter drop with no more jarring to his knees than if he'd just stood up from a perfectly designed chair. A nanosecond later, it was raining Marines. Tuttle, January, and Al Julie, with the other fire team, dropped beside him. Dollish crashed to the deck shortly thereafter, not getting to his feet fast enough to stay out from under J and Peavy as they followed the humans. Stone kept his voice calm. January and Al Julie, please get those hatches open. He jabbed fingers in the directions where Numos and the rest of the Marines should be deployed. He looked at the four man fire team. Not knowing their names, he addressed them as a group. Marines, try not to damage anything that might blow the ship up. Without a word, the Marines raced toward a knot of Hyrakanians. Most of the aliens were unarmored, but with or without protection, a fire team of angry Marines dropping into your midst was a death sentence. The Hyrakanians died quickly, though not exactly quietly. Stone spun in a circle as piglets began dropping from the ceiling. He pointed at various systems. Piglets raced where he pointed, either singly or in groups. They killed any Hyrakanians they encountered and secured the equipment, engines, or whatever Stone pointed at. Making room for a homemade ladder and a swarm of piglets climbing down to assist, he moved away, followed by Dollish, Tuttle, and his Drascos. He noticed January and Al Julie were about to be pushed back from a hatch by a group of armored Hyrakanian defenders. When the Marine fire team hit the four armed freaks in a bone crunching flanking movement, sweeping them away from the hatch before Stone could shout. Marines led by Numos, Vedrian, and Hammermill boiled into engineering. Stone moved to the spot where he thought the anti-gravity spinning disks should be, but they weren't there. Looking around the area, he spotted them across the huge bay. Before he could direct Numos to the disks, a group of Hyrocanians attacked his small group. The aliens were armed with a few hand tools and their kitchen knives. They must have been desperate. A Hyrocanian slammed into Stone, causing him to take a step backwards. Grabbing the enemy by the arms, he twisted sideways, using the creature's own weight to throw it to Jay. Jay plucked the Hyrocanian out of the air by an ankle, and slammed it to the deck with a bone-shattering thump. PB bellowed a deep-throated roar, and leapt into the middle of the Hyrocanians. She threw one to her sister, knocked another to the ground, and drove her tail-spike through a third. Stone couldn't shoot. Even if PB wasn't in the way, there were far and away too many delicate pieces of equipment that might get damaged by errant gunfire. He was about to follow PB into the middle of the Hyrocanian defenders when they were swept aside by a wave of marines. Hammermill led the charge, carrying the enemy away like litter on a light breeze. Stone climbed onto a tall piece of equipment to get a view of the engineering bay. He'd barely stood up when he heard Numos's voice crackling over the comms. Engineering secured, Captain Shorty. The ship is yours. Chapter 40 the cluster of people gathered around the bridge conference table couldn't help but smile. They were still behind enemy lines, with dozens of enemy ships surrounding them. Their way home wasn't guaranteed. It was still a toss-up whether backtracking using the Hyrocanian database would get them back to Ali's world. Slipping away from the system, the human shuttle carrying all their gathered information headed for the piglets' home. Everyone was hopeful the piglets' code would let them into their system and then out again. The good news outweighed the bad— they had successfully taken a second ship from the Hyrocanians. Admittedly, the ship was smaller than the rusty hinges and designed as a warehouse, but it was in the hands of an allied species. The alliance was unofficial, but Butcher and Shorty were happy with the arrangement. Several thousand of his people followed Captain Shorty, although the little piglet himself remained with the humans for the time being. A few hundred piglets remained on the rusty hinges— no one asked whether they were following the piglet pirate or feeling some sense of obligation toward their human rescuers. Commander Nessiet had taken charge of the rescued humans and piglets now aboard the rusty hinges. They had recovered eight additional humans and two hundred piglets not on the warehouse ship's manifests. Apparently the Hyrocanians were not above skimming a few profits or fudging their warehouse supply sheets for personal gain or amusement. The humans' new camouflaged repulsar mines now blocked every jump point in the system. 
Apparently, the Hyrokanians had not noticed that ships occasionally left the system, but none ever entered. The civilian scientists had hacked the computers of every ship in the system. All databases were duplicated, and the team of Wisniewski and Emmons were confident they could spoof any ship, making them believe anything Butcher wanted them to believe. The only Hyrokanian computers they could not spoof were on the stationary weapons platform orbiting the planet and its attendant ground-based protector. Captain Shorty had transferred Sissy to their new ship and installed her as the interim commander, despite her objections. Sissy had given Butcher everything she thought the human ship might need, amounting to precious few items. With the gardens and orchards in full swing, they had more vegetables and fruits than they could eat. A few unintelligent creatures managed to round out their protein requirements. Shorty got Butcher to sign a draft for payment of goods transferred from his ship to the rusty hinges. Butcher grumbled about it, but everyone knew, including Shorty, the grumbling was just for effect. Butcher looked at the assembled team. Okay, people. So far, so good. We've had our share of luck. I plan on sending a second shuttle through the jump point with any additional information we've gathered and duplicates of what we sent with the first shuttle. Stone wasn't surprised, but Wisniewski looked shocked. The civilian scientist said, Captain, why are we sending a shuttle and not going ourselves? The information we've gathered will keep the data miners happy for a year, going through everything. Somewhere in this mess of data is a location of the Hyrocanian homeworld. I'm sure of it. Butcher said, Yes, that's why I'm sending all civilians back on that shuttle along with the information. It'll be crowded, but safer. Cat replied, Bull, I don't know what you've got planned, but I'm too old to run away now. I'm staying. Wizzer? Wisniewski nodded reluctantly. Yeah, what she said. Butcher said, You just remember that later. Smiling, he added, I was prepared to send all of the human rescuees back as well, but most of them gave me the same spiel you just did. I won't force anyone to leave, no matter how dangerous it might be to stay. Wisniewski paled. Dangerous? Butcher laughed. Yes. Want to change your mind? Wisniewski looked at Emmons and then back to Butcher. He shook his head. No, I think I'll see this through. Butcher looked at the monitor on the table. Sissy looked back at him from the bridge of the X warehouse ship they were now calling the Freedom Wagon. Captain Sissy, are you prepared to depart the system? Sissy shook her head. She typed into her data port keyboard, and her translator said, By your leave, Captain Butcher, I would stay and fight with you. Seated at Butcher's conference table, Shorty said, Sissy, many of the people with you are non-combatants, and they want to go home. Stone nodded in concert with Butcher. Both agreed with Shorty. The three humans he'd rescued were civilians, taken in mid-flight from a skiff at the edge of human space. The man and his two daughters deserved the opportunity to return to their home space. The piglets deserved no less consideration. Sissy said, Our captured Hyrocanian shuttles aren't hyperspace capable. I feel sorry for the people who want to leave. I was held by the Hyrocanian, too, remember? I will not abandon those I owe for my rescue. She seemed to stare directly at Shorty. Nor will I leave you, Privet. You want to send these people home? So do I. You want to hurt the Hyrocanians? So do I. If you want the Freedom Wagon to go home, you come back here and take it yourself. You left me in charge, and I won't go without you, nor will I leave Ensign Stone behind while he is in danger. Butcher nodded at Shorty. Good luck with that one. The captain glanced at his advisors. We've gathered all of the information we can get. I'll admit, putting in the repulse our minds throws a kink into the plans of the Hyrocanian fleet stationed in this system. But my orders are to also do what damage we can. I think... We can do more. Numos asked, What have you got in mind, Tom? Butcher said, I think we can send a flurry of mines at all enemy ships in the system. If we time it right, we can hit them simultaneously, so none of them will see it coming, and turn on their shields in time to save themselves. Exo Gupta said, That sounds doable. The timing would be tight, but a quick flurry, and we let our mines drift toward the enemy. These mines are too small for anyone to see them coming. Not to mention we can use their own IFF against them. None of their ships are doing much moving around, so we should be able to anticipate where everyone will be at any given time. Their shields are currently down, so we should be able to do maximum damage with a minimum number of mines. From the looks on their faces, Stone could see that this plan was something the captain and the XO must have previously discussed. Butcher looked pleased, but Gupta was frowning. The XO added, However, our best position for clear shots at every ship puts the rusty hinges within range of the planetary weapons platform. 
We can't attack all their ships and still slip out the back door before that orbital beast turns us to dust. Butcher said, So, either we take out the orbiting platform, or we limit our impact on the ships. Can we take out the platform? Gupta shook his head. No, sir. That planet-side base will tear us to shreds if we get close enough to kill its big brother, and vice versa. I've run the simulation a hundred different ways, and it always comes down to our certain destruction. Unlike the spaceship buddies, both the orbital and the planetary base have their shields up. Always. They seem to be on permanent alert. We can't get close enough to use what little firepower we have without them challenging us and opening fire. Wisniewski said, We haven't been close enough to clone their data. We can't spoof their systems or the systems of the base located on the planet. Numa said, So we can't kill them without them killing us first. Butcher nodded. That's about the size of it. We can cut and run now, taking a few shots as we leave, but we'll only get a few of their ships, leaving two dozen or more behind untouched. Maybe we can entice them into following us and trap them in hyperspace. Numos scooted his chair back, stood, and began pacing. Let's call that Plan B. I don't like running without a fight. He stopped, his fists clenched. I believe my Marines can take the orbital weapons platform if you can get us in there. Give us a shuttle, and we can pretend to be a resupply delivery. Wisniewski and Emmons looked at each other and nodded. I appreciate the enthusiasm, Dash, but we can't get close enough to drop you in their lap without getting shredded like old cheese. Butcher shook his head. It's clear from what Wizard and Cat can find. They have standing orders to even shoot their own ships if they get too close without authorization. They may let a shuttle through for a delivery, but they wouldn't expect a delivery from the rusty hinges. But... Sissy interrupted Numos. The Freedom Wagon is a warehouse ship. Resupply from us might get through. Butcher said, no. Even if we get Wizard and Cat to spoof them with orders, and they let you get in close enough to send a shuttle, you can't get close enough to the planetary base to fool them. They'll end you once they realize their orbital big sister is under attack. Numos said, then how do we take out the planetary base? Can we hit them first? Gupta said, if we hit the planet first, the ships in the system and the orbital platform will kill us. We can spoof their ships, but not the platform. Butcher said, Major Numos, can you split your forces between the orbital platform and the planetary base, taking them both out? Numos shook his head. It'll take everyone I have to destroy that orbital beast from the inside without alerting every ship in the area. Spoofing only goes so far. If the rusty hinges starts shooting, it's over. Once the Hyrocanians start seeing explosions on the orbital platform, they'll figure something is seriously wrong, no matter what Cat tells them. Butcher spat, Then we don't have any way to take out the planetary base and the orbital platform without them killing us in the process. Stone said, I can take the planetary base out, sir. Chapter 41 Stone immediately wanted to take the statement back, but, unlike a poorly written digital message, there wasn't any way to retract the statement once the words were out of his mouth. Everyone was looking at him like he'd lost his mind. Everyone except Jay, who was lying quietly at his feet. She nodded at him, as if to say that whatever was good for him was good for her. Butcher said, Would you care to elaborate, Ensign? His tone made it clear he wasn't asking. Stone said, Sir, the orbital platform is in a geosynchronous orbit. There are a dozen military satellites in orbit that we can assume are visual relays, right? Gupta spun the display of the planet above the conference table. He highlighted the satellites. Yes, and we've all seen the dozens of gaps all around the planet large enough to drive a shuttle through to the surface. Butcher pointed at a couple of the gaps. We can drop an attack force through any of these gaps close enough to the planetary base to facilitate a ground attack, but... Numos finished for him. I can't split my forces for this. That orbital base is so big it'll take all of my marines to secure it. Butcher added, Even the closest LZ is too far away for Navy suits. They just aren't designed for long-term engagements. That's a three-day bounce even for marines. The atmosphere won't allow for anyone to get out of their suits. Wizard nodded, The planet appears to have a light chlorine atmosphere. The pressure and temperature are low, not freezing, but low enough that hydrochloric gases and acids shouldn't accumulate in heavy concentrations. Stone said, Sir, my suit can make that distance. However, I wasn't thinking of taking a Navy assault team. I was thinking of using Drascos. There are eight of them, and they're all Marine-trained fighters. Breathing isn't an issue for them. Their lungs can breathe anything except a vacuum. 
They prefer carbon dioxide, but the Draskos can breathe a chlorine atmosphere. Jay snorted and slapped the deck with her tail. The bone spike at the end rattled the rusted deck plates. The look in her eyes was a clear indication that she was ready to go. Butcher shook his head. Son, one Navy officer and eight Draskos taking on a whole planet-based weapons platform doesn't sound like a recipe for success. We don't know what you'd find. He waved a hand to stop Stone from interrupting. I know they're tough, but that's too much to ask. Numa said, Tom, those Draskos are tougher than most of us give them credit for. Both J and PB have been able to beat a whole platoon of Marines in training. I will admit that the younger Draskos are easier to beat, but only because they're easier to distract, and they aren't quite locked in on the whole teamwork concept yet. Butcher asked, So they can't do it? Numos replied, I didn't say that. I said my marines can beat them by being trickier. We've got hundreds of years of learning to adapt to unknown situations. The Draskos are learning, but they don't have a history to draw from. And as you said, we don't know what they'll find on that base. Stone should have kept his mouth shut and let these men talk him out of what looked like a suicide mission. Instead, he said, Sir, I'm not saying that we can attack, destroy, and get away unscathed. I'm saying that we can cause enough disruption that the Hyrocanians won't be able to stop you from killing a dozen Hyrocanian ships, damaging a dozen more, and getting out of the system. Besides, suppose they do kill Jay or PB, what do you think would happen? Wisniewski laughed. That would be the worst thing they could do. The surviving Drasco would immediately begin to change to male. We don't know how fast the growth would be, but the chemical change would rapidly affect her brain, turning her into a rampaging male. Stone said, "'Sir, we can't stop a male short of a lucky shot.' He stood up, walked around Jay, and grabbed her head in his arms. He gave her a gentle squeeze. "'If it comes to that, and this ship's survival depends on it, I'll put a bullet into PB myself.' Jay snuffled and woofed a huge breath across Stone's face. "'No, Mama! Shoot me!' She didn't broadcast the request through her dataport translator. Stone breathed back into Jay's mouth. He didn't know if Jay was willing to die first to save PB, or if she would rather be shot than turn male. He filed the question away to ask later. That was a discussion he wanted to have with each of the Draskos. The younger ones needed to know what might happen to them if two of any triplet died. Shorty had stood up, but his short height made him hard to notice. He climbed up on his chair, and then onto the table. He walked over to the display of the planetary base and typed furiously into his database translator. Our combat suits are smaller, but we can cross this distance in four days. I'll go with Stone and my Drasco friends. He held a hand up to his ear. Stone noticed he had a listening device attached there. Jay said, Mama, he's asking his piglets for volunteers. I can't hear their answers. Shorty nodded. I have a team of thirty fighters in suits. Stone pushed Shorty to the side and expanded the display area around the Hyrocanian base. We should be able to shuttle down to here. This spot is hidden from the base by this mountain range. We can bounce from there to attack. After we destroy their ability to fire on the rusty hinges, we hike back to the shuttle. If you're still in the system, we can rendezvous. If not, well, Shorty is a pirate, right? We'll just take another ship and follow you home. Chapter 42 Dolish's face fell in disappointment. He looked at Vedrian, Hammermill, and Tuttle for support, but there wasn't any to be had. Stone shook his head again. I'm sorry, Spacer Dolish, I can't take you with me. Your navy suit doesn't have the capability to support you that long. Dolish said, You're taking some supplies, right? His voice cracked as he desperately searched for a way to make Stone change his mind. We could take a tent. I could get out of my suit every now and then. We could recharge and reset it. His voice faded away. Stone said, we're moving too fast for that. Look, Tim, you're my friend, right? If I could take anyone, I'd take you. But I can't. You know it. Dolish nodded. Me and a few Marines, right? Dolish was correct. He would feel more comfortable taking a platoon of Marines along. But that wasn't going to happen either. Major Numos needed his full complement to shut down the massive orbiting weapons platform. The much smaller planetary base was an easier target. Easier or not, Stone knew if he didn't destroy, or at least disable, the planet-side base, the Marines would all die in orbit. The Hyrocanians on the orbiting platform might be able to repel and kill the Marines, no one knew for sure, 
But if Stone's attack force wasn't successful, the Hyrakanians on the planet would open fire on their own platform rather than lose it to the humans. Stone had to succeed or his friends would die. As much as he wanted Dalish with him, the spacer would slow him down. Tim, I'd take you if I could. Dalish shook his head. I wouldn't take me. Don't worry about it, boss. I understand. Stone wondered whether his friend understood or not. Dalish wandered away, his eyes wet, obviously trying not to cry in front of Stone and a trio of Marines. Tuttle shook her head as she watched Dalish walk away. She wrapped an arm around Stone's head and pulled him in close. Don't worry about Timmy, Ensign. He's a good kid and really does understand. He just has a few abandonment issues. You know about his family, right? Stone realized he didn't know anything about Dalish prior to their meeting on Allie's world. What about his family? Tuttle said, he told me one night when he'd been drinking too much jungle juice. It seems they sent him off to school one morning, and when he got home that night, they were gone, took all of their stuff, and left him behind. He hasn't seen them since. He joined the Navy shortly after that, just so he could get a good meal and a warm bed. Stone looked at the tough Marine corporal. Two things, Marine. One, I'm not abandoning Tim Dollish. He's my friend, and I will be back for him. Tuttle laughed. Of course you'll be back. I'll make sure he knows. Two, what the heck are you doing getting Tim drunk? Me? It was his jungle juice, Ensign. Honest. Tuttle had a look of complete innocence that didn't fool anyone. I'll talk to him. He'll be okay. She squeezed Stone a little harder. You got time for a quickie before you go? Last time offer. Allie laughed, grabbed Tuttle by the ear, and pulled her away. Back off, Barb. He doesn't have time for a quickie with me, so he sure doesn't have time for you. Hammermill reached over and slapped Stone upside the head. It stung, but Stone knew the big marine had pulled his punch. He stuck his hand out to shake. Ensign Stone, man to man, I'll race you to Valhalla. Stone said, Hammer, I didn't think you believed in stuff like that. Hammermill shrugged. Gotta believe in something. I believe in Major Dashiell Numos to lead me into the Valley of Death and out again. I believe I'm invincible. I believe you're indestructible. It's these others around us that I worry about. He squeezed Stone's hand. Then he grabbed Tuttle's shoulder, and they followed Dollish. Allie kissed him, looked him in the eyes, and kissed him again before walking away without a word. Stone walked across the hangar deck, vaulted into the shuttle hovering above him. Stepping into the nearest shuttle hatch, he turned and saluted the rusty hinges, holding his salute until the hatch cycled shut. Turning back, he banged his knee against a luggage cart. Three dozen carts and shipping containers lined the corridor. He'd done his best to strip out every working cart or container he could find on the rusty hinges. He'd found them tucked in almost every corner where someone had left them laying about. The Navy used hundreds of the small anti-gravity carryalls during the retrofit and resupply of the Q-ship. Most were banged up, had faulty leads, a short-life power system, or the anti-gravity hum sounded off-key. He would use them to haul everything his team needed to cross the hostile, toxic planet. His suit could keep him fed and watered, and the piglet suits were built on the Marine's design and were as self-sufficient as his. However, his Draskos couldn't go four days without food and water and be expected to fight at their peak condition. He even packed tents to allow everyone to get out of the chlorine atmosphere and rest, the same type of tents Dollish had thought to bring. Stone hadn't wanted to bring Dollish along, even if the man's suit was capable. Not that he didn't trust or like Dollish— but he fully expected to beat Hammermill to Valhalla and didn't want to drag Dollish to an early grave. He tapped open his comms. Shorty, we're all aboard. Let's move. Chapter 43 Yellowish air swirled around Stone. A light breeze picked up dust, tossing it around like small dirt tornadoes, at the base of the tall escarpment, protected by the bulk of the shuttle, the wind only threw small dust and tiny sand particles. Shorty's pilot had grounded the shuttle after a treetop-level radar-evading race across the rugged terrain. They couldn't fly any closer to the base without the Hyrocanians spotting them. From here, they'd walk. Looking in the distance, he saw gusts of wind wrenching fist-sized rocks from the mountains, throwing them around like invisible giants playing dodgeball. The rocks fell to the ground like hail, or slammed into a mountainside, shattering into ever-increasingly small pieces, until they were little more than dust to be picked up and swirled around again. Spinning up his suit optics, he saw rocks hitting the escarpment, splintering, being snatched by the wind before falling to the ground, and hurled again. 
The shards looked sharp, but not sharp enough to damage any suit in his expedition. They wouldn't put a dent in a Drasco with their rusty pig-iron-like hides, but they could blind an unwary Drasco. Stone dug into a luggage cart, pulled out a handful of sand goggles, and tossed them to Jay. Pass these out to Peavy and the girls. Jay's eyes blinked against the dust, her voice from the data port getting sucked away by the wind. We'll be fine, Mama. I don't want you fine, I want you better. He jabbed a finger at the goggles. Those will make you better, after a couple of days of this. Jay shrugged her shoulders, foregoing the data port translator. I feel wrong without my armor. Stone slammed a gauntlet down on the top of a shipping container. It's packed in here. You can put it on when we attack. We have a long hike ahead of us, and we all need to be rested when we get there. We're going to ride as much as we can, bounce when it's possible, and hike when we have to. I don't want you carrying any more weight than you're forced to. Jay looked askance at the luggage cart. Yes, Mama. I'm bigger than I used to be. Think that tiny thing will hold me up? Stone nodded, then realized he was closed inside his own combat suit. Nodding wasn't the most effective way to communicate. They have the anti-gravity and propulsion to carry anything we can balance on them. Can you balance on them? Jay straddled a grounded cart, wiggling her belly as she settled on top of the cart. Ta-da! She picked her feet up off the ground, putting all of her weight on the cart. Stone reached under her neck, popped open the panel, and pulled out a controller. His suit's external receptors picked up the scent of milk chocolate and mint from Jay as he turned the dial, giving the cart lift to push her into the air. He remembered her trying to jump onto a moving cart years ago, and laughed. She was much bigger now, and more coordinated than she was as a baby. The cart hummed louder as it lifted her bulk, but it stayed in tune as if it was happy with more weight on its back. Jay wonked loudly and jumped to her feet. She stood upright on the cart, her neck stretched out and her arms spread wide, wonking in enjoyment. The light breeze caught her vestigial wings, appearing to give her the feeling of lift. In a flash, all eight Draskos were balancing on the luggage carts. Stone popped open the control cover on Charlotte's cart. He ran the cable from that cart to Jay's cart, hooking the daughter just behind her mother. He bypassed L and B to open the control panel on Emily's cart. Raising the cart to the same height as Jay and Charlotte's carts, he maneuvered it into place behind Charlotte's cart. He turned to find Anne, but Shorty squeezed in between him and the carts, attaching Anne's cart behind her sister's. All the piglets were linking the carts into strings. A few piglets had climbed onto carts and were racing around, running them at top speed, slamming them to a stop, raising them to their highest level, and seeing how fast they could go as low to the ground as they could get. Soon there were strings of carts whipping around like mini trains gone berserk. Stone didn't say anything. They were going to travel a long distance, and piglets were going to be doing a lot of the driving. They needed to become familiar with cart capabilities. He heard an off-key hum, and then another. The carts all seemed to be working fine, but he heard some straining. Shorty, have your people drive those carts past me, slowly. Yash, Bosh. It took only a moment before Stone identified the carts with problems. Pull them out of the line. Switch their cargo to other carts. We're leaving these behind. Stone sensed Shorty wanted to ask why, but the piglet did as he was told. Stone said, I don't want to take equipment with us that might break down at the wrong time. Once we get through these mountain passes, we're going to be racing across open ground. We'll need to move as fast as we can for a couple of days. These carts are already not working up to standard. Even in this wind, I can hear their power systems working off-key. Shorty nodded. Yash, Bosh. Anything or anyone breaks down, we leave them behind. Stone put a gauntlet on the piglet's shoulder. There wasn't any way the little alien could feel the touch, but he could see the gesture. We leave things behind, Shorty, not people. Shorty said, We're here, Bosh. Every one of us knows this is going to be a hard slog. No one wants to be left behind. But we have a saying, The slow rat gets eaten. Stone said, Shut down as much power on the shuttle as your pilot can manage without. We don't want it discovered, even by accident. He looked at the mountain range, hiding them and their shuttle. Send out your scouts. A dozen piglets raced away from the shuttle, scattering into the cracks and crevices of the escarpment. He tapped open a map and set it to hover stationary between him and Shorty. Finding a pass up the escarpment and through the mountains was going to be time-consuming. Although they had scans from the telescopes on rusty hinges, they only had a general idea of a pass through the mountains. They hadn't been able to get close enough views to see a path that could be easily traversed. He glanced around him. P. 
piglets were driving cart trains around like they were being clocked for speed and graded on recklessness. Drascos stood on carts, wings flapping in the wind, hooting with abandon. Anne and Elle took tumbles off carts, but were back up and on another cart long before the laughter from their mothers and sisters died down. Shorty stared at the map as if trying to force the details to fill in by the strength of his vision alone. Little lines were filling in as piglets in suits raced through canyons and gullies, looking for a way through. The lines centered along their suits' video transmissions of the mountains surrounding the scouts. All too often the lines backtracked and took another path, when a piglet found its path blocked. Stone couldn't hear anything Shorty was saying, but the little guy was waving his arms like he was directing each piglet's movement. Stone checked the time. Shorty, we only have three hours to find a way through, or we have to abandon this plan. Unless we find a way through the mountains, we have to go to Plan B. Plan B required them to wait until just before the attack time, take the shuttle over the mountains, and hope they didn't get spotted before crashing onto the base hangar deck. Shorty said, Yes, Bosh. I don't like Plan B. Stone agreed. Plan B is stupid. Might as well fly the shuttle right in front of the gun muzzles. They won't expect anyone coming in on foot over this landscape, but they will spot a shuttle-sized object and shoot us down before we get close enough to do any damage. Stone said, They're probably going to kill us before we get close anyway. Shorty said, I know. Just don't tell my people that. They think this is going to be a cakewalk, and that we're all going home again. Stone made a mental note to look up cakewalk. He wondered how Shorty's translator picked up a term like that. He was about to ask about it, but the piglet kept talking. I don't mind dying here. Here is as good as anywhere for an old man like me and a warrior like you, but I do want to get close enough to hurt these bastards before I go. Stone didn't think of himself as a warrior, but he suddenly felt puffed up that Shorty thought of him that way. Well, I don't know about all of that, but if we don't shut that base down, all the Marines are going to die on the orbital weapons platform. Shorty looked up at Stone. That is why I gave my shuttle pilot orders to use Plan R. What's Plan R? Last resort. It's ramming speed, full-on engines to overload. He'll do that? Shorty shook his head, turned, and looked at the shuttle as if he could see the pilot deep inside. The translator managed to sound both sad and worried. My pilot is female. She has watched more of her children eaten alive by those four-armed freaks than a mother should have to watch. It was a challenge to get her to agree not to ram them until she knows for sure we've failed. Then we'd better find a pass. Shorty looked at the map excitedly, pointing a finger at a piglet's position on the map. The piglet was moving quickly, streaking farther and faster ahead than any of his counterparts. Stone couldn't hear the command, but other piglets abandoned their tracks. They backtracked, and in a swarm, dashed up the same path as the front-running piglet. The front piglet came to a halt, sending them a panoramic view of a high rock face stretching up for a thousand feet. Unable to hear Shorty's command, Stone felt his heart skip a beat. The swarm of piglets didn't catch up to the front-runner before they began to branch out, fanning farther and farther into the mountain passes. Piglet's paths halted, they backtracked, and followed the next farthest piglet's track, fanning out, searching and probing. All along the way, the map updated as video of the mountains broadcast from piglet suits filled in the blank spots. Shorty waved his arms like conducting an orchestra, although none of the scouts could see him. Stone glanced behind him. The trains had pulled up to a halt, lining up in one neat row. Everyone was watching the map. He tapped the map. Making duplicates, he threw them to every driver. The few piglets not on driver duty or searching the mountains peered over their driver's shoulders. He didn't recognize the hand gestures between the piglets, but it looked like they were taking bets and gambling on the outcome of the search for a path. Stone looked around him. Peavy sat atop a cart, her goggles making her eyes look oversized. She was grinning into the wind. He asked her, What are the piglets saying? Peavy shrugged. They're making a game of the race through the mountains. They make games of everything. Stone laughed. Grandpa would say that's like the pot calling the kettle black. There wasn't any activity the Draskos hadn't turned into a game. They'd even had a running contest to see who could hold off going to the bathroom the longest, and who could make the biggest pile of poop. Peavy said, When can we meet Grandpa, Mama? You talk about him all the time. We all want to meet him. When we get back to human space, I'll take you to meet my family. I don't think it's fair that you get to know them, and we don't. You're my mama, and we should know your mama. Soon, Peavy. 
He turned back to check the map in time to see a search line streak forward at an amazing speed. The swarm behind it abandoned their tracks, backtracked, and followed the piglet's trail at a run. Well, it's not fair that Allie got to meet your family on Peach's Rest, and we didn't get to go. Chapter 44 Stone froze. His family was who Allie kept mentioning about meeting on Peach's Rest. It should have been obvious, but somehow the thought hadn't occurred to him. He should have expected it from his family. He hadn't kept it a secret that he was going to take leave with Allie, but, on the other hand, he hadn't told them. They must have gotten word somehow and gone there to check up on him. Or her. Or both of them as a couple. He tried to remember everything Allie had said about the people she'd met on leave, but her conversations had been all little hints and teases during a long and busy deployment. When they'd managed to find time together, talking about Peach's rest hadn't been on the top of his list of things to do with Allie. Had she liked his family? Had they liked her? Who was it? Just his parents? His parents and grandparents? Or had she been subjected to a meeting of the whole clan? Without him there to intercede, his mother would have told all those embarrassing stories of him as a toddler. Dad would have boasted about all of the silly minor victories he'd managed. Who knows what kind of crap his grandfather would have spouted. He decided it was a good thing he wasn't going to survive this attack. He wasn't sure he would ever be able to face Allie again. No, he wanted to see her again, and the desire was more than an urgent interrogation about who said what to whom at some faraway vacation spot. Both her attack on the orbital weapons platform and his attack on the planetary base had good odds of success, but military mathematics said that adding good odds to good odds always decreased the odds for both sides. No plan, no matter how good, ever survived first contact with the enemy. Neither attack had great plans, just good plans that might work. No military attack was a sure thing, no matter what admirals and generals ever thought. How could he not want to see Allie again? He loved her. He told her so more than once, and she'd told him she loved him, too. Maybe he hadn't said it often enough. Sure, he was young, but that didn't mean his feelings were any less strong. Allie wasn't young. Her feelings toward him were suspect by many. Was she just after his money? Stone didn't believe that, although he knew many people did. Could a relationship last when his own feelings were questioned? Even the ship's behaviorist, Dr. Cat Emmons, had asked if he thought he was mature enough to commit to a single long-term relationship. He'd replied by pointing out that his Aunt Ruth and Uncle Jim had married younger than he was, and their marriage was an example of harmony, love, and longevity. Stone looked up at the map again, in time to see a piglet's track suddenly speed up as if the tiny creature was bouncing forward at top speed. It had reached the halfway point through the mountains and skidded to a stop. The scout's suit broadcast a video as the piglet turned in a slow circle. It was standing on the shore of a wide lake, with tiny waves lapping at the rocky shore. There wasn't any vegetation, but the long, smooth slope the piglet had just ran down was repeated across the lake, sloping up again into the mountains. Stone didn't like lakes, rivers, ponds, or streams. He'd seen enough creatures lurking in their watery depths to satisfy him for a lifetime. Allie's world was replete with dangerous land creatures, but its waterways were even deadlier. They hadn't seen any sign of life on the planet. Still, this was the first surface liquid they'd seen, either from space or on the ground. Surface liquid and a breathable atmosphere usually meant life, if nothing more than plant life. He had to admit that he didn't know what the liquid was. It could be anything from pure water all the way to hydrochloric acid. He just didn't want to meet any creature who breathed chlorine and drank acid. Let's move forward, Shorty. Without waiting for a response, he bounced along the track leading to the side of the lake, his body aching to do something. He felt the pent-up excitement and adrenaline pumping through him as he stretched his muscles inside the suit. Waiting was always the hardest. Even running a short way was going to help burn off some of his nervous energy. He scanned the terrain as he ran. The scout's trail was exactly what they'd hoped for, relatively smooth and wide enough for the carts to squeeze through, although there were a few spots the carts would have to pass through in single file. There were a few minor crevasses that were easy for suits and drascos to jump over. The anti-gravity on the carts should keep them up, as long as they raced across at top speed. Bouncing along at a sprint, it took almost an hour to reach the small group of piglets clustered by the edge of the wide lake. 
He stood at the back of the piglets. The diminutive creatures were standing way too close to the mountain lake's edge for his taste. Stone reasoned he wasn't afraid, but was using appropriate caution, since he didn't know what might be hiding in the deep liquid. One of the piglets pointed at the lake and typed into its translator. Water. It typed much slower than Shorty. Shorty slid to a stop next to Stone, his suit being slightly slower than Stone's larger custom-built suit. He says the water has trace mineral elements, but nothing our suits can't filter out. The chlorine in the atmosphere has dissolved in the water, but in minor concentrations it's no stronger than a strong disinfectant. Stone checked his HUD. The cart train was still a few kilometers back. The Draskos were playing on and around the carts. Preventing eight Draskos from jumping into the water to play was going to be a chore. He needed to find out if it was safe before J, P, B, and the girls arrived. The lake was too wide to bounce across, and he couldn't see either end using his suit optics. The water was only clear for a few feet, quickly succumbing to muddy, murky depths. He couldn't catch any odors coming from the lake, but that wasn't a surprise, as liquid often blocked telltale fragrances. His senses weren't telling him anything. The wind was whipping down the lake, squeezed between two high ridges of the mountain range. Here in the open, the wind was stronger than it had been when they were protected in the mountain passes or by the bulk of the shuttle. All small rocks, sand, and dust had long since blown away, leaving the shore of the lake covered in large rocks and boulders, nothing weighing less than a hundred kilograms. Stone picked up a rock. The suit registered the weight at fifty-six kilograms. He gave the rock a little jiggle in his hand. Even in his suit, he wasn't any good at throwing something in gravity and hitting anywhere close to what he was aiming at. Still, the lake was wide enough that he should be able to throw the rock somewhere close to the middle. Tossing the rock, he glanced down at Shorty. The rock splashed, making a ripple that was lost in the wind-whipped waves. He said, Before we cross, I want to be certain we aren't going to meet any local creatures who might pose a danger. Shorty had lived on Allie's world long enough to understand the caution. He nodded and waved his people back from the shore. Maybe we should try and go around. Stone tapped his chest and squeezed the appropriate finger. A bunker buster shot away from his chest. With exact precision, it hit halfway between the two shores. Sinking into the water, it exploded in a water-gushing spout. The explosion surprised him. It hadn't blown up where the bomb hit the water, but quite a few meters to the left. He wondered if some water creature had caught the bomb and started to drag it away, but there wasn't any debris floating to the surface that he could see or smell. Shorty said, This is a river, not a lake. There must be a strong current under the surface. That eliminates going around it. Stone turned to watch the cart train sliding down the smooth slope to the river bank. Though the train was visible in his HUD, turning to look was more a habit than checking his HUD. The Draskos wooted as they stood balancing on the carts as the piglet drivers whipped the trains in wild abandon, trying to unhorse the Draskos. B and Charlotte took wild spills, rolling through the rocks. Both Draskos leapt to their feet and raced toward the lake on foot, faster than the carts could move. Stone's suit was capable of operating just as good under liquid as it did in a vacuum. He didn't doubt that the piglets' suits were just as capable, but he was loath to order Shorty to send his people into the river to check for danger. He leapt skyward, following the track of his bunker-buster bomb into the lake. Chapter 45 Faster than he could react, the weight of his suit drove his legs knee-deep into silt at the bottom of the river. Using enhanced optics, he spun the dial through all the various modes as he turned in a slow circle. Infrared, radiological, and X-ray didn't reveal anything but water and silt as far as he could scan in any direction. He modified the magnification, looking for smaller and smaller creatures, until he found a few amoeba-sized life-forms swirling in the muddy water. He flexed his knees and bounded back to the shore, splattering Shorty with mud and water when he landed. The piglet looked at him through his faceplate in disgust. He flicked a few specks of mud off his suit and typed into his translator, I see nothing in the water, ain't you? Stone smiled. Nothing so far. Let's take a break here and then cross after... He was interrupted by eight Draskos racing past him, hitting the water with such force that anyone within a dozen yards of the shore was drenched. They disappeared underwater and surfaced quickly, spouting water and spitting streams at each other. T said, Like, this is cold for sure. Anne giggled, right? Not like the beach at home, you know. 
T said, race to the other side. Last one, there is a booger brain. J and PB even joined in the race. Shorty looked up at Stone. Boss, I suggest we take a break on the opposite shore. Stone nodded. You think? He looked around at the carts. Finding the number he was looking for, he shooed a pair of piglets off the top and popped it open. Searching through it, he located the correct bin and refilled the Bunker Buster feed chain, replacing the one he'd fired into the lake. He'd been in combat enough to know he wanted a full load of everything at all times, just in case. Shorty asked, Will these carts get across the river? It's too far for our suits to bounce, but we can cross by walking on the bottom. Stone pointed at his knees. The mud is this deep. That'll put it halfway up your waist. I'm sure your suits can move through that muck, but it would be an unpleasant trip. The carts can cross this river easy, just keep their speed up. My suit can make the crossing, so you ride and I'll bounce. He waited until the first mini-train of carts built up velocity and hit the water at top speed. The anti-gravity dug a furrow in the water, frothing the waves, but it maintained its rate toward the other shore. Other piglets followed him in no particular order, with suited piglets clinging to the cart tops. Stone didn't bounce high. Keeping his jump flattened for distance, he slammed into the far shore ahead of the racing Draskos. He used his external speakers to broadcast his cheers, urging them all to race faster. Waving his arms, he greeted Jay as the winner of the race, with PB coming in a close second. Emily snorted, coming in dead last. Not fair. Our mother's your bigger, right? L laughed. You're a boogerhead. M not. R too. Before they degenerated into a name-calling brawl, Stone said, Emily, you didn't come in last. Look behind you. The whole string of piglets on carts had barely reached the halfway point in the river. Most were puttering through the water without any difficulty. One cart train was having difficulties, as the driver slowed to keep from being swamped by spray from other carts and the wind-whipped waves. It slowed to a halt, the anti-gravity keeping it from sinking, but it didn't have enough surface grip for forward motion. Stone added, Emily, I'll bet you can swim back out there and push those carts to shore. Emily hit the water before he finished asking. T and L followed her. Charlotte and Anne jumped back into the water, but rather than swim toward the carts, they began jumping and rolling, trying to push the other's head under water. B plopped her butt on the rocky shore and watched her sisters. J and PB stood by Stone, staring up at the mountains surrounding them. We have to go through there, Mama? PB asked. Stone said, yes. Shorty and his people will find us a way through. Jay said, they got us this far. They have to find a way through, or we can't fight the Hyrocanians. Right, Mama? PB answered for Stone, that's right. If we don't stop the bad ones, a lot of Marines will die for nothing, and the bad ones may just blow up our ship and eat our daughters. Jay added, no ship, no way home. Stone didn't want to think about it, but the Draskos were right. The younger ones may think of this as a fun outing, but Jay and PB obviously understood the seriousness of this deployment. Like all such coordinated attacks, this one was timed to the nanosecond. His team needed to hit the planetary base at the same time the Marines hit the orbital weapons platform. Too much deviance, and either location would discover the attack and come to the aid of its sister base. He checked the time on his data port. They were ahead of schedule, having found a quick path through the first set of mountains. Early was just as bad as too late. He signaled Shorty, letting him know they would hold here until the scouts found a way through the next mountain range. Most of the piglets had been riding. Stone couldn't tell whether Shorty sent the same batch out to search, or if he switched them for a fresh group. Pulling up his map, he kept one eye on his Draskos and one eye on the map, as it filled in with data from the scouts racing ahead. Shorty shook one of the legs on his suit. From the looks of the piglets on the riverbank, Shorty had said something, but he hadn't typed anything into his translator. Piglets broke down laughing, slapping each other on their backs and rolling on the ground. PB said, I don't know those words Shorty used, Mama. Jay added, Marines and Navy sometimes talk that way, too. Stone had heard more than one human use certain words, but he wasn't planning on giving his Draskos a course in profanity. He just said, You just have to understand the gist of what someone is saying. When they talk like that, you don't need to know word for word. Shorty typed into his data port translator, You want to know what I said? Fracking new combat suit has started to malfunction. Stupid waste containment failed and is leaking down my leg. Stone tried not to laugh. We can set up a sealed tent. Maybe you can get out of your suit and fix it. 
Shorty said, oh, hell no. I'm going to give this thing back to the Cretan who didn't make it right. He's going to clean it out, not me. Stone bent down to look at the piglet's suit. It was a civilian-made suit, but the systems were based on marine and navy suit capabilities. This was originally a marine design, right? Shorty admitted, well, yeah. I'm a privet, a pirate, remember? Stealing things is what I do. Smiling, Stone tapped a little hatch on the piglet's left thigh. Can you open this for me? Huh? The piglet was quiet for a moment as he looked for the appropriate control. I didn't even know that was there. The little hatch popped open. Stone waved at the piglet to follow him down to the river's edge. Once there, he tapped the left heel on Shorty's suit. Open this, too. While he waited for Shorty to pop the little heel hatch open, he said, Field testing equipment is one thing, but you should be more familiar with your suit before joining an operation like this. Didn't have much time. We'll make do. Stone grabbed a hose from the left thigh hatch and stretched it into the water. Twisting a ring on the end of the hose, he waited for two seconds before dirty brown water began squirting out Shorty's heel. He let the water flush through Shorty's leg. He didn't shut off the river siphon until the water pouring out was as clear as the river water. He heard PB giggling and looked up. Piglets were rolling around on the shore in fits of laughter. Jay said, Shorty is talking funny again. Shorty's finger even stuttered on his translator keyboard. Cold. Stone smiled in sympathy as he snapped the hose back in place and shut the hatches on Shorty's leg and heel. Your suit will warm you fast enough. We just flushed your waste containment system and washed down your leg. You'll be fine. Shorty shook his head and typed, I wish you'd have prepared me for that. Still, it feels better, although I'm not sure what we just did to the ecology of this planet. Dumping piglet waste here might change the destiny of this planet. Stone laughed. No one has ever proven that the human homeworld Earth didn't flourish because some visiting alien took a dump in some primordial goop. Shorty grinned. Blasphemy. Everyone knows we all grew from seeds spread by galactic winds from the first great garden in the sky. Stone didn't want to step on another species' religion, even though Shorty sounded like he was joking. He thought back to the humans he'd rescued from the Hyrocanian warehouse ship. They claimed to be of religious refugees. According to the man, the Emperor had ignored their requests for help, but that didn't sound like the Emperor he knew. Emperor Alberto Garza wasn't like some leaders in the past who'd ignored individual rights. The emperor was a fanatic about protecting and encouraging individual rights and responsibilities. He might have encouraged complainants to stand up for themselves first, but he wouldn't have turned a blind eye to coercion and torture. The emperor didn't profess any one religion. He might hold strong beliefs, but expressing his personal faith might have come across as an emperor's endorsement for one religion over another. Humans had fought wars in centuries past over differing beliefs, some fights as silly as whether Adam and Eve had belly buttons or not. Humans were still not mature enough to stop fighting over such foolishness, but the emperor wouldn't sanction one religion over another, and neither would Stone. If Shorty wanted to believe in heaven as a garden, then who was Stone to tell him different? For all Stone knew, heaven was a garden, and all the planets were populated by seeds strewn about at random by some unknown race of aliens, or gods, depending on your point of view. He did know planets held more life than humans had once thought possible. Plants covered many planets in the Goldilocks zone of most solar systems, but a higher percentage held some animal life than any odds maker could justify. The number of intelligent species humans had met far exceeded any proffered probability statistic since Enrico Fermi criticized the Drake equation. The equation was the first attempt to calculate the potential for life on other planets. Shorty pointed at the map. Their scouts were backtracking and starting over more often than they had on the first range of mountains. These mountains weren't any higher than the first set, but they appeared smoother, older, more worn down. Hopefully that didn't mean all of the canyons and gullies were filled in. There had to be some gaps between the remaining mountain peaks. With a silent wave of his hand, Shorty sent another dozen piglets fanning out into the mountains, searching for a way through. Stone checked his time. They were no longer ahead of schedule. They still had time, unless they couldn't find a way through quickly. Chapter 46 Stone looked at the crevasse. The wide gap was the last hurdle in this mountain range before his force reached the valley floor. 
His suit could make the jump across with less effort than walking up a stair step, and the piglets could easily span the distance in their smaller suits. The gap wasn't so wide his Draskos couldn't leap across. However, it was too deep for the cargo carts to get across. They were only luggage carts, after all, not designed to float across a hundred-foot drop. They were emptying carts faster than he'd planned. Many of the carts were filled with foolish expendables, like drinking water and food. His suit could sustain him for a long duration by recycling his own waste supplemented with vitamins and nutrients. The piglet suits could do much the same for them, but moving through these mountains ate through their supplies at a prodigious rate. Bodies, human, piglet, and Drasco, required extra fuel to operate in hard terrain under suboptimal conditions. Once they started forward, he hadn't left any carts behind. Not that he was worried about leaving such common human technology behind for non-human scavengers, but the piglets and Draskos were all taking turns riding on the carts, resting and sleeping as they wound their way through pass after pass. Sleeping, scouting, and driving had pushed them to the edge of the valley where the planetary base was located. Stone hated being outside for so long. His agoraphobia had subsided, mostly because he was wrapped inside a combat suit that was little more than a fancy mobile metal box. The ceiling over his head was just inches above, but it was there. That presented a new problem for him. Everything inside the suit felt used and reused. The air tasted flat and stale. The water, by now mostly filtered water, had a scummy feel on his tongue. He really couldn't smell anything, but he felt like the odor from his suit's waste recycling system was wafting up to his nose. He knew several Marines who had spent days on end inside their suits without complaint. He was trying not to complain to himself, but this trip was more difficult than he imagined it would be. It took a conscious effort not to open his faceplate, even knowing the chlorine-filled air would make him feel worse than he already felt. After days inside the suit, he was beginning to feel numb, not thinking straight. He should have taken his turn on a cart to nap, but he hadn't. This was his operation. These were his people. He felt responsible, and that kept him from sleeping. His suit provided him with enhanced nutrients and stimulants that kept him moving forward, but he had not taken the sleep aid his suit offered him. He didn't want to sleep until this mountain range was behind him. Stone stared stupidly down at the deep hole. Obviously, the deep crevasse had Shorty stumped. It must have looked insurmountable to him. Stone had been at the rear, more sleepwalking than riding drag, until Shorty called him forward. They'd made up ground, and were six hours ahead of schedule again. If they had to backtrack and find another way around because of this crevasse, they might miss their attack time altogether. Allie's life was on the line. Not keeping their schedule wasn't an option. Stone said, Float the empty carts up here. Though the ledge they were following was slender, there was room for the empty carts to squeeze past the others. Taking the controls of the first cart, Stone set it at the edge of the crevasse with the long edge facing the gap. The anti-gravity on these things works both ways. Sometimes a lumper will want to lock the cart in place when loading or unloading cargo. He pushed a switch on the bottom of the controller panel. The cart settled onto the rock ledge and stuck there. Kicking it with his boot, the cart didn't budge, even though Stone put a deep dent in the side. The cart was securely clamped to the ledge. Taking the next empty cart's controller from the piglet driver, he moved the cart sideways up over the first one. Just at the tipping point before it fell, he hit the switch. The bottom of the second cart clamped onto the side of the first cart. The second cart now hung out over the crevasse held in place by the first cart. The carts were the standard 4x4x8 four by four by configuration. Stone had long ago researched 4x8 and found it to be a building material standard. The carts were designed to hold a flat 4 feet by 8 feet sheet of plywood, sheetrock, or plasticrete. Both military and civilian designs were all 4 feet deep with lids. Floating a third cart across the first two, he turned it sideways and slipped it over the side of the second cart, flipping the anti-gravity switch so it locked into place on the side of the second cart. Building a bridge this way was slow work, expanding the length only four feet at a time. Stone moved out of the way, allowing a piglet to move the next cart into place. He was amazed, once again, at how fast piglets adapted to technology once they'd seen it work. Coming from an agrarian society, it seemed improbable, except he'd seen the trio of piglet spaceships confronting the rusty hinges upon entering the piglet's homeworld system. Those spaceships were a match for almost all UEN ships. 
Shorty said, We aren't going to have enough empties. Stone nodded. Let's try condensing material from one to another. He went to the numbered cart that held the expendables for his suit. His suit could manage much more weight without slowing him down, but extra bullets, bandages, and food supplements were bulky. Still, he wrapped all the supplies up into a pack and strapped it to his suit. Though he didn't require the extra firepower, he strapped on his old familiar TDO 960A slug thrower rifle. It wasn't fancy, but the weapon was as comfortable as an old friend. Taking his gear didn't empty the container. J and PB, come here, please. The Draskos were negotiating the mountain ledge with ease, while maintaining a single file configuration at the rear of the line of march. PB kept glancing nervously over the edge, but the younger girls dancing along the rim, throwing rocks over the side, and even relieving themselves over the edge. PB tried to caution her daughters, obviously nervous about the long drop, but the girls continued to act like young children with a new toy. Jay reached him first, PB standing behind her. Mama? Stone pointed to the remaining gear in the container. The Marines taught you and your girls to fight and to shoot an assortment of weapons. These are for you. Grab one and hand the rest out. He'd barely finished speaking before Jay and PB started scooping the weapons up, strapping them on, checking magazine loads, and double-checking safeties. Even though the holsters and rigging were designed for military personnel, the Draskos had found places to tie them on their massive bodies. PB grabbed extras and passed them to the younger Draskos. From her selection of who got what weapon, Stone was sure she handed them out in order of individual skills and preferences. Happy wooting echoed across the mountains. Stone thought to say something about being careful, but the younger ones handled the big guns with as much proficiency as he would have. Move it, human. A piglet pressed past Stone, taking control of the now empty cart and driving it forward to complete their bridge. Stone said, J and PB, we're getting close to the enemy base. We just have to get across this crevasse and then down the rest of the mountain. The base is in the middle of the next valley. You and your daughters might as well put your armor on. A few moments ago, the younger Draskos were acting like children on a picnic outing. Once their armor was strapped on, they fell into line, hushing their hooting. This armor surprised him, but he recognized the marine fabrication style. It wasn't their normal chrome-covered titanium. It was made of some light, flexible, bulletproof resin. The shine was gone, replaced with a non-reflective flat black. They each retained their signature blues and reds, but the colors were muted. Instead of parade-ground flash and jewelry twinkle, this armor was designed with deadly purpose. The Draskos looked ready for war. Even their eyes became stern and cold, like marines heading into combat. Stone smelled their minty odor blossom into an almost overpowering peppermint fragrance. His suit had long since managed to filter out all but a hint of the chlorine odor. The Draskos were ready. He was ready. He hoped the piglets were. His comm unit beeped. It decoded a burst transmission. Orbital assault team is a go. The Marines were aboard a shuttle pretending to be a resupply run to gain access to the weapons platform. For Ali, Numos, and Hammer, it would be a long twenty-four hours creeping through space at a pace mocking the Hyrocanians' lazy attitude. The plan was the Marines would hit the platform at the exact moment Stone's team assaulted the planetary base. Chapter 47 Stone sent a vis-aid bubble up to hover above the gully rim. It sent back a clear view of the base. This close to the weapons base, he didn't broadcast the signal, just in case the Hyrocanians were more alert than any he'd encountered previously, and were scanning their surroundings for errant signals. Signal intelligence and communications security were standard UEN operational procedures, but he wasn't sure the Hyrocanians did anything with logical thought, aside from following their drive to eat. He assumed they had an equivalent drive to breed, but so far he hadn't seen any evidence of that, although Wisniewski and Emmons had given in to fits of laughter over some video files they'd found, vids they'd not shared with him. Hyrocanian pornography didn't sound like something he wanted to see anyway. The visage showed him the area surrounding the back door of the base. Piles of trash and waste littered the whole area. Stone didn't need the vid to confirm Hyrocanians used their back door as a garbage dump he could smell it. Even his suit filters couldn't override the stench. The odor was so bad the Drasco's eyes were watering as they tried not to sneeze. 
Hyrocanians were the ultimate conspicuous consumers. They attempted no recycling efforts beyond simple life support filtration. Stone noticed a wide variety of recyclable materials mixed with bodily waste and animal bones. When he spotted a skull in a pile, it took no little effort to control his stomach. The skull was about the size of a piglet. He wasn't sure what piglet bone structure looked like, but he didn't want to point it out to Shorty. Wondering if he really should tell Shorty, his suit flashed an alert, informing him it wasn't a piglet skull. The bone was human. The size indicated it was a small human. A very small human. A toddler, about two or three years old. Teeth marks were evident on the bone. Stone clamped his jaw shut against the bile rising from his stomach. He closed his eyes for a second. Killing Hyrocanians was now his first priority. The opportunity couldn't come fast enough. A glance at his data port confirmed they still had a few minutes before their attack was to begin. Winding their way across the valley floor through gullies and washes had been easier than a long sprint across the open ground. They were as close as they could get to the base without exposing themselves. Hunkered down out of the wind, they hid behind high, hard-packed dirt walls of a deep gully. They only had a hundred yards of open ground to cross before reaching the closest hatch. He configured his data port display to show Shorty, Jay, and PB the visade view. A cluster of piglets gathered around, staring at their target. Shorty leaned in close and said, That's a wide hatch. Stone nodded. Looks more like a garage door than a personnel hatch. Good. I was hoping we wouldn't have to cycle through a small airlock a few at a time. This might get us all in at one entry point without damaging air containment. Shorty looked at Jay and Peavy. Big enough for Drasco's. He obviously hadn't seen Drasco's squeeze through a hole smaller than their massive bodies. Drasco triplets could fit through a lot of small hatches, but Jay and Peavy had grown too large to squeeze into many airlocks, even one at a time. Stone's preference would have been to sneak up and put breaching charges all over the base. That should blow huge holes in the life support system, allowing the planet's chlorine atmosphere to swamp the base. He rejected that plan of attack because he didn't know if human or piglet foodstuffs were on the base. The presence of a human skull didn't confirm there were humans to rescue, just that there had been once. His current plan was to sneak in the back door, spread out, do whatever damage they could, and rescue any intelligent species they could find. Primarily, they had to shut down the enemy's ability to fire their weapons at spacecraft or the orbital weapons platform. Once the base was under their control or destroyed, they could call their shuttle in for pickup, assuming one of the Allied controlled ships in the system was still available to extract them. He pointed a finger at Shorty, gesturing in a wide circle to the left, ending at the base's back hatch. He turned, without waiting to see if the piglet complied. He kept low, moving up and over the lip of the gully, circling around to the right. Any motion detector would easily spot the movement and send an alert to a base security monitor. He doubted anyone was watching. Out of the gully, the whipping wind pulled at him, his suit easily compensated. The wind picked up various pieces of garbage, swirling trash and detritus, strewing it across the open valley floor. A garish piece of cloth blew past stone. Anyone watching security monitors would constantly hear an alert from motion sensors. Some of the piles of trash were as tall as he was. Keeping low, he reached the back wall of the base. Sliding along the wall, he made every effort not to touch anything that might alert the Hyrocanians to his position. A fire team of piglets waved at him from the other side of the back hatch. He waved back. He couldn't see anyone or anything back at the gully, even using his suit's enhanced optics. Even the body heat his Drascos generated whisked away in the high wind before it rose above the lip of the gully. The plan was to rush through the back hatch as soon as they could gain access. Stone held a breaching charge in his hand. Once set and exploded, he and the piglet fire team would race inside— one piglet would repair the breach with an emergency quick-set fix-it kit. One piglet would open the hatch for the rest of their assault troops. A pair of piglets would provide cover fire for the repairman and the doorman. Stone was along because Grandpa had always said that a real leader leads from the front. That was his excuse for being first inside the base. The real reason was that if he didn't do something soon, pent-up nervous energy would eat a hole through his stomach. Stone checked his data port, watching the timestamp count down to zero. He tapped open his comms and sent a coded burst transmission. Planetary team is a go. 
The assault had started days ago, when the rusty hinges in the Freedom Wagon had launched timed volleys of missiles and mines at Hyrakanian ships all around the system. Anticipating where each enemy ship would be at this exact moment had been a challenge. Since most ships were stationary, the Q-ship flooded those locations, hoping to catch the Hyrakanians with their shields down. Those mines and missiles should be reaching their targets now. He felt the ground vibrate before he could press the activate button on the breaching charge. Waving a warning to the piglets, he flattened himself against the base wall as the hatch began rumbling up. Puffs of air blew swirls of dust. The Hyrocanians hadn't completely equalized pressure or fully cycled their air systems before opening the wide hatch. A pair of suited Hyrocanians followed a floating platform out of the opening before the hatch was completely open. Their suits were simple worker EVA configurations. The platform was stacked with piles and bags of garbage. Strong winds tugged at the trash, pulling pieces away, sending it flying across the valley floor, littering the landscape with odd pieces of waste. The Hyrocanians trudged behind the cart, not bothering to look at the platform, their surroundings, or each other. They stopped a dozen feet from the hatch. Each grabbed a bag of trash, throwing it skyward to let the wind take it where it willed. Stone reclamped the unexploded breaching charge to his thigh and pulled his TDO 960A rifle into firing position. His built-in suit weapons would have been faster, but they were definitely overkill. Two quick trigger pulls, and the Hyrocanians were as useless as their trash. Stone didn't even look at his victims. The slugs ignored the light EVA suits, punching small holes in the back of the Hyrocanians' heads. Their hydrostatic charge blew the aliens' faces off. He stepped through the open hatch. His rifle snapped back into its holster while his suit readied every weapon. The open space beyond the massive hatch was a hangar, mostly empty except for a half-dozen flitters and skiffs parked haphazardly across the wide floor. Waving his arms at the piglet fire team, he waited until they sprinted across the deck to cover the far hatch. Like most automatics, the interior hatch wouldn't open until the outer hatch was sealed and the atmospherics reset to interior normal. The piglets pointed their weapons at the hatch. Stone remembered wondering, back on Lazaroni base, it seemed like years ago, why an officer and an NCO were required to be present when the exterior hatches were opened to the outside. Now he knew. An alarm would already be ringing if the Hyrocanians had someone watching the hatch. His suit confirmed that no alarm was ringing. He sent a burst message to Shorty, Come on! Piglets and Draskos bubbled up and out of the gully, Climbing up, running, and bouncing forward, they raced into the hangar bay. Stone was amazed. The piglets charged forward en masse, exactly like an old vid of pirates boarding a ship, waving weapons like they were swords and clubs. He was sure they were shouting, Arg! except he couldn't hear them, and none of them took the time to type their battle cry into their dataport translators. Many of the piglets were riding the luggage carts. Considering their shorter legs, Stone wasn't surprised they were riding in and on the carts. The carts wouldn't provide any protection, as they were constructed of little more than air and foam. Most were now empty, drained of excess consumables, and some had their lids ripped off, giving the piglets floating boxes to travel in. The Draskos maintained a tight formation, even at the full run. Leapfrogging like a pair of marine fire teams, they covered the other's advance while one swept her weapon behind them to cover their sex. Jay's blue team sprinted into the hangar, weapon muzzles covering every possible ambush point. PB and her daughters covered the blue team. B, in her muted blood-red armor, was actually running backwards as the last one in the door. Stone hit the external hatch button with a button-pushing skill he'd long since mastered. The hatch rumbled, clanking along like a rusty chain. It stopped about halfway to the deck and froze. Stone hit the button again, but nothing happened. He slammed his fist next to the hatch access panel, and the hatch relented, creeping down to seal against the deck. A piglet across the hangar bay waved when a colored light turned white. On a UEN ship, one light would be red and one would be green. He didn't know what colors the piglets used. The change was enough to signal that the air pressure had equalized with a Hyrocanian breathable atmosphere. Shorty said, Open our breach. Stone said, We might get deeper into the base if we open the hatch quietly. We've got to announce our presence sometime. True, Shorty, but let's see if we can get your people into the vents to shut— The interior hatch started to rise, interrupting him. Cover! he shouted. He twisted toward the moving hatch, prepared to send a bunker buster through it. 
The weapon wouldn't explode until it was through the hatch, then it would blow up in the corridor or cabin beyond. Instead, Anne stepped forward. I got this, like for sure. She squeezed the trigger on her weapon. Stone almost ducked. An anti-armor shell roared from the end of her shoulder-mounted cannon. The shell hit the hatch with a thump and a roar. The metal peeled back with a screech. A second shell, set free when the outer shell exploded, blasted through the hole. A bright flare washed back through the opening, followed by a wall of flame pushing crispy bits of Hyrocanians along its gust front. Before anyone else could move, Emily and Charlotte bracketed the opening. The shock wave from Anne's shell rattled their armor as they squeezed the triggers on their weapons. Emily's minigun spat round after round down a long corridor. Charlotte's weapon, a tripod-mounted anti-aircraft gun, chuffed a dozen rounds down the corridor in the opposite direction. Jay shouted, Now! Peavy and her daughters raced forward on the heels of Blue Team's last shots. Paired up, they squeezed into the corridor facing both directions. Their weapons were at the ready, but there wasn't anything to shoot. Clear! Peavy shouted. Stone said, Shorty, I think the Hyrocanians know we're here. Your team is up. Let's shut this place down. Aye, aye, boss. His reply was so fast, Stone was sure Shorty had speed dial hot buttons for some responses. Piglets raced forward, flowing over and around the Draskos. They disappeared into vents, hatchways, and behind grates. More than one team raced down the blackened, twisted corridor, riding in luggage carts, weapons bristling in every direction. Jay, advance and destroy. Yes, Mama. Let's go, girls. Peavy, let's see if we can find their kitchens. Finding the kitchens quickly might save any sentient species stored there. Stone hoped there weren't any humans on this base. He was certain there had been, but he was sick at heart at the misery he'd already seen. Before leaving the hangar, he glanced at the bulkhead and spotted what looked like a skiff or floater charging port. He wondered how an alien species built a ship and a base with components that so closely resembled human, military, or civilian ships. He dismissed the thought. Everyone knew Hyrocanians were good at stealing tech. Slapping the charge on the bulkhead, he twisted the directional dial and hit the button. He then moved quickly into the corridor, the last of his team to leave the hangar. Five seconds later, an explosion washed across the hangar bay. Skiffs and floaters were thrown about from the force of the blast. Secondary explosions set off a long series of blasts. Without commands, T and B moved down the charred and blackened corridor in the opposite direction J and her daughters had taken, sweeping their weapons before them. Stone was pleased. The Marines had trained his Draskos well. They weren't just mascots or working canines, but full-fledged combatants. Here! T said. Her muted pink armor didn't twinkle in the overhead lighting, but the light color was at definite odds with the angry glare in her eyes. She held up a clenched fist, pointing at a closed hatch. Though Stone's faceplate was down and locked in place, he could smell the odor of rancid grease mixed with the fragrance of roses dipped in maple syrup. A large number of Hyrocanians were on the other side of the hatch. Before he could move forward, L pushed Stone aside. Screw this! L shouted. She hit the hatch with her full bulk. The hatch buckled as the hinges gave way. L rolled back out of the hatchway, rather than race into the cabin. The muted magenta flames on her armor raged against the black background. Peavy stepped between Stone and the hatch as T and B tossed grenades into the cabin. They each threw two and ducked back into the corridor. Four quick muffled wumps vibrated through the deck. Stone was sure his suit would have protected him, but he patted PB in thanks anyway. He realized she couldn't help herself. Protecting him, even if he didn't need it, was part of her nature. B wonked in excitement and raced into the cabin, followed closely by T and L. PB bolted after them. Stone put a foot on the far bulkhead and used his knees to propel him into the cabin. His weapons were ready, but he had to be mindful of friendly fire. He bounced into the cabin in a long, flat arc. The Draskos had holstered their weapons. The cabin wasn't small. Spread out before him was a wide bay. Scattered around were bunks and boxes of personal goods. There weren't any neat orderly rows like a human barracks, but a hodgepodge of mismatched furniture apparently dropped wherever there was an open space. The walls of the bay were lined with Hyrocanian combat suits. Some suits lay in piles on the deck, some hung haphazardly on hooks, and a few were mounted into charging ports on the bulkhead. Dozens of Hyrocanians were scrambling to get to and into their suits. Weapons forgotten, the Drasco Red Team moved into the Hyrocanians with abandon. 
T grabbed a pair of hyracanians. Without looking, she tossed one over her shoulder to L. The hard talons on Drasco fingers could easily crush rock. L shredded the hyracanian before it hit the ground at her feet. T squeezed the neck of the other alien until its head popped loose. The two moved to the right, racing along the right bulkhead, catching hyracanians clustering near their suits. PB and B raced along the left bulkhead. A hyracanian leapt at B with a sharp kitchen knife in each of its four hands. She grabbed it, casually throwing it across the bay into a knot of aliens. It crashed into the others with a bone-breaking crunch. PB's tail shot over her head. The black armor cap covering her bone tip impaled a hyracanian who had managed to climb into its combat suit, but hadn't managed to seal up yet. She shook the four-armed freak free while stomping a pair of hyracanians trying to sort through their suits. The suits were little more than piles of metal on the deck. Stone walked down the middle of the bay. His drascos were like scythes slashing through tall grass. Hyracanians were cut down, stomped flat, and pulled into pieces like wheat for the harvest. Shorty's voice called out over his comms. Command center is... Wait. Through his armor, Stone felt a distant vibration. The piglet continued. Gone. Stone wanted to check on Allie. The marine assault should have started the minute he and his team entered the hangar bay. He wanted to check, but didn't. The proper contact and reporting point was Commander Butcher on the rusty hinges. Stone didn't have any valid reason to check, beyond his concern over his girlfriend's well-being. Unable to stop himself, he tapped open his data port. Base assault progressing. Command center destroyed. Roger that, Ensign. Um, any progress reports from other teams? We're busy here, Ensign. Keep your focus on your task. The voice wasn't Butcher's, but the words were. It was exactly what his grandfather would have said. He wanted to know more, to get an update, but everyone had their hands full. Pointing a finger at a pair of scrambling hyracanians, he squeezed. Both creatures disappeared in a blossoming mist. Another alien ran away from B. It fell at his feet. Not slowing down, he stepped on its chest, crushing it flat. A cluster of hyracanians reached the far wall. The fattest creature among them was almost sealed in its suit, shouting at the others around it. Stone's suit could translate the creature's words, but he didn't care. He shot it, feeling a release of anger at the enemy and his frustration at not knowing about Allie, following the bullet speeding across the short distance. The bullet penetrated the suit before exploding. The suit remained standing. A fountain of body parts spouted toward the ceiling. Stone sprayed the remaining Hyrocanians with soft bullets, soft meaning they would go through soft tissue but not ricochet off or damage a bulkhead. B, in a relatively clear spot, pulled her weapon from its holster. She held the same type of anti-aircraft gun Charlotte carried. The weapon was a heavy artillery piece normally mounted on a tripod and humped into place by a pair of marines. She squeezed the trigger and chuffed a dozen rounds into a knot of hyracanians trying to squeeze through a rear hatch in a panic. A hyracanian leapt at PB. Rather than fire her weapon, B intercepted the leaping alien by jamming the barrel of her gun through its open mouth and shoving hard enough it came out the backside. The spray of blood and brains slid off her chest plate. Jay's voice said over the comms, Mama, Anne is hurt. She's injured bad. We found their storerooms. Lots of creatures here, but no humans. No us and no piglets so far. Stone said, Shorty, enemy weapons control is now non-functional, Bosch. Rigging charges on the weapons stores. Jay, stay put with your daughters. We'll get Anne out of there and get her some help as soon as we can. Are you Charlotte and Emily all right? Emily got knocked around a bit, but she says she is still ready to fight. Shorty, call in the shuttle for pickup. We won't blow this place until we're long gone. Yes, Bosch. Request permission to search and destroy. Permission granted. Stone knew the old pirate really wanted to start looting. He didn't care if they stripped out everything they thought was of value. To the victor go the spoils. The Empire's military did not condone pillaging, but the piglets were at best allies, not Navy or Marines. Jay, do you have a shuttle hatch nearby? Right here, Mama. Stone wondered about that. The usual shoddy Hyracanian design would have put a warehouse or shuttle hatch so far away from their storage area they would be completely useless for loading and unloading. The logic of putting a hatch close by for easy offloading of cargo seemed to elude the aliens. It made him think this base might not be a Hyracanian design, although it was clearly built for their use. Stone popped his helmet off, letting it fall back on its hinges hanging down his back. He took a deep breath. The air smelled foul, like trapped Hyrocanian farts, but being inside his suit for days on end made the air inside stale. 
Something about breathing good station air inside a base with a solid ceiling overhead was comforting. Opening up wasn't the smartest thing to do, but he'd been in the can for so long he almost felt like a tin of small early June peas. An unsuited Hyrocanian leapt from under a bunk, vaulting up with a screech, the knife in its hand sliced across Stone's forehead. Grabbing the alien with a gauntleted hand, Stone wrenched the knife from its hand. Cutting deep through layers of fat, he gutted it and dropped the body to the deck. Unbuttoning had been foolish. He knew that in hindsight, but he would have gone crazy if he'd had to stay confined up a moment longer. Though the Draskos had the room almost clear, that didn't mean it was safe. Almost is not the same as completely. He tried to feel the cut across his forehead, but as sensitive as the tips of his gauntlets were, they weren't like human fingertips. Still, they didn't come away bloody, not with human blood anyway. He could put the helmet back on and let the suit evaluate the damage, but he couldn't bear the thought of sealing up again. Instead, he popped a visade bubble open and pointed it at his forehead. A small scratch was already closing up, knitting quickly, thanks to the military nanites in his bloodstream doing their job. The edges and ends of the cut were already disappearing. He'd been saved from a serious injury by his thickened skin. Jay, activate your locator. Yes, Mama. Standing in the middle of the barracks bay, he pulled up a display on his data port. Ignoring the carnage going on around him, he began mapping the base, tagging the Drasco Blue Team's location, and noting the warehouse hatch for their shuttle pilot. Shorty, please ask your teams to begin sending location reports and movement history files to me. Yes, Bosch. The base map hanging in the air in front of him began to fill with detail after detail. The weapons control room was three decks up from their entry point. He wondered how the piglets had located it so fast and disabled it so rapidly. If they survived, he would enjoy reviewing their video files. He smiled. He was sure Shorty's past experience as a pirate had been useful during their attack. Almost without thinking, Stone ducked as half a Hyracanian sailed by. T giggled. Sorry, Mama. Stone pointed an accusing finger at PB's daughter. Watch it, girl. He smiled as T pretended to look contrite, a look that barely translated from Drasco to human. Stone returned to his map. The diagram was filling in rapidly. Certain corridors and bays were tinted green, indicating they had been cleared. Unknown areas were marked in red, but as Shorty's teams moved from one bay to the next, the areas quickly shifted from red to green. Keep it slow and safe, Shorty. We're still good, Bosch. We've got a few of my people down, but less than we expected at this point. Stone grinned. He hadn't really expected anyone to be alive at this point. To save Ali, he'd been willing to sacrifice his whole team, blowing the base to dust if that was what it took. Jay's location is marked on the map. All the Draskos and Stone were marked in blue. Shorty had demanded that his people be marked in yellow. Get your wounded to her location for transfer to the shuttle as soon as it arrives. Neither of them spoke about what to do with the piglet dead, although Shorty had shrugged about losing piglets when discussing the plans. Stone had avoided the subject of dead Draskos with Jay and PB, only discussing the changes to the living. PB and her daughters clustered around him. The younger Draskos were giggling and shoving each other in excitement. The bay was clear. Stone pointed at the map. The deck below showed a bay exactly the size and configuration of the one they were standing in. PB, this may be another barracks. Phoebe nodded. Her talons scraped along the deck until they caught on the edge of a plate. She dug in and pulled. B grabbed the edge of the plate and yanked it away. Stone looked into the hole. The ceiling below them wasn't anything more than a thin sheet of plasticrete. L and T scorpioned their tail spikes into the hole. Twisting, they wrenched it free, pulling it back and throwing it over their heads. PB laughed. I like this way of going from deck to deck. It's much faster than finding ladders and going through hatches. Stone looked into the hole. Staring back at him was a gathering cluster of suited Hyracanians. This group had enough time to respond to the alarms by getting suited and organized, although a few of their group were still trying desperately to get their suits clamped shut around fat bellies. The alarms shut off. Shorty's team must have found the control. The Hyracanians below raised their muzzles, but not before L, B, and T brought their weapons to bear. The Drasco's quick reflexes were faster than the lazy and slow aliens. Stone and PB stepped back as the three younger Drascos began a slow shuffle, moving in a circle around the hole, each firing their preferred weapon down the hole at every angle they could manage, without dropping down the hole. Flame and debris blasted back up the hole as ammunition usually used against armor, aircraft, and massed troops exploded, blew up, and ricocheted around the bay below them. 
Elle released the trigger of her minigun and tossed a few grenades down the hole. They hit the deck below with enough force that they bounced into the far recesses of the bay before exploding. Waving her daughter's back, PB flattened her body to the deck and stuck her long neck down the hole. She swiveled her neck in a circle. Coming back up, she shrugged, reached across, and tapped Stone's map display, turning the bay from red to green. Stone tapped the map. Shorty, here's a map update. Check that red room on the top deck. Your people missed it. He wasn't worried about the base being combat-ready. All it would take was a few specific twitches in proper sequence of the correct fingers, and the charges Shorty's team had placed around the weapons storage areas, and the whole base would blow, taking everyone and everything with it, littering the planet's landscape with more debris than the enemy had already scattered about. Those twitches would be a last resort, or something he would do from kilometers away. Twitch. Boom. But not yet. Checking every nook and cranny on the base might yield intelligence of unknown value. To Shorty, every hidey hole might contain something worth stealing, so Stone was sure the piglet would look everywhere he could. B shouted, Look, Mama! She held a string of some gems. These spilled out of this box! Can I keep them? Looting was against UEN regulations, but the Draskos weren't officially Marines or Navy. They weren't even mercenaries, since they weren't getting paid. Stone shrugged. If it's all right with PB, then it's okay with me. B said, These are pretty. I want to give them to Anne. She's hurt, and these pretty things might make her feel better. PB wonked in excitement. She and her daughters dove into the scattered piles of goods, digging through this and that, bundling up goods to take with them. Rechecking the map, Stone saw that the base was changing from red to green almost as fast as the map could update the color. The base was large, but not so huge that swarming through it would take long. A glitter in a pile of goods around a large bunk caught his eye. A bag of data crystals lay scattered in the mix. Looting was one thing. Gathering intelligence was something else. Stone scooped the crystals up, noting that some of the crystals were human configurations, some were Hyrocanian, a couple were designed in piglet style, and a few were shaped like none he'd ever seen before. He didn't know if they had readers that could access them. Stuffing the crystals in a thigh bin, he walked to the bay's hatch. Even though the corridor was marked green on his base map, with a sigh he put his helmet back on and stuck his head out, looking both directions. Let's go, girls. Let's go find Jay and her daughters. He doubted PB and her girls needed the map to locate their relatives. Stone could have found them by their fragrance. Instead, he used his eyes and map reading skills to move from deck to deck. PB and her girls dashed forward, disappearing through an open wide hatch. Stone heard a loud wonking chorus as the Draskos gathered with their family. As a counterpoint, he heard a Drasco crying. Even from a distance, he could tell it was Anne. The injured Drasco wrenched at his heart, and he tried not to be thankful that the only serious Drasco injury had happened to one of the younger girls. They might all be in serious trouble if Jay or PB had been killed. The resultant hormonal change from female to rampaging male would be as dangerous as the planted explosives scattered around the base. He wanted to rush in to check on Anne, but he stood at the hatch. Waving and directing teams of piglets into the warehouse bay, he scanned as far as he could see in all directions. His map showed every bay and space as green, but that didn't mean there weren't enemy combatants hiding who could throw a wrench in the works. Most of the piglets were carrying bundles of goods. A series of luggage carts scooted down the corridor at high speed. Shorty stood on the top of the lead cart, pointing the way. Injured piglets clung to the tops and sides. The carts themselves were filled to overflowing with booty. Stone didn't want to count. He knew they'd lost piglets in the fight. The surprise was that there weren't any Drasco fatalities. He was saddened to see as many injured as there were, but try as he might, he was more than glad there hadn't been any human fatalities. The stream of piglets dribbled to a halt. The corridor was clear. Stone said, Jay and Peavy, get Anne on a cart for transfer to the shuttle. He wondered where the shuttle was. They'd been here for hours and hours. Glancing at the time, he was shocked at how little time had passed. Shorty shouted, Shuttle inbound, docking in thirty minutes. Stone pointed at a pair of armed piglets. He pointed at their eyes and then to the corridor. The two little creatures jumped into position and took over his duties, watching their six. He turned for the first time and looked into the warehouse. Jay and Peavy were lifting Anne onto a cart. A string of jewels hung from the injured Drasco's neck, glittering in contrast to the subdued colors on her chest plate. Piglets were racing in a dozen directions, checking this cart and that, looking at injured and loot with equal care. All around the swirling activity were creatures, large and small. 
Screeching, moaning, clucking, and bleating, the animals had gotten loose from their pens and were running, jumping, or just standing. Dozens of food pens were open, and dozens more were still closed. Stone hoped the shuttle had room for all of them. Chapter 48 Stone stood on the shuttle bridge, watching the Hyrocanian planetary base as the piglet pilot backed them away. His helmet was off, but he'd kept his suit on during the transfer from the warehouse bay into the shuttle. Loading the shuttle had taken far longer than the assault itself, but it was worth it. Shorty had the shuttle stuffed with enough goods and animals to make all the piglets rich. He delayed calling the rusty hinges. Commander Butcher knew he'd succeeded, because the base hadn't done anything to help the orbital weapons platform. He didn't know how successful the Marines had been, but the orbital platform hadn't sent any help to the base, either. He asked, "'Can we bring up any long-range views on the monitor?' The piglet shook his head, imitating a human response. Shorty said, "'Not long-range enough. We can ask for a relay from the rusty hinges or the freedom wagon, if you want.' Stone replied, "'No. I imagine they're busy right about now. Please send Commander Butcher a pickup request.' "'Yes, boss. Sent and received.' Stone looked at the view of the base below them. From this angle, it looked like any square metal box built by any race. It could have been anything from storage to an old apartment building. He squeezed his fingers. A few puffs of debris blew from the building. Instead of the huge explosion he expected, the base wrinkled, crumpled, and folded into itself. It shrank down, as if something was sucking all of the air out of it. The base disappeared in a whirl of dust, sucking in much of the trash scattered across the little valley. The dust settled as the base sank into a deep crater. The ground around the base heaved, twitched, and finally let loose in a geyser of flame. A series of smaller explosions twisted the geyser into a ball of expanding light, heat, and debris. Shorty looked up at Stone. Well, Bosh, that was a waste of a perfectly good building. Nothing that you couldn't rebuild if you wanted to move into this particular neighborhood. No thanks, boss. Planets bore me. I like living in space. Well, you have your own spaceship now. The Freedom Wagon is a pretty nice place to live in. We still have a few pockets of Hyrocanian vermin we have to sweep clean, but it's in much better shape than the rusty hinges. Plus, you and Sissy have a bunch of your people who want to go home. Shorty shrugged. That is, assuming we can exit this system, and that old fart of a brother gave us the correct code to allow us past their repulsars. The monitor blinked, switching from the yellowish atmosphere of the planet to the black of space. The shuttle pilot put them into a stationary orbit around the planet, and looked up expectantly at Stone and Shorty. "'Now what, Bosch? Stone said, "'The rusty hinges should have seen the planet base blow up, so they know we've succeeded. They'll time a pass by the planet to pick us up at the same time they pick up the Marines' shuttle. You're assuming that either of our ships survived their engagement with the Hyrakanian ships in the system?' Stone nodded. There was a big chance that the coordinated mine and missile attack against all Hyrocanian shipping had failed. They hadn't expected to get a clean sweep, but Butcher had taken his shots and moved his ship, hoping that any surviving enemy ship wouldn't suspect their Q-ship of the attack. If Rusty Hinges had been discovered to be the shooter, any remaining Hyrocanian ships would have blown their ride home to space dust. The three-pronged attack on the Hyrocanians in this system was a long shot. However, attacking and destroying as much enemy shipping as possible had been Butcher's understanding of his orders. Gathering information and leaving was an option, and Stone doubted anyone would blame Butcher if that had been his decision. No one expected the rusty hinges to take on dozens of Hyrocanian ships single-handed. No one except Butcher and his crew of volunteers. The rusty hinges was reconfigured as a Q-ship for this exact purpose. Butcher would have blamed himself for not trying, even if no one else would. Stone agreed, even if that meant he was never going home. If Rusty Hinges was destroyed, Freedom Wagon was their only pickup. Shorty's new spaceship might get them to the Piglet homeworld, but no one had discussed whether he would use his ship to return stranded humans back to Allie's world. If the Rusty Hinges was gone, the only stranded humans would be Stone and any Marines who survived their attack on the Orbital Weapons Platform. Can we get a view of the Orbital Weapons Platform? There was a slight delay as Shorty queried the pilot and responded back. No, Bosch, not from here. Our orbit will bring us around in about... A voice shouted from the monitor as the picture changed from the black of space into an obese Hyrocanian. They didn't have the translator software loaded into the shuttle's systems, but Stone didn't doubt the creature was spouting obscenities. He asked, Is that thing speaking directly at us? 
Shorty said, No, boss, it is a system-wide push. Any idea what it's saying? Stone shrugged. No, Shorty, he could be demanding our surrender or asking us over to be lunch. Wouldn't those be the same thing? Before Stone could reply, the screen changed again. A haggard-looking Commander Butcher replaced the Hyrakanian. The man's hair was sticking up at odd angles, and dark circles had taken up residence under his eyes. Even his lips looked chapped and dry. He was smiling. The enemy is hot on our tail, but we're coming for you. Don't broadcast your location. We only killed or damaged about 75% of the ships in the system with our initial attack. We managed to take down another two before they figured out who we were. Stone did a quick count. When his team left the rusty hinges, there were twenty-six enemy ships in the system. Seventy-five percent meant eliminating or damaging twenty ships. That left six enemy ships, give or take a few, depending on whether some weren't damaged too badly to pursue the humans. The Freedom Wagon had weapons, but it was a warehouse ship and had little to no chance against a Hyrakanian ship of the line. That left the rusty hinges in a six-to-one odds battle. But Butcher was smiling. "'We're coming in hot, people!' The plan is to pick you up on the fly. Send us a coded location beacon and head— He looked over his shoulder and repeated some coordinates. Head there at top speed. We'll open the shuttle hangar hatch and scoop you up on our way past. Oh, and brace for impact. Stone put a hand on the pilot's shoulder. Do it. Let's kick this boat in the butt. Get us moving as fast as you can. Shorty looked up at Stone. Human pilots can pick up a shuttle at top speed? He looked surprised and in awe of human piloting skill. His face fell when Stone answered, Nope, never happen. Chapter 49 Everyone aboard the shuttle braced as well as they could. The piglets climbed back into their combat suits, hoping they would provide some cushion. Stone's suit would protect him from being rattled around too much, but the Draskos and animals they'd taken from the planetary base were sure to be tossed around, assuming the rusty hinges could manage to capture a moving shuttle— Stone made a mental note to find out why humans hadn't made an effective tractor beam. Tractor beams were still science fiction fodder, just like time travel. So far, no scientist had been able to get either to work. There were reports of tractor beams that could grab a coffee cup on a workbench and drag it across the tabletop. There was even some success in a stationary base grabbing an unmoving skiff and towing it from one place to another. No one had been successful tractoring a moving shuttle to a faster-moving spacecraft, any more than anyone had succeeded in doing more than shifting a few mice a couple of years into the future. Stone plotted their heading. They were racing toward the navigation jump point that would take them to the Piglet homeworld. They would escape into hyperspace if the rusty hinges could pick them up on the fly. If not, they would eventually be discovered and captured by the pursuing enemy ships— they couldn't jump, as Hyrakanian shuttles didn't have hyperspace-capable engines, and as much as he thought about it, he couldn't fathom how to retrofit the Hyrakanian shuttle engines to jump back and forth, like he'd once done to a UEN-built engine. Stone was sure he and Shorty could play hide-and-seek with the Hyrakanians for a while, but the shuttle wasn't meant for long-term survival. He looked down at the little piglet. Shorty must have been thinking the same thing. Stone shook his head when Shorty smiled a bit, he could imagine the little pirate planning to board another enemy vessel. Attacking another ship had little chance of success, since their element of surprise had long since expired. Going out fighting was better than the possible alternatives, like drifting into empty space between systems, surrendering to be some fat slob's afternoon snack, or slamming into an enemy warship at ramming speed. Dying wasn't just dying. Sometimes it mattered how you went. First, there was nothing on the monitor. Then, as if by magic, the rusty hinges filled the screen, the huge hangar bay hatch opened like the hungry maw of some giant space creature. Faster than an eye could react, the shuttle slammed into the forward bulkhead of the shuttle bay. It started to bounce back, but slammed into a second shuttle and jerked to a halt. Stone clambered to his feet, reaching back to pick up Shorty, who'd fallen underneath Stone. Bouncing out of the room, he shouted over his shoulder, "'Shorty, check on everyone! I've got to get to the bridge!' Sprinting out of the shuttle's control room, he raced down the corridor and through a dilating hatch. He was concerned about his Draskos and the piglets, but he was more upset at not knowing about Allie. Had she been wounded, or worse, in the attack on the weapons platform? Was the Rusty Hinges going to be able to pick up the Marines, or did Butcher have to abandon them to save his ship? Where was she? The bridge was the only place he knew he would find answers. Fortunately, the anti-gravity on the shuttle was still working— he popped onto the surface at the top end of a long, downward-sloping side. 
To him, it felt as if he was running on a flat surface while the ship's shuttle hanger was twisted at an odd angle. Almost without thinking, he registered the twisted forward bulkhead of the hanger his shuttle had just rammed. The metal had given way to the shuttle's abrupt crash. The shuttle's anti-gravity system had protected it from serious damage, but one point of the tetrahedron pyramid was crumpled. Stone reached the end of the shuttle's side and vaulted toward the hangar deck. Twisting in midair, he somersaulted to align his feet downward. He popped the catch on his helmet, allowing it to hang down his back. His feet hit the deck, and he turned, spotting a second shuttle in the bay. The Rusty Hinges had three shuttles. They'd kept one, one had carried the Marines, and Stone's team had taken one. This shuttle was blackened by an explosion, and a wide rip exposed a couple of interior decks. Firemen and damage control were struggling to contain the fires. Stone! He spun around at the sound of Allie's voice. Their bounces toward each other ended in a heavy metal clash as their suits took the impact. His lips sought hers with no less force. When he could breathe again, he looked at her. Her helmet dangled behind her like his did down his back, but her faceplate was cracked and resealed with duct tape. Her suit was charred and bent. She was laughing. Stone grimaced. Never again, love. Bullshit, Stone. Every chance we get. I didn't mean the kissing. I meant going into battle without you. She laughed. That's what I meant, too, you goof. That's what you get when you love a Marine. Numos's voice cut off his response. Enough kissy face, Vedrian. Tend to our wounded. He jammed his finger at the torn shuttle. Have Hammer get the fire under control. Keep him busy. Get his mind off rain. Find Al Juli. Make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. Get me a personnel report ASAP. Set up a morgue for Lieutenant Escamilla and the rest of the dead. Dead Marines were probably in body bags, already cremated to ashes. However, setting up a place for friends and loved ones to say goodbye was standard Marine procedure. Stone knew enough to know their morgue would be in a bar. The Marines had lost Second Lieutenant Rain Escamilla, and from the sounds of it, Al Juli had lost his wife. P1C Emma Al Juli. Nay, January. Those deaths would be hard on the company as a whole, but more so for the people who loved those Marines. Sir? Allie twisted out of Stone's grasp and leapt up into the damaged Marine shuttle. She was gone before he could utter a word. She was a Marine, and did what Marines do. Finding her alive had been a jolt of electric shock to his body. His lips still tingled from the excitement. Maybe she was right. Going to war separately was hard, but coming together later was intense. Stone! Numos shouted. Get your head out, boy! We're not done yet! The Major was peeling himself out of his combat suit with record speed. Tuttle was crouched behind him, using a cutting torch to cut him out of his suit. A gash from the suit's shoulder slid all the way down to the buttocks area. Fluids were leaking out of the gash, but there didn't appear to be any blood. Get out of your suit, Ensign Stone! Report to the bridge on the double! Numos pushed his way clear of the broken combat suit, turned, and rushed away. Tuttle looked up at him from her knees. She grinned and winked at him. Been trying to get that man out of his pants for years. Wiggling the cutting torch, she asked, Need help? Stone hit the emergency escape button on his suit. It fell away from him in pieces with a clatter, falling to the deck. He turned and raced toward the bridge. Numos was sprinting ahead of him. Stone's enhanced reflexes and speed enabled him to catch up to the man quickly. Even with his marine-enhanced combat nanites, Numos was favoring his left knee. Without asking, Stone scooped the man up, swung him over his shoulders in a fireman's carry, and continued on at full speed. Numos grunted, but didn't say anything until they reached the bridge hatch, where Stone set him down. All the Major said was, Shit! Stone nodded his agreement. He didn't know he could run that fast carrying a person on his shoulders. He thought the Major's sentiment was quite appropriate. The Navy security man guarding the bridge hatch looked startled at their rapid appearance. He kept both hands on his rifle while he kicked the hatch open for the two officers. Stone followed Numos onto the bridge and closed the hatch behind him. His nose wrinkled at the stench. He smelled a mixture of human waste and rancid grease. Not the rancid grease scent that indicated hostility, but the actual odor of half-eaten greasy food left lying around for a few days. The odor of human waste wafted from a porta potty set up in the corner. A chief petty officer was sitting on the toilet. She grunted and hung her head wearily, as if sitting on a toilet in an open room was a relaxing time-out. Unwashed sleeping bodies lay scattered about wherever there was spare space. Master Chief Petty Officer Thomas, disheveled and rumpled, levered himself up from his seat at the conference table. Sir, he gestured for the major to take his chair. Numos shook his head, as did Stone when Thomas offered his seat to him. The Master Chief gratefully dropped back into the chair. 
He continued to stare at the monitor while working some equations on his data port screen. Butcher grinned at the two men. He grabbed Numos by the hand and pumped it vigorously. Stone offered his hand, but the commander grabbed him by the shoulders and hugged him. Pulling away, Butcher finally said, We couldn't have pulled this off any better if we'd planned it. Numos smiled at the sarcasm. Butcher laughed. A three-pronged attack that almost went off without a hitch. Let's say we were 89.75% successful. Oh, first, I want to apologize for picking your shuttles up. Stone said, No apology necessary, sir. It was rough, but... Butcher laughed harder. Oh, not that. Wasn't that really fun, though? Two such pickups in a row is good for the record books. What I mean is picking you up at all. You'd probably live longer if we'd left you on the shuttles. Numos asked, his voice more startled than when Stone had carried him through the corridors at a full sprint. What? Oh, hell, gentlemen, we're just a few minutes short of the Hyrocanians blowing our asses out of space. Chapter 50 Stone leaned over Master Chief Petty Officer Thomas's shoulder, staring at the data and mathematics scribbled on the monitor and the Master Chief's data port display. He didn't understand or even recognize half of the equations, but the solution was clear. No matter what angle the rusty hinges took toward the jump point, no matter how much speed they could coax out of their engines, and no matter how many munitions they threw behind them, the Hyrocanian battleship was going to catch and kill them. Butcher said, They have their front shields on maximum, so any shots we take at them just bounce off or slide away. Stone asked, Wizard and Cat, is there any way to spoof their computers to make them think they've already killed us or that they lost us? Shaking his head, Butcher answered, We tried. They must have thrown in a new firewall once they figured out we were getting into their systems. Stone doubted the usually slow-witted Hyrocanians had any computer experts who could outcode the human scientists. It might be possible. It was more likely they just pulled the plug on the infected systems. The ship was certainly trying to get close enough to turn the rusty hinges into space dust without the aid of computers. Butcher continued, That big bastard was the closest Hyrocanian ship to us when we started throwing missiles and mines. They'd have gone down in flames along with every other ship we hit, except they started to move, and we missed them completely. We've been running and dodging them ever since. They aren't straight behind us, but they do have the angle on us now to intercept us before we can jump out of the system. We might be able to outrun them if they were trailing us straight on, but not now. A bigger ship didn't mean bigger engines. Anti-gravity engines didn't care about the size of the ship. The only issue was connectivity to the ship. Theoretically, a small engine could move a planet. However, the one time that stunt had been tried, the only surviving engineer said, She was just a big bitch to steer. The planet's wobble and spin had been uncontrollable. Stone said, Sir... If we can't get away, I'd rather go down swinging. How about turning to fight? Butcher shook his head. We thought about it, but that big bastard would flick us away like a mosquito attacking a hungry bat. Our test shots have been at a distance, but we're close enough to know their forward shields are too strong to punch through before they pound us down to unpainted metal flakes. Our best hope is to dodge their weapons fire using our shields until we can manage to squeak through the jump point. Stone wasn't sure what a mosquito or a bat was, but he decided not to look them up at the moment. He understood the imagery from the context. Glancing at the monitors, he could tell they were only a few short moments away from the pursuing ship reaching effective weapons range. Numos asked, What about the Freedom Wagon? Did Sissy and her civilian crew get away? We don't know. We can only hope they jumped out of the system when the fireworks started, since we lost contact with them about that time. Navigation, sir. The operator's voice sounded weary, with just a touch of panic wrapped in resignation. Objects dead ahead. No, wait. Every monitor snapped on, just as they shot past a huge dark shape. They only recognized something was there when distant stars disappeared behind the object's bulk. Astrogation, what was that? A small moon or an abandoned ship? Astrogation, sir, don't know. It's too dark to get a clear reading. If it is a ship, it was abandoned a long time ago. Even emergency running lights must be burnt out. If it's a rogue moon, it's hiding in the shadow of that nearby ice planet. We don't even have a visual, sir. Helm, sir, whatever it was, we were close enough to scrape off paint, if this ship had paint to scrape off. We— Tactical, sir, the woman's voice interrupted. The object is moving. The monitors showed a dark shape, discernible only because astrogation had tagged the dark shape, allowing the viewers to see a dark shadow. They still couldn't register a shape, just the movement of a mass. 
Butcher looked at Gupta. Exo, a ship lying doggo to squeeze us between their guns and that big bastard behind us? Gupta said, No, sir. If that was their plan, they missed their window. We have shields on high, but they still could have hit us with enough to get through our shields before we even saw them. Now we're tactical, sir. It's a ship. Damn thing is still full dark, but running at ramming speed. Ramming? But we're already past it. Butcher's voice illustrating his confusion. Not at us, sir. She's aimed at the big bast— I mean, target Alpha, behind us. They'll intersect at an angle far enough behind the Hyrakanian's shields that they will crush the other's hull like ice for a margarita. Sissy. It took a second before Stone realized he'd even said her name aloud. No one on the bridge disagreed with him. Tactical, sir. Sissy's opened fire. She's throwing everything she's got at target Alpha. Tactical's voice picked up the pace as her excitement grew. She's got the angle on their shields. Go, baby, go! The big bastard still doesn't see her. Stone closed his eyes, willing Sissy to fire and turn, turn and run to the jump point. Direct hits! Tactical was excited enough to forget protocol and announce themselves, but everyone recognized her voice, although it wasn't the calm, controlled tone they were used to. Multiple hits! That's it! Take the bastard down! Tactical was shouting, A dozen direct hits! Wobble setting in! Target Alpha is losing way! Secondary explosions! Heavy wobble! Throwing debris! Wait! Now, Sissy's turning the Freedom Wagon. She's going to hit debris from the big bastard, but her shield should hold. Um, sir? Stone wasn't the only one who cheered. Communications, send a message to Captain Sissy on the Freedom Wagon. Tell her to head to the jump point. We'll meet her in orbit around the Piglet homeworld. Gupta said, Assuming their code to let us in the door still works, and we don't get bumped back into hyperspace by their repulsar mines. Chapter 51 Stone controlled the grimace threatening to escape the rigid set of his face. Standing at attention, he wiggled his toes and flexed his knees, envying the marines in the formation who were attending this ceremony in their combat suits. Another piglet dignitary ascended to the dais. The translator was typing furiously to keep up with the speech. This piglet was the same little guy who commanded their space navy. Stone recognized him only because he recognized the spangled sash he wore over his shoulder. Stone hoped this was the last speech for this ceremony. Everyone from Commander Butcher to Spacer Dollish had been fed, feted, and given medals and awards. Medals were a new idea for the piglets. They grasped the concept with enthusiasm, even giving Sissy her own sash with a bright yellow stripe, denoting her command of a piglet vessel during combat. Apparently she received the first yellow stripe given by the piglets, and she was the first female to ever be given a sash. This little guy could be blathering on about anything or nothing. Stone had quit listening three speeches back. He'd been awarded another half-dozen medals to add to his collection, for everything from saving a baby piglet to commanding a company of piglet warriors on a hostile planet. Being recognized for doing a job was nice, but he wondered why they couldn't do this sitting down. Every time the piglet space commander said something even remotely apropos, dozens of piglets chanted something— that the translator typed in as Arua. Their cry of approval was always punctuated by a wave of Drasco wonking. The seven Draskos were keeping their enthusiasm up, although Stone was beginning to envy Anne, still stuck in medical getting her broken leg and shoulder repaired. Early on, the Marines had yelled Ura, but even the Marines were getting tired of the interminable speeches. Shorty threw a dirt clod at the speaker. It thudded against the piglet dignitary's belly. "'Shut up already, you old gash bag!' The translator typed furiously, obviously ordered to relay everything anyone said. The space commander harumphed back. He actually turned his back, bent at the waist, and let loose a long fart. Shorty hit him in the ass with a second dirt clod before the piglet could turn back again. "'Enough!' Shorty said. "'These humans risked their lives in combat against a mutual enemy, and now you're trying to talk them to death. But we want to thank them and let them know how much we appreciate you said that already a dozen times, Shorty shouted. The little pirate stomped his way up to the dais. Even my ears are getting tired of this, and my feet hurt. You know nothing about protocol, you... you... privet? Shorty laughed. I'm only a pirate because Mom liked you best. No, she didn't. She liked me... Wait, what? Shorty laughed harder. He grabbed his brother by the shoulders, giving him a friendly shake. Enough speeches! These folks are anxious to get home, and I'm going back to the Hyrocanian system. 
Stone was almost shocked into speaking, but he was still at attention, and muscle memory saved him from embarrassment. Jay called to him, "'What does Shorty mean, Mama?' The Drasco's haphazard formation dissolved as they tried to make sense of Shorty's statement. A quick argument broke out in the Drasco ranks. They were evenly split about going back and going home. Their home planet had evolved the Drascos into fighters, struggling every day to survive. Without having to fight for their next meal, combat was a good substitute for a Drasco's urge for conflict. Shorty said, The humans inflicted serious damage to the ships in that system. They also put repulsar mines at every known navigation point. Any damaged ship with hyperspace capability would jump to a repair base. Any undamaged ship might jump or might not, but any ship still there is fair game, and I call dibs on their cargo. His brother said, I will send a squadron of battle cruisers with you. He waved a hand to stop Shorty's interruption. You keep the cargo, but I want that system clear as a buffer for our world. Never again will we let a ship of eaters have access to our children. A rousing chorus of Arua was punctuated by Drasco wonks and Marine Uras, almost drowning out the space commander's next words. Shorty said, My ship, the Freedom Wagon, has been resupplied and is taking on crew. Enlistment bonuses for signing on are quite large because of the bounty we brought back from our last trip. The space commander said, Only the dregs of our society will sign on to a ship commanded by a privet. Shorty laughed. The Freedom Wagon is captained by my slave, Sissy. He pointed to Sissy, standing next to a table off to the side. You've made a point today of how well she did. The space commander sputtered, No male would sign on to be ruled over by a female. His voice faded away, as dozens of piglets swarmed over to the table to sign on with the pirate crew. Jay shouted, Stand where you are, girls. No, Charlotte, this is the piglets' fight, not ours. Stone could tell from her tone that she didn't believe her own words. The Drasco's fancy parade-ground chrome armor glittered as they danced in excitement. Emily shouted back, But we owe the four-armed freaks for hurting Anne! Like, really? T shouted, For sure! B wonked loudly, We're Marines, sisters! We don't get to pick and choose our fights! PB's voice was calm. Her tone surprised Stone, as she was usually the most excitable Drasco in the crowd— we stand with Mama. Where he goes, we go. No arguments. Jay sighed with agreement. Mama led us to a good fight, and he will lead us to more. Shorty shouted over the hubbub, Formation dismissed! A dozen NCO voices picked up the command, and repeated it so quickly that no human officer had the time to counter the command. Stone shivered a little to relax his muscles. Walking over to his Drascos, he said, I'm a Navy officer, girls. I go where the Navy sends me. I want you with me, but I can't force you to go anywhere or do anything. Just know that I love you all. He felt someone at his back and glanced over his shoulder. Allie flanked him on one side, and a haggard-looking hammer mill flanked him on the other. Allie asked, Problems? Stone said, Some of the Draskos want to go with the piglets. T said, Revenge for hurting Anne, you know? She typed into her dataport translator as fast as she talked. Stone was amazed at how quickly she entered her words into the virtual keyboard. Hammermill said, I do know. I lost many good friends, and going back sounds like a good idea. Emily said, Good friends, yes, but Anne is our sister. Hammermill shook his head. Stone spoke quickly. Hammermill lost Rain Escamilla. He loved her and wanted to make her his family. You know what that means to humans. T said, not bothering with her translator, so only Stone and the other Draskos heard, Really? Like, not the same thing? L raised up to her full height and wonked loudly. Not the same. Worse for sure. Humans make family of their choosing, not just who you were born with. She slapped her tail against the back of T's head. You know that. Sisters, she rolled her eyes. J said, We've discussed human marriage. PB said, Husband and wife. Stone reached back and grabbed Allie's hand, ignoring all regulations against public displays of affection. B said, Foreverness. L said, Children! All of the Draskos nodded in concert, as if that was the telling argument. B said, resorting back to her translator, Mama is Navy, but we're Marines. We fight where Marines tell us to fight. T snorted, We're not real Marines. Only humans get to be real Marines. B shouted back, R2! Emily said, R not! Allie held up her hands for quiet. The Draskos quieted immediately. Hammermill looked at Allie. They're right, you know. 
Any regulation against their enlistment? Allie shrugged. No regulation I've ever read specifies humans only. I never heard of a non-human species volunteering. Let's run it past the Major. Hammermill said, We wouldn't have had half the trouble we did if we had a trio of Draskos with us on that orbital platform. They would have warned Rain about the enemy behind that hatch before she walked into an ambush. Allie nodded, slipping her hand out of stones. Reaching across, she gave Hammermill a gentle squeeze on the shoulder. She slid her hand back into stones so quick he still felt her earlier warmth. Charlotte wonked sadly and grunted in an unusual way. "'I want children, Mama. I want babies of my own, like Jay and Peavy have us, and you have them.' Jay said, "'No, you don't.' Peavy said, "'Yes, she does. It wasn't nice, but look what that male gave us.' She gestured at the girls clustered around her. Jay nodded and sighed, looking at each of their daughters in turn. "'I guess it's time we have that talk.' Chapter 52 Stone wanted to shout at the doctor, but the man outranked him. He said, as quietly as his temper could manage, "'Sir, Private Anne is an enlisted Marine. Regulations state that all Marines get combat nanites for rapid healing.' "'Ensign Stone, I recognize that Major Numos enlisted your Draskos.' He glanced up at the newly minted Corporal J towering over him. His nervousness was evident, but he held his ground. "'That enlistment has yet to be vetted by Marine Higher Command. It might not be.' However, the doctor waved a hand, stopping Stone's interruption. However, I have explicit instructions from my command. The medical corps is leery of putting human-designed nanites into non-human species. We just don't know what can or will happen. Stone said, But Anne is healing so slowly. The nanites would get her back on her feet quicker. The doctor exploded. Slowly? Slowly? "'Good gracious, young man! Her healing is a dozen times faster than any normal human! That leg and those shoulder bones were shattered into a hundred tiny pieces! A human would spend a month in traction as those bones re-knit. It's only been about four weeks or so. And my patient,' he emphasized the words, "'my patient is already stumping around in a cast. I will admit that a Marine would be back on their feet in half the time, even less if we were at a fully outfitted hospital.' but this bucket is barely outfitted with more than an aid station. Stone asked, So maybe when we get back to Allie's world, you can see about getting her leg fixed? The doctor shook his head. Oh, no. We jump, hopefully, back into human space in a few hours. You'd have to re-jump to Brickman Station. That is a quick jump, but then you'd have to take Private Anne on to Lazzaroni Station before you found a hospital that might, and I stress, might, have an examination room large enough to examine a Drasco assuming the Marines will claim her as one of their own, and she'll be healed by the time you get her there. Stone said, That makes my point, Doctor. The combat nanites the Marines authorized will heal her even faster. Speaking as if to a child, the doctor said, Son, your own medical files tell us about the dangers of mixing Drasco DNA with human-designed nanites. No, don't interrupt. I know about the changes your body had gone through— we still don't know if those changes are done yet, or if they're transferable to your children. Stone froze. That was something he hadn't thought about. The subject of children was something he was going to have to discuss with Allie. They'd barely started discussing marriage, both mentioning that they wanted children. Well, Allie wanted them. Stone knew Grandpa expected him to produce an heir to the family fortunes. Eventually. He'd never thought about the word eventually. It had always been a long time off in the future— but what if he shouldn't, or worse, couldn't, have children? The family would shift to the next heir. That was what their numbering system was all about. Grandpa was one, mother was Dose, Stone was Trey. Both mother and Aunt Ruth would abdicate when the time came. So would his cousin Brenda, as she was well on her way to becoming a medical doctor and wouldn't give that up. His cousin Jim Jr. was next. Jimbo was a goof. No, he'd been a goof as a kid, but they were no longer children. He didn't know what Jimbo wanted, but somewhere along the family line the right heir would be found. The Stones were a large family, especially when you began counting distant cousins. Someone to run the family fortunes was always available, and that would be someone who didn't desire the money or the power, but had the ability to manage their vast enterprises without losing themselves to the lure of wealth. But would Alice and Vedrian still want to be his wife if children were off the table? The doctor said, what changes would be wrought in a Drasco with nanites? 
You don't know, and neither do I. I'm a doctor trained to treat humans, but I find myself assigned to a bastardized ship that has humans, both civilian and military, with Drascos and Piglet vent runners. Did you know that Commander Butcher took a page from Major Numos's book and enlisted the vent runners into the Navy? Stone hadn't known that, but it made sense. He smiled at the thought. Piglets in the Navy would make vetting the Drascos into the Marines less of a challenge. Don't smile, young man. That makes me responsible for the piglets' medical care. So I've studied everything I can find about them, as little information as that is. They're Navy, so I have to keep them healthy, even if I don't know what I'm doing. The Drascos are Marines, so I've read every file on them I can find, just as I'm more than conversant about your own none-too-standard medical history. But I'm healthy, Doc, more than ever. Yes, you are, and I will admit that none of the changes in your body is beyond human capability. I mean, you can't fly, can you? You don't have X-ray vision, do you? You can't shapeshift into a tiger, right? Stone shook his head. He hadn't thought about trying to fly. He didn't have wings, but if he had a set of stable manufactured wings, he might get off the ground. He hadn't tried to shapeshift either, but he doubted it was a good thing to try when he was inside his combat suit. He didn't have X-ray vision, because he'd tried using it when Allie was in the shower, and he'd failed miserably, having to go into the gazebo and stare firsthand. But all of your changes are beyond the norm. Some humans have good vision, but I don't have a record of any human with vision as sharp as yours. Some humans have great hearing, but I don't have a record of any human with hearing as great as yours. Some humans have sensitive olfactory receptors, but I don't have a record of any human with a nose as extremely refined as yours. And some humans have an exceptionally tough epidermis, but I don't have a record of any human with skin as thick and tough as yours. But still human. Still human for now, Ensign. But that's my point about giving nanites designed for humans to Drascos. What is normal for a Drasco? Would giving Private Anne a full range of marine combat nanites force her body to change into a male? We've got enough problems on this ship without a rampaging male Drasco tearing through our corridors. Stone hadn't thought of that possibility. He nodded. I withdraw my request to give Anne nanites. I've met a male Drasco, and it isn't something I want to do again. The doctor chuckled. I've seen the video of that encounter. You were lucky and stupid both, but can you imagine how much harder that would have been if it had been a male trained for combat by Marines? He looked pointedly at Anne. Anne took the hint and typed into her translator, I'll be fine, Mama. It doesn't hurt much. Her eyes took on the unconvincing look of pain. Maybe you could bring me some more ooze next time? That might make me feel better. Jay said, Greedy little pig. I'll bring you two bars later, but you be careful, or you'll get fat and lazy, just laying around doing nothing. Her voice was soft, regardless of the words. Stone's data port blared. Ensign Stone to the bridge. Jump into Allie's world in a hundred twenty minutes. Chapter 53 Stone raced onto the bridge. Two hours gave him plenty of time to get from medical to the bridge, but he liked to run. Sliding to a stop, he slid into a seat next to Dr. Wisniewski. He smiled a greeting to Major Numos and Dr. Emmons. Butcher said, Glad you could finally join us, Ensign. There was a hint of humor in the man's sarcasm. Numos asked, Private Anne doing okay? Stone nodded. He wondered how Numos knew where he'd been. She's healing quickly, sir. Not as quick as she would with the nanites, but fast enough. Numos nodded. I stopped by earlier to check on her. What? That shouldn't be a surprise. She's part of my command now, right? I dropped off a bar of that ooze they eat up like candy this morning, and she seemed good, not ready to return to duty, but good. Smiling, Stone nodded. Anne was turning into quite a little con artist at getting people to bring her the ooze. He wondered if she was eating it all, storing some for later, or even selling some to her sisters. Butcher pointed at the time display hanging over the conference table. The time was counting down to the jump. We've read and reread the Rusty Hinge's database on the jump from the Piglet homeworld into Allie's world. Their initial jump into the Piglet home system was met with a repulsar mine that threw them back into hyperspace. We know how much time they spent in hyperspace because their database automatically recorded the time spent. Wizard's team has confirmed that information. Stone was aware of the double jump. How the Hyrocanians had found Allie's world by accident was common knowledge on the ship. 
He and Danielle Wright had found Allie's world the first time by accident as well. Butcher continued, The Hyrocanians jumped out of hyperspace and spent an undetermined amount of time in normal space before jumping into and out of hyperspace again to find Allie's world. The time between the jumps is unknown, but the time in hyperspace is well known to us. Gupta said, Both of the shuttles we sent back earlier with data followed the double jump pattern exactly, retracing the Hyrocanian's trip. Unfortunately, we haven't heard back from either shuttle. Butcher nodded. I have decided the Rusty Hinges is going to make the trip as a single jump, combining the times of both hyperspace jumps. Our computers, our civilian scientists, and our astrogation team has assured us that they don't know if it will work or not, but they can't tell us if a double jump works either. He smiled and clapped his hands in excitement. I like a good surprise, don't you? Stone wasn't sure he was as fond of surprises as Butcher. The decision wasn't his. He was a lowly ensign whose whole responsibility was as a staff advisor to the ship's captain on the bridge. Advising the captain on a decision that he'd already made didn't make sense, so he held his tongue. Not that he would advise the captain to make a double jump instead of combining the times into a single jump, but both methods involved timing and avoided the problems of jumping into and out of hyperspace without using known and tested navigation points. He'd done that before and almost crashed into a space station. He glanced at the time display. The time seemed to have barely moved from the two-hour mark, he was beginning to hate time, the accumulation of it, the passage of it, and that stupid thing where time in hyperspace didn't count in real time and went away. As a freighter's kid growing up, he was well aware that making friends with children on space stations was a waste of time. From their perspective, he might have been gone only a few short months, but in his time, because most of a freighter's time was spent in hyperspace going from one space depot to the next, he could have aged a year or more. People aged in hyperspace, but normal time didn't exist in hyperspace, so people aged without normal time passing. No time passed in hyperspace because there wasn't anything in hyperspace. No light, no heat, no energy, no matter, no length, depth, width, height, or even any time. Nothing was nothing. Time was something, even though time itself was weirdly flexible in normal space. Speed affected time, causing strange dilations. Gravity affected time, causing the rate of time to change. Watching the time display, Stone wondered what was causing the countdown to seem like it was slowing down until it was barely creeping by. Stone looked up. Everyone had something to do. Numos was wrangling a pile of reports on his data port. Doing double duty as the Marine Company commander and the Rusty Hinge's third watch commander, he had twice as many reports to fill out. Butcher and Gupta had their heads together, working on some personnel issue— the bridge crew all seemed to be turning this dial, punching that button, or tweaking some display. Even Dr. Wisniewski had Dr. Emmons' neck to nuzzle while she was writing another of her interminable behavior reports on someone. He felt useless on the bridge. Still, if he wasn't here, there wasn't anywhere else he had to be. He had initially been assigned to watch over the piglets. The vent runners were Navy now, and no longer his responsibility. The piglets from the space commander's family, on their way to Ali's world to colonize the land he'd offered them, didn't need his oversight. They were at home, farming and managing the various gardens, hydroponic and otherwise, scattered around the ship. A few of them decided they liked ship life much better than planets, and had announced they weren't leaving the ship no matter how nice Ali's world was. His Draskos were marines now, but he still felt responsible for them. They were too intelligent and becoming too mature to require his babysitting services. In fact, he'd seen so little of them lately, he had to go looking for them when he needed some Drasco time. Navy officers all over the ship had duties to attend to. Thinking about it, the only gap in the Rusty Hinge's officer contingent was the officer in charge of waste systems. The NCO who'd taken charge of the systems when Lieutenant Senior Grade Missy Maya was ordered confined to his quarters was running them more efficiently than Stone could or Missy Maya had. If he had more time, he might go down to the kitchens and see what Tim Dollish was up to. But there was that time thing again. He had time, but didn't since he was supposed to be here. The time display slowed down further, barely clicking forward second by second. He wanted to pull out his own data port and verify the accuracy of the clock on the display. He didn't. He sat watching Dr. Wisniewski and wondering where Allie was and what she was doing. He let his mind drift. Navigation, sir. 
Sixty seconds to jump. The phrase snapped Stone back to awareness. Sixty seconds, Butcher acknowledged. Navigation, you have the con. Take us out of hyperspace on your mark. Tactical? Tactical, sir. We're squawking IFF on all freaks. Loud as we can, sir. Numos reached across the conference table and changed the display from the countdown clock to the ship's external view. He settled back into his chair to stare. The monitor showed the gray of nothing. A glare of light replaced the gray. Navigation, sir. Translation successful. Tactical, sir. Minefield, dead ahead. Butcher shouted, Helm, dead stop. Helm, sir. Aye, aye, dead stop. Tactical, sir. They're human minds and responding to our IFF. We've... Astrogation, sir. Star charts match Alley's world. Tactical, sir. We've got Navy ships massing across our front. Their shields just went up. Weapons are spinning up hot. Butcher said, the calmness in his voice infectious. Comms open. Calm, sir. Aye, aye. Comms open. Tactical, sir. We're squawking IFF loud and hard on all freaks. They should be... A Navy admiral flashed onto the monitors. He smiled and said, Welcome home, Rusty Hinges. We were just about to come looking for you. Chapter 54 United Empire Navy officer Ensign Senior Grade Blackman Perry Stone sat on the veranda of his guest bungalow. He propped his bare feet up on a small wicker ottoman. The overhead fan swished back and forth with a slow rhythmic monotony, but the pleasant onshore zephyr overwhelmed its delicate breeze. The view of the black sand beach and calm blue ocean were stunning through the grove of thirty-foot-tall ferns surrounding the building. The scene wasn't spoiled in the least by small groups of families and military personnel playing in the mild surf. Picking up the fruity drink off the side table, he swished it, unconsciously matching the rhythm of the fan overhead and the roll of the surf from the beach. This wasn't Peach's rest, but it sure beat living in his assigned B.O.Q. room. He glanced over his shoulder at Allie, asleep in their bed, her half-naked body lying twisted in the sheets. The amenities here were much better than even his room aboard the Rusty Hinges. A thank-you note to Queen Danielle was definitely in order. She offered him the use of his old governor quarters for as long as he was on the planet. He may not have any official duties while on leave, but Allie was filling in his nothing-to-do time quite nicely. He wanted to ignore the space commander's invitation to visit their new piglet colony and review their progress. He couldn't think of anything he wanted more than spending quiet time with Allie. He wanted to ignore the invitation, but he wouldn't. The piglets put on quite a feast and throw one heck of a party once they get past their speeches. He shifted slightly as a loud screech filled the air. No strange odors wafted up from the beach alerting him to danger, but he looked anyway. Newly promoted Sergeant Barbara Tuttle was holding Petty Officer 3rd Class Tim Dollish over her head. With a heave, she tossed the young Navy man into the clear, clean water. The screech had been one of delight. Dollish even managed to keep his swim trunks on this time. Tuttle followed Dollish into the water with a wild spray. The light warm wind blowing in from the beach brought him the fragrance of cinnamon. The odor wasn't pleasant like cinnamon on snickerdoodles. This fragrance had overtones of burnt garlic, so strong he could almost taste it on the back of his tongue, and it made his eyes water. He knew the drifting odor, and it wasn't a good thing. Stone was halfway to the beach at a full run before the guard towers made their clack and whir drive to their height. A sharp report cracked through the air, and the towers settled back down. A small geyser spouted far out to sea, well beyond the safety nets. The all-clear sounded. The partiers on the beach barely looked up from their fruity drinks, books, or games. Turning around, he walked back to his bungalow. Allie sat up in the bed, the sheet pulled up to her neck. As he entered, she dropped the sheet and wiggled her fingers in a come-here command. The End This has been Metal Boxes, Rusty Hinges, Volume 3, written by Alan Black, narrated by Doug Tisdale, Jr., copyright 2016 by Alan Black, production copyright 2016 by Alan Black. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.